National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Say. Oh, Sam. I'll take it easy. The papers are on the street. I saw them. So did I. There'll be some red-faced editors ducking behind their green eye shades tomorrow. What do you mean, Sam? You don't plan up the score until the returns are all in, F. This applies to presidential elections, boxing matches, and executions at San Quentin Prison. Sam, you mean Willie? I mean Willie. Batten down the hatches and turn over your foam rubber cushion wonder girl, for even now I'm homeward bound with a stride-by-stride account of a 12-hour marathon, which I shall call, for obvious reasons, the Hail and Farewell Caper. <laughs> Transcribed for NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all, starring Stephen Dunn in The Adventures of Sam Spade. I've been robbed. Happy? Sam? Brought in here this minute. Oh. Have I done something? That's what I was about to ask. Have you been sticking your delightful, freckle-covered, upturned little nose into my schnapps bottle? Well, answer me, girl. Sam, you know I don't do that. All right, then, who? Well, the nervous little man who was here did open the drawer to find a pencil and paper and, and leave a note. Okay, you're clear. Oh, Sam, what about the little man? A good and leading question, F. Shall we attempt an answer? Oh, I'm at the ready, Sam. Shoot. They fill it in to Justice Edward Benjamin, State Supreme Court from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the hail and farewell caper. Dear Justice Benjamin. My relationship with the spindly little man goes clear back to a week ago, Thursday, possibly even before that. But that was the day I first noticed him. I remember it was Thursday because I was having corned beef and cabbage at Schroeder's. With him, it was a glass of water at the next table. He was paying little mind to the menu, having decided to spend the lunch hour staring at me. A couple of times, he put down his glass of water and pushed back his chair as if he were going to come over and talk. But he changed his mind. I put away the corned beef and cabbage and was halfway past the pie when he finally did it. Uh, uh excuse me, sir. Hello? You, uh, you, sir, are uh, Mr. Spade? I am. The uh, detective, Sam Spade, detective agent? At your service, sir. Now, what can I... I, uh, I, uh, you see, I, uh, do you have a match? I gave him a match and he thanked me and went out. On Friday, I saw him in Ben's grotto over a plate of wrecked soul. We got just about as far, then he returned the match he owed me. The following week, I saw him four times. Once as I was going into a show, once at the post office, and twice as I was going into my office building. Each was the same. We'd get up to the point where he was about to tell me something, then he'd back down and ask me what time it was, or did I have a horse in the fifth at Golden Gate, or would I lend him a cigarette? Then he'd bustle off as fast as his spindly little legs could carry. And thus matters stood yesterday. Place, my office, time, 1.37 p.m. Sam Spade. Mr. Spade, is this... this... This is a gentleman who... who is yeah, that... don't tell me I know the voice. Now, what is it this time? I do uh, like to see you, Mr. Spade. I must see you. I know. I'll save us both a trip. The it date is, is April 26th. The time is 1.38 p.m. It, All it trains, really planes, and streetcars are leaving on schedule. Most important... And for the favor to Golden Gate tomorrow, consult your nearest please, bookie. Please, sir. Please, Mr. Spade. Please, do not jest. This is a matter of life and death. I see. Fine. Then I'll see you tomorrow for lunch, huh? I won't be here, Mr. Spade. Oh, where'll you be? Dead. Dead. Look, look, I'm I, tired of this, I, Mr. Spindley. Give it to me straight or sign off. Now, what I, is it? You've got to listen to me, Mr. Spade. It's, it's most important. It's a life or death. It's a life... Hello? Mr. Spindley? Hello? It almost seemed as if he were in earnest this time, so I didn't hang up. I hustled down the hall to the next office, found another phone, and sweet-talked the supervisor into tracing down Mr. Spinlin. It was a pay booth in a drugstore opposite the Park Emergency Hospital. The clerk in the drugstore was just getting over it when I punched in. Spindley had collapsed in the booth and had been hauled across the street to the hospital. On the bed there. Oh, thanks, doctor. Life and death, Mr. Spade. Terrible. You've got to stop it. 
It's murder. He's been legal muttering murder. like that ever since we brought I him in. Yeah, you. hop, huh? The legal kind. You see before you an overdose of sleeping murder. tablets. You mean he tried to kill himself? I can't think of an easy way anyone could feed him two yes. full bottles, can you? Pull through? Probably. I gave him a good pumping. Don't let them do it. Don't. Don't. All right. It's murder. Right. Now, murder. now, Mr. Doe, don't carry on so. But I know who did it. I, I, you must stop him. All right. All right. I, I know who is Take it easy. I, Boy, he's got a lot of strength for a little guy. Mr. Doe, huh? No name. Yeah, nothing to identify him. Funny thing, that. What do you mean? I'd almost guarantee the man's undernourished, hasn't eaten for days, shabby clothes and so on. Yet look at the roll I found in his pocket. Hmm? How much? Almost $800. Oh, did you find anything else? Yeah, this. Huh? What do you make of it? Well, front page of the Star Times. It's a galley proof, isn't it? The kind they run off in the linotype room before they start the presses. Yeah. Killer dies tonight. Willie Johnson, hitchhike murderer, to enter gas chamber at midnight. Innocent, innocent man. It's, right. it's murder, it's murder. Down you go, Mr. Doe. But, but I know who did it, sir. I know everything. I, uh, everything I uh, know. A frame. It's a skillful frame. You mean Willie Johnson? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I know who it was. It was, it was hail and farewell, sir. Hail well, Who was it? Come on, Mr. Doe, wake up. Mr. Doe. Yeah. I was waiting for that. Hit him? Like a ton of bricks. He'll be incommunicado for the next 24 hours or longer. Hail and farewell. A broken down actor. Huh? Only an actor would think more of an exit line than an innocent man's neck. You mean you believe he knows? I don't know what I believe. The guy's been trailing me for 10 days, driving himself nuts, tries to knock himself off. It's a cinch he believes it. Hmm. Well, there's no chance of bringing him around before tomorrow. Yes, and Willie Johnson dies tonight. So what happens? So I'm stuck for taxi fare to San Quentin. Believe in him? Believe in Willie Johnson? Yeah, I know you're his lawyer, Mr. Grayson. I'm I... his lawyer because I volunteered to serve you, Mr. Spade. I've been in the law a long, long time. I've defended a lot of phonies. Sometimes you've got to if you want to eat. They all sing the same song. I was framed. Oh, I know all 89 verses. But Willie... Yeah? Willie's song is different. Because Willie Johnson's an innocent man. Willie was framed. Mm. Four appeals. Four appeals, four stays. And we've had our last one. It's folded up now, Spade. I'm going to take the walk with him at midnight. So do something for me, will you? Sure, sir. When... When you walk into a cell... Remember you're talking to a man who's going to die in less than eight hours. We're trying to... We're trying to build his spirit up so he can go out with... The colors flying, you know? Yeah. Don't give him a lot of false hopes, Pete. Because... Because there isn't any... I don't quite understand, Mr. Spade, sir. I've told my story so many times. I, uh, I'd like to write something about you for the papers, Willie. Oh. Yes, sir. But all the newspaper gentlemen been here and gone. Yeah, I know. Could you tell it just once more, Willie? Well, all right, sir. It was more than a year ago, I guess you know that. Yeah. I was broke, you know. Mm. Things hadn't been going so well, sir. I was down to my last two bits that night. I walked into Sherry Dugan's. That's the bar on the waterfront, huh? Yes, sir. I got to talking with a fella sitting at the bar there. He bought me beer. Who was he? I never did find his name. I ain't seen him since that night. If I could find him, I don't reckon I'd be where I am, sir. Uh. He had a paper with him. Was reading the classified ad section. You know the part about autos, transportation, so on? Yeah. Well, there was an ad there. I'd say we'll pay $500 plus expenses to drive car to Mexico City with a phone number. Mm -hmm. And the fellow said if he were in my shoes, he'd call up and inquire. So I did. I inquired. And I got the job. Mm. Well, sir, about an hour later, I met a man with a car at Southern Mason by the gas station there. And he gave me the 500 and I start out for Mexico City. Who was he, Willie? Never found his name either, we tried, too, Mr. Grayson. Me. Never could find him. I see. 
Well, it, it was raining that night, sir. I remember. It was raining. And I hadn't gotten more than 50 miles south of town, somewhere around Morgan Hill it was, huh. when a siren blew off behind me, and the first thing I knew was well, they was asking me questions about a girl. A girl named Georgia Lyon. Uh-huh. It was her car, it seems, and the, the officer claimed I stole it. They, they made me raise my arms, and they, they searched me, and, and th- there was a knife in my pocket, you see, with, with blood on it. Uh-huh. There, and I, I, I don't know how it got there, and the $500, that had blood on it, too. And, and there was blood on the seat. And, and, and when they opened the turtle back, there she was. This Georgia line, I told you. Uh-huh. All double up there and dead. And they, they said I'd done it for the money in the car. And I, I, I guess I just went crazy, Mr. Spade, with, a, with this all coming at me at once that way. You see, I, I tried to make a break for it, and I got away. And uh, I know I knew it was a terrible wrong thing to do. I know that. Yeah, what about the trial, Willie? Well, sir, Mr. Grayson done everything in his power, sir. And, and so did I. Mm. I told the truth as close as I could recollect it, but it didn't make no sense. We never found a man in a bar or the man who drove up in the car. What about the phone number in the ad? Oh, that that turned out to be a fancy dress shop on Powell Street called uh, uh, Mason Francine. Mm. And the classified ad, sir, that, that was the queerest thing of all. Well, what do you mean? Well, Mr. Grayson went to every newspaper in the country for two weeks either side of the night. And there wasn't any such ad in any of them. Huh? So they said I was lying. They said I was lying. I made it all up I, in my head. And I, now they're going to kill me for it. Yeah. I don't know, Mr. Spade. I've heard it so long now. Maybe I did kill her. Maybe they're right. Maybe they're right. But there was something in the way he said, maybe they're right told you they were wrong. I thanked him and told him I had what I wanted for my story and said goodbye. There was no hope in his face, but no despair either. He knew what was coming and he was ready. And that's all. I hit the homeward bound commuters on the wrong side of the Golden Gate Bridge, so it was almost seven when I checked in at Cherry Dugan's bar on the waterfront. A girl was sitting three stools down from me, a class-type dame in a black file suit from Magnum's. And a hat that must have set some good-time Charlie back 50 bucks. Not the kind of a dame you'd expect to be sitting in Sherry Dugan's, least of all as drunk as she was. Well, here you are, Jack. Sixty cents. Thank you. Hey, wait a minute. Huh? This is a one-man operation, isn't it? Mm, yes, why? Well, then you'd be Sherry Dugan, huh? <laughs> no, no, I, I bought the joint from Sherry a few months back. Why? Well, I'm, uh, I'm doing a story for the papers on Willie Johnson. Tell me, was Sherry here on the big night? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Only Woodley Johnson wasn't. You could look it up, what Sherry testified. Where is he now? Oh, South America. And there he'll stay. You know why? Why? Sherry has brains. For a man in his shoes, there's no better place right now than South America. Oh? Tell me more. He needed a rest the worst way Sherry did. After all he'd been through. Tending bar can be difficult at times, right, Tim? Uh, yes, yes, indeed, yes, indeed. Show me a good bartender and I'll show you a barn diplomat. And more besides. Mm-hmm. Now, here's the sherry, wherever he is. Keep running, sherry, keep running. You know, sherry's like a dog running away from a can tied to his tail. We all are. Who's we? All of us, all of us, the world. Give me another drink, Tim. Oh, now, listen, lady, I don't think I... Don't give me any lip. This is a first-class wake, isn't it? A send-off for Willie, isn't it? Poor! Marilyn, what are you doing here? Uh, Well, just in time, Georgie. Sit down. Come on, we're going home. Take your time, George. Two of the members present, one more, will have a quorum. Pour him a drink, Tim. You want me to carry you out of here? Might be fun. Where's Daddy? He's pacing the floor. Now, come on. You know something, George. You've got a can tied to your tail, too. No use running, George. Oh, you're out of your head. Whatever made you come here? Kind of appropriate, don't you think? Special night tonight. What? Yes, you all fixing. Gonna have us awake. Not here we aren't. Are you coming? Nope. All right. Where, where are we going? Going home. Bye, Timmy. And you, whoever you are. Hey, wait a minute. 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 Hey, wait
wait for the waiter. How about to have hold a... Hold it, hold it. Oh. How much does she owe you? I got three forty-five. Uh, here. It's oh. worth it. Now tell me, who is she? Oh, it's a model. Some dress shop uptown. Oh? Like the Maison Francine, for instance? Yeah. How'd you know? That's the hunch. What's her name? Oh, Marilyn Hale. Her old man runs the Star Times, you know, the publisher. Yeah. The guy is his partner, George Farewell. You must have heard of the firm Hale and Farewell. I had, but it was a slightly different reading from the one Mr. Spindley gave me at the hospital. I looked at my watch. Willie was four and a half hours from the end of the line when I took off for the press room at the Star Times. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's fun and music for you tomorrow evening with the Dennis Day Show. There'll be songs by Dennis and another typical tangled comedy situation, the kind of hilarious mix-up that could happen only to Dennis Day. And now, back to the hail and farewell caper, tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Time, 8-11. I got out of the elevator in the basement of the Star Times building on Mission Street and started looking for the press room foreman, somebody named Joe Fortescue. I finally found his feet sticking out from under a sick linotype, hauled him out, and tried to make him understand what I wanted. Yeah, I know, I know who you mean. I know a little bandy-legged guy. That... Can't hear you. I say, I say, he's a little bandy-legged guy. Yeah, that's the guy. Hello, what about him? Come on. Go ahead, you first. Ah, now who is he? Oh, uh, Charlie Forrest, he's not. I know, but that's not what I care. Been off his rocker for a year. Look, you see that picture on the wall over your head? Yeah. That's Mr. Hale, the Iron Fist. Oh. Won't tolerate no inefficiency, you understand? But uh, uh, this screwball, this Charlie Forrest, I personally can him twice, and both times Iron Fist sends him back to me. Yeah. So, so it, it don't make no never mind to me, brother. Leave him come to work, Stuart, all the time. Leave him lay off for two straight weeks like this time. <laughs> Don't make no never mind. Yeah, yeah, now look, I'm up with you now. How long's Charlie been this way? Oh, a year or so. I know just when it started. When Willie Johnson was hauled in on the hitchhiking killing, right? Oh, you've been talking to Charlie, huh? Yeah. Uh, funny thing how that hit him. You'd find him sitting in a corner by himself, mumbling all the time about the guy being innocent. Mm. What do you suppose Charlie had to do with that? Oh, I don't know. Got real crazy toward the end, you know. Said he was killing Willie Johnson. And you'd ask him with what? And he'd say a linotype machine and a hunk of newsprint. One day he even offered to prove it, you know. How? Oh, I don't know. He said he had proof. He said he had the evidence that would save Willie's neck. Hid in his room. Boy, <laughs> he was the office trolley. Look, I've got to find out know. where he lives. They don't know upstairs. I don't know. We don't know downstairs, neither. He moved out of his apartment three weeks back and don't nobody know where he went. Look, he was in this morning. Picked up a galley proof of page one. Uh, that's right. Yeah. I'll tell you who might know where to find him. Oh, come on, come on. Yeah, about ten o'clock he leave here. Said he was going to look him up. Somebody, uh, somebody named Spade. Thanks. Sam Spade. He's a detective. That remains to be seen. A bandy-legged little guy named Charlie Forrest, F. He must have been in around 10, 10.30 this morning. Oh, dear, I didn't get here till 11. Uh, They're still clearing stuff off the tracks from the MacArthur reception. Yeah, never mind that now. Listen, write this down. Oh, oh, wait till I find a piece of paper. Hurry up. Here, here, under the ashtray. Yeah. Go ahead, Sam. Call Jeremy Grayson. He's a lawyer, and he's with Willie Johnson in the death row at Quentin. Tell him to get hold of a justice on the state Supreme Court and hold the line open until I get him. You got that? Yes, sir. Is there anything else? No, I'll get back to you in a little while. Sam! Wait a minute, don't hang up. What's the matter? <gasps> this paper I'm writing on under the ashtray. It's a note. Well, go ahead. Mr. Spade, please contact me at once. Charles W. Forrest, Bellflower Hotel, 338 Stockton Street. It took 20 more minutes to cross town and 10 on top of that to convince the clerk at the Bellflower I had a right to the key to Charlie's room, which I had not. I tossed the room from the light fixture to the floorboards, covered everything from the window shades to the bathroom plumbing. Result, one batch of dirty laundry, six soggy cigarettes, and two empty bottles of sleeping pills. 
I was on my way out when I remembered one more thing. It wasn't an accident like in the movies. It was on purpose. I unscrewed the tops of the iron bedposts. Inside number three, I found it. There was a payphone at the end of the dark hallway. Sam, I warned you about this. We've had four stays. They won't come through with a fifth. I've got a fair hole card, Grayson. Did you get the judge? Yeah, Benjamin, State Supreme Court. What'd he say? What I knew he'd say. No evidence, no stay. Tell him I got evidence. It better be good, Sam. It is. A phony newspaper, a copy of the Star Times for the night of the murder with a special page in the classified section carrying the ad that Willie answered. How does that sound? You've got it now? Yeah. Well, for Pete's sake, hang on to it. I'll get back to the judge. Say, wait a minute, who, uh, who's behind it? It's a long story. I'll tell you when I see you. Hang up. Uh, when you what? Spade. Spade. Hang up or I'll kill you. Spade. That's it. You can turn around now. Well, Iron Fist. We've met. I've seen your picture, Mr. Hale. It flattered me, no doubt. Give it to me. What? The paper, stupid. I haven't read the funnies. All right, Mr. Spade, if you'd rather. <laughs> Iron Fist knew other games besides publishing. He moved up, I went for the gun, which suddenly wasn't there, and he was giving me a fast demonstration of judo for beginners. First thing you know, I was sprawled on the floor, and he was looking down at me along the barrel of his thirty-eight. <laughs> I could kill you, I suppose, but why? Why? He backed off toward the window, spread out the paper, and crumbled it up. No. You know what you're doing with that match, Hale. Shut up. You're burning Willie Johnson at the stake. I said you're... shut up. He touched the match to the pile of papers, watched them flare suddenly, lighting up the entire hallway. He looked like a medieval devil. I'm sorry about Willie Spade, but it has to be, that's all. It has to be. What did you have to do with Georgia Lyon? Nothing. Nothing at all. And her name wasn't Georgia Lyon, really. It was her stage name. No. Her real name was Farewell. Your partner's wife? Why, Spade, didn't you read the testimony at the trial? She was leaving George that night. She'd made a noble decision to walk out of his life and leave him free. For your daughter, huh, Marilyn? That's right. And it was such a tragedy Georgia had to run into Willie Johnson the very night she left. Wasn't it, Spade? <laughs> wasn't it? He bent over the fire, watched it die down into a pile of ashes. I was looking at something else. A draft from the stairwell behind me had picked up a glowing scrap and set it down at the foot of a sleazy window curtain behind him. <laughs> well, that's it, Spade. The last of Willie Johnson. The last of... I hit him at the knees as the curtain went up in a blinding flash. No judo this time, just an old-fashioned hammerlock. There we go. Come on, give me that gun. No. The fire. I'll break your arm, Hale. I'll break your arm. There. Well, that's better. Now get up. Get up. Hale, stop. Hale. I caught him in the leg as he hit the top of the stairway. He took off like an eagle, lit on his neck halfway down, and toppled the rest of the way like a loose packed sack of laundry. He was dead when I got to him. Score, with an hour and five minutes to play, no evidence, one dead witness, one unconscious one, one killer, an accomplice at large. There was only one way left to go, and I took it. Floor, please. George Farewell's apartment. That's the penthouse. Yeah, is he home? Oh, I don't know what's the matter up there, sir. I, I think something's wrong, awfully wrong. Hmm? He went up there early this evening with a young lady, and the door to the roof is locked at the eighth floor. That's never happened before. Any other way up? Well, you might try the fire escape if it's urgent. It is. So I climbed the fire escape at the eighth floor and went up onto the roof, or rather into George Farewell's patio. I worked my way through a maze of potted shrubbery around a fish pond with a fountain in the middle. Piano music was coming through a pair of French doors. But before I saw where the music was coming from, I knew it was the radio and not the piano. Because the piano, a 14-foot grand, had George Farewell sprawled across the keyboard with a bullet through his head. I crossed to the set of French doors on the other side of the house. And there I saw her, standing up on the three-foot parapet surrounding the roof, looking eight floors down into the street. 
You're not really going to jump, Marilyn. He did it his way. I'm going to do it mine. Don't come any closer. Don't. I won't. So George shot himself, huh? Why not? Man goes through life with a can tied to your tail. No running away from that. No, there isn't. Well, you're going to jump? Give me time. Oh, you want to do it the dramatic way, don't you, Marilyn? Only 35 minutes left until Willie checks out over at the... And to make it really ironic, you'll want to take off before he does, right? The one person left who can save him. I talked to Willie, Marilyn. He must hate the world. He doesn't hate anybody. Poor jerk. I think he'd feel even sorrier for you, throwing your own life away while you can still save his. You can't run away from this tin can, but you can untie it. You can climb down off that wall and ride over to Quentin with me. You can tell him George Farewell killed his wife. That the three of you and the little linotyper made a pigeon out of Willie. Ah. I held my breath. She swayed, looked down into the street, poising herself. Then she turned round and stepped onto the roof again. Let's go. Congratulations. Yeah. Only George Farewell didn't stab his wife that night. I did. up at Quentin with six minutes to spare. The foregoing, Justice Benjamin, is submitted in support of the stay of execution granted Willie Johnson and will be set forth in detail in Mr. Grayson's petition for a new trial. Period. End of report. Gee, Willie can say it. What can I say? Well, I have one constructive suggestion. I could say you're the greatest Finest, most wonderful... Yes, but you'd only be repeating yourself, Tara. The proper line at this moment is, I shall have the report ready for you immediately following the next announcement. Right? Scoot. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Listen to the stars on this Sunday's big show. Jimmy Durante, Ethel Merman, Milton Berle, and Gordon McRae, plus Meredith Wilson and his orchestra. Your MC on the big show, of course, is the glamorous Tallulah. You're invited. Here it is, Sam. Sam? Hmm? Here's the report. Oh, yeah, yeah. What are you writing, Sam? Uh, Look, how's this? Man of the world, dashing, debonair, cosmopolitan, temporarily at liberty, desires employment. (laughs) Sounds wonderful. Thank you. What does it mean? Uh, All right, we'll drop it down a few notches. Private investigator, accomplished raconteur, will tell troubles to listening public. Nice telephone voice. Contact Sam Spade, 1 East 48th Street, New York. 1 East 48th Street? Yeah, my address during the summer months, Cherub. You got it? 1 East 48th Street, mm-hmm. New York City. Mm-hmm. Oh, maybe a lot of people will write, Sam. I'm sure they will. Think so? There'll always be a Samuel Spade Incorporated. Will there? Look ahead. Smile through the tears, Sam. I am. The day will come soon again when... When the when... phone will ring and you will say... Sam Spade Detective Agency. Yes, and I will say... (laughs) Me, sweetheart. Buck up, old girl. Stout fella. Stiff upper lip. Good show. Not goodbye, but... Oh, reward, Sam. Hail and farewell. Good night, sweetheart. Tonight's transcribed adventure of Sam Spade was produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn, Lorreen Tuttle as Effie. Also in the cast were Junius Matthews, Olin Soleil, Wally Mayer, Sidney Miller, Kathy Lewis, Paul Fries, Ed Max, and Lou Merrill. Script for tonight's adventure by Harold Swanton. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. John Wilkins, Johnny. Prime Mutual Limited. 
Oh, hi, Don. Thanks for the Christmas present. Well, just don't take out the cork near an open flame. Yeah. Uh, say, do you know anything about a guy named Mel Pryker? Nothing good about him. Why? Got himself killed last night. Murdered. Pryker was born to be murdered. Maybe so, but not at our expense. We're holding a $100,000 policy on him. Wow. Who's the beneficiary? His uh, partner, Nick Shearn. Nick Shearn? You picked a fine pair of rats. Yeah, I know that now. The New York police are holding Shearn, but they've got no evidence. Go down there and check it out for us, Johnny. If Nick did the killing, we're off the hook. Any witnesses? One, apparently, the hat check girl in that nightclub of theirs. What's her story? I wish I knew. She's disappeared. We've got to find her, Johnny, before some of Nick's hoodlums find her. Don, maybe they already have. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Trimutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenditures during my investigation of the Nick Shearn matter. Item 1, 2280, transportation to New York, tips and incidentals, and taxi fare to the office of Lieutenant Ed Rafferty, Homicide Division, the man in charge of the case. Oh, hiya, Johnny. Where have you been? Not bad, Ed. How's the homicide business? Terrible. If you look at that teletype, shoplifting, five complaints right in a row. The week before Christmas, that's all we get, shoplifters. Mel Pryker wasn't shoplifting. Oh, you working on it, Johnny? Yeah, the insurance angle. Nick Shearn's the beneficiary. A hundred grand policy. Well, you got a tough one, boy. Shearn killed him all right, but I don't think we're going to be able to stick him. Come on in the office. Hey, you know what that kid of mine wants for Christmas? Marilyn Monroe? Oh, oh, next year, Johnny. He's only ten, you know. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. No, he he wants a motorbike. Can you tie that? Ten years old, and he says he needs a motorbike. (laughs) Have a chair. Okay. Well, look, I know a factory representative here will make you a good deal on one, eh? Oh, now, forget it, Johnny. No, I was 14 before I even had a pair of roller skates. And then I had to buy them myself. You know, kids are spoiled today. That's the half of what's wrong with them. Uh, ah, there's the file on the case. What little we've got. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, how'd it happen, Ed? Uh, you mean, how do I think it happened? That's good enough for me. Mel Pryker and Nick Shearn were both in the rackets for years, as you probably know. Yeah, I've heard rumors. Well, a while back, they teamed up and opened a string of supper clubs. That's where Pryker got it, in their main club, the Chez Colette. Strictly legitimate, huh? Well, more or less, I guess. They could afford to be. The dough they were making and arguing over, according to the word around. That's the reason for the killing, the way you see it. Sure. Nick figured if half was good, all the take would be twice as good. And the insurance on top of it. Ah, you're a fast one, Johnny. (laughs) Anyhow, uh, several people heard the shots about 2.30 in the morning, it was, right after the club closed, but none of them bothered to report it. The cleanup crew came in at three and found Pryker's body. He was lying in his office, shot twice, gun on the floor beside him, no prints, with his own gun, and it was kept there in his desk. Where was Nick Shearn? Well, we picked him up an hour later at another one of their clubs. The manager was with him, and... uh, Oh, Benny Stark. Now, he used Benny. to... Benny. Yeah, I know. Trigger man for Nick's mob in the old days. Fifteen years overdue for hanging. <laughs> That's our Benny. Anyhow, they, they both swear that Nick was there from 1.30 on. Uh-huh. What about a paraffin test, Ed? Positive. Clear to the elbow. And you can throw it out the window. What do you mean? Earlier that evening, Nick spent two hours at a shooting gallery uptown firing a pistol. Ooh, smart, huh? He really planned for it. He really did. And without a witness, we haven't got a chance. I understand there was a witness. Some girl who was mixed up in it. Easy, Johnny. You're talking to a Rafferty. Hmm, so the girl's Irish. Miss Kathleen O'Dare. Old country, back three generations. County Kildare. <laughs> then naturally, she's as innocent as a newborn babe. Naturally. Then how does she figure? Well, a taxi driver who knows her said that he saw her leave the club five minutes after the shots. She denied it, said that she left at closing time. Well, now, in my book, she was lying. Scared to talk, huh? Paralyzed. And with plenty of reason. You know Shuren's reputation. Mm. What about the cab driver? Now, I changed his story. He said it might have been some other girl he saw. Oh, no, no. Tell me, Ed. Let me guess. Uh, That's right. His name's O'Toole. And I forgot to mention that Kathleen's pretty. Naturally. 
Anyhow, I let her go. I had to. And when I went around to talk to her this morning, she'd flown the coop. Any chance I'm a next boy's grabbed her? I don't think so. It looked more like she came home, packed in a hurry, took her kid, and blew. Kid? Ah, eight-year-old daughter. Irish and a mother, too. I was on sacred ground. Oh, he was fingering me gun. <laughs> no, seriously, Johnny. Would you find her? She may be able to break Nick's alibi, and it's our only chance. And it might be her only chance. Nick Sharon's not the boy to leave a loose end lying around. I know. I've got 30 men checking bus depots, airlines. And no luck, huh? In this mess, this time of year, I'm a hard-boiled cop, Johnny. I've got no Christmas spirit. I'm glad it only comes once per annum. Well, there's not very much to go on, that's for sure. <clears throat> I'll see what I can turn up, Ed. Check with you later. All right, that's fine. Oh, oh, oh by the way, Johnny. Yeah? Uh, about that friend of yours. What friend? Uh, the guy with the motorbikes. Uh, how, how would I be getting in touch with him? Oh, yeah, his name's Ralph Sterner. He's in the phone book, office in the Mackley building. Hard boil cop. <laughs> well, uh, the kid's only young once. Yeah, sure. Now, you find that O'Dare girl. Find her, keep her alive, and get her to talk. How long have I got to find her? Uh, what do you mean? Nick Shearn. How much longer can you hold him? Johnny, he was turned loose an hour ago. So that was it. A lot of maybes, a lot of questions, and a lot of pressure. A job to be done and done fast. Find one Kathleen O'Dare, former hat check girl at the Shea Colette. Keep Nick Sharon's hoodlums away from her and persuade her to talk. And three to one, Nick was looking for her too. He was free now, on the loose. And he might be anywhere. Only the way it turned out, he wasn't just anywhere. He was in one particular place. Johnny. Parked right smack in front of the precinct station. Over here, Johnny. He was sitting in the back seat of a sedan, and his trigger man, Benny Stark, was at the wheel. Been there a long time, hasn't it, Johnny? About five years, as I remember it, Nick. It was that warehouse robbery over in Queens when you got away with $40,000 worth of furs. Uh-uh, you've forgotten me. I was acquitted on that one. Oh, yeah, I know. After they pulled the only witness out of the East River, his feet in a bucket of cement. Just coincidence. I've never seen him before. You've seen Miss O'Dare before? Sure, I have. She works for me. She's a good kid, Johnny. So I hear. Well, I wouldn't harm a hair on that girl's head. She'll be relieved when I tell her that. Get in. I want to talk to you. No, no, no. Sorry, Nick. I like it fine just the way it is. In the car, I'd be outnumbered. You got me all wrong, Johnny. I don't play that way anymore. What about Benny? Has he reformed, too? <laughs> well, if that's what... <laughs> Benny, go take a walk. Yeah, boss, but... I said go take a walk. Okay. Get in, Johnny. What's on your mind, Nick? You uh, working on this case? Yeah, I'm on it. Why? That's what I figured. I was talking to my lawyer in there and saw you go to Rafferty's office. I guess the insurance company's going to try to welch on that claim. It's your party, it? Nick. You talk. I got a better idea. What's that? You know, it's real nice out in Las Vegas this time of year, Johnny. A man can have a lot of fun out there for the next month with... Maybe $10,000 to play with? What man are you talking about? You. I don't have $10,000. You will. 30 minutes from now, if you say the word. Oh, Nick, you're lucky we're not standing out there on the sidewalk. In a car seat, I haven't got room to swing. You're still a fool, huh? I don't know. Why don't you write me about it? You'll have plenty of time. You're up there in the death cell. Suppose I didn't make any claim on that policy. And you wouldn't have any reason to stay on a case. No sale, Nick. A hundred grand is a lot of money. I'd want to find out why you didn't make a claim. You know why. You're out to pin us on me, and so are the cops. A man with a record hasn't got a chance. You should have thought of that before you killed Mel Pryker. Want to know something, Johnny? I didn't kill him. Well, I'm betting you did. What do you care who killed him? You're not shedding any tears over it. No, but I'd sure hate to see you get away with it. And I'd hate it even more if anything happened to that girl. Kathy O'Dare? Now, what could happen to her? She just might fall in the river. She probably thinks she's safe as long as she hides from the police and refuses to talk. She doesn't know you very well. You had me all wrong, Johnny. You know, you hear a lot about peace on earth, goodwill toward men around this time of year. But I don't have much goodwill toward the kind of rat you are. And I figured there'd be more peace on earth if you weren't on it. Push me and maybe that's what'll happen. Well, at least that's fair warning. Yeah, that's fair warning. I'm going to tag you for this, Nick. 
You can count on it. Expense account item two, two dollars and forty cents. Taxi to the east side rooming house of Kathy O'Dare. I didn't have much hope of turning up anything. Ed Rafferty and his men had already been through the place inch by inch. But it was the only starting point I had. The landlady was out and a uniformed policeman let me into Kathy's flat. I spent an hour and a half and got nowhere. I went through her mail, bills, advertisements, casual notes from men she'd met at the club. But nothing personal, not even a postcard. There were no pictures, photographs of Kathy or her daughter anywhere in the flat. She made a clean sweep, then left in a hurry. And obviously, she didn't mean to be found. But I had to find her, and fast. It was dusk when I left. The street lamps were on and the colored Christmas lights in the windows of on the block. Snow was falling in big, soft, gentle flakes, and there was a holiday feeling in the air. It was neither the time nor the setting for murder. Big contribution, son. Give Lou something to help poor. Oh, sure. How's it going this year, Santa? Oh, it's better than usual, but it just seems there's never enough to go around, no matter how. Well, bless you, son. Thank you kindly. Don't mention it. Good luck, Pop. Thank you, son. Well, the city ought to clean the streets better. I've been waiting for you. Sorry, Benny. It's not my day for punks. Get some friends who want to talk to you. Start walking, Johnny, down the alley. Uh Uh-uh. It's dark down there. Start walking. This ain't just my hand in my pocket. It better be, Benny, with two cops standing up there on the porch watching. What are you talking about? There ain't no cops. I smashed him in the mouth and knocked him flat. Followed it up and kicked his gun. I got it. He rolled over, came to his feet, and rushed me. I was right, hoping he would. Right. Yeah. No. He had that coming, son? He had it coming. Well, he, he sure did get it. Yeah. Hey, you know something, Pop? I think Benny wants to make a contribution to help the poor. Well, he ain't saying no. <laughs> oh, he's a good boy, at the moment at least. Here you go. That ought to help some. Two, three, four... Five hundred dollars. Put it where it'll do the most good. Well, Merry Christmas, son. Happy New Year. Yeah, same to you, Pop, and many more of them. Hey, taxi! There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the next Shern Matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, an old lady with a broken arm a shivering girl, and bullets in the snow. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Mrs. Gottler speaking. Gottler? I'm Kathleen O'Dare's landlady. Oh, yeah. And that's word you wanted to talk to me. That's right. I'm trying to find Miss O'Dare. Do you know where she is? You a friend of hers? I think I will be once I meet her. I'm an insurance investigator. I want to help her. That's what the other one said. What do you mean? What other one? The fellow that come up here a while ago, short, mean-faced, shifty-eyed. Benny Stark? Was that his name? He didn't Dollar, I guess he was too busy. Busy? Doing what? Breaking my good right arm. I'll be right over.
tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, New York City, to the Home Office, Tri-Mutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut... Assignment, the Nick Shearn matter. Expense account continued. Item five, $2.30. Taxi to Mrs. Gottler's rooming house, the place Kathy O'Dare had called home until she disappeared. Come in. Get your hands up. Mrs. Gottler. That I am. Well, look, I'm Johnny Dollar. I talked to you on the phone. It's all right. You can put that gun down. Well, I guess it's you all right. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but I've only got one good arm left, and I'm aiming to keep it. Pull up a chair. Thanks. Kind of rough boy, huh? Uh, I'd have showed him who was rough if I could have got a hold of my gun. I'd have blasted him, Christmas week or not. I'd have blasted him, Mr. Dollar. Yeah, I know how you feel. And me with all these presents to wrap. How can you wrap presents with one arm? That is being a paper hanger. Well, I'll be glad to help out, Mrs. Gottler. I won't guarantee what they'll look well, like. Well, no, I sure do appreciate it. And don't worry about their looks. i got to get them wrapped, that's all. Now, let's see now. Uh, this paper goes on that one. Oh, all right. It's a water muffler for my nephew over in Brooklyn. You know, them terrible winters they have over there. Oh, yeah, they're frightful. Of course, it may be better this year. The Dodgers won the pennant. Ah, nothing but luck. It won't happen next year. <laughs> you never know. Hey, tell me something, Mrs. Gottler. How come Benny worked you over? Hmm? Why did he break your arm? Here. Stick this card on it huh? as soon as you get the ribbon tied. Oh, okay. No time of year like Christmas, I always... Well, he wanted to know where Kathy went. When I said I didn't know, he jumped onto me. Said I was lying. If I could have got hold of that gun. Where uh, did she go, by the way? You aiming to break my other arm, Mr. Dollar? With all these packages to wrap? Here, hold your finger on that knot. I'll tie it tight now. Them postmen in Brooklyn are always busting things open. I know. Well, that's one down. Where did you say she went? Oh, I didn't. No, this one I'll deliver myself, so it don't need to be wrapped so careful. All righty. Kathy lit out of here in the middle of the night. You think I'd sit up 24 hours a day spying on my rumors? You might, if the rumor happened to be one of your special favorites. Who told you that? What's the difference? She was, wasn't she? Kathy was everybody's favorite. Anybody that ever met her. Oh, you'll meet them as make remarks about a girl that works in a nightclub. But I'll tell you one thing, Mr. Dollar. Kathleen O'Dare is a finer lady as you'd ever care to find. And I would care to find her. Well, good luck to you, then. And if you do, let me know where she is. You helped her pack, didn't you? No, how did you know that? Here, here, here. That's about as good as I can get it. Be careful when you deliver it, though. It's not tied very tight. I didn't know, Mrs. Gottner. I was guessing, but it figured. Kathy was scared half to death when she packed up and left here. All she had in her mind was to run and hide. She wouldn't have thought of stripping that flat, taking out every bit of personal identification. Somebody had to help her. Now, where'd she go? I don't know. Look, look, you don't get the idea. I'm on her side. She's up against a rough deal and doesn't even know it. You've got a sample of the way those boys play, and that was only a sample. With Kathy, it'll be a whole lot worse. They're looking for her, and sooner or later they'll find her. Her only chance is for me to get to her first, so you... I'm not lying, Mr. Dollar. I don't know where she went, and that's the truth to help me. I tried to get her to tell me, but she wouldn't. She said if I knew it would be dangerous for me. I helped her pack, yes, but I don't know where she was going. Well, that's that, I guess. I don't know where to turn next. She apparently didn't have any other close friends. I don't even know what she looks like. I've never even seen a picture of her. I was hoping you Well, could... if that'll do you any good, I've got one right here in my sewing basket. One what? A picture. What did you think? She gave it to me about a year ago. But she'd never had many taken, but here it is. Thanks. Real pretty girl, don't you think so? Yeah, she's lovely. Well, at least I'll be able to recognize... When was this taken, Mrs. Gottler? Now, how should I know? Three or four years ago, I guess, before she came here to the city. This photographer's address, the name of the town, is that where she came from, Brambury, Michigan? Well, yes, that's her hometown, Brambury. I'd forgotten the name of it. And she was just talking about it a week or so ago. She wanted to go home for Christmas, but she said she couldn't see. 
Mr. Dollar, do you think she might? Maybe. It's the most likely place a scared girl would run to, home. Anyway, it's worth a chance. Mrs. Gottler, uh, I love you. Why, Mr. Dollar! Why, Mr. Dollar! Expense account item six, $88.35. Hotel and incidentals in New York and transportation to Brambury, Michigan. Brambury turned out to be a lumber village, half hidden among the pine-covered hills. It was a little bigger than a wide spot in the road, but not much bigger. A foot of new snow had fallen within the past 24 hours. A fluffy white blanket lay softly on the trees and the housetops and filled the deep hollows in the frozen ground. Men in bright red flannel shirts drove horse-drawn logging sleds through the forest trails, and their shouts sounded sharp and clear, a crystalline tinkle in the icy air. Brambury looked like the place where Christmas was invented. It was beautiful. And very quiet when it came to putting out information. I found it out first when I tried the local telephone operator. Number, please. I uh, just checked in here at the hotel operator. There doesn't seem to be a phone book, so... steal them. That's why. Traveling people going through. Oh, uh, souvenir hunters, I suppose. How's that? Uh, look, I wanted to call the O'Dares. Could it's you put... Oh, well, and that's the one I want to call. Would you mind ringing him? Won't do no good. He ain't there. He's slabbing up at number four mill today. Well, actually, it's his daughter I want to talk daughter? to. Yeah, that's right. Kathleen. Do you know her? Just growed up with her, though. Oh, well, would you mind... Are you a friend of hers? No, I've never met her, Where but... Where are you from? I came here from New York, What's but I... What's your name? Johnny Dollar. Now, would you please ring Kathleen she and... She here. She lives in New York City. I know where she lives. And what give you the idea she'd be up here? I'm psychic. Look, where can I get in touch with her? I wouldn't know anything about it, Mr. Dollar, and I can't give out that kind of information. You better go on back to New York and write her a letter. Let me talk to your supervisor. Supervisor? Well, I'm all there is, so I guess that's me. Start talking. Forget it. You're welcome. I got the same kind of runaround from the hotel proprietor. As soon as I mentioned Kathy, he suddenly forgot his own name, age, and the time of day. One thing sure, this town took care of its own. I wondered if the law in Brambury would take the same attitude. I decided I'd better go find out. As it happened, I didn't have far to go. On the sidewalk in front of the hotel, the law came to me. Just a second there, mister. Hmm? I'd like to have a little talk with you, if you don't mind. All right. Quite a change to find somebody here who wants to talk. I understand you just got in from New York. Here on business? Look, you know why I'm here, but now everybody in town knows. Got any identification on you? Yeah. Have you? My name's Martin. Dan Martin. I'm the deputy sheriff in charge of this part of the county. Oh, then you're just the man I was looking for. Is that so? I'm Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. I'm looking for a girl named Kathleen O'Dare. Do you know where she is? What do you want with her? I'm working on a murder case. She's a witness. Is there any kind of a charge against her? No, I just want to talk to her. What makes you think she's here? Are you a friend of hers, Mr. Martin? I've been in love with Kathy since we went to grade school. I'd be willing to die for her. Does that answer your question? All right, let me put it this way. You think you're helping her by hiding her out. All of you think so. But you're wrong. You're helping her right into her grave. Kathy doesn't figure it that way. She's scared. She doesn't know what she thinks. I know these boys who are after her. They don't play kid games. And sooner or later, they're going to find her. So if you love her and if you know where she is, you better take me to her before it's too late. I don't know. I don't know what it is Kathy's mixed up in. I didn't want to ask her. But I know it isn't the police she's afraid of. And I don't think it's you. No, at the time she ran out, I wasn't even in the picture. I'm on her side too, Mr. Martin, and I've got to see her. Go talk to her father, old Mike. See what he thinks. He's not at home right now. Yeah, I know. He's out at number four mill. How do I get there? The county pickup truck is parked down the block. The tire chains bit into the packed snow and pushed the four miles of logging road behind us. It was late afternoon, and the sun had dropped behind the timbered slopes, throwing a pale sheet of cold yellow against the western sky. Here and there, a few scattered lights were coming on, in the windows of the village and the bunkhouses of the lumber camps. 
Bright white sparks against the darkening shadows. Emptiness, loneliness. And somewhere in it, a frightened girl in hiding. A girl who'd run away from the city of a hundred million lights. And from an unsolved murder. Michael Deere was winding up a job working at the big slabbing saw, and I stood by and waited for him to finish. Be right with you, Mr. Dollar. This is the last one. Okay. Of it now till after Christmas. Yeah, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Oh, that's all right, Mr. O'Dear. My name is Johnny. Never mind. I know all about you. Dan Martin phoned. Said you was on your way out. Mr. Dollar, the answer is no. I see. I've had it over since Dan called. Before I'd have anything happen to Kathy, I'd rather see ten murderers go and hung. Now, look, hiding out won't help. As long as Nick Shearn is free, Kathy's in danger. He can't hurt her if he can't find her. I found her, Mr. O'Dare. Just by luck. There's not one chance in a million of... Sounds like a car. Ooh, the tarnation would drive out here this time of the evening. We walked over to the big doors. The car had stopped about 20 yards away. A man got out and turned toward us. I was standing under the dock light, so he recognized me before I got a good look at him. He jumped back in the car and went for his gun. Benny Stark. Get back, Mr. O'Dear. It was too dark to get a decent shot. I tried once more. And missed, and the car disappeared behind the trees. Mr. Dollar, who was it? Was that one of them? That's right, Mike. They found her. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Nick Shearn matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a lonely vigil in the snow, a killer prowls the night, and a lovely lady vanishes. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dan Martin here. I was up the street when you Listen, called. Listen, Sheriff, they've traced Kathy O'Dare here to your nice little town of Brambury. Who has? Nick Shearn's boys. One of them, a trigger man named Benny Stark, came out to the sawmill hill a few minutes ago. I traded a couple of shots with him, but he got away in a car. Did he head north or back toward town? Toward town, I think. You can't see the turnoff from here. All right, Dollar. You're packing a gun. Will you take the pickup truck and block that turnoff? Hold it until I can get somebody out there to relieve you. Right. How many deputies you got? Deputies? Uh-oh. What about volunteers? Is this Benny Stark the man Kathy's afraid of? He's one of them. Then I'll have volunteers. Twenty men within a half hour, armed with deer rifles. And every one of them a dead shot. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) 
from Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Brambury, Michigan, to the Home Office, Tri-Mutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Nick Shearn matter. Expense account continued. Item 8, $3.60 for two packs of cigarettes and a pint of Applejack, borrowed from the foreman's locker at the sawmill. I figured these as standard equipment for holding down a roadblock at 10 degrees above zero. And Mike O'Dare agreed with me 100%. Well, I'll tell you one thing. They can make it out of corn, rye, barley, make it out of gold if they want to. Uh, but they'll never come up with anything better than what they make out of apples. <laughs> here, here, have a short one, Johnny. No, no, thanks. I'll save it for later. Well, I'll just, uh... <sighs> It's got the taste of Indian summer in it. You ought to see this country around that time of year, Johnny. Breaks your heart, it's so beautiful. Well, it's beautiful now with the snow on and it would be more so if there wasn't a killer running loose in it. Johnny, I want to ask you something about my daughter. And I want you to answer me honest. All right. It's no use trying to fool you. She's here all right. I know. But she hasn't told me what it was that happened in New York. What she ran away from. It. Somehow I figured it was just as well not to ask her. Your sheriff, Dan Martin, said practically the same thing. Dan's been in love with Kathy since he was 12 years old. He's a good man. Solid. So I figured Anyway, she was scared. Scared half to death. And she'd come home for help, so we tried to help her. What was it you wanted to ask me, Mr. O'Dare? You mentioned a murder case, Johnny. You didn't give any of the details, just said that Kathy was her witness. Is, is she mixed up in this murder? And you wanted an honest answer. All right, I'm not sure. I see. That's why I wanted to talk to her, get her story, the truth. I realized from the start she might be guilty. I don't think so, but it's a possibility. You may as well know about it. I guess you realize it wouldn't make any difference. Not to me or to Dan. Oh, yeah, I figured. In other words, you're with me as long as I'm trying to protect her. But you'll fight me if I find reason to think she's guilty. That's about it, Johnny. Well, at least we know where we stand. And I hope it won't come to... What's the matter? Car coming. Light on the trees there at the bend. Yeah. Do you suppose maybe... Probably not, but you can't tell. Better get behind the truck just in case. They'll have to shift into low to edge past us. Let me get that spotlight on. I, I guess I'll just have another quick one. <sighs> that wind cuts right through your bones. It's a dark-colored sedan. It might be him. Funny. I'd been hoping for two months that Kathy'd come home for Christmas. And I didn't figure I'd be out here in the woods, hiding behind a truck... Waiting to shoot it out with somebody that wanted to kill it. It's a crazy world. Keep your head down, Mr. O'Dear. Yeah. Hmm, just the driver by himself, wearing a dark hat. No, no. You know, that kind of looks like... Huh? Why, Curly, it is. What? That's Ted Perkins' old wreck. No doubt about it. And it... All right, you better wave him out past. He probably thinks we need help. Okay. Hey, it's all right, Ted. It's Michael Dare. Go ahead, go ahead. We don't need anything. Eh, yeah, well, all right. Thanks anyway. Well, there's one thing about people around here. They mind their own business and don't ask no questions. And they don't answer them often either. How's that Applejack holding out? Two long hours went by. Only three cars came out from the village. And each time a long moment of tension while we waited to identify the occupants. But all of them were townspeople. Benny didn't show. One truck came down the logging road from the back hills loaded with dwarf spruce and fir. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. We were waiting for an assassin. But the truck only carried Christmas trees. The night was crystal clear with bright stars hanging low on the blackness. But it kept turning colder and colder. And to leave the Applejack didn't help much. And the wind, too, changed gradually and blew fitful and gusty and strange. Eh, it's going to storm. Come a blizzard, maybe. Not tonight. Tomorrow sometime or tomorrow night. I know this country. I know the signs. Uh, there's an odd feeling in the air, all right. There's an even odder one in my leg. Log rolled over and on it pretty near six years ago. Bothers me some in the winter. It's a lot worse, though, right before a storm. Well, that's kind of a handy thing to have. Well, that's one way of looking at it, I guess. Like one time when Kathy was little. When her ma was still alive. God rest her soul. 
We had a big measles epidemic here in Brambury, and every night Kathy used to add a line to her prayers. She'd say, And please let me catch the measles so I can stay out of school like the other kids. <laughs> now she's wanted as a witness in a murder case. And somebody's prowling out there in the dark, trying to find her and kill her. Little Kathy, who never harmed anybody in her whole life. Some things just don't make sense, Johnny. Some things never have. There was another time once when men like Benny were prowling in the dark, trying to find a little child and kill him. And he hadn't harmed anybody either. That was nearly 2,000 years ago. Yeah, so it was. I like you, Johnny. Kathy will like you, too, and little Jill. Oh, oh, there's a pair for you. That kid looks more like a mother did at her age. Another car coming, Mr. O'Dare. Yeah, so there is. And this just might be the one. Maybe. I sure wish that Applejack hadn't run out. But it was only a couple of men Deputy Martin had sent out from town to relieve us and take over. Big men, calm and quiet, wearing plaid Mackinaws and heavy lace boots and carrying Winchester 94s over their arms. They told us Benny Stark had been seen. He'd come up from the west, driven onto one of the roadblocks unexpectedly. In a flurry of shots, he'd broken through. The men couldn't understand his persistence. They thought he'd run for it, get out of the area once his presence was known. I didn't bother to explain to put him straight, but I knew Benny had never run, not now. He was a trigger man, a professional killer with a reputation at stake. And he had his orders to silence Kathy O'Dare. A half hour later, we were back in town, turning into the main street around the village square. Strings of colored lights on a tall pine in the center of the square blinked and sparkled as they swayed in the wind. Around a hundred cars and trucks were parked in the street and in the lot behind the town hall. And the sound of singing drifted out from inside. They're practicing carols and things for the big doings on Christmas Eve. Ain't it beautiful? The men at the roadblock had given a description of Benny's car and the license number. It was just barely possible. Got something in mind, Johnny? Yeah, let's take a look through those parked cars. I don't know. If it was me, I sure wouldn't be hanging around here. I'd stick to the tall timber. Yeah, but you're not a city boy, Mike. Tall timber is foreign soil to Benny. He's only comfortable when he's close to a crowd. He the fellow that's supposed to have done that murder? No, it was the man he works for, a cafe owner, ex-gangster, a man named Nick Shern. Let's check that lot around at the side. I don't think he'd show here in front. He'd be taking a big chance showing anywhere. In a town this size, people know each other. It's his job to take chances. And he probably doesn't realize... Wait a minute. That sedan against the building with the side window broken. Seven, eight, two, one. That's his car, Johnny. Yeah, wait here. I eased my gun out of the holster and started toward the car. There were no lights in the lot, only the soft glow reflected from the packed snow underfoot. And the car itself stood in the dark shadows next to the building. I couldn't see whether anyone was in it or not. The singing seemed to swell louder as I approached. I moved slowly, watching for any sudden movement. The car was empty. It was time, past time, to talk to Kathy O'Dear. And with the pressure tightening the danger close to home now, her father was ready to take me to her. We drove over to Dan Martin's house, where it turned out Kathy and her daughter were staying. Dan's mother had been looking after her. Dan was there when we yeah. arrived, busy on the phone. Yeah, I know the car all right. The one Jed bought last spring down in Bay City. Seven, three, nine, two. Uh, where was it parked? All right, keep an eye out, Charlie. So long. Benny Stark has stole himself another car, huh? Took Jed Wharton's station wagon. Well, what for? That was a better one he had. Charlie says the steering gear was sprung. I guess it happened when he crashed that roadblock. Well, how's Kathy and the young'un? Oh, fine. They were asleep upstairs. Uh, Mom's next door helping Mrs. Barton stuff a turkey. Johnny, you, uh, you figure it could wait till morning. I'm sorry, Mr. O'Dear. I've got to talk to her tonight. All right. I'll go wake her up. Mr. Dollar, no matter what she's done, don't 
hurt her any more than you have to. As far as I know at the moment, Dan, all she's guilty of is withholding information. And most people would have done the same thing. Nick Shearn's a rough boy to tangle with. She was scared, that's all. Lost her head. She never did belong in a city. She belongs right here in Brambury. This is her kind of life. Why did she leave? Well... Oh, we argued one day, and she said she'd show me. So she ran off and married that fellow. He treated her bad. Finally, he left her. But she was too proud to come back. She wouldn't have come back now if she hadn't have been so scared. Well, maybe it'll work out now. She ought to stay. Her kid ought to grow up here. Learn the outdoors and the woods like Kathy used to know it. Why, she roamed through those hills like a young Indian. Knew every trail in that forest. Every timber camp and trapper's cabin from here to the ridge. I remember one time the two of us were up toward... Dan! What's the matter? What is it, Mr. O'Dare? You said... You said Jill and Kathy were asleep upstairs. Ain't that what you said, Dan? Of course that's what I... Mike... What's happened? They're not up there. They're not up there anywhere else in the house. They're gone. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Nick Shearn matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a little girl who believes in Santa Claus, a big girl who believes in very little, and both of them facing death. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Mike O'Dare, Johnny. Any sign of Kathy? No, the boys at the highway turnoff haven't seen her or Benny, either one. Not a soul out that way in the last hour. What about there at the sawmill? Nothing, Mike. No fresh tracks on the logging road. No sign of her. And the worst thing is, it's starting to snow again. Yeah, here in town, too. Dan Martin just phoned. No luck. She hasn't shown up at any of the roadblocks. She's... She's around somewhere, and we've got to find her. We will, Mike. And it's got to be fast, Johnny. There's a blizzard coming up, and that gunman Benny Stark is around, too. Maybe he's already found her. Maybe he even took her from the house, her and Jill both. Maybe she didn't get scared and run. Maybe it was him. Maybe he's... Mike, in stop and... it. That kind of thing It's not going to help any... Well, what is going to help? I don't know, but I've got a half-baked idea, and I may be right. Stay there at the house. I'm coming back to pick you up. And one thing you can do while you're waiting... What, Johnny? Pray. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Brambury, Michigan, to the Home Office, Trimutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Nick Shearn matter. Or more important, find Kathy O'Dare. 
Item 12 on expense account, $4.90. A tank full of gas for the county pickup I'd borrowed from Deputy Sheriff Dan Martin. The falling snow was thickening now, and the wind was rising and steadying in the northwest. The night had all the makings of a blizzard. And wherever Kathy and her daughter had gone, we had to find them before it hit. It was 10.14 p.m. when I pulled up at the side porch of the Adair house. And Kathy's father came hurrying out to the truck, leaving the door open behind him and buttoning his heavy mackinaw as he ran. Any news, Mike? Not a thing. All right, get in. Shut the door. Yeah, we'll get a foot of snow before morning with a zero wind behind it. Now, listen, Mike. I think we can forget any idea that Benny found her and got her out of the house. In that case, she wouldn't have taken your car. He's already got one. I know. I thought of that. And he wouldn't have given her time to dress herself in jail the way she did with heavy clothes and snow boots. And she wouldn't have taken the rifle. Then what has happened? She knew I'd be there to talk to her sometime this evening. I think she lost her nerve, couldn't face it, decided to run again. Maybe so, but where, Johnny? That's what I want you to tell me. What? No, I don't mean you knew what she was going to do and where she was going to go or... Then help how to... do you think I can tell you? Look... Kathy knew about the roadblocks Dan Martin set up to trap Benny Stark, knew where they were. So if she didn't want to be seen, then naturally she'd avoid them. She couldn't, not if she wanted to get away, take the highway to Flint or Detroit. She'd have to pass one of them at least. But she hasn't passed any of them, so she's still in this area. And I don't think she ever meant to leave it. But then... Dan Martin said Kathy used to spend a lot of time in the woods when she was growing up. He said she knew every back trail in these hills, logging camps, trappers' cabins. She did. She used to worry the dickens out of me the way she... Yeah. Now, where would she go, Mike, if she wanted to hide out back in the hills somewhere? There's a lot of places. Chippewa Canyon's one. Three or four timber camps abandoned in the winter. Some cabins along the... No, no, she couldn't make it. There's a roadblock before you get to the turn off there. It's got to be some place she could reach without being seen. Well, there's... There's Barker's Flats. Oh, but that's 12 miles by foot trail. She wouldn't try it in this weather. Not, not with Jill along, anyway. Then there's... Lake Pine? No, it's over the other way. Pine Lake Road. Where's that? Runs northwest of town. Not much better than a wagon road. Dan didn't put a block on it because it dead ends at the lake about five miles out. What's out there? Nothing at the lake. But you can go on up Pine Creek about four miles on foot, and there's some cabins. Maybe a waste of time, Johnny. Let's get going. Expense account, item 13, $6.90. One dry cell electric lantern, an extra pair of batteries picked up at the Brambury Hardware Company on the way through town. The falling snow, driven by a bitter cold wind, formed a dense curtain in front of our headlights. And from the turnoff all the way up the narrow twisting road to Pine Lake, I had to keep the truck in second gear. There were car tracks in the road, all right, several of them. But they were covered now by the new blanket of snow. And it was impossible to tell whether they'd been made earlier tonight or a week ago. The road ends a couple of yards past this next turn. And we'll soon know. There's four or five side turnoffs. Clearance where, where you can park. We'll have to check all of them, I guess. All right. That draw there on the right. That break there in the trees. That's that's where the Pine Creek Trail starts. Well, we'll swing in. Mike, I guess we won't have to check those turnoffs. Huh? Is that your car over there under the trees? Yeah. That's it. I left Mike waiting in the cab while I went over to look inside the car. It was empty, abandoned. And there was no note, no clue of any kind to tell where Kathy had gone. I raised the hood and felt the motor block, ice cold. The car had been here for some time. I flashed the lantern on the ground and followed the faint tracks made by two pairs of snow boots. They entered the deep draw that led back into the hills, the start of the Pine Creek Trail. I snapped off the lantern and stumbled through the snow back to the truck. What'd you find, Johnny? It's them, all right. They've headed up the trail. I found tracks in the snow. Yeah, then we'd better get started out No, no, wait. I'll go after them, Mike. You take the truck, go into town, find Dan Martin, bring help as fast as you can. That storm's getting worse. No, you don't. I know the risk, starting up that trail with a blizzard coming on. And if you think you're going to protect me by sending... Knock it off, Mike. There's no time, and you're wrong. I'm not protecting you. I'm protecting myself. What do you mean? That bum leg of yours. I don't want you on my hands, too, along with the girls. All right, Johnny. I'll go after Dan. And hurry, Mike. I'm depending on you. Yeah. Good luck, Johnny. See you, Mike. I stood there in the snow watching the headlights of the truck move away. 
Finally, they swung around the bend and disappeared. And I suddenly felt more alone than I ever had in my life. I'd gotten rid of Mike deliberately, sent him away on purpose, because I hadn't told him everything. I could see no point in tearing his heart out. There was another car parked on beyond Kathy's, nearly hidden by the trees. Jed Horton's station wagon. The car that had been stolen by a killer named Benny Stark. It took me half an hour to cover the first mile, and the storm kept getting worse. The beam of the lantern penetrated a bare 30 feet ahead of me before it was smothered out in the white blackness of the night. After a few hundred yards, the tracks I was trying to follow had nearly disappeared, snowballed over, and blotted out. I gave up looking for them and stuck to old Mike's description of the trail, following the left bank of the frozen creek. The drifts were deeper down along the creek bottoms, and the going was rougher. But I didn't dare leave it to look for better footing. It was my only landmark. The trail itself was buried. And any man who lost his way tonight and wandered off into one of those side gullies would wander straight to his death. An hour passed. Then an hour and a half, or two hours, maybe. I lost all track of time and distance. The wind cut through my clothes, and the numbing cold crept into me deeper and deeper. Gradually, the walking, stumbling, breathing, even thinking became automatic and without feeling. The world itself seemed to narrow down to a tiny circle close around me. And all beyond was chaos, blackness, and roaring storm. I tripped over fallen logs and floundered back to my feet. Dropped my lantern and recovered it. Broke through the crusted drifts and struggled for footing and kept on moving. In the weird nightmare of the blizzard, I could hardly recognize reality when I came face to face with it. When a beam from my lantern touched him crouching by a tree a few yards away, I could barely accept him as being real. He'd been watching my light as I approached, waiting for me. It was Benny Stark with his gun leveled and aimed. Don't be a fool, Benny. Drop that gun. A curtain of snow swept between us then, blotting out the sight of him. I was grateful. I turned and stumbled on into the storm, moving in pitch darkness now, except for the ghostly glow from the snow-covered ground. The second shot had smashed my lantern. I had nothing left to go by but instinct and luck, and they weren't enough. Within 15 minutes, I was hopelessly lost. That's when I started hearing the music. Miles from no place where there couldn't be any music. Except inside my head. The cold and fatigue were finally doing their work. I knew the signs. The next step was to start wandering in circles, smaller and smaller ones, and the last step to drop exhausted and go peacefully to sleep. Peacefully and permanently. But the sound kept growing louder, and I moved in the direction it seemed to be coming from. It couldn't be just illusions. It had to be real. Hello! Hello there! Then suddenly, only a few yards away, a brilliant blaze of light exploded from the darkness, and it seemed that a golden-haired girl was standing in the middle of it, and for a moment my sanity tottered. Who's out there? My golden vision was wearing blue jeans and a flannel shirt and was holding a rifle. She looked exactly like the photograph I'd seen of Kathy O'Dare, and the blaze of light came from an open cabin door. Who is it? Speak up or I'll shoot. Oh, thank heaven. Hold it, Miss Dare. It's Johnny Dollar. Are you getting warm now? I don't think I'll ever get warm again. You will if you don't move away from the stove a little. The back of your shirt is starting to smoke. Yeah, I, I thought I was beginning to feel something. How's the firewood? There's plenty. And plenty of food. And a radio. If I hadn't heard that music, I'd have blundered right on past this cabin. Oh, we've got everything. We can hold out for a month if we have to. And I hope we have to. What about your daughter? Is she all right? Sure. She's fine. The picnic for her... A camping trip. She's sound asleep back there in the lean-to. Dreaming about Santa Claus, I suppose. I wish I could. How did you find me, Mr. Dollar? Oh, aren't you 
guesswork. I was born under a lucky star. I wasn't. Oh, I don't know. I think you've been pretty lucky, considering everything. More so than your landlady back in New York. Mrs. Grattler? What do you mean? Betty Stark went to see her. Tried to find out where you were. When she wouldn't tell him, he broke her arm. Oh, no. Oh, the poor woman. Oh, it's a rough game, Miss O'Dear. Trying to play it cozy with a mobster like Nick Shearn. You know, of course, that he sent Benny here to find you. He'll have a hard time finding me in this place. He did find you. What? Maybe he followed you from the house or saw you drive through town. Anyway, I ran into him back down the trailerways. I thought I heard shooting a while ago. You did. He tried to ambush me. He thought he had the drop and he wouldn't give up. I had to kill him. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Nick Shearn matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the showdown. Victory, and then disaster. When a visitor to the little town of Brambury turns out to be death. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar? Spell it. J-O-H-N-N-Y-D-O-L-L-A-R. That's not right. You forgot to capitalize. Hey, you're right, honey. Let me hear you spell your name. Okay. Capital J-I-L-L, Jill. Capital O, apostrophe... Apostrophe. I never can say that. Capital D A R E. Oh, dear. Of course, my last name's actually something else. I forget. But my mother says I'm really an O'Dare. Not the least doubt about it. I could see it in a minute. I like you, Johnny Dollar. And I kind of like you, too, Jill O'Dare. You think my mother's pretty? I think she's lovely. Then why don't you get married to her so I can have a daddy? Well, that's, um, well, that's certainly something to think about. And, uh, not a bad idea. Now, I'll uh, be quiet before you wake her up. I'm already awake, and with a plot like that being hatched, I think I'd better stay awake. Is there coffee, Johnny? <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location, a small cabin in the timber outside Brambury, Michigan, to the home office, Tri-Mutual Insurance Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment... The Nick Shearn matter. Expense account, final page. Item 15, one million dollars for a certain feeling. I realize, of course, that the amount of this item is somewhat unusual. 
and may be cause for mild criticism by your accounting department, unless the accompanying report includes an adequate and detailed explanation. Therefore, to avoid unnecessary correspondence and delay, I am attaching said explanation herewith. Here's your coffee, Kathy. Thanks. How long did I sleep, Johnny? Oh, a couple of hours. It's around four in the morning. The storm hasn't let up at all, has it? Oh, it's worse, if anything. Jill, honey, it's four o'clock in the morning and your eyes are just about to fall out. Now you go back there and go to sleep. Do I have to, Mommy? You have to. Run along now. Mr. Johnny Dollar and me were having a lot of fun till you woke up. <laughs> well, that's life, sweetie. Night now. Good night, Jill. Good night. Proud of her? I'm crazy about her. That's what you mean. She's a great little girl. She's the only thing I ever did in my whole life that turned out right. That bad, huh? Johnny, it's no good. I know why you're here. I know what you expect from me, and the answer's no. You're jumping the gun. I haven't asked you anything. You will. You haven't done all this for nothing. You're going to ask me to come back to New York and testify against Nick Shearn. I might ask you to tell the truth. Is that just another way of wording it? I didn't see anything, hear anything. I don't know anything about it, and I have nothing to say. So Nick Shearn gets away with another murder. I wouldn't know anything about that. And sooner or later, of course, he'll kill you, too. He sent Benny Stark out to do it, and Benny missed. But he's got other boys, or he might even handle the job himself. Why? By now, he ought to know that I'm not going to tell. But there's always that chance you might change your mind. And Nick's a gambler, but he likes the odds on his side. He doesn't take chances. Whenever he can, he stacks the deck. I wish I could help you, Johnny. But I don't know anything about it. I left before it happened. How long have you worked for Nick Shearn? Known him? Two years. I'm not wide-eyed about him, Johnny. I've heard what he's been, what he may even still be, a gangster, hoodlum, racketeer, but that's none of my business. The club was legitimate, my job there was on the level, and he never got out of line once. And no doubt he's always been kind to his mother and loves dogs and children. I wouldn't know. Except children. He's crazy about them. He was always buying something for Jill. Asking about her. And he also shot and killed Mel Pryker. I couldn't say. I see. Well, you're letting a lot of people down. People here in Brambury that you grew up with. People that love you. Your father, Dan Martin. What have they got to do with it? You know, it's a great country up here. I'd like to spend more time in it. And it's big country. Big and beautiful and dangerous. Like that blizzard outside there. It's not the kind of country that turns out cowards. Cowards? Your father said something yesterday. That some people belong in cities and some don't. And that you're one of the second kind. He was right. The city's made a coward of you. You don't understand. And they know it. Old Mike, Dan, all of them. Of course, they'll never mention it. But you're letting them down and they know it. And you know it, Kathy. They don't have a daughter to think of. It's not her fear we're talking about. It's yours. All right, I'm scared. I've got reason to be. It's easy for you to talk. You don't know what fear is, what it can do to you. I don't. It can push you and drive you and make you do things you hate yourself for. And it can destroy you. How would you know? How would any of them know? Who haven't felt it, who haven't been there. Kathy, you're not alone. We've all been there. It's not the fear that's important. It's the courage you bring up to fight it. I've tried. I've... I've nearly gotten crazy trying to think it out. But it always comes back to one thing. Jill. She's what counts. Nothing else matters. And if you love her, teach her to grow up without fear. Sacrifice anything if you have to, even your life. But teach her courage. There's nothing greater you could do for her. It's all right, Kathy. It's all right. It's all right. I knew what was right, Johnny. I knew all the time. Sure, sure. Of course you did. All you needed was a little push. Want to tell me about it now? I... I was there at the club that night. When it happened, I stayed after closing. I had some presents for Jill, and I wanted to wrap them before I took them home. Nick and Mel Pryker were upstairs in the office. Nick was there? Yes. I could hear them arguing. They didn't know I'd stayed, and then... Go on. I heard Mel yell out. He said... No, Nick, no. And then I heard the shot. Yes? I didn't even think. I ran up to the office. Mel was lying on the floor, and Nick was standing there with a gun. He told me to get out and to keep quiet. 
I wanted to keep on living. That's it, huh? Yes. Would you make a statement to the police, testify at the trial? Yes. Oh, good. Will you help me, Johnny? Will you stand by me? You know I will. You've got to because I'm scared. I'll be scared all the way, but I'll do it if you'll help me. I'll help you, Kathy, all the way. Why don't you curl up here and get some sleep? Come on. Maybe now I can sleep. It's going to be all right. Thanks, Johnny, for giving me the push. Oh, sure, honey. You know something, Johnny? I'm with Jill. I like you, too. She went to sleep with her face against my chest. And after a while, little Jill came tiptoeing in and curled up on the other side. And I sat there holding them both, thinking and waiting for the dawn. So that's what I mean about a million-dollar feeling. True, it wasn't my little girl, or my big girl either. But for the moment at least, well, that item still goes. I'll still tag that feeling at one million dollars. And I was sorry when the storm was over and a rescue party came up from town. Because I felt I'd had one moment in a lifetime that I'd never find again. Good King Wenceslas looked down on the feast of Stephen when the snow lay round the fire. The big event of the year in Brambury was the Christmas Eve show in the town hall. There was music and a pageant and singing and everybody took part in it. From the youngest kid in town to the toughest old grizzled lumberjack from the back hills. Jill was in the children's chorus, and old Mike was to operate the spotlight, so they went on ahead. I took Kathy. And since she wasn't quite ready to face people yet, we made a point of getting there late. I didn't care when we got there, as long as I was with her. We slipped in quietly and took seats at the back of the room. The string group from the high school orchestra was playing, and no one noticed us. Not even old Mike, Kathy's father, who was working the spotlights. I hope Jill does all right. She hasn't had any time to practice with us. Oh, she'll do all right. We'd been there about ten minutes when somebody else came in and slid into the one seat between us and the door. I didn't look around until I felt Kathy stiffen beside me. Oh, no. It was Nick Shearn. Nobody gets excited now or makes any sudden moves. We just sit here quiet like. He slid his hand over to feel inside my coat under my arm. Now packing around, huh? Perfect. I'd left my gun at Kathy's house. Old Mike had been dubious about it, but with Benny dead, I'd seen no reason to carry it. And after all, it was Christmas Eve. All right, now we're going to ease out of here now without attracting no attention from anybody. You're crazy, Nick. You're crazy. Shut up. And just don't forget one thing, now. I'm not holding this gun on you. He's aimed right at the middle of Kathy's back. Let's go. Johnny. No choice, Kathy. Come on. The back of the room was dark. Nobody paid any attention. Somebody was always leaving or coming back in. Come on. I got a car over at the side. Eh? Johnny. Watch it, dollar. We'll be right back, Mike. Just gonna get some air. All right, Johnny. But don't go running out before I give you your present. Huh? Here. And don't uncork that until you're ready for some serious business. All right, I'll... I'll... Re- Thanks, Mike. Thanks a lot. Don't mention it. Good luck, Johnny. Yeah, come on, let's get away from here. Johnny, he's going Take to... it easy, Kathy. Wait for me! Oh, what... Oh, no. Jill, go back! Oh, I say, Uncle Nick! Why did you tell me you were coming here to hear me sing, Uncle Nick? Well, uh... uh listen, Pick me Jill... up? Please, Uncle Nick. Take your hands out of your pocket and pick me up. Uh, look, Jill, you run along now. Who's that? Dan Martin. He's a deputy sheriff and he's a dead shot. Better do like she says, Nick. Take your hand out of your pocket and pick her up. All right, reach in my pocket, Johnny, and take my gun. Later, Kathy and I walked around outside. We could still hear the children's chorus singing inside. Jill saved our lives tonight. No, she saved Nick's life. What do you mean? That present your father gave me. Up there at the spotlights, he could see what was happening, and he thought real fast. 
That present was a gun. Then you... I had Nick covered from the time we stepped off the porch. I'm glad he didn't move. I'm glad it happened like it did. Yeah, so am I. I thought we'd never see those stars up there again. You kept hold of yourself, Kathy. You showed a lot of courage. No. But maybe I can learn to show it. I was just thinking, Johnny, looking at the stars up there. There was fear in the world then. Two thousand years ago. And he had courage. Expense account item 16, $230.40. Incidentals in Bramberry and transportation for two adults and one child. Bramberry to New York. Expense account total, $486.20. End of account, end of report. Remarks? Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to all of you. From all of us here on the program. And God bless you. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Peggy Weber, Don Diamond, Ben Wright, Jack Crucian, Barney Phillips, Sam Edwards, and Ken Christie. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine... Invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. So let's settle back comfortably and listen, and uh, while you're getting settled, I'd like to know if you like seafood. And by seafood, I mean everything from, well, from broiled lobster to fried halibut. Because if you like seafood, any seafood, you'll love it together with Petri California Sauterne. Fish and Petri Sauterne were made for each other. No kidding. Boy, I'll never in my life forget a broiled brook trout on the plate in front of me and a glass of well-chilled Petri Sauterne right next to it. Mm. That fish and that Sauterne. Mm. Petri Sauterne has a pale golden color that's really good to look at. And as for taste, well, that Petri flavor is really something. Take my word for it and try it, won't you? Oh, and I'll tell you something else. Try that Petri Sauterne with chicken sometime. (laughs) <laughs> Look, I'd better stop before I get hungry all over again, but just remember this. The best friend a good meal ever had is a glass of Petri wine. And now let's keep our appointment with the good Dr. Watson. Good, good. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Come over here and join me by the fire. I didn't think it was cold enough for a fire tonight, Doctor. Oh, I suppose it isn't really, but there was one late, so I just couldn't resist putting a match to it. <laughs> Fire's a good accompaniment to storytelling anyway. Oh, yes, my boy, a fire and a glass of port. Uh, care to join me in one? Thanks, Doctor. So, uh, you're going to tell us a sea story tonight. Yes, Mr. Bartell. The whole adventure took place aboard a small steamer as it plowed through the stormy seas of the Indian Ocean. Uh, here's your glass, my boy. Thanks. 
And uh, what were you and the great Sherlock Holmes doing on the Indian Ocean, may I ask? We were on our way to Calcutta to solve the case of the vanishing elephant of Pa Butipur. Oh, yes, the story you told us a few weeks ago. That's quite right, my boy. It's in the summer of 1894 that we left Liverpool aboard the steamship Lucifer. It wasn't a large ship, and as both the uh, Mediterranean and the Red Sea proved somewhat, shall we say, unfriendly, I may tell you the first part of the voyage was quite unpleasant. In fact, until we left Aden, I'd spent most of the time in my cabin. I'm not much of a sailor, you know. However, as we headed eastward towards Colombo, the weather cleared up a bit, and I came on desk and joined home. I remember on the second night out of Aden, we paced the decks together. The stars above us twinkled, the promise of a bright tomorrow. And the faint tinkle of a piano being played in the passenger lounge formed a perfect setting for an evening stroll. It only seems like yesterday that Holmes said... Watson, it's good to see you on your feet again. Yes, it's good to be on them, Holmes. It's been a miserable trip for me so far. The captain told me tonight that we can expect good weather between here and Caravati, our next port of call. I thought Colombo was the next stop. And where is Cavaravati, whatever you call it? Anyway, I never heard of the place. It's a tiny island in the Indian Ocean. It's a British protectorate. Those are the only facts I was able to glean from the encyclopedia and the ship's Did library. Did you ask the captain why we're stopping there? No, no, I didn't. Um, as we are traveling incognito, I felt it wiser not to ask too many questions. I find this incognito business something of a strain. Every time a steward calls me Mr. Hamish, I can't think who on earth he's talking to. Ah, well, as I find myself answering to Mr. Mycroft almost automatically. By the way, old chap, now that you're going to mix with the ship's passengers, I suggest that you adopt a Scotch accent. It would seem more appropriate for a Mr. Hamish, and I don't want anyone aboard to suspect our true identity. Oh, I'll do my best, but I must say, Holmes, I think you're being unnecessarily mysterious. <laughs> Possibly I've been influenced by reading too many of your rather florid stories of our adventures together. My stories are not florid. They're all perfectly true. Oh, I mean, don't be angry with me, old chap. Don't be angry, please. By the way, uh, we'll... Uh, you'll be interested to know that I've... Uh, unearthed a little mystery aboard this boat. I trust you to do that. Where is she? I mean, what is it? Oh, you observe that suite of cabins on the bridge deck above us? Yeah? What about them? Well, I've been watching them during uh, my nightly strolls for the past two weeks. The suite is occupied, and uh, yet the blinds are never raised. And I've never seen meals taken in there. I presume, therefore, that it must contain a private galley and a cook. I don't see anything mysterious about that. It's probably occupied by some wealthy invalid. Well, possibly, possibly. Another interesting fact is that the occupants are not uh, entered on the ship's passenger list. It all sounds very mysterious. There's probably a perfectly simple explanation for it. In any case, you must save your energies for the problem that awaits us in India. You're Mr. Mycroft now, remember that. I will, Mr. Hamish. Uh, Mr. Mycroft? Uh, yes, Mr. Hamish? Would you care to join me for a wee drop of brandy in the smoking room? <laughs> Mr. Hamish, I shall be delighted. <laughs> Excellent brandy. Excellent. Watson. Watson, you notice that rather garrulous gentleman over there in the corner? You mean the one at the table with the oriental-looking fellow? Yes, the talkative man is the ship's doctor, but I haven't seen the other gentleman before on this voyage. I wonder if he's an occupant of the mysterious suite on the bridge deck. Let's go over and talk to him, shall we? And remember the accent, Mr. Hamish. <laughs> and so, Verda... When we landed at Colombo, I decided to take Mrs. Abbott for a moonlight rickshaw drive through the cinnamon gardens. Uh, uh, did you gentlemen want to see me? Uh, if you'll excuse us, Dr. Harris, my friend Mr. Hamish and I were having a little argument, and we thought that perhaps you might be able to settle it for An us. An argument? Oh, I love a good argument. Uh, sit down, gentlemen. This, uh, this is Mr. Verder. How do you do, gentlemen? Uh, good evening, sir. My name is Hamish, and this is my friend, Mr. Mr. Mycroft. I'm so happy to meet you, gentlemen. Now, how do you know, Mr. Verder? Ah, uh, now, gentlemen, uh, tell me what you're arguing about. Uh, well, I'll Doctor, have a good argument. Uh, you see, it, it wasn't exactly an argument. My friend Mr. Hamish insists that the Suez Canal was built by a Dutchman in 1870. I'm convinced that it was built by de Lesseps, a Frenchman, in 1869. We, uh, we thought you'd know. <laughs> you flatter me. I'm only a ship's doctor, not an historian. Uh, ask Verde. He probably knows. Uh, can you settle the question for us, sir? I can, my Mr. Mycroft. Uh, you are almost correct. The canal was opened in 1869 though its construction began ten years previously. De Lesseps, a French engineer, was in charge of the operation. There is a statue of him in Port Said Harbour, 
built to commemorate his skill and enterprise. Oh, much obliged to you, Mr. Vera. Um, Hamish, I think that I win my bet. Aye, my curf, I'm afraid you do, if you're sure of your facts, Mr. Vera. <laughs> uh, I'm sufficiently sure of them, Mr. Hamish, to venture a small wager myself. No, no, no. I think I'll not make any more bets on the subject, thank you. Uh, well, gentlemen, if you will excuse me, I shall return to my cabin now. Oh, don't go. No, 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 no don't go, sir. You'll make us feel as if we'd driven you away. Oh, not at all, Mr. Hamish. I enjoyed meeting you both. But I have some letters to write. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, he's, he's a charming person. Charming and extremely knowledgeable. Mm, bit of a bore, if you ask me. Uh, you two fellas enjoyed your trip? I'm just beginning to. It takes a little time to get my sea legs, you know. Uh, Dr. Harris, how long have you been on this ship? Four years. Uh, this is my 23rd trip east on the Lucifer. Uh -huh. Why? Well, uh, there's something that puzzles me on board this ship. I'm sure that you would explain it to me. And what is it? Well, the uh, suite of cabins on the bridge deck. Who occupies them? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know? I don't know who would, and that's why my friend asked you. Well, I'll tell you. Though it's supposed to be a secret. But there'll be no harm in telling you now, for we're dropping anchor off the island of Cavarati in the morning. In that suite of rooms, in that suite of rooms, is the Rani of Cavarati herself. She has her own staff of servants and everything. What do you think of that? Oh, how very interesting. And is the oriental gentleman who uh, left the table when we arrived part of our entourage? He is, sir. He's the sort of uh, prime minister of Cavarati. This whole trip of theirs is very hush-hush. Rani returning to her country, afraid someone might make an attack on her life. Have to keep it all hush-hush. Cavarati is an island that's had a lot of trouble. <laughs> you seem to be remarkably well informed about the place, sir. Yeah, I should be. I used to practice there in my younger days. Oh, really? How very interesting. Yes, I could tell you strange tales about the island. I remember... Oh, hello. See that fellow coming into the lounge? You mean the big man with the, the grey hair? Yes. That's Sir Christopher Wyatt. Owns all the tea plantations on Cavarati. He's a dull fellow, but I'll call him over. Uh, Wyatt, come over and join us. Be careful. You talk your head off if you give him half a chance. Ah, draw up a chair, Wyatt. We were just, just talking about Cavarati. It seems to me that would be a good subject to keep away from. At least till after tomorrow, Harris. What do you mean? You know perfectly well what I mean. I should have thought that after your own experience on Cavarati, you would have learned a little discretion. You're talking like a schoolmaster, Wyatt. Why don't you just sit down and have a drink and be friendly? Thank you. I prefer my own company. Compass ass. You and Christopher don't seem on the best of terms, Doctor. I know too much about him. He's afraid of me. That's what he is. Uh, look at this girl coming into the room. Great scut. She's good looking. Judging by our oriental costume, she must be a member of the Rani's retinue. Yeah, she's coming to our table. Yes, my dear. What is it? Which of you gentlemen is Mr. Mycroft, please? I am. My mistress sends her compliments and asks that you will call on her in her suite. And who is your mistress, may I ask? Her Highness. The Rani of Cavarotti. Oh, I shall be delighted. Please tell the Rani that I shall pay my respects without delay. We will join her in a few minutes. Very well, Mr. Michael. You know, Holmes, this is pretty exciting. The girl that just brought us the message was a stunning creature. Imagine what the Rani herself must be like. Oh, what an incurable romanticist you are, Watson. I suppose you picture the Rani clad in oriental splendor, reclining like an odalisk on silken cushions. Oh, no, no, there's no need to make fun of me, old fellow. Oh, here we are at the cabin. Ah, oh, it is you, gentlemen. Follow me, please. Your Highness, the Rani of Cavarotti. All right, Regina, you can off it. Yes, Your Highness. Well, me lads, don't look so startled. Come in and sit down. Your Highness, I... Uh, uh... What's the matter? What's the matter? Don't I fit into your picture of a Rani? What did you expect? A slant-eyed beauty with a veil and big hips? Well, I've got the big hips, all right. Uh, your Highness... Um, <laughs> oh, I... never mind, what? Your Highness. Sit yourselves down and talk free and easy-like. I may as well begin by telling you that I know who you both are. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Oh, dear me, dear me. Oh, I've seen you in the good old days in London, you know. Uh, may I ask if our visit is purely a social one, or are you in need of uh, professional advice? Oh, a little of both, Mr. Holmes, a little of both. And we'll start off with being social. 
Roma. Mem Saib. Champagne. Botachi, Mem Saib. If you will pardon my asking you, madam, but uh, I've never seen you before, somewhere. <laughs> oh, that's a question I'm always having to answer. Yes, you probably have, Dr. Watson. You see, I was in the chorus at Daly's Theatre in London for a, <laughs> quite a few years <laughs> until the Raja of Carverotti decided I'd look better on his island than I did in front of the footlights. Uh, your husband, the Raja, <laughs> is dead, isn't he? Yes, he, he was killed playing polo. Champagne, ma'am, say. Polo. Champagne, pina sector. Acha. He doesn't speak English, so I'll get along with telling him my troubles. Mr. Holmes, somebody's trying to kill me. Kill you? It's good. Uh, may I ask what reason you have for saying that, madam? You may, Mr. Holmes. <clears throat> Before I left England, I had threatening letters warning me that if I ever went back to Calvarotti, I'd never get to the island alive. I got another letter in Port Side that said the same thing. You kept these letters, I trust? No, I didn't. I tore them up. I never did pay attention to letters that weren't signed. Well, that's a great pity, madam. Those letters might have been invaluable. Well, it's too late to think about that now, Dr. Watson. Here's what's on my mind. I land at Calvarotti in the morning, and if anyone's up to a bit of no good... Tonight's their last chance. You would destroy the threatening letters, madam, thereby indicating that you did not believe in the threats, and yet you now appear to feel that you are in danger. I wonder what made you change your mind. The ace of spades. Yes? I don't understand you, madam. In the last two days, every time I tell my fortune, I get the ace of spades. <laughs> now, you know what that means. Death. Oh, come now, madam. If you'll pardon my saying so, that's a very childish superstition. Well, the cards have never lied to me yet. Oh, you can laugh at it if you like, but I know. <laughs> well, do you mind if I ask you a few questions? Anything you like, Mr. Holmes. Fire away. How long is it since you were in Cabarati? Mm, about 18 months. We were in England when my husband died, and I couldn't face the idea of going back to that island alone. In three months ago, Verda... Oh, he's the chief minister of Cabarati. Yes, 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 madam. We met him for a moment in the lounge. Oh, well, long ago. Verda came over to England to persuade me it was my duty as the Ronnie to go back. I see. As far as you know, have you any enemies among the passengers on board the ship? No, oh, that's an odd one to answer, Mr. Holmes. But I can tell you right here in my suite there's someone who doesn't like me. That girl, Raduna, the one that brought you my message. She was in love with the Roger herself. I know she hates me, even though she did stay with me in England after my husband died. Mm, how about Ferda, your minister? <laughs> oh, he's all right. My husband thought the world of him, and he's been wonderful to me. He came from Cavalati recently, you say, to persuade you to return there. That's right, Mr. Holmes. Well, Bruma seems to be all right after drinking that champagne, so it'll be safe for us to have some now. Champagne omelog kedo? Botache mem said. Oh, I've been burning with curiosity to know why you gave him a glass of champagne a few minutes ago, and yet we... <laughs> didn't have any. Well, surely that's obvious, Watson. Mm -hmm. uh, Fulmer is the official poison taster, isn't mm -hmm. he, madam? That's right, Mr. Holmes. He tastes everything I eat or drink before I do. Well, if it doesn't affect him, then I know it's safe. Verda brought him over to England when he came to fetch me. On the island of Cavarotti, poisoning's quite an hobby, you know. There were uh, two people in the smoking room tonight who seemed to know quite a lot about your island. The ship's doctor, rather garrulous gentleman by the name of Harris and Sir Christopher Wyatt, who owns tea plantations on the island. Do you know either of them, madam? I should say I do, both of them. Dr. Harris isn't any good. He was on the island for a bit, but he got into some kind of trouble, and my husband had him thrown out. Mm, and how about Sir Christopher Wyatt? <laughs> oh, Chris is all right. I saw quite a bit of him in London after my husband's death. <laughs> As a matter of fact... Well, if I weren't going back to Cavarotti, I, I don't think he'd be on the boat at all. He hasn't been there for over five years, ever since he had a row with my husband over the wages he paid the native labor. It seemed to me that several people aboard this boat have a personal interest in the island of Cavarotti. Interests that might uh, be influenced by your death. That's yes, just what I was going to say, madam. I think we should uh, keep an eye on you. Oh, that's just what I was hoping you'd say, Doctor. You see, I'm giving a bit of a supper party tonight. All the people we've been talking about have been invited. And I thought, well, I thought if you two were to be here, perhaps you'd be on the lookout for any any funny business. How about it? Well, of course we'll come, won't we, Holmes? I think it might be a good idea. Though I would suggest that we retain our incognitos as Mr. Hamish and uh, Mr. Mycroft. Well, whatever you say, Mr. Holmes. And now, let's have that champagne. <laughs> You know, Holmes, I remember the Raleigh when she was in the chorus at Daly's. She looked 
cunning in tights. There was one night I... Yes, no, I'm old chap, we... don't mind. At what? the moment, there's a question I want to ask you. Oh, sir? Is your medical bag fully equipped with all the antidotes to poison? Poison? <clears throat> it's ridiculous. How could the Rani be poisoned when she has a poison taster? My dear Watson, you mustn't... Hey, hello! 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 What the blazes is that? Come on, Watson. That cry came from the companionway. There are two figures struggling by the rail there. Good heavens! One of them has pushed the other down the companionway. Ah! Good Lord. His skull smashed in. I'm afraid that he... What's happened? Sir Christopher Wyatt. What are you doing here? I was taking a stroll. I heard a yell from this direction and came there as fast as I could. Great Scott, this fellow's bleeding badly. We must get the ship's doctor at once. That's hardly necessary, I fear, Sir Christopher. What do you mean? In the first place, this man is dead. In the second place, he is the ship's doctor. We'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second, so I'm just going to ask you to do one thing for me. Well, I should say for yourself. Tomorrow night, if you're having meat or any meat dish for dinner... Why not open up a bottle of Petri California Burgundy? That wonderful, rich, red Petri Burgundy will turn your dinner into a real feast. You see if it doesn't. Because there's nothing like a good wine with good food. And I know your family gets good food, and I know that Petri Burgundy is a good wine. In fact, it's a perfect mealtime wine. Try it and see. And now, Dr. Watson, tell us what happened next. You said you found the ship's doctor dead at the foot of the companionway? Yes, Mr. Bartell. His neck had been broken instantly. Imagine there was a good deal of excitement aboard. No, my boy. As a matter of fact, there wasn't. We managed to get the body back to its cabin without attracting attention. Holmes, after revealing his true identity, was able to persuade the captain to hush up the killing until after the Rani's party had taken place. Oh, he didn't want to scare the murderer, I guess. What happened next, Doctor? Holmes and I returned to our cabin to dress for the party. Holmes, I remember, was in a state of suppressed excitement. He spoke quietly and deliberately. Watson, surely it's obvious why the doctor was murdered. Well, it isn't obvious to me. It's all... elementary, my dear fellow. If you are planning a subtle murder by poison. How wise to remove the one man who might save the victim's life, a doctor. Oh, you keep harping on poisoning. It seems to me that it would be the last way a murder would try to dispose of the Rani. Everything she touches is first tested by the poison tester. Exactly. That's why I call it a subtle murder attempt. Didn't you notice the physical attributes of Prumer, the poison tester? Uh, which in particular, huh? Well, his unusually glossy hair, his remarkably clear complexion, his plump figure. Look here. Just tell me one thing, will you? What's that? I presume that in your medical bag you have a supply of magnesia. Naturally. Do you also have hydrated ferric oxide? Yes, I do. Splendid. Then us be off to the party. Oh, funny things to take to a party, I must That's say. true, my dear fellow, but I'm afraid that this party may not prove as convivial as the Rani thinks. Holmes, it's nearly one in the morning. Everything seems to be going splendidly. It seems to be, Watson, but keep your eyes on the Rani. Yes, I have been. The poison taste has tested everything that passed her lips. Uh, we Dot and Doris, to you, Sir Christopher, uh, you having a good time? Yes, indeed, thank you, Mr. Hamish. How about you, Mr. Mycroft? Oh, the Rani's a perfect hostess. Who could help having a good time? I don't think that girl, Regina, should be here, though. I don't want to be pompous, but after all, she's only a glorified servant. Oh, possibly the laws of etiquette are not so strict in ca- <coughs> Cavarati as they are in London, Sir Christopher. Oh, perhaps you're right. But I don't trust the girl. <clears throat> There's something shifty about her. I've told the Rani more than once. Oh, well, I suppose it's none of my business. I think I'll try and persuade the Rani to sing us one of her old songs. Yeah. He doesn't trust her, do no, and I don't trust him. I don't think it was an accident that we found him near the body of Dr. Harris. Shh, shh. Here comes Vera. I trust you gentlemen are enjoying yourself. Very much, Mr. Vera, thank you. I imagine you must be excited at the prospect of returning to Calavati. I am, Mr. Mycroft. Though I only left it three months ago, it has seemed more like three years. Do you can what time we'll arrive there? I am told that we shall be there in five hours, Mr. Hamish. Oh, look, look, look. The run is at the piano. She must be going to give us a tune. <laughs> yes, let's move a little closer, shall we? Chris here has asked me to sing something. Well, my voice isn't what it used to be, and don't I know it. But me spirit's the same, and that's enough to put a number over. 
So, all right, boys, here we go. My sweetheart's the man in the moon. I'm going to marry him soon. Two would fill me with a bliss just to give him one kiss. But I know that a dozen I never would miss. I'll go up in a great big... Oh... Great Scott, she... Quick, Watson, your medical bag. I'll lock the doors. Right, your Holmes. Bring some water, please. Help me. Oh, please, help what me. What is the matter? Don't be frightened, madam. I'll take care of you. Best. Give me water. Oh, such pain. All the symptoms of arsenic poisoning. Now I know why Holmes asked me for heli and magnesia and phenic oxide. Do something for me, doctor. I'm dying. Don't worry, Your Highness. You're not going to die. She's going to live, Holmes. Ah, oh, gracious me, I'm tired. Just touch and go there for a while, though. Well done, Watson, old chap. Well done. Now that she's out of danger, why can't we all go back to our cabins? It's nearly dawn and we've been locked in here since one o'clock. You've no right to do this, you know. Possibly not, Sir Christopher, but there's a murderer in this cabin, and I don't intend to let him escape. Mr. Holmes, what happened? How could I have been poisoned when Fruma tasted everything first? Why wasn't he poisoned? For a very simple reason, Your Highness. The murderer has been conditioning Fruma for over a year. What do you mean? He's been feeding him gradually increasing doses of arsenic until he has finally become immune to the poison. Great Scott, I never thought of that. Homer's glossy hair, his complexion, and stout figure are all typical of a person who consumes arsenic regularly. But who could have done it? Only one person had the opportunity. Well, tell us who that person is. No, not you, Sir Christopher, not you. For you haven't been on the island for years, whereas Fruma returned from Calavati but three months ago. Raduna has also been in London with her mistress for the past 18 months, remember? The answer is obvious. You did it, Verda. You brought the taster over when you came to fetch me. You'd prepared him for the year beforehand. Of course I did. No white runner will ever rule over Cavaratti. And you murdered Dr. Harris. Equally true. Mr. Holmes, give me the key to the door, please. Oh, no. What? Do not come near me. Please throw it on the floor. Do not hesitate. You see this revolver? I should have no compunction in using it, I assure you. How do you expect to escape, Vera? The key, please. Thank you. You'll never get away with this Verda, you devil. But I shall. We are now in the harbor of Cavarati. I shall swim ashore and arrange your welcome, my dear Rane. Turn your backs, please. Turn them. Thank you. Goodbye. He's gone. Come on, Watson. Hot for him. You, you have your revolver, Watson? Yes, but I didn't get a chance to draw it. He had me covered. I'll draw it now, old fellow. Aim for a leg or an arm and don't hesitate to shoot. There he is, up on the lifeboat. He's climbing up on the rail. Where is he? Where did he go? Up there on the rail above us, madam. He's going to dive. Give me that revolver, Dr. Watson. Quick, that's it. Come down off there, Verda. Fools! Meddlers! Keep out of my affairs! There he goes. He's dived. Ah! Madam, you shot to kill. Of course I did, Mr. Holmes. Remember that we're now in Cavarotti waters. And that I... Though I may not look like it at the moment, I am still the Ronnie of Cavarotti. Say, that that was a swell story, Doctor. It had a lot of color and quite a bit of action. <laughs> color and a bit of action? Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you liked it, my boy. Oh, I did. Say, you know, that's not a bad idea. I mean, uh, having someone taste everything before you eat it. Oh, it's a very old idea, very old. Very common, too, years ago. You know the kind of job I'd like? No, what's, uh, what's that? I'd like to be the official taster for the Petri family. Boy, just think of all the Petri wine I'd get to taste. Petri to the right of me, Petri to the left of me. What a life. 
What wine? Yeah, I wouldn't mind having that job myself. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> the Petri family, you know, really knows how to make good wine. They've been making wine for generations. And because they've always owned and operated their own business ever since it was started way back in the 1800s, well, the Petri family has sure piled up plenty of skill and experience. Yes, they've been handing down in the family from father to son, from father to son, the fine art of turning luscious grapes into delicious wine. That's why you can't go wrong with any Petri wine. It must be good. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, uh, Doctor, what new story do you have lined up for us next well, week? Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you an adventure that Sherlock Holmes and I had many years ago. It concerns a series of bonfires, an underground cellar full of gunpowder, and a strange death on the rooftops of London. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Mazarin Stone. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine invite you to spend the next half hour listening to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And say, let me tell you something I found out just the other day. Steaks are really back again. Good, thick, juicy porterhouse steaks. Mm. That's for me. A thick, tender steak on the rare side, together with a glass of Petri California Burgundy. You know, Petri Burgundy is a perfect mealtime wine. And with meat or any meat dish... It's the very last word in good eating. Honestly, when you taste the wonderful flavor of that rich red Petri Burgundy, you're tasting one swell example of the art of winemaking. It's full-flavored and just about the most delicious wine that ever poured from a bottle. Try it the next time you have steak or chops, or the next time you have hamburger or pot roast. Believe me, Petri Burgundy is the best friend a good meal ever had. <laughs> And now let's look in on our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Come in, come in, come in. Ah, there you are, Mr. Bartell. Evening, Doctor. Just in time to join me in a cup of coffee. Draw up your chair, young fellow, my lad. Thank you. Ah, that's it. Well, Doctor, you told us last week that tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure takes us to the south of France. That's right, Mr. Bartell. The south of France in the year 1900. A beautiful playground bordered by the bluest of blue seas and populated with an extraordinary cross-section of cosmopolitan Europe. Rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief. All of them attracted by that Riviera paradise. All of them drawn by the magical spell of a small white ball spinning round the rim of a roulette wheel. Now, don't tell me that you and the great Sherlock Holmes were there on a gambling spree. We were not, Mr. Bartell. <laughs> At the time my story begins, we just concluded an extremely delicate mission. A mission, I may say, that... Uh, concerned the safety and good name of uh, a very prominent member of the royal family. Say, Doctor, you don't mean... Uh, one story at a time, Mr. Bartell. In any event, my boy, I'm afraid that's the case about which my lips are sealed for all time. But to return to tonight's adventure, one June evening, I persuaded Holmes to accompany me to the gambling casino at Fregius, 
not far from Cannes, where we were staying. It wasn't quite as fashionable as a casino at Monte Carlo, but as I intended to do a little modest gambling myself, it seemed an establishment more suited to my means. As we stood there at the green baize covered tables, the chatter of voices and the melodic chanting of the croupiers, as they called the results of each spin of the wheel, formed a background to a quiet conversation that Holmes and I were having. Lost again, Watson. Oh, confounded. That number 10 must come up soon. Oh, why not cut your losses, old fellow, and come for a stroll with me on the water? Well, just a big wake. A couple more bets, Holmes. I, I have a big 10 is bound to come up in a minute. <laughs> Watson, I believe the blood of a gambler courses through your veins. Oh, there's no harm in taking a little flutter once in a while. Why don't you risk a few francs, oh, Holmes? Oh, no, thank you, my dear chap. The law of averages convinces me that my money is safer in my pocket. In any case, I'm a little dubious as to the integrity of this particular casino. Oh, huh? What makes you say that? Well, you will observe that this roulette wheel has a double zero. Most continental wheels have only a single one. It would indicate that this house is extremely concerned with its percentage. Mesdames et messieurs, faites vos yeux. Oh, just two more turns of the wheel, Holmes, and I'll take that walk with you. Oh, you misses the gear spieling. Why do you not get on the other side of the table? Why must you always stand next to me? Hello. The trouble up there. I've placed my bet, so, so let's go and see. I ask you, so why do you play here beside me? I'm afraid I don't see any reason why I can't play wherever I wish. You are, you've broken my luck. Ever since you come to the table, I've done nothing but lose. Please, to move away. Well, move away yourself if you don't like my company. Heinrich, why do you not stop now? You've already lost more than we can afford. Oh, one more throw, Elsa. I can win it all back if only this young man will move away. Why should my husband move? He's had a bad run of luck, too. Rien ne va plus. Ah, oh, you've lost again, Watson. Heinrich, you must stop now. I must stop inside because I've lost everything. I hope you're satisfied, Mr. American. You've broken my luck and ruined me. I hope that you and your turn will be ruined too. Heinrich, Heinrich, wait for me! I never heard such rubbish in my life. Were you listening to him, sir? I heard his last few remarks, Mr... Uh, Gilbert. Roger Gilbert. Gilbert. And this is my wife, Helen. How do you do? My name is Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do? Didn't you think his remarks were a little out of place, Doctor? <laughs> I certainly did, Mrs. Gilbert. I don't see how I can possibly blame your husband for his run of bad luck. I didn't like the look on his face as he left the table, though. Have you any idea who he is? His name is Schneeman. He's staying at the same hotel as we are. I've never spoken to him, but I've heard him being paged there. Well, he shouldn't gamble unless he can afford to lose. Well, I'm losing, darling, and I can't afford it. Oh, but... I can let you have more money. You know that. Oh, no, Helen. I, I may have married an heiress, but I'm not going to use her fortune to gamble with. Oh. <laughs> I'll lose my own money, and then I'll quit. Mesdames et messieurs, take for you. You last bit, Watson? Yes, Holmes. This time I know that number 10 is going to come up. It's got to. <laughs> I've lost again, darn it. Helen, this is my bad night. Well, why don't you stop now, dear? Holmes, I've made 350 francs. On this throw of the wheel, old fellow, but as you've lost some 500 francs doing it, I can't say that you're quite stuck me. Oh, Mr. Holmes, <laughs> I can see that you're no gambler. I'm afraid not, Mrs. I Gilbert. I didn't say that, Holmes. Uh, you may not like roulette. You've taken a good many chances in your life with long odds against you, too. Well, nevertheless, chap, in the sense Mrs. Gilbert means it, I'm not a gambler. Oh, that's a good idea. Hey, what's the commotion over there? That German woman with a crowd forming around him. Yes, yes, the wife of that man that said I ruined him. Attention! Attention! Est-ce qu'il y a un docteur dans la salle? There must be trouble. He's asking for a doctor. A doctor? Come along, then. Will you excuse me, please? Thank you. Excuse me, madame. Mon ami, il y a un docteur. Monsieur! Cette dame a besoin d'un docteur. What happened, madame? It is my husband. Is he ill? I just found him lying out in the garden. Please come with me at once, gentlemen. Uh, of course we will, madame. What seems to be the matter with him? Here, doctor. I think he is dead. <laughs> lying by that tree, Doctor. Please see if you can help him. Somebody else seems to be on the scene before us. Who are you, sir? I am Monsieur Chevray, director of the casino. Do any of you know this poor man? I am his wife. Is he... Is he dead? I... I am afraid so, madame. Let me look at him. I'm a doctor. Was your husband gambling in the casino tonight, madame? Yeah, he was. Poor Heinrich. He lost everything that we have. 
I'm afraid he's dead, madam. Shot through the heart. Oh, to leap a cut. Suicide, Watson? Yeah, looks like it. Mm. Yes. Powder burned on the shirt front, revolver clutched in the right hand, fingers in a natural position. The angle of the wound settles it. Obviously self-inflicted. I missed you as you slipped out of the casino. What's wrong with him? I'm afraid he's dead, Mr. Gilbert. Yes, he committed suicide. I hope, young man, that you are satisfied. All night you brought him bad luck. He asked you to move away from him to change his luck, but no, you could not do it. Oh, Frau Schneeman, I'm terribly sorry, but I really don't see how you can blame me. I do blame you, and I also blame you, Monsieur Chevry. Me? But what have I done, madame? Why do you let a man lose all his money at your tables? Is life so cheap to you, or money so important that you cannot close the tables to someone before he's ruined? Madame, I am all sympathy for you in your tragic loss. But the casino cannot be held responsible. If a husband should not afford to gamble, then he should not come here. How are we to know the financial limitations of our, of our customers? You said your husband lost everything you had tonight, madame. Yeah, everything. Then how do you account for this sheaf of banknotes in his breast pocket? Good Lord, must be several thousand francs, sir. Then he wasn't ruined. And his suicide, therefore, cannot be blamed on his losses at my casino, madame. How do you account for this money, Frau Schneemann? Well, I do not understand. Heinrich kept nothing from me. I know that he had not so much money on him when he started tonight. Uh, well, why do you all look at me like that? Is it that you think? You think... Quick, why not she faint it? I've got her. We must, must get her to her room. You can take her to my suite in the casino. No, let's take her to the hotel. My wife will look after her. Poor woman, she's had a dreadful shock. She can probably do with another woman's company. It's very considerate of you, Mr. Gilbert. Where are you staying? At the Hotel Creon. It's quite near here. I'll get a cabin. While I'm doing that, Watson, see if you can revive her, will you? Jesus then God. we'll take her to the Hotel Creon. Very kind of you, Mrs. Gilbert, to let us bring the poor lady into your suite. Well, it's the least I can do, in spite of what she said about Roger bringing her husband bad luck. Oh, I'm sure she'll need your help when she wakes up, Helen. Yes, I think you'll find that she'll sleep for some hours. I gave her a strong sedative. Well, we were just about to have a drink, gentlemen. Do you care to join us? Oh, thank you, sir. Well, that'll be very nice, Mr. Gilbert. Roger was just telling me that quite a large sum of money was found on Herr Shaman's body, Mr. Holmes. Uh, yes, Mrs. Gilbert. Several thousand francs. It's very puzzling, Holmes. Why should a man commit suicide with so much money on him? I think the answer is obvious. He didn't. What on earth do you mean? Well, the money was placed there after he had shot himself. The bank notes were in his breast pocket, if you remember. Hardly the usual place to carry money. Though it is the easiest pocket for someone to insert it without disturbing the body. But why on earth would someone place money on it after his suicide? Prevent the casino from getting a bad name. I've heard of it being done on several similar occasions. Gives the impression that the unfortunate victim had other motives than gambling losses to account for his suicide. Right, Scott. You mean that one of the casino employees found the body lying there and slipped the money in his breast pocket before we arrived on the scene? As you know, my dear Watson, I'm not a gambling man, but I'll lay you a hundred to one. That is what happened. Well, that's a new one. Well, here are your drinks, gentlemen. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Say, Helen, Mr. Holmes has given me a brainwave. Another one? What is it this time, Roger? Now, I've been losing very heavily tonight. Roger, no. I've told you. If you need money, I'll be only... But I don't. I've got a scheme for making some. Oh. I'm going to gamble again tonight after dinner. If I lose, here's what I'll do. I'll stain my shirt front with red ink. Walk out in the grounds, fire a shot, and lie down as though I'm dead. I'll wait for someone to come along and stuff my pockets full of banknotes. <laughs> not, not a bad idea, Mr. Gilbert. <laughs> I think it's a darn good one. What do you say, Mr. Holmes? Well, it's a whimsical one at any rate. Who knows? You might even be successful. Roger, you're not really going to do it, are you? Sure. Perhaps I'll get some of my losses back that way. <laughs> well, let's drink to it, gentlemen. At least I may have hit upon an idea of making money. <laughs> Dear Watson, you'll have to work hard at your practice when you get back to England. Your infallible system appears to be extremely fallible. And yet the fellow who told me about it said it couldn't miss. It's just a matter of doubling the stakes each time you lose oh, and then... Oh, my dear fellow, I've been studying your system. But I can tell you a really infallible way of making money at roulette. You can? What is it? Well, 
Own the gambling house and operate the tables yourself. The odds would be all in your favor. Oh, what a brilliant suggestion. Own the gambling house and I'm willing to. Not gambling for tonight, Watson? It's nearly 11 o'clock. No, I think so. Let's take a stroll around the other table, shall we? By the way, old fellow, the young American, Mr. Gilbert, was losing heavily again tonight. He was? I wonder if he'll try that trick that he threatened. The one with the red ink. The shot in the night. I shouldn't be at all surprised. As a matter of uh, interest, I saw him leave the tables about half an hour ago. Shh, shh, shh. Here comes his wife on the arm of Monsieur Chevrolet, the director of the casino. I agree with you. Good evening, Mrs. Gilbert. Monsieur? Bonsoir, monsieur. Hello, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson. Monsieur Chevrolet is giving me a personally conducted tour of the casino. It's quite fascinating. And uh, it is quite fascinating for me to have so beautiful a woman on my arm, mademoiselle. <laughs> I know that I am the envy of all the men in the room. Oh, stop <laughs> flattering me so much. I'm not used to it. Mrs. Gilbert, how is, um, Frau Schneemann? She seems much better. She wakened an hour ago and insisted on going back to her own room. I wanted her to spend the night with us in our suite, but she wouldn't hear uh, of I it. I think I should drop in and see her before I go to bed. Oh, you have finished the gambling for tonight, perhaps, Doctor? Uh, no, perhaps about it, Monsieur Chevry. I've had a bad run at the tables. Oh, I am so sorry. Has anyone seen Roger? He left the tables about half an hour ago, Mrs. Gilbert. After doing as I did and losing quite heavily. So he lost again, did he? I wonder if he'll try that uh, new system he was talking about. <laughs> we were just discussing that possibility ourselves, Mrs. Gilbert. Mrs. Gilbert! Mrs. Gilbert! Frau Schneemann, you shouldn't have left your hotel now. It is too late to worry for me, Herr Doctor. It is for Mrs. Gilbert now that you should worry. What do you mean, madam? Well, I went back just now to where poor Heinrich died. And there, lying in the grass, I saw another body. I was too shocked to go too close. But I am quite sure that I recognize your husband, Mrs. Gilbert. Oh, Dr. Watson, she's ruined Roger's trick. And he'll have taken fright and bolted by the time we get there. Watson, maybe let's go at once and find out, shall we? <coughs> he, he hasn't gone. He's, he's still lying there. It's a most convincing spectacle. That red ink really does look like blood. Yes. And blood sometimes looks like red ink. Mr. Gilbert. Roger, get up. The joke's spoiled. Roger, get up. I'm afraid that's impossible, Mrs. Gilbert. He's dead. Dr. Watson's story will be continued in just a second, which is all the time I need to tell you that the easiest way I know to transform a simple meal into a feast is to serve that meal together with Petri California Sauterne. Petri Sauterne is a delicate white wine. It's the perfect companion for chicken or turkey. Turkey. Ah, yes. Turkey and Petri Sauterne. That's the heart of any Thanksgiving dinner. Look, why not make this Thanksgiving dinner the best one you ever had? Give it the air of a banquet. Serve it with Petri Sauterne. And when you buy that Sauterne or any wine for your Thanksgiving dinner, whatever you do... Look for the letters P-E-T-R-I, because a Petri wine is always a good wine. Well, Doctor, so the young American's joke turned out to be another tragedy. Yes, Mr. Bartell, the poor fellow was lying there dead with a bullet wound in the heart and a great splash of blood staining the whiteness of his shirt front. What happened next? Monsieur Chevry, director of the casino, took the distraught widow away from the scene while Holmes and I examined the body closely. Within a few minutes, we were joined by Inspector... Uh, Ganivet of the French police. As we stood there in the moonlight, the sounds of music could be heard from the casino. It was hard to believe that two men had died in that lovely garden since the moon had risen. Monsieur Holmes, you and Dr. Watson have concluded your examination. Yes, Inspector Ganivet. You favor me with your observations. You say that you are certain that this is not another suicide? I'm sure of it, Inspector. Look at the wound. The bullet entered the body at a direct right angle, whereas a self-inflicted shot is always fired obliquely. Yes, that is so. Then uh, you suggest that this man was shot from above as he lay on the ground pretending to be dead. I'm convinced of it. Why, Monsieur? Well, for two reasons. Though it's impossible to be sure without a laboratory test, I'm certain that beneath those blood stains are stains of red ink. Look for yourself, Inspector. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed it does look like it. What is your other reason for being certain that this man was shot as he lay here pretending dead? I'll show him the banknotes, Watson. Uh, here you are, Inspector. We found them stuffed in his breast pocket. So, 
Of notes with a bullet hole through the middle of them. Very illuminating. Uh, tell me, gentlemen, how many people knew of this, uh, this little plot you have told me about? This plan of the dead man's to pretend to be shot? Just three people, Inspector. Dr. Watson, myself, and Mrs. Gilbert. Hello, then the answer is obvious. You and your friend are innocent. It must be the wife who killed him. No one else knew of the plot. Mm, I'm not so sure of that. Frau Schneemann, the dead German's widow, was in the next room when Gilbert told us about his plan. She might have heard, though I could swear that she was asleep. I gave her a very strong sleeping draft. From what you have told me of her husband's suicide, she might easily have had a motive for murdering oh, this man. Oh, come, 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 gentlemen. Surely it's obvious who murdered Mr. Gilbert? Who, Monsieur Holmes? Well, it's certainly one of the two widows. Since there seems to be some doubt in your minds, I suggest we return to the casino. I can promise you the answer to your question within a very few minutes. <laughs> Well, Monsieur Chevrolet, now that we're all assembled in your office, I shall sit down quietly and let Inspector Ganivet conduct his examination. No, 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 Monsieur Holmes. No, you have handled the case so far. Please to con continue it to the end. Yes, Monsieur Holmes. I should appreciate it. We <laughs> have it at your signal. Very well, gentlemen. It won't take me long. Frosch Neyman. Yeah, Herr Holmes. At uh, what time did you leave your hotel tonight? Well, I do not know what time it was. Well, what made you leave it? Well, I could not sleep. I knew that they had taken poor Heinrich's body away, but I felt that I must walk back there. It was the last place I saw him alive. How close did you come to Mr. Gilbert's body when you saw it lying there? Oh, close enough to see who it was. Then I ran into the casino to tell his wife I knew what had happened. How did you know? You, you uh, didn't come close to the body. I could tell by every line of the body as it lay there. I could tell because I knew that poor Heinrich's death would not be avenged. Thank you, Frau Schneemann. That will be all. You may go. Monsieur Holmes, she has no alibi. Surely you Inspector should Ganibet, if I'm to conduct this investigation, I must do it my own way. Pardon, Monsieur Holmes. Please continue. Right. Uh, you may go, Frau Schneemann. Mrs. Gilbert? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Where were you prior to our meeting in the casino tonight, just before we discovered your husband's body? After I left the hotel, I walked over here along the seafront. Can anyone verify that statement? I suppose not. I didn't meet anyone that I knew. And what did you do when you arrived at the casino? I played a little chemin de fer. A few months later, Monsieur Chevrolet came over to the table and asked if he might escort me over the club. Ten minutes after that, we walked into you and Dr. Watson. That is quite true, Monsieur Holmes. I can swear to it. Thank you, Mrs. Gilbert. I'm sorry to distress you with these questions. You may go. I'll wait outside, Mr. Holmes. I must know what happened. Wait for me there, madame. I shall join you in a few minutes and escort you home. Ah, oh, well, another suspect with a poor alibi, alibi eh, Gallivet? I must say, Monsieur Holmes, your methods puzzle me. It seems to me that both those women should be watched. Yes, I agree with the inspector, Holmes. Please don't worry, inspector. I've asked two of your plain clothes men to keep an eye on the ladies. And now, Monsieur Chevray, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Ask me any questions you wish, Monsieur Holmes. Thank you. You will agree that it is the custom of the casino to put money on the bodies of suicides after their death. To give the impression that gambling uh, gambling losses were not responsible for the tragedy. Well, I, I, I do not oh, think... Oh, come now, Chevrolet. I know that is a fact as well as you do. Exactly. Now, on those rather gruesome occasions, whose responsibility is it to secrete the money? Yours? Or do you entrust the matter to an underling? I do it myself. I see. Did you place the money on Herr Schneemann tonight? Yes, monsieur, I did. And did you also perform the same service on the body of Mr. Gilbert? No. I knew nothing of that death until the German lady, Frau Schneemann, <coughs> running into the casino. Excuse me, interrupting, monsieur. Uh, of course, Inspector. What is it? I think that you are wasting time. It is obvious that Madame Gilbert committed the crime. She knew of her husband's plot. She had no alibi, and she had the motive. For is not uh, <laughs> marriage itself the greatest of all motives for murder? Oh, oh my dear, Inspector. How very cynical. Madame Gilbert did not kill her husband. I know it. And what is your opinion, Watson? Uh, it's a German woman. She had no alibi either. And remember, she was half mad with, with grief. Mr. Chevrolet, you say that you know Mrs. Gilbert is not guilty. How do you know? I was with her myself at the time the murder was committed. Oh, indeed. How very interesting. And what time was the murder committed? Well, it, it was... It, it was... Our investigations have never established what time the murder was committed, Monsieur Chevrolet. I'm afraid you've walked into my trap. You've given yourself away. Great Scott Chevrolet, it was you. Chevrolet, I've known you a good many years, and this is going to be a hard thing to do. I am going to arrest you. Oh, no, you're not, Gennibay. Put down that revolver, sir. Do not be frightened, Doctor. I am not going to shoot you. 
Debray, why did you murder Roger Gilbert tonight? Surely you know that too, Monsieur Holmes. Because I am in love with his wife. She is young, beautiful, and rich. It did not occur to me until I saw the young fool lying there tonight pretending to be dead. In my profession, it is natural that I should carry a revolver. What was simpler? Mr. Gilbert gave me the perfect opportunity. I, I could not resist it. Put down that revolver, Chevrolet. Why are you all so frightened? Surely you know how I am going to use it this time. I think so, monsieur. But it's a coward's way out. What an unreceptive remark for such a perceptive man. No. No, all my life I have been a gambler. I gambled tonight. For the highest stakes of all, and... And I lost. No. No, I am not afraid to pay for my losses. Au revoir, monsieur! Case, Holmes. Uh, I never suspected Chevrolet. And I, old chap, suspected him from the beginning. Well, I wasn't the only one who was stupid anyway. Inspector Ganivet thought it was the wife. True. Very puzzling conclusion for a detective inspector to arrive at. Oh, it seemed logical enough to me at the no, time. No, 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 my dear Watson. Cold logic should have told you otherwise. Roger Gilbert had been losing heavily and had planned this hoax. He obviously had no money on him. Therefore, the money was planted in his pocket by Chevrolet. After he shot him? No, my dear fellow. Before. Before? The bullet hole through the bank notes provided that. Now, uh, had the money been put there innocently, Gilbert would have, um, well, you know, come back to life as soon as the person placing it there had left. He would not have remained lying on the ground for a murderer to find him. And Chevry must have bent over him as he lay there, placed the money in his breast pocket, and then fired. Uh, precisely, Watson. Well, Holmes, I must say you solved it very neatly. You've told Inspector... Ganivet, that you wanted no credit in the case. Naturally, uh, publicity would be unfavorable. If you remember, no one is supposed to know that we're in the South of France. <laughs> I'm certain that the inspector learned a few tips about detection tonight. Possibly, old <laughs> fellow. And I hope that uh, you have learned a few about gambling. How do you mean, Holmes? Well, you're backing the wrong color. Hmm? A gambler is usually superstitious, and superstition... Well, I should have told you what color to follow tonight. I still don't understand you, Holmes. I was playing number ten. Exactly. Number ten is black. You should have followed a red color tonight, old fellow. The color of red ink. Red ink. And blood. Say, Doctor, that was a swell story. I didn't know you liked to play roulette. Well, you know, I, I figured out a system for roulette. It's like yours. Uh, every time you lose, you double your money and keep doubling until you win. Oh, it's a great system, Mr. Bartell. There's only one thing wrong with it. What's that? If you lose, you go broke before you win. <laughs> look, 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 take, take my advice. Don't gamble. You can't beat the laws of chance. Uh, but suppose I bet on a sure thing. Like what, for instance? Oh, like the fact that Petri wine is always good wine. It is, you know. Because the Petri family has been making wine for generations. They've been hanging down from father to son, from father to son, the art of turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into delicious, fragrant wine. Ever since the Petri family started their business way back in the 1800s, they've been perfecting the art of winemaking. That's why Petri wine is always good wine. The Petri family took time to bring you good wine. So no matter what type of wine you prefer... Why not take a few seconds of your time to look for the letters P-E-T-R-I. They spell delicious wine, Petri wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story are you going to tell us next week? Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you of a strange adventure that Sherlock Holmes and I had when we were in Stratford-on-Avon many years ago. It concerns an actor, a mysterious boating accident... And several dead butterflies. It sounds good, Doctor. I'll see you then. Oh, fine, but now, now, don't forget next week we're going to broadcast our program from the Paramount Theatre in Hollywood for the Victory Loan Drive. So if any of our friends are going to be in Hollywood, we'd love to see them there. Just buy a Victory Bond at any store or bank on Hollywood Boulevard, and in return, you will be given your ticket of admission. Better hurry up, though, before all the seats are gone. Let's really buy lots of those Victory Bonds. Let's finish the job.
Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, A Study in Scarlet. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. It was hot, boiling hot that night. I wanted to grab a beer and turn in early. So what happens? I get my beer, but with it comes a gunshot, a beautiful woman in trouble, and murder. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime mystery, CBS presents his most famous character, brought to you now in... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. With Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's unusual story, Red Wind. There was a rough desert wind blowing into Los Angeles that evening. It was one of those hot, dry Santa Anas that come down through the mountain passes and curl your hair and make your nerves jump and your skin itch. On nights like that, every booze party ends in a fight and meek little housewives feel the edge of a carving knife and study their husbands' necks. Anything can happen when the Santa Ana blows in from the desert. I closed up my office early. I got tired of reading Philip Marlowe, private investigator, backwards on the ground glass of my office door. So I locked up and decided a nice cold beer would taste good before I went up to my apartment. Killer up again, Mr. Marlin? Marlow. Uh, Marlin. Yeah, Marlin's a fish. <laughs> yeah, I know. Marlin's also the name of a lady on the radio. Marlin, comma, Mary, the story of. Yeah, my wife listens to it. Oh, yeah, good for her. All right. Hey, you, bartender. Another ride. Yeah, that drunk again. What do you expect in this business? Autograph hounds? Major Sappy. You hear? Be right with you, sport. Gotta draw this man a beer. Crying out loud, these stumble bums. Hey, Bud. You got another customer, Bacchus. Uh, hey, Bud, you seen a lady in here lately? A lady? A tall, good-looking, brown hair, a print bolero jacket, and a blue silk dress. No, sir. No, sir. Uh, nobody like that, Spinion. All right, straight scotch fast. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. As the man drank, I noticed the drunk was grinning at him. And then, without changing his grin, the drunk swept a gun from somewhere so fast it was just a blur coming out. Made a couple of hard snaps and a little smoke. Very little. You other guys, don't move. So long, Waldo. Don't move, you two. Poor Waldo. I bet I made his nose bleed. So long, boys. Drink up. Get on the phone, kid. I'll get his license number. Holy smoke. Too late. He drove away in the dead guy's car. Uh, maybe he ain't dead. No, he's dead, all right. Oh. That guy was using a 22 target yeah. pistol. When they use that kind of gun, they don't make mistakes. Where's your phone? This uh, is for the police. <laughs> Prowl car boys were there in five minutes. Waldo was out of business, all right. Nothing in his pockets told who he was, but he had about $700 on him. And with that kind of heavy coin, you can buy a good 1910 automobile even today. Well, I told the cops what I knew, including about Waldo's brown-haired pretty girl in the bolero jacket. It was about 9 o'clock when I stepped out of the elevator in my apartment house and almost walked right into a brown-haired pretty girl in a bolero jacket, waiting for the elevator on my floor. Oh, excuse me. Just a minute, lady. <laughs> What is it? I'm a great admirer of Valero jackets. What? Now, take the one you've got on, for instance. I'm sorry, but I'm in a hurry. No, 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 wait. If you'll be good enough to let me... Oh, you've made me miss the elevator. It's just as well. What? Well, it's better you don't go out in those clothes. Just what do you mean? Tall, good-looking, Valero jacket, blue silk dress. Mm Mm-hmm. Lady, might I take the trouble of telling you that you're in trouble? Trouble? Yeah, the cops are looking for you in those clothes. I haven't done anything. Maybe not. But if I were you, I'd have a little talk with me. I, 
I'm old I'm enough. I'm in room 41 across the hall. And I know things about you. Well. Good girl. Come along. It took a firm grip on her arm, but I managed to get her to my room. I rustled up some drinks, but when I turned to give her hers, I... I saw she held a small automatic. She looked at me steadily. I put down both glasses slowly so I wouldn't be misunderstood. Look, sister, I, I, I know it's hot tonight and heat does funny things to people, but uh, let's put that little thing away and have a nice cool drink, huh? Don't move. Oh, I'm strictly frozen in my tracks. Stay that way. Okay, okay. But wouldn't you like to know that I'm a private detective? Private detective? Yeah, I can prove it if you'll let me. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, I don't like those things pointed at me. I'll have that drink. Oh, good. I don't often give good liquor away like this. I can't afford it. Why are they after me? Well, a man was just shot in a bar down the street. Before he got it, he'd been asking about a tall, pretty girl with a bolero jacket. What did he look like, this man? Oh, he was tall, about 5'11". Slim, dark, dark brown eyes with a lot of glitter. Dark suit, white handkerchief in the breast pocket. And he must have seen you early at night to know how you were dressed. Am I getting anywhere? He used to be my... My chauffeur. You had an appointment with him, didn't you? I... He asked for you, didn't he? Yes, I had an appointment with him. He'd stolen something from me when he left three days ago. I was going to buy it back from him. Why didn't you tell the police? I couldn't tell him. It was valuable, wasn't it? Valuable enough for Waldo to steal. Fifteen thousand dollars. Peanuts. But it wasn't the value. You see, it meant something to me. The man I loved gave it to me. And now he's dead. We shot down over Germany. Now go back and tell my husband that. He'll, he probably hired you. He did? How much is he paying me? And uh, where is this husband of yours? He's at a meeting. This late at night? He's a very important man. The hydroelectric engineer. Never mind about him. What about Waldo? Why was he knocked off? You mean he's dead? Waldo is dead? Yes, sister, he's dead. Very dead. Oh. Screaming won't bring him back. I'm not going to scream. Who would that be? There's a dressing room behind the door. Hide uh, there. Take your glass with you. All right, all right. I went to the door, making a loud, yawning sound. Foolishly, I didn't have my gun. That was a mistake. Because when I opened the door, the guy on the other side certainly had one. A twenty-two target automatic that had already killed one man that night. And I knew the bald head, the flat, shiny eyes, and the face like a poisonous lizard. Baldy put the muzzle of his gun lightly against my throat. I backed into the room and Baldy kicked the door shut. You alone? Look for yourself. I'm asking, not looking. I'm alone. You and that dumb bartender saw me dust off Waldo. What did Waldo do to you? Who's asking? Just making conversation. He stooled on me on a bank job we did together. Got me four years in Michigan Penn. How is he? Dead. <laughs> well, I'm still good. Drunk or sober. Tell me why I came here, pal. You heard the barkeep and me talking. I told him my name and where I lived. Hmm. That's how, pal. I said, why? Skip it. The hangman won't ask you to guess why he's there. You're pretty tough at that, ain't you, pal? But you're slamming off. All right. But, uh... Could you get that gun out of my neck and try somewhere else? Just any place. This better? This suits you all right? It's just so it isn't my neck. Say when, pal. It's your party. I leaned against the gun weakly door of the dressing room showed a crack of darkness. The crack widened. I began to shake a little in spite of the heat. The girl came quietly into the room, but there was white all around her irises. She was scared. She had a gun in her hand, but I was sorry for her. Dead sorry. She tried to make the door a scream. Either way, it would be curtains for both of us. Scared, mister? Worried about any little thing? I couldn't talk. The girl floated in the air somewhere behind Baldy. And her horrified face was drifting toward us. My mouth was as cold and dry as yesterday's toast. Well, kid, how's it feel? 
You ready yet? Say the word. Well, don't take all night about it. If you're going to do something about it, do it. Why not, pal? I like this. Suppose I yell. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Put up Go your ahead. hand. Hey, look. Oh. Oh. Thanks, sister. That buys me. Everything I have is yours, now and forever. Is, is they dead? You flatter me, no end, lady. I only punched him. Now get out of here while I call the yes. cops down on this killer. Yes. Good night. Wait a minute, wait a minute. That jacket marks you for the cops. Leave it here. You don't need it in this kind of weather. Yes, here. Okay. See you again. Why? I don't know. Who am I to be the rival of a dead flyer and things like that? Now, on second thought, forget the whole thing. I'll see that the police get Jesse James here. Good night, lady. Yeah? You mean me? Yes, please. Oh, you again. Get in. I want to talk to you. You want to know what happened at headquarters? Yes. I went down to headquarters with the law and gave him the story. I left you out of it. Oh, thanks. You saved my life. So no one knows anything about you. Incidentally, neither do I. My name is Mrs. Frank Barsley. 212 Fremont Place. Olympia 24596. Is that what you wanted? I guess so. Well, there it is. Now, why'd you really come back? I wanted my pearls. Oh, no. Pearls, too? Yes. All right, tell me about the pearls. <laughs> We've had a murder, a beautiful mystery woman, and a sadistic killer, and an heroic rescue. Now we will have pearls. I was to buy them back from the man called Waldo. Well, I saw everything that came out of his pockets. There weren't any pearls. Could they be hidden in his apartment? It's possible. Waldo lived on the same floor you do, in this apartment house. And why didn't I know him, at least by sight? Well, he just moved in last week. He managed to get a sublet. Sort of amateur magician on the side, huh? It's, uh, getting rather late. Yeah. What about your husband this hot, mysterious night? He's still at his meeting. Good. Why did you say that? I didn't have any answers. We just sat there looking at one another. I was suddenly aware of the hot desert wind stirring up the night. I took hold of her and I kissed her. She sat very still. I was shaking when I let go of her. Her voice trembled a little when she spoke. I meant you to do that. Oh, I wasn't always this way. Only since Johnny Dalmas was killed in the war. He gave me those pearls. Forty-one of them. With a diamond propeller clasp. <laughs> I'd have loved them if they were wooden beads because he gave them to me. I loved Johnny. The way you love just one time. You understand that? Yes, I can. What I don't understand is how you could explain a $15,000 pearl necklace to your husband. I told him they were imitation, that I bought them myself. How did Waldo latch onto them and what they stood for? When my husband was in Argentina, Waldo and I would go for long drives. I was restless and wretched because of Johnny. Sometimes Waldo and I had a little drink together. But that was all. But you confided in Waldo about those pearls. Yes. And when your husband came back, Waldo stole the pearls and offered to sell them back to you. He'd tell Papa. Oh, I was a fool. And now you think the pearls are upstairs in Waldo's apartment. I suppose it's a lot to ask. I've been paid. I'll go look. Wait here. Was I gone long, Lola? No. Well? No. No pearls? No pearls. Oh. There was a man in Waldo's room. Man? Who? You know a guy named Leon Velasanos? 
No, not by name. I don't know. Mexican, South American, about 45, small, iron gray hair, very neat. Fawn-colored suit, wine-colored tie. No, I don't think I know such a man. You say he was in the room? Yeah. What did he say? Very little. In fact, nothing. He was dead. You are listening to The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by one of America's most outstanding writers of crime and mystery fiction, Raymond Chandler. Our story for today, The Red Wind, continues in just a moment. But first, a message of interest for all young men. How would you like to be up there in the wild blue sky, flying America's mightiest bombers, fastest fighters, and newest jet jobs? Believe me, it's a great feeling to know that you have the skill, the courage it takes to become a pilot officer in the United States Air Force, the Air Force that's second to none. Keep your eye on the local newspapers and your nearest Army Air Force recruiting station. An aviation cadet recruiting team will be in your community soon. If you're between the ages of 20 and 26 and a half years of age, single and a high school graduate, plan to see the aviation cadet interviewing team. If you pass the mental and physical examination... You'll be accepted for the 52-week Aviation Cadet Training Program. When you graduate, you'll be a second lieutenant in the U.S. Air Force, the mightiest of all. And now, back to the adventures of Philip Marlowe. With Gerald Moore as our star, we continue today's adventure. I sat with Lola Bosley in her car, listening to the hot wind gallop around in the midnight streets. I just told her about the Latin-looking man I'd found in Waldo's room in a very dead condition. I held her hands until they stopped trembling, and then I gave her the few remaining details. He had a gun in his shoulder holster, but someone had strangled him before he could set up in business with a gun. Someone? You mean Waldo? Maybe. You see that convertible coupe two cars ahead of us? Oh, it's been there for hours there before I parked here to wait for you. Well, Leon, the guy in Waldo's room, came in that car. But according to the key container he carried, it isn't his car. Well, whose car is it? And does it matter? Yeah, it belongs to a lady, according to the tag on the car keys. Eugenie Kolchenko, West Los Angeles. I've never heard of her. Mm-hmm. Well, you better go home now. What are you going to do? Uh, drive that flossy convertible around and wave at my friends. <laughs> Impress people. You run along now. Me, I've got another date. Yes, what is it, please? Miss Eugenie Kolchenko? Yes, what is it? Did you lose or misplace a pigeon gray convertible coupe? What are you saying? Don't be alarmed, I found it, brought it home to you. Come in, please. Uh, it is a reward you wish. Shall we say... Snap out of a dragon, lady. Who was he? Who was who? A little guy. Leon, you loaned your car to. He's dead. Who was he? Oh, no. No. Eugenie. Darling, darling, come here, please. What's the matter, my dear? Who is this man? I came about Miss Kolchenko's car. What about her car? Well, the gentleman who borrowed it couldn't return it on account of he isn't alive. He's dead, darling. He is dead. That's putting it more bluntly, of course. Dead, huh? Yeah, completely. Who are you? Philip Marlowe, private investigator. My card. Mm. Have you told the police yet? Never do at once what can be profitably deferred pending negotiation. ESOP. I might negotiate. Peachy. Just what do you know, Marlowe? Well, a man named of Waldo was shot in a bar tonight. I happen to have the insight as to who he was, and when I visited his apartment tonight, I found this Leon Velasanos dead. He wouldn't have had $500 and 20s on him, would he? No. But this Waldo had over $700 on him when he was killed in that cocktail bar, mostly in 20s. Mm. Is there a basis for negotiation yet? Very well, Marlowe. There were certain bills for some stuff Miss Kolchenko here had charged to my account. But, darling, you told me I might charge to your account. All right, my dear, so I wasn't bright. That might be the understatement of the decade, but go on. I had the bills safely in my briefcase. Somehow, this Waldo had a chance to steal the briefcase. I hired Leon, gave him $500 to buy back those bills from Waldo. Instead, Waldo took Leon's coupons, was forced to kill Leon in the process. 
Then he went out to keep another date and walked into an old pal hostile enough to blow him down, huh? Then somebody still has those bills, and I'm in for a divorce suit, huh? Hmm. The man who shot Waldo got away in Waldo's car with your briefcase in it, could be. Cops caught him. And the police have the briefcase? Maybe. But the police are interested in solving crimes, not in tossing mud for the benefit of sensation eaters. I have a friend or two at headquarters. Let me see what I can do. It's worth $500 to me, Marlowe. Then that's what it'll cost you. All right. Good luck and thank you, Mr... Marlowe. Philip Marlowe, remember? Marlowe. My name is Frank Barsley. Barsley? Oh. And just what does that mean? The big hydroelectric engineer. Yeah. Yes, how'd you know? Never mind. May I use your telephone? Someday I must tell you about Ibarra. Now he's a salt of the earth, Ibarra. Detective lieutenant over at Central Homicide. Well, I phoned Ibarra from Miss Kolchenko's house and told him where he could find a well-dressed cadaver named Leon and furnished a few small details. I gave Ibarra time to check my tip and then I went down to see the good lieutenant and told him why I'd been up in Waldo's room only to find Leon instead of a certain lady's string of pearls. Pearls, eh? Yeah, I thought Waldo might have had them up there. Whose pearls were they? The ladies. Go on. Oh, they might have been in Waldo's car that Waldo's killer drove away in. Yeah. What? Yeah. They might have. Yeah. Also, a batch of bills charged to the account of a certain Frank Bosley. Yeah. The police aren't interested in domestic scandal. They want to prevent or solve crimes, right? So? So, I've got $500 for the police fund. Mm. If those pearls and those bills are returned to their rightful owners. Quit your kidding. It's a valuable necklace. Yeah. There's your necklace. Take it away. On the level, Ibarra? Just tell me straight what it's all about. All I ask. Sure, sure. Well, you see, this Waldo was blackmailing a wife with the pearls and her husband with the bills. Mm-hmm. Barsley, that's the guy's name, sent Leon to get the bills from Waldo. Waldo killed him and then stepped out and got nailed by that guy in the bar he'd stool pigeoned against once. Mm-hmm. Well, if Barsley's name stays out of the papers, I get 500 bucks. It goes to the police fund. Thanks. We'll keep him out. I'm not in this case for money. I just want to get back the bills and the pearls. Sure. And like you say, Marlowe, the police aren't in business to sling mud. Look, you can deliver the pearls to the lady yourself if you like. No, you better take them to her, Marlowe. You see, except for that diamond propeller clasp on them, they're phony. Phony? But look, Marlowe, I know pearls. Real pearls feel gritty between the teeth. These are hard and glassy. Try yeah. Yeah. They're phony. All but the clasp, Marlowe. All but the clasp. I took the pearls and had them appraised the next morning at a gilt edged place in Beverly Hills. Phony, all but the clasp. Hmm. An imitation as good as these couldn't have been made that fast. These were the pearls that Waldo had stolen. I took the glass pearls to a dive on Melrose and had them duplicated for $20. I had the jeweler attach the diamond clasp to the $20 duplicate string of pearls. Then I called up Lola. Hello, Lola. Okay, you're in? Oh, Mr. Marlowe. Yes, it's okay here. I have a string of pearls for you. Oh, really, Philip? Really, did you get... Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Lola. Waldo was getting set to jip you. We sold the real pearls and made up a string with the diamond clasp. May I at least have the clasp? Sure. Meet me at four at Nikolaev's. Nikolaev's at four. I'll be there. Hey, yeah, Lola. These are the pearls the police found in Waldo's car. You're right. They're not my pearls. I'm sorry, Lola. No. I still have the clasp that Johnny gave me. Well, I'm happy if you are. <laughs> happy? No, not quite happy. See, this morning my husband told me where to separate. No, I'm very sorry, Lola. You've been very kind. That's all right. This is... Goodbye, I suppose. Yeah. 
You'll never get over Johnny Dalmas. Goodbye, Lola. If anybody ever bothers you again, let me know, huh? Name's Marlowe. Philip Marlowe. I'll remember. Philip Marlowe. I drove almost to Malibu. And then I parked. And then I walked way out on a rock cliff jutting into the Pacific Ocean. And then I reached into my pocket and dug out the string of bohemian glass pearls that Lieutenant Ibarra had found in Waldo's car. <laughs> I cut the knot at one end and slipped the pearls off one by one. One by one, I flipped them into the water. Should have seen the gulls swoop down on them. And then they flapped up again, screaming indignantly. Phony pearls. They'd fooled Waldo and Lola Barsley. But they couldn't fool a seagull. I said aloud, To the memory of Johnny Delmas, just another four-flusher. I listened a while to the wheeling seagulls. All at once, I realized that the wind had died. The Santa Ana had blown itself out. The red wind was done. It was over. It was cool again. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. In tonight's story, Red Wind, Lola was played by Peggy Weber and Barry Kroger was Baldy. Joan Banks played Eugenie Kolchenko. Jeff Corey was Lieutenant Ibarra. Parley Bear was Barsley. Lou Krugman was Waldo, and Wilms Herbert played the bartender. The special music was conceived and conducted by Ivan Dittmars. Philip Marlowe will be back in just a moment. Young man, be a Marine. Combine travel, adventure, and education at no expense to yourself. When you're a Marine, you can travel to the far places of the earth and carry on at the same time your own educational program through free Marine Corps Institute correspondence courses. You have plenty of courses to choose from, and an ideal way of studying geography or history is to take a course dealing with the background of the area in which you are stationed or any of the more than 160 Marine Corps Institute courses. Thanks to this Marine Corps Institute, thousands of Marines are making continual educational advancements during their service in the U.S. Marine Corps. That opportunity upon becoming a U.S. Marine is yours for the asking. Check with your nearest Marine Corps recruiting office tomorrow for complete information. <laughs> Next week at this same time, be sure to tune in for another adventure of Philip Marlowe when Marlowe says, I was low, very low the night I set out searching for the girl with the strange hazel eyes. The fog which hung over Los Angeles didn't help. And I felt even worse when I found her. For by then I had death on my hands. <laughs> If you like your laughs mingled with spicy music, be around tomorrow to hear the premiere of Alka-Seltzer Time, featuring Herb Schreiner and Raymond Scott's quintet. There'll be guest stars, too. Here's a show that's guaranteed to keep Monday from being blue. It's coming your way Mondays through Fridays over most of these CBS stations. 
so consult your local newspaper for the time of Alka-Seltzer time. This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's my beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's my beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. In the cold of winter, Broadway is seen through a misty chill, and it's that time again. Make the big wish, Palm Beach and the 15-day tour to sunny Cuba. Make the annual excursion to the Travel Bureau to ask prices. Then step next door again and purchase the steaming knish against the blasts of January. And the next door down, and stand under the music shop loudspeaker and listen to the record of La Cucaracha. Button up your overcoat. Walk Broadway. It's touched you, and it can never rub off. Just off Broadway, 11 o'clock in the morning time on West 39th, apartment house, and this. Languid attitude of hand against the floor, trail of blood upward to girl on bed, shot and dying. And this, the doctor bending over her. And in the living room, this, the protesting man. Oh, who, who are you calling a killer, mister? I'm no killer, I'm a mover. Mr. Barnes... You want uh, an item of furniture moved, a stick or a house load, you call me and I come with my truck and I move you. You want to kill a girl, you should call somebody else, not me, mister. Listen, why should Nobody I... Nobody called you a killer, Mr. Barnes. I'd just like to know how you happen to find this girl, that's all. Well, it, yesterday comes a call. I got a big ad in the yellow section of the phone book, a picture of my truck and all. Well, yesterday comes a call... Oh. Take your time. I've stumbled on some strange things in my line of work, Mr. L. Like the time I was moving some wine... Well, just tell me about this morning. You got a call? Uh, yesterday. All, all here on the order sheet. Pick up apartment full of furniture, this address, take it to this address. Here, right here on the paper. It's written down, so how could it not be so? It, it's written down, so how can it not be so? I'll just take that paper. Thanks. Go on. So, look under where it says special instructions, and it will prove to you that the dame who called, Helen Selby, she said her name was, she said in case nobody's home, walk in and start moving. That's the way it happened. You knocked, nobody answered, you walked in. Sure. Walked around, cased the joint. The trunks were already packed, and right over there, walked into the bedroom, looked, looked again, called the police. L look on a paper, will you? It's written down. I can't be lying to you. The time then for waiting, measured like this, Brief span of morning sun to lie against the face of a wounded girl. Gold drift of January light on throat of dying girl. Till ambulance came and the young men of the stretcher to lift her, carry her to another place, another room, suitably darkened. And time now for you to leave. Ride then through late January City, uptown and east to where river reflects late morning and shadows of men staring into it. And late morning wishes cast into its waters. And uptown into the 70s to a delivery address on a moving man's order sheet. 1212 East 78th, Brownstone House, January trees in concrete wells against its facade, lace curtains, stoop, freshly scrubbed. Yes, what is it? I'm from the police, Danny Clover. So? Uh, I'd like to talk to you. May I come in? Well, I don't know. You see, this is... Can't you tell me about it inside? Yes, yes, I, I think I can. I think it'll be all right. Please come in. The living room there. But please be careful of things and... Uh, and what? Uh, what I've been trying to tell you. This isn't really my house. And it's a very nice house. I just live here with a friend. It's his house. Whose? Leo's. Leo Pearson. Oh, I'm sure your friend won't mind, Mr. Uh... Alex. Alex Ewing. And I'm not sure that Leo won't mind. He's very careful about his nice things, and so am I, and we get along real fine together. You see, Leo is a very lonely man. Huh? Oh, yes. You see, his wife and child were killed in an automobile accident. My, it's almost a year ago. A year. And Leo was a... It was very lonely, and he asked me to come live with him, and 
Well, I did, and it's worked out just fine. Police? Why have you come here? A girl, a young woman, was having her things moved into this house this morning. A young woman? Helen Selby. The moving man found her in her bedroom. She'd been shot. She's dying. Oh. Oh. Yes, Mr. Ewing? Nothing. Just that it's such a terrible thing. To be wounded, to die. A young girl. Uh, such a terrible thing. Yes. Helen Selby, you know her? No, no. I never heard of the young woman until now. And your friend, uh, Mr. Ewing? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I wandered for an instant. Uh, that young woman, perhaps Leo knows her, but he hasn't said anything to me about it. She was going to move in here? Yes. Where is Leo? Well, I don't know. He went out early this morning. He didn't say where. He said to take care of things, Alex. And I scrubbed the stoop and did other little things around. And well, I made lunch. And Kate, shall I tell him you want to talk to him when he comes home? Yes. I'll do that. I'll tell him first thing. Well, let me show you to the door, Mr. Clover. Danny? Hmm? Come on in, Muggerman. i got a few things here. Uh, items on the girl. Uh, yeah, here. The name's Helen Selby, all right. Went through a packed stuff, found this driver's license from California. Thumbprint on a check for the girl's okay. What else? Uh, 23 years old. Let's see. Um, yeah. Yeah, what? Oh, take it easy for a minute, will you? I'm trying to figure out my own notes. Uh, here, she's uh, employed as a secretary at the Sun Up to Sundown Trucking Company. <laughs> Son of the sundown. Great, huh? Where's it located? Uh, downtown, Danny. Perry Street. I got the address here. Somewhere. Do me a favor, Morgan. Sure. Give me the address. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And the Sun Up to Sundown Trucking Company is easily found. It stands out from the rest of Perry Street because the grime of its brick facades is emblazoned with yellow painted suns. Sun ascending, sun descending. And the entire miracle powered by great stake trucks and the demigod at the reins of the cab wearing the billboard grin and a winged helmet. And inside, the golden girl, marked receptionist, sunflower behind beat-up desk, who slides out from behind it, the better for you to receive the impact of her slim stalks. Also happens to handle office personnel. Can tell you all about Helen Selby. Hired in December for the winter rush. Clerk typist, 5750 per. Here a week and a half when glommed onto a driver, Chris Miller... Other personnel, it has taken as long as five weeks to glom onto Chris Boy. And if you're fast on your stems, boy chick, you might catch Chris by the loading platform, truck number 367. Right through there. And if it's no burden, mention to Chris, reception was inquiring after his health. And slim finger on a buzzer, and a door is released. A corridor, then loading platform, and truck 367, and the man standing beside it. You, Chris Miller? Uh, some other time. I felt I got a schedule eating on me. Here. Police, Chris, look. Uh, you, you'll explain up front after how you file the schedule up, huh? I was told you know Helen Selby. You got all sizes blabbermouth here on you. You know her? Oh, you want to know her, too? I'll give you a knockdown. State your qualifications. Your girlfriend's been shot. She's dying. Someone opens her mouth and spills out my name and Helen's, and right away you figure I did that to her. To Helen, with... Gun and pistol. Did you? I don't know her long enough to get that excited about her. That kind of emotion in me, she hasn't had a chance to stir up yet. You'll tell me about it, Chris. About the emotions between you and Helen, I mean. Helen uh, dying? Yeah. Where? Police emergency hospital. Well, I get a chance from the schedule. I'll check her there. Right now, I got no way to make it work out. I... Here or downtown, Chris? Oof. From New Year's, she came out here for something, the platform. Happened to let a, a remark drop. There was a whole new year ahead of her with nothing in it but her so far. I happened to remark how come tan on her face, on her arms. She said from California. Well, I heard from California could be a blast, so <laughs> I invite her. That was New Year's. After that, a few bars and a few movies, a couple of dances, records in her apartment. That's all. Helen and me, me and Helen, our match. Well, look, yeah, I know, a uh, schedule. Danny. 
Uh, don't apologize for being late, Dan. I got here as soon as I got your message, Dr. Sinsky. Too late, huh? Helen Selby died 15 minutes ago. It wouldn't have mattered what time you got here. She never regained consciousness. Well, that's as good comment as any. Me, a doctor with 30 years in hospitals like this, I never thought of a better comment. Well, sums it up. Oh, uh, Danny. Uh-huh. A man came into a room a few minutes ago. He said his name was Leo Pearson. Said he was a relative. I let him stay. Leo Pearson? That's right. I've been at his house. I've been looking for him. Thanks, doctor. Mr. Pearson? Mr. Pearson? She's dead. I want to... Uh, so soon I found her. I lost her. My niece, dear Helen, I, I'm sorry, my dear. So sorry. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Truly a leader in its field, your Sunday night playhouse has, for years, made a specialty of historical dramas and literary adaptations. Every week, Lionel Barrymore is your narrator and host. Tomorrow night, again, on most of these same stations, enjoy your Sunday night playhouse, presented by CBS Radio. Morning sunlight strays through January wind, and Broadway robs minutes from the time clock to stop running, to stand still for the splatter of warmth, crowd clusters in sun pools, and for the latecomers, room only on the fringes of warmth, the chill place, the shadow place, where a vendor stood last night and hawked his night merchandise, and sold out before you got there, late for that, too, so move on, smile the secret smile, nibble on the bone. At office, on worksheet, there will be a demerit for the sunbathers. And for you, a pat on the cold cheek for promptness. In my office at headquarters, a man who last night had stood at the side of a dead girl, a murdered girl, who had not wept, who had sung some tuneless thing, a man of regret. She had loveliness, a gentleness also, Helen Selby. Mr. Pearson. She offered this to my house and to me, and... There could have been happiness in it. I so arranged it. You mean about her moving in with you? Mr. Clover. Yeah? You were in my house. That's right. Then you saw how I live. It's a nice house. Your friend. My friend Alex. He told me of you. You know of Alex? Well, that he's your friend, that he lives with you. That he said he knew nothing about Helen Selby. Alex, that... to me, was once a partner in coin collector business many years ago. Alex was a man without... Poise without serenity, and then because he was so, he sold to me his share of the business and squandered the money, he became a man of pity. I arranged for him a place and a home for the old and the helpless, <laughs> home for the men of pity. Then you took him out of there and brought him to your house. You know of my wife, my son, you know of this? Well, Alex told me they Killed, were... Killed, struck down in an accident, taken from me, and I... I was alone. And one day I thought... Alex, of course, Alex, and I brought him to my house. About Helen Selby, tell me about her. Of Helen? How you met her, how you got to know a young woman well enough to ask her to come live in your house. Helen is kin of my wife's blood, and I am an old gentleman. What was she to your wife? Niece to my wife, child of my wife's sister, who was in California many years. Then you knew her before she came to New York? No, no, I, I, I did not know of Helen. Her mother, my wife's sister, is dead now many years the child, we had known nothing until Helen came to me, to my house. When? Maybe a month. Helen came, said to me she is of my wife's sister, showed me old letters such as between sisters, showed me an album of pictures when she is baby. And the thing came quickly in my thoughts. What thing, Mr. Pearson? Uh, Mr. Pearson? And the laughter of youth and the touch of youth... Helen said to me once, how lonely you must be, old gentleman. (laughs) 
How quick in the eyes of youth. And you asked her to come live with you? Yes, yes, I asked her, and I said to her, with your husband, too, stay with me, Helen, this big house, for you, for... Husband? She tell me a boy she loved, a boy who wished to marry her. I, I have a big house, many empty rooms, and nice things for a girl. Now it's again death, and only death, and rooms of em. <laughs> it's not gentleman to cry before... It's not... <laughs> and after that, after the grief washed over him and broke and carried him with it to some shore of the mind, to the faraway and desolate place of lost images, after that, the small things, fold the handkerchief neatly and replace it in the breast pocket, straighten the tie, flick the lint. Neat man going out of doors where people could see him. And after he leaves, sit with it for a while and think. Helen Selby, dead girl, was going to be married, her uncle said, which didn't jibe with previous information. So call the sun up to sundown trucking company, and the solar voice on the other end tells you that Chris Miller is off today and gives you his home address warmly. So get Detective Mugovan, squad car ride, address, and Chris Miller entertains from his bed. This is going to be a real fine day, I can tell that. Not enough we got a cool radiator, I gotta have you. Get out of the bed, Chris. We want to talk to you. Uh, show me where it says I can't roll over on my side and tuck the chin on the elbow and converse. So, Mary, you gonna get different answers from me in a bathrobe? You know about Helen? Hey, how's Helen? Dead. Uh-huh. Helen. Look, Sonny, I got a confession to make. It's about the beds in the pokey. There's been some complaint Leave about him alone, I... Mark. He crying? Just leave him alone. I'm okay. Just give me a second again. Am I robe Okay. You shoot Helen, Chris? No. We found out Helen was going to get married. To you? Yeah, to me. You know a man named Leo Pearson? He killed Helen? You know him? No. Helen was going to live with him. Yeah, I, I know about that. And then you were going to move in? Yeah, later, after we got married. What were you waiting for, Sonny? I wanted to get married right away, set up housekeeping here. Not for Helen, I'm not, not good enough. She used to like fancy. She's a good kid, but uh, like fancy, you know. Sure. You know? Not quite. You tell us. Well, move in with Uncle and get to, I don't know how she put it, get the feel of the place. And then we get married, and I'd move in too. Makes sense, doesn't it? I used to tell Helen it made sense. I don't know. Telephone's ringing, Danny. May I, Danny? Oh, of course you may, Gino. Thank you kindly. Lieutenant Clover's office, Sergeant Tartagli at this end. Yes. Oh, I see. I will do that. And your address, madam? Kill me, madam. I happen never to have heard of your place, so the address, if you please. Uh Uh-huh. Thank you. I will forward your message to the proper party. No trouble at all. And you also, madam. Thank you. Danny. What, you know? Bessie Hancock. Huh? Miss Bessie Hancock of the Hancock Home for the Aged, 190th and Riverside Drive. She has read in the papers of Mr. Leo Pearson of our current murder case, and she has certain information which may or may not be important, she said. Also... Order the squad cards, you know. Of course, Danny. Goes without saying. Right uptown now, along the road that bans Manhattan from the river. Riverside Drive and chill afternoon. 190th Street. Look across the brown water to the Palisades. And make a turn at the sign of the clenched fist and pointing finger. Hancock, home for the aged. Gentle and loving care. Park the car and walk through the swinging gate. Up the path, lined by last year's grass and last rainfall's footprints. The porch, with an old gentleman on one side of the steps, an old lady on the other, rocking. Faster, stationary race between them. 
The lady who answers the door has a lorgnette pinned to one side of her blouse and a watch pinned to the other. Yes? I'm from the police. My name's Clover. Yes, won't you... Oh, just a moment, please. Uh, Still angry, Mrs. Cochran? Oh, don't be. That's Mr. Settlin's way, that's all. He wants to talk to you, don't you, Mr. Settlin? Be nice, Mr. Settlin. Uh, Please come in, Mr. Clover. Uh, This way. Thanks. Oh, you may sit down. (sighs) Was something wrong? Oh, Mrs. Cochran and Mr. Settlin. I want everybody to be happy, and they're not happy. Not with each other. Mr. Settlin plays pranks with frogs, and now he's taken to answering ads in magazines and signing Mrs. Cochran's name. Oh, such ads. Oh. It's about the phone call you made a while ago to the police. I know. You know, I wonder if I was right. About what? About having that music piped into here. I started it last week, and since then, my boarders don't use the game room so much. The checkerboards and the dominoes, they just sit and rock and listen and don't seem to be happy at all. I want everybody to be happy. Was Alex Ewing happy? Alex Ewing? Then you know why I want to talk to you. Oh, I made an assumption. I... I spoke with Leo Pearson. He told me he paid the bills for Alex in a home for the aged. Then you called. Oh, Alex was miserable. He made us all miserable. The things he would do. Oh? Get up in the middle of a meal and make speeches. How this was a prison. How he wasn't really old. How he would rather be dead than stay here. If Mr. Pearson wasn't paying me so much money to keep him here... And after Mr. Pearson's wife and son were killed, he took Alex out of here and into his own home. Yes, thank goodness. For instance, you see that big stain on the wall? Hmm? Mashed potatoes. Alex... Uh, Why exactly did you call me, Mrs. Hancock? Oh, I don't know whether it's important. Last week, Mr. Pearson came in here and made arrangements for us to take Alex back. Today was supposed to be the day, as a matter of fact. Of course I charged him more money. You can understand that. If my boarders get miserable again, I should be paid for it, surely. And I do want everybody to be happy. Mr. Clover. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Hello, Mr. Pearson. Uh, Mind if I come in? Please do. I am pleased to see you. Thank you. Would you care for some wine? Thanks, no. Is Mr. Ewing here? (laughs) Did I ask a funny question? No, no, forgive me. It is only that Alex is in the library poised over a chess problem. Therefore, he is here and he is not here. I'd like to talk to him. (laughs) We will go to him this way. Alex? Don't bother me. Go away. Go away. Castle to King 4, Queen to Bishop 4, and mate. In another minute. Perhaps Mr. Clover's in a hurry. What? Look up, Alex. Good evening, Mr. Clover. Hello, Alex. And now we will chat. Leo. Yes? Uh, We were having a very fine evening. What does Mr. Clover want? Ask him, Alex. I'm sure both of you know. It's about the murder of Helen Selby. More questions, Mr. Clover? I've told you everything. I've told you... I'm sorry, Mr. Pearson, but you haven't. I I don't understand. About Alex here. I've got nothing to do with it. Well, quiet a minute, Alex. Let's hear what Mr. Clover has to say. Very well, but I have nothing to do with any of it. What haven't I told you, Mr. Clover, about Alex? That you were going to send him back to that home for the agent. Not now, not anymore. Alex? Uh, Yes, sir. Tell me uh, about that home. I don't want to talk about it. It's all right, Alex. You're not going back there. I understand you weren't happy there, Alex. It was a prison. Why should I want to talk about it? I was there. It seemed very nice. Why why do you say it was a prison? I'm 62. I'm not old. Alex, friend. I'm not old. 
Old is when you're ready to sit in a chair and rock. Old is when no one wants you. Alex. I'm not going back there. Well, Alex, I told you you're not going back there. Now let's talk about Helen Selby. <laughs> a lovely girl. Whoever killed her, what reason could he have? I think I know, Mr. Pearson. I'm not old. She called me an old man. You said you didn't know her. Uh, know her? I talked to her once. Well, a schemer. I could tell that. When did you talk to her? She was here once, for you. I sent her away. Schemer. Something like that, what I was going to say. I think she was going to move in here. She, later her husband. And take your house over. Already she convinced you to throw me out of here, to send me back That's to... why you killed her, isn't it? I'm not an old you man. You killed her because it's on account of her you were going back to that place. Alex? Here's where I'm happy, Leo. You killed her? Yes, yes, yes. Murderer. Murderer. And what are you? An old fool. Let a young girl come in here and walk around like this and talk like this. Yes, uncle. Yes, uncle. I know how she talked. I know how she walked. I was. She was my niece. Welcome here. I wanted her here. Let her go, Alex. Like this, Leo. Like this. <laughs> like this she walks. You fool. You lonely fool. This man's taking me away, and you're going to be alone. Big house, Leo. Lots of rooms. Lots of echo, Leo. Take me away, Mr. Clover. It's a panic in neon, this Broadway, where pleasure is a packaged commodity and pain. Where bargains prevail for numbness and the fleeting smile, sometimes on installments. It's a place that dares you, and one way or another, it'll rock you to sleep. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Herb Butterfield was heard as Alex, and Lou Merrill as Leo. Featured in the cast were Gloria Gordon, High Everback, and Lamont Johnson. Bill Anders speaking. Sunday night all over America, everything stops with the laughter when it's Jack Benny time on CBS Radio. Join the gang again tomorrow night. Jack, Mary, Dennis, Don, Bob Rochester. For more of that special kind of comedy that everyone recognizes by its Jack Benny trademark. America now listens to 105 million radio sets and listens most to the CBS radio network. Theater. Brought to you in part 
by True Value Hardware, your store of first choice. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The world, it is said, has changed over the centuries, but people have not. Perhaps this is because all too often the human heart is more intent on seeking its own pleasure, satisfying its own selfish needs, than giving thought to others. But there is innocence, too, and love and selflessness. And it is the interplay of these good and evil forces that form the warp and woof of the strange and horrifying tale I bring you now. Listen. Oh, Murray, I tell you, it was Chris. I talked to him. Chris is alive. Andrea, Chris is dead. No. Whoever is buried in that grave, it isn't Chris. <laughs> mystery drama, My Sister, Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Paul Hecht and Beatrice Strait. Come with me now to a cemetery near New York City. It is late afternoon. An afternoon of gloom and drizzle and cold, damp fog. Two women, half shrouded in the fog, walk amongst headstones that rise like white bones in the gray of the afternoon. They are sisters, these two. Andrea and Sybil Carter. And they are walking toward a certain grave. Really, Andrea? It seems to me we could have skipped visiting Chris's grave today. You needn't have come if you didn't want to, Sybil. When we buried our brother two weeks ago, I vowed to visit him every day. That's what I'm doing. But you can't go on doing this the rest of your life. Even Murray has asked you to be reasonable about it. Yes, come once a week, he says, or once a month. Well, you know what that would lead to. Coming not at all. No. I love Chris more than anyone else in the world, and I'm... Who's that? What? Someone... A man standing beside Chris's grave. And just make him out in the fog. I don't see... Oh, yes. A man standing with his head bent as, as if he were praying. Shh. He's raising his head. He's turning towards us. He... Sybil. Oh, Sybil, my God. My God, it's Chris. Oh, Andrea, don't be silly. It couldn't possibly it be. Is. Andrea! Oh, Murray, come in. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't come the minute I got your call, Sybil. Oh, that's all right, Murray. I know how busy your law practice keeps you. <laughs> your estate, you mean, yours and Andrea's. Chris's death has raised all sorts of tax problems. I'm afraid his death has raised more problems than that. Yeah? Yeah, what is this all about? I told you on the phone. You didn't really tell me what I thought I heard. Andrea is convinced she saw Chris. Saw him today in the cemetery, standing beside his own grave. Oh, come on, Sybil. What kind of nonsense is... Murray, please. I'm telling you the truth. Where is Andrea? In her bedroom, sleeping. Dr. Swanson gave her a strong sedative. Murray, she was in such a state, so hysterical. Look, let me get this straight. You and she went to Chris's grave this afternoon? Yes, we were walking toward the grave when we noticed a man standing beside it. And there was a man? Oh, yes. I saw him, too. He was standing beside the grave with his head bent, as if he was saying a prayer or meditating or something. I had just said I wondered who he could be when he raised his head and turned towards us. Huh. That was when Andrea started to scream, It's Chris! It's Chris! And then she just fainted. Went out cold. Who was the man? I don't know. Well, what do you mean you don't know? You didn't see his face? You didn't talk to him? It was a foggy day, Murray. It's been foggy all day, and out there at the cemetery, it was very foggy. I could barely see his face. 
And so, if it comes to that, neither could Andrea. Well, this is the strangest thing I've ever... Tell me, has Andrea had any other brainstorms like this one? Well, has she? Well, Murray, I... Now, look, sweetie, I'm your attorney, yours and Andrea's. If something not quite right is happening, you can tell me. In fact, you'd better tell me. Oh, Murray, you're more than just our lawyer, you know that. It's no secret that Andrea's in love with you and... <laughs> And that I am, too. And that I'm in love with both of you and can't make up my mind between you. But what has that to do with it? Oh, she'll pull herself together sooner or later and straighten out. Chris's death was a terrible blow to her, that's all. It was a blow to you, too, wasn't it? More than a blow, Murray. A puzzle. I still can't figure out how he could have fallen over a railing nearly chest high. Eighteen stories to the street below. Frankly, I keep wondering about that, too. But about Andrea now... Murray, the truth is she's been acting very strangely. What do you mean, strangely? Well, imagining things. Like Chris this afternoon and... Well, a few days we went shopping downtown. And I took the Bentley. When we went back to the parking lot to get it, Andrea looked shocked when the attendant brought it around. Why shocked? Well, she swore up and down that we'd driven into town in the Jaguar. <laughs> That's crazy. Murray, please don't say that. Don't even use that word. Something even stranger happened last night. What? Well, we'd had dinner here in the apartment. And Andrea said she was going to walk down to the corner to mail a letter and get a breath of fresh air. I stayed at the table having another cup of coffee. Well, when she came back from mailing the letter... You couldn't have gotten much fresh air in that short a time. Fresh air? What are you talking about? What is all this? What's all what? Well, the table. The food, the dirty dishes. What do you think it is? I'm asking you. What is this? Oh, it's what's usually left after two people have had dinner. What two people? Oh, Andrea, come on now. Will you answer me? What do you want me to say? We had dinner. You went out to mail a letter and get a breath of... Andrea, what's the matter? We did not have dinner here. We didn't? We had it at Delahanty's. See, just like we used the Jag instead of the Bentley the other day. Now, what kind of a crack is that? No crack, Andrea, no crack. All I'm saying is you're imagining things again. And... I did not imagine the Jaguar. I am not imagining this. You and I had dinner at Del Delahanty's, not here. In that case, Andrea, where have you just come from? Come from? You went out to mail a letter and get a breath of fresh air, you said. You just came back. You just now walked through the door. If that doesn't prove... You're forgetting the earring. Earring? What earring? Here, look. You can see for yourself I've only got one earring on. Well, you must have dropped it when you... That's exactly what I said less than 15 minutes ago. When we got home from Delahanty's and we're getting out of the car, I said, Sib, I've lost an earring. One that's from that jade pair that Murray gave me for my birthday. I said I wanted to search the car. And that's what I've been doing. I haven't been out mailing any letters. I've been searching in the car for that jade earring. Damn it, Sybil. Don't look at me as if I've lost my senses. You know, I'm beginning to be afraid you have. I tell you, if Sybil. If we had dinner... At Delahanty's. What is all this food and these plates and everything else doing on this table? I don't know. Well, darling, I do. We had dinner here. No. I'm, I, I'm certain we couldn't have. What are you going to do? I'm going to call Del Delahanty. He saw us there tonight. He came over to our table and chatted with us. We'll soon see whether we dined there or we didn't. Andrea, dear, please. You're simply going to embarrass yourself. Della Harris. Oh, Dell, is that you? Yes, who's this? Andrea Carter, Dell. Nice to hear from you, Miss Carter. Calling for a reservation? What? Oh, we're pretty full up, Miss Carter, but I'm sure I can arrange something. If Del. You... Yeah? Del, uh, my sister and I. Didn't we have dinner at your place tonight? You put me on, Miss Carter. We didn't dine there tonight? We 
if you did, I didn't see you. Thank you, Dell. He says... We weren't there tonight. Darling, we weren't. Then I... Did imagine it all? Afraid you did, yes. But it was all so real. Sybil. Sybil, I'm going out of my mind. And I had a real rough time with her then, too. Believe me, Murray. She was simply beside herself. Yeah. A jaguar, this business of Delahanty's, and now today, imagining she saw Chris at his own grave. Murray, you don't think she's... Well, you know. I don't know. Grief hits some people like a sledgehammer, belts them so hard they never recover. Trouble is... Yes? Trouble is... <laughs> Andrea isn't that kind of people. Mr. Redman. Hello, Dal. Nice to have a future New York DA at my bar again. <laughs> That'll be the day <laughs> that I make a district attorney, I mean. Uh, me? I'd bet on it. Drink okay? Perfect. Long time no see. You've been busy, I guess, eh? Uh, very. You too. I see Della Handy's is just as crowded as ever. I got no complaints. Carriage trade mostly. People that wouldn't go anywhere else but Della Handy's to dine and dance or just have a drink at a bar. Or gamble. How is that? Gambling does go on in the back room, doesn't it? Where'd you get an idea like that, Mr. Redmond? Oh, I have ways. If I'm going to help you win your bet and become DA someday, I got to keep on top of things, wouldn't you say, Dan? Yeah. Well, nice having you with us again, Mr. Redmond. Hope to see more of you. Yeah. Um, before you go, Dell. Yeah? A friend of mine, a lady friend, mentioned she thought she'd lost an earring here one night. An earring? Yeah, a jade earring. Would you know something about it, maybe? No, but we keep a lost and found box right behind the bar. Eddie, uh, give me the lost and found box, will you? It was lost here, Mr. Redmond, and we picked it up. It's sure to be. Well, thanks, Eddie. There we are. I see. Gold cigarette lighter. <laughs> Look at them rings of dames. Leave them in a the powder room. Money clip. Oh, here. Huh. An earring. This what you're looking for, Mr. Redmond? Yeah. Yeah, this is exactly what I'm looking for, Dell. <laughs> well, hey, I'd, I'd look on your face. You look like you found a lot more than an earring. I have, Dell. I have. Murray Redman has indeed found more than just Andrea Carter's earring. He has also found that she didn't imagine dining at Delahanty. Nor then, in all likelihood, did she imagine driving into town in the Jaguar. The Jaguar, which unaccountably turned into a Bentley. But as for imagining or not imagining her dead brother standing beside his own grave, well, we'll get closer to the answer to that when I return in a few moments with Act Two. told that the proper study of man is man. Personally, I prefer to study women. Whether I did or not, I'm sure that had I been handsome young attorney Murray Redman, unable to decide which of two wealthy sisters I wanted to marry, I'd have been absolutely intrigued by the curious circumstances which now seem to attend them. I'm not sure, however, that I'd have adopted Murray's direct approach. Sybil is either trying to drive you crazy, Andrea, or she's setting you up for commitment to a sanitarium. I can't believe this, Murray. Here's the earring to prove it. But isn't it possible that somebody else lost an earring at Delahanty's? It's a duplicate of mine. Okay, okay. It isn't. Oh, Murray, I can't believe this. What you're saying is you don't want to believe it. I don't either, but facts are facts. You and Sybil did have dinner at Delahanty's last night. She arranged things to make it look as if you dined here. And face it, Andrea, if you hadn't lost the earring and I hadn't picked it up at Delahanty's right at this minute, you'd think you were going off your rocker. And frankly, so would I. Well, it was clever of you to check for the earring at Dell's. Well, I'm a pretty smart fellow, you know. <laughs> smart enough, anyhow, to smell a rat when I come across it. 
Like this dinner business or the car nonsense or Chris standing beside his own grave. Yeah, and I might as well tell you now, Andrea, I don't believe Chris's death was accidental. Murray. No one could have fallen over that railing. Fallen off accidentally, yeah. If he'd been sitting on the railing, even taken his own life if it comes to that. No, personally, I think he was pushed. Murray, do you realize you're accusing Sybil of murder? I do. <sighs> and of trying to make it look as if I'm crazy. Yeah. Well, why? Why would she do anything like that? Do you really want me to answer that? No. I suppose not. If what you say is true, and it isn't, the answer could be that Sybil wanted to get control of all our money. And me. You? To lay it on the line, Andrea, she's in love with me. So am I. <laughs> what else is new? Well, there you have it. With you out of the way, Sybil would have, or think she'd have, a clear field. I... I just don't know what to say or do. Well, the thing to do... At least for the moment, is simply, well, simply to play along. You see, what I want is to get enough evidence against Sybil to nail the truth and her to the wall. You know, I, I'm simply dumbfounded. Oh, it can't be true, Murray. It simply can't. We all have more than one side or sides we usually conceal. Yes, I know. I, but, oh. What's the matter, Andrea? What is it? That painting on the wall there. Yeah, what about it? Well, you've seen it before. Look at it. I'm looking at it. So what? Three children playing on a lawn. There were always four. Four? Four kids? I mean, are you sure? Well, I'm positive. There were two boys and two girls, and now there are two girls, but only one boy. Murray, this isn't another of Sybil's... Well, we'll uh... soon find out. Let's just have a close look at the painting. Well? No. No, I don't see... Wait a minute. Sure. Oh, man, what a skillful job. Skillful? Yeah, of painting out the figure of the second boy. Here, here, see for yourself. <laughs> You'd never know that figure had been painted out if you didn't look closely, very closely. <gasps> you, you see? Well, yes. My God, it is true, then, that Sybil is... I'm afraid so, Andrea. However you look at it, Sybil is guilty. Guilty as sin. All I've got to do is prove it. You get the hell out of my office, Redmond, or I'll throw you out. Cool it, Dell. Just cool it. Cool it? You come in here and call me crooked, accuse me of pulling some kind of fraud, and then tell me to cool it? All right, let's say I advise you to cool it. Look at this. The earring you picked up here last night... What about it? It belongs to Andrea Carter. It's one of a pair I gave her. She lost it out there in the restaurant while she was having dinner with her sister. The dinner you said never took place. I said? Andrea phoned you last night to ask if she and Sybil had dinner here. You said they hadn't. You lied, Dell. Now, why did you lie, huh? Okay. Okay, so I played a little joke. Somehow it doesn't strike me so funny. I'll tell you what does, though. Why you and Sybil Carter teamed up to play this little, uh, joke on Andrea. Teamed up? Me and Sybil Carter? What else? Look, Dell, take a lawyer's advice. Open up. Spill everything. And do it now. Copper plea? Like that? Something like that. Chris. Chris Carter. The brother. Yeah. He was into me for over 12 grand. He gambled like it was going out of style and always lost. Go on. So he falls off the terrace of their apartment and gets killed. Mm -hmm. I'm out 12 grand. I call up the Carters and I get the Sybil dame on the phone. I tell her how I'm out a dozen big ones and she tells me to drop dead. Oh. But the next day, she shows up here and says she'll pay the dough if I'll help her play a... A little joke on her sister. Pretty expensive joke, wouldn't you say? I didn't say anything. If she's willing to get me off the pad for 12 grand, I'm willing to help her play her joke. So where's the harm in that? Who gets hurt? Worse than hurt, Dell. Somebody could get dead. Real dead. Dell, 
Dell broke down and told her the whole story. Just like that. It surprised even me. I guess he's not as tough as he looks. More acts. Fact is, though, that uh, that earring of yours stopped him cold. I had him dead to rights, and he knew it. Murray. Yeah? I want to face Sybil with this. Face her right now. Uh Uh-uh. She's bound to try another trick, and probably soon. Mm -hmm. And that could be the one that hangs her. If it weren't for you. Oh, Murray. (laughs) I'd be out of my mind. I'd be stark raving mad this minute. No, you wouldn't. No, you're too level-headed for that. (sighs) Well, forewarned is forearmed. You know what Sybil's up to? We both do. So she can't win, Andrea. Murray, when this is over, let's get married. I couldn't make up my mind which one of you I wanted for a wife, but I guess I can now. Andrea, I definitely can now. Yeah. Oh, of course, Marcia. Send her in. Oh, come in, Sybil. Come in. I know I'm interrupting you. It's something important. <laughs> you are, but you're worth it. Here, sit down. Thank you. How's Andrea? She's my reason for being here, Murray. Well, what do you want to tell me? Murray, I'm worried about Andrea. Terribly worried. You mean her nervous attacks? Well, they're more than that, I'm afraid. What you call nervous attacks seem more like delusions to me. I'm beginning to think that she is on the verge of insanity. Has something else happened? Yes. There's a picture on the wall of the living room. A painting of three children playing on a lawn. Yeah? Andrea swears that there were four children in the picture, not just three. Or were there? Four children in the picture, I mean. Well, of course not. There were always three? Well, yes. You don't sound too sure. What I'm trying to say is... Well, I couldn't swear in a court of law that there were always three children in the painting... Well, you know how we look at things after a while without really seeing them. What I am saying is that if there are three children in the painting now, then there must have always been three, not four. Makes sense. Which Andrea's saying that there were four doesn't. Hmm. That, combined with everything else that's happened since Chris died, has got me worried. It's something to worry about. So what I came to ask you, do you think I ought to get her to consult a psychiatrist? Might be a good idea. Would there be any danger in it? Danger? Well, I mean, if she went to a psychiatrist and he discovered that she was... seriously ill. I mean, really insane. Would she be committed or something like that? Well, it depends. On what? First of all, whether she was dangerous to herself, others. If he felt that she was, he'd certainly recommend placing her in a sanitarium where she could be cared for and perhaps, in time, cured. If that was to happen, if he made that decision, you'd have to sign papers of commitment. Oh. Would you? I don't suppose I'd have any choice, would I? Oh, there's always a choice. Another thing. If anything like that were to happen, what about the estate? Uh, You know as well as I do, Sybil, that you'd be in complete control. Well, no, I didn't know. Your father's will divided his fortune equally among the three of you. You, Andrea, Chris. You and Andrea came into Chris's share when he died several weeks ago. If you signed papers certifying Andrea as insane, she would be declared incompetent to handle her affairs and, as next of kin, you'd take over for her. You didn't know that? As I said, I... I don't know much, if anything, about these things. That's why I came to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now you know... Oh, uh, sorry, excuse me, Sybil. Uh, yes, Marcia. Oh, yeah, put it through. Murray! Murray! Come quickly, please! Andrea, what is it? Murray, we're wrong. All wrong. It isn't Sybil. She's not playing tricks. Murray! I am going out of my mind. What happened? Andrea, where are you? Okay, I'm on my way. Andrea, you've got to get control of yourself. What is it, dear? What happened? 
I went to the cemetery to, to visit Chris's grave. Yeah, yeah, I know that. And a man... A man was standing beside the grave like the other day, Sybil. Yes, dear, yes. And like the other day... As I walked towards the grave, he lifted his head and looked straight at me. It was Chris. Honey, the man we saw the other day wasn't Chris. And neither was this one. It was Chris. The way you sound, it... You sound as if you actually believe... I do that... believe it was Chris. He talked to me. He what? He said... As I came towards him, he held out his arms to me and he said... He said... Hi, sis. Thanks for coming. And it was his voice? His voice. His face. Oh, Murray, I tell you, it was Chris. It was Chris to the life. <laughs> Well, if you're shocked, think how shocked Murray Redman must have been. His entire theory that Sybil is trying to have Andrea committed out the window, just like that. On the other hand, Chris couldn't be standing by his own grave. Could he? Perhaps we'll find out when I return shortly with Act Three. It is almost axiomatic that at those moments in life when we are absolutely sure we are right, something happens that shocks us with the knowledge that we are absolutely wrong. Assuredly, that is what has just happened to Andrea Carter and Murray Redmond. Convinced that beyond a shadow of a doubt, Andrea's sister Sybil is trying to set her up for commitment to an asylum, they are stunned to realize that this may not be the case at all. But, Andrea, what you're saying is impossible. It couldn't have happened. Oh, I tell you, it did, it did, it did, it Murray, did. I'm going to phone Dr. Swanson. Okay. I'm sure you'll come right over. Come on, Andrea, what is the meaning of this? What? Chris is dead. You couldn't have met him at the grave. You couldn't have talked to him. Murray, Murray, please believe me. It happened. It was Chris. It's incredible, inconceivable. You say you talked with him? What did you talk about? What did you say? He said, Hi, sis, thanks for coming. And you? For a few minutes, I couldn't say anything. All I could do was just stare at him. And he looked at me and he said, Trust me, sis. I'll explain everything in time. I just wanted you to know that I'm alive. And then what happened? And then he said he was going to leave me then, but that I'd see him again soon, and he kissed me on the cheek. Kissed you? Yes. Then he began to walk away, and I started after him, but he turned, and then he said, No, no, don't follow me. You'll understand in time. And I, I let him go. I let him walk out of my life again. I can't believe any of this. I can't believe it either, but it happened. Oh, Murray, what does it mean? This can't be one of Sybil's tricks. The man I talked to was my brother. I don't know who we buried in that grave, but it couldn't have been Chris. It was. It couldn't. I was there. I was there when they closed the casket. I was one of the pallbearers. Oh, Dr. Swanson's on his way over. How are you feeling, Andrea? Uh, uh, I'll be all right. Would you like a drink now? Oh, yes. I could use one, Sybil. Murray? Yeah, yeah, I could too. Uh, double, please. Murray. Chris can't be alive, and yet... Murray, we are going to have to open the casket. Oh, no. Sybil's right. Oh, no. I've got a court order this afternoon. Don't look so horrified, Andrea. You don't have to be there. Oh, but yes, I do. Oh, Andrea, why? Because I know what you're thinking. Both of you now. You're thinking I'm out of my mind. I don't. You must. What I've told you is crazy. But I want to be there when you open that grave and see for yourself the proof that I'm sane. Or... Or what, dear? Mad! Stark mad! <laughs> All right, gently, boys. Gently. Open up now, Mr. Redmond. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I can't look. Uh, that's all right, Sybil. 
Uh, look, why don't you just go, go over there under the trees? You don't have to look either, Andrea. I must. I must. Stay there, Sybil. Sybil, don't come here. Don't look. It's not Marjorie. It's not Marjorie. All right, close it up, boys. Close it up. Come on. Come on. Who's in it? Yes, yes, it's Chris. <laughs> and for the last time, Andrea, I do not think you're crazy. You're as sane as I am. Then, my meeting with Chris and talking to him, it was a trick. Yes. But... How could it have been done? How could Sybil have managed it? I don't know. Now, you said that Sybil is clever. I'd say she's diabolically clever. Uh, Andrea, I brought this along. I I want you to take it, and I want you to keep it near you. A gun? Uh, yeah. Murray, I, I'm scared to death of guns. I, I, I couldn't even touch that now, thing. Now, listen to me. There's no question in my mind now that Chris's death was not accidental. Sybil... He was pushed off that terrace out there. I'm sure of it. I'm equally sure that Sybil may try to kill you. Oh, no. It's a possibility. Oh. Her plan to have you committed is not working out, not as fast as she'd like to. I'm trying to stay just one jump ahead of her. It seems to me she just might try to kill you and make it look like an accident. Like with Chris? Yes. So here, take it. Oh, but Take I... it. And keep it near you at all times. You understand? At all times. Oh, sorry, Andrea. I hope I didn't wake you. No. Just resting, Sybil. You want something? Well, yes. I thought we might talk. About what? Andrea, I've been doing a lot of thinking about this. About you... And I think you ought to see a psychiatrist. Oh. So does Murray. Anyhow, he doesn't think it would be a bad idea. You've discussed it with Murray, have yeah. you? I love you. Murray loves you. It was only natural I should go to him for advice. You are lying, and you know it. What are you talking about? You are either trying to drive me out of my mind or trying to make it look as if I am so that you can have me committed. Andrea! Everything that's happened to me since Chris's death, which was no accident, Sybil, you killed him. I... Everything that's happened since then. Every strange, incredible thing. That business with the cars, the dinner bit, the painting with only three children in it instead of four. Oh, yes. And even my meeting with Chris... Chris, in the flesh, I don't know how you manage that. But it's all been arranged. Every single thing arranged by you. Why should I do such things to, to you? To get control of the money that we share jointly. To get Murray for your husband. You are out of your mind. To think that I would do anything so vicious, so depraved. Yes, vicious and depraved. You. <laughs> and when I realized it. When I could no longer hide it from myself and had to face it. That my sister, the sister I loved devotedly, had murdered our brother, Andrea, and was now tricking me into thinking I was going out of my head. When I realized that, Sybil, I didn't want to live anymore. I wanted to die. Oh, Andrea, I wanted dear. to die. <laughs> what are you doing? Murray gave me this gun to protect myself with against you. I told him I was scared of guns. I'm afraid even to touch them. <laughs> but I didn't tell him why. I didn't tell him I was afraid I'd use it on myself. Oh, no, I, no. I, I, I can't go on living, Sybil. <laughs> All that meant anything to me is gone. Chris is dead. You've turned on me. You want me dead and out of the way so that you could have the money and Murray... Right then, you shall have what you want now. Give me that gun. Give me your bicycle. Give it. Your bike. Give it. Give it. Give it. Oh. Sybil. Sybil. Murray? This is Andrea. Yes, Andrea. Murray? I've just...
killed Sybil. Shall we go now, Andrea? Andrea, dear, the, the, the funeral's over. So is my life. They're both down there now. <laughs> side by side. Under the ground. Chris and Sybil. Come on. It's cold. You're shivering. Come on now. All right. <laughs> I never thought when I bowed to visit Chris's grave every day. I never thought that in a few short weeks we'd be visiting Sip. What's the matter? Why have you stopped? Someone coming towards us on the path. Look, they're under the trees. What? God, it looks like... It looks like... Sybil! You're imagining things. No, no, look, it's a woman. You can see her clearly now. Sybil's clothes, the blue suit that she wore. It's a Sybil's hat. Murray! It is! It can't be, but it is Sybil. <gasps> Why, Andrea? What are you doing here? What are you doing here? I came to visit Chris. Murray! Easy, Andrea. Sorry. Oh, dear, there's no one here but us. You're imagining things. No, 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 no. Sybil? Sybil, it is you, isn't it? Of course. But you're dead. You're dead. Dead? I'm very much alive, as you can see. I killed you. Shot you to death. My God. We just... Buried you. Come on now, Andrea. I want you home. I'll get you a sedative. She's there, I tell you. I don't see anyone. I do, I do. Heaven help me. I'm mad. I'm out of my mind. Oh, Murray, Murray. Help me. I've done a terrible thing and I'm being punished. But you've got to help me. Save me. Terrible thing? What terrible thing, Andrea? I killed Sybil deliberately. I m murdered her, Murray. I murdered her. It's just as I murdered Chris. You? I pushed him off the terrace to his death. I shot Sybil to make it look like an accident. Oh, I knew if I pointed the gun at my head, she'd try to take it away from me. The tricks and all that happened... Sybil wasn't playing the tricks. I was. You, Andrea? You played those tricks? You hear, Murray? You hear? I'm listening, Andrea. No, no. You heard Sybil. Sybil. There is no Sybil oh, here. Forgive me, Chris. Forgive me, Sybil. Forgive me. Of course. But why did you do all this? <laughs> to make it look as if you were trying to get me out of the way. When all the time I was planning to do away with you. <laughs> it was all a trick. It was nothing but a trick. Yes, a trick that backfired, I'm afraid. <laughs> backfired on you, Andrea. What, what? You heard me correctly. You've been fooled. <laughs> fooled by your own trick. I don't understand. I don't... Un Tell her, Sybil. She... She is standing there. Yes, Andrea. <laughs> I am. And very much alive. What? How? Huh? Oh, Murray. You tell her. I can't. Andrea, you went too far. You overreached yourself. Your story about meeting Chris clinched things for me. Oh. It was impossible. Either you had to be insane, and I knew you weren't, or you had to be lying. And that was when I decided to force your hand and <laughs> use a few tricks of my own. Oh, what about the gun you gave me? It contained what? blanks. Oh. I took Sybil into my confidence. I had to, and <laughs> she played her part very well. 
I'm sorry, Andrea. But you did bring it on yourself. Yes. Yes, I did. <laughs> All right, Andrea. Let's go. No. What? I don't want to go home with you. I'm too ashamed. Please. I don't want to go home. We're not going home, Andrea. We're going to the police. As I said at the outset, the world changes, but people do not. There are those who believe this planet we inhabit is a school. A school where we are sent by God, by providence, what you will, to learn to be better. Experience, of course, is the teacher. A harsh teacher, but an effective one. I think you'll want to know that Sybil Carter is now Mrs. Murray Redmond, and they are very happily married. Andrea is living quietly and comfortably in a sanitarium. For as it turned out, strangely enough, this woman who pretended that her sister was trying to drive her mad really was. Our cast included Beatrice Strait, Paul Hecht, Marion Seldes, and George Petrie. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Time. Time now for the best in mystery. Tonight, Mystery Classic stars Mason Adams in The White Curtain. Good evening. This is your host for Mystery Time, Don Dowd. Tonight's Mystery Time reaches into the files of the world's finest stories to bring you a mystery classic. This is a highly suspenseful story of two strong-willed men and a beautiful woman thrown together by the forces of nature on a rampage. Listen now as Mystery Classics presents the chilling drama, The White Curtain. From May to November... Mount Frosty, the highest peak of the Yellow Mountain Range, is alive with tourists. They drive up the winding auto road in station wagon taxis from the coach house at the base, or they make their way up the trails on foot. The weatherman on summer duty gets plenty of company, all he wants. It's only when my stint begins in September that it gets lonely up there. And it stays that way for eight everlasting months. Nobody comes up anymore, nobody at all. In loneliness like that, a man's dreams take on a peculiar substance and dimension. Often it's hard to tell where a dream leaves off and reality begins. There was that afternoon towards the end of November. I was sitting in my cabin just staring into the grate of the electric heater. I fell asleep and I began to dream about a beautiful woman. She was tall and slim... She had a feminine grace that made every motion of hers a figure in a dance. Her hair was black, black as night, with shining lights reflected from its waves. 
Her eyes were blue, no, purple. The hazy purple of the far horizon. And her skin deep under the outdoor tan was fair and smooth. Her voice was low, husky. And her mouth, her knowing, eager mouth was soft and yielding. Suddenly, a knock at the door brought me back to reality. Hey, open up in there. Open up. Uh, uh, just, just a minute. Oh. Are you deaf what? or something? I've been knocking for five minutes. What, what do you want? You mind if we come in and warm up? It's cold out here. What are you doing here? Didn't you see the sign at the foot of the road? The mountain is closed to tourists for the winter. We came up one of the trails, stopped at the Devil's Cauldron, and then came on up to the top. If we could just rest a bit before we start down again... Oh, uh, this is my wife, Zoe. Your wife? Won't you come in? It was the girl I'd been dreaming about. Only her hair was different. It wasn't black at all, but a sort of honey brown. Oh, I'm a walking icicle. You must be exhausted. Sit down over there in front of the heater. That'll warm you up. Must be way below freezing up here on the peak. It's ten above zero right now and getting colder. Getting colder? You hear that, Zoe? We'd better get the chill out and then start right down again. Yes, I suppose so, Melvin. No. Although... No, you can't go. It's a four-hour trip going down this mountain. You won't make it before dark. Well, we'll take the auto road down. I have a flashlight in my haversack. No, I'm sorry. I can't allow you to go. <laughs> Come now, old man. You're not going to tell us what we can or can't do. But it's... It's dangerous. It's very dangerous. I suggest that you stay over. I've got plenty of room. You can start out in the morning, go down by daylight. Melvin, oh, listen, I'm tired. Why shouldn't we stay over? Well, that is if Mr... Parker, Fred Parker. But if Mr. Parker does have room for us... Oh, I have plenty of room. There are two bedrooms with a bunk in each of them. You two can have the bunks. I'll sleep out here on the couch. Please, Melvin, I, I think we should. Well, all right. Thanks a lot. Don't thank me. You're doing me the favor. Having company is something I can only dream about, ordinarily. I suppose it does get awfully lonesome up here, doesn't it? Yes, at times it does. Oh, by the way, I'm Zoe Colby, Mr. Parker, and this is my husband, Melvin Colby. Glad to know you. How do you do? You you just get your things off and I'll get supper started. You must be plenty hungry after that climb up the trail. Oh, maybe a little. Made it up in six hours, though. That isn't bad time. Oh, that's pretty good. Say, how come they didn't tell you at the coach house that the mountain was closed to visitors? We weren't staying at the coach house. We're on an auto trip cross country. Parked the car at the foot of the East Trail early this morning and came right on up. Isn't this an unusual time of year for a vacation? Oh, I'm not on a vacation exactly. Sold out my business four months ago and Zoe and I have been traveling ever since. Footloose and fancy free. No strings to hold us anyplace. No relatives to worry about. When we find some place we really like, we'll settle down. That's nice. Do you really spend the whole winter up here alone, Mr. Parker? That's right. Oh, I, I do get some visitors in May and June. Otherwise, it's eight months of solitary. Oh. But I get July and August off. I guess it gets pretty cold up here in December and January. Cold starts in November. The mercury can go down to 30 or 40 below overnight. <laughs> Just thinking about it makes me sure. Uh, how about a drink, Parker? Sorry, I don't have anything. Government regulations. I have a bottle in my haversack. You see, I'm prepared for all emergencies. Just let me open this. A pair of socks, sweater, knife, can of beans, can of meat, pistol. Here. Quart of the best. You'll have one, won't you? I don't mind if I do. Zoe? No, thanks. Here, here's a couple of glasses. Okay. Hey, if that's for me, that's enough. Really? <laughs> well, there you are. Thank you. No. Looks like pretty good stuff. It is the best. Well, here's how. Yeah. Uh, well, we kill that in a hurry. How about another? Uh, no, thanks. Well, uh, I'll have a little more. That just hit the spot. Oh, Melvin, please. Now lay off, Zoe. I can handle it. Uh, excuse me, folks, for a few minutes. I've got to go out and read the instruments. Well, uh, make sure you order some decent weather for tomorrow. I went out to the weather shed, made my entries in the log, and came back. I'd only been gone a few minutes, but Melvin was bent over the table with his head on his arms. I thought he was drunk. Zoe was at the window, staring moodily out at the gathering dusk. I went to the phone. Hello, McGuire. Uh, five o'clock reading. Temperature, dry bulb zero, wet bulb minus two. Relative humidity, 92%. Yeah. 
Partly cloudy, four tenths alto stratus. The wind, northwest 39 miles per hour. Barometric pressure at the station, uh, yeah, 600 millibars. Yeah, it looks that way. Right, that's all for tonight. So long, McGuire. Well, that's done. How about some food? I'm afraid I owe you an apology. My husband's fallen asleep. The warmth and the liquor were too much for him. You don't owe me any apologies, Zoe. We'll let him sleep. Maybe it's a good thing all around. Zoe helped me get Melvin into a bunk. Then we had our supper. There wasn't much said during the meal, but afterwards it was snug and cozy sitting in the easy chairs. And when I noticed the first of the snowflakes flying against the double windows, I had to hide a smile. Now there wouldn't be any talk of going down in the morning. With luck, I could count on Zoe's being with me for a long time. Zoe and Melvin, too, of course. The next morning, I just finished phoning in my 8 o'clock report when Melvin came out of his room. Hi. Sure is snowing. Yeah, it's been snowing all night. When will it stop? Oh, three days, four days, week maybe, I don't know. That's great. There's going to be no cinch going down in the snow. You'd better not try it at all. But I'm not going to wait a week, that's for sure. You're going to wait until it's clear. Now, look here, Parker. What are you trying to pull? No one ever goes down in a blizzard like this. Oh, no? Zoe, are you up? Yes, Melvin, I'm up. Good morning, everybody. Morning. I got some news, Zoe. Fred's trying to tell me we're stuck here, maybe for good. Well, I've been watching the snow from my window. It's awfully thick. Well, have some coffee and get into your coat. We're leaving in ten minutes. Yes, but if Fred says we can't do it, well, perhaps he knows what he's talking about. I don't believe him. He wants us to stay. Misery, perhaps, wants company. Look, the thermometer is down to 20 below zero out there, and the wind is over 60 miles an hour. You won't get half a mile. It's all down here. There have been 18 inches of snow. That means drifts higher than your head in places. It's suicide trying to go down now. Well, if we waited for the snow to stop, could we make it? No. You're here indefinitely. You're wrong. We're leaving. You're staying here. Please, Melvin. Maybe he's right. If you try to leave... I'll have to slug you, Colby. No kidding. Well, maybe this revolver I brought along will make you change your mind. Zoe, I beg of you not to go with him. You'll never make it. So it's Zoe, is it? Now I see why you're so anxious to keep us. Come on, Zoe, finish your coffee. Get your things and we're off. In a few minutes, they left. I watched them from the window. I could see the wind tearing at their clothes, the snow driving into their faces. Then they turned a bend in the trail and disappeared. They'd be dead in an hour unless... I got into my hobnail boots and furs and started after them. I bent over their footprints, which the snow and the wind had already begun to fill in, and I struggled into the gale. A hundred yards and I was chilled to the bone. Another hundred yards and the trail divided. One set of footprints going one way, the second another. I followed the shallower set of prints. After a few steps, they seemed to wander blindly. Fifteen minutes later, I stumbled over Zoe's snow-covered body. I swept the snow aside and bent close to her pale white face. She was still breathing. I lifted her to my shoulder and I clawed and fought my way back up the mountain. Oh, you found her. Yes, I found her. You found your way back here, too. Here, let me Don't you touch her. I'll take care of her. Is she all right? She will be. I'll get her under some blankets. Oh, it was terrible out there. Terrible. I never realized... put Zoe into a bunk, covered her with blankets and let her sleep. When I came into the main room, Colby was nursing a drink. Well? 
I suppose I ought to tell you how grateful, grateful. I am. Grateful? You're not grateful. You hate me for what I did. What? What are you talking about? Why should I hate you for saving my wife's life? I know how a man's mind works. I do lots of reading up here. You left her out there to die. By bringing her back, I showed you up for the coward you are. That's why you hate me. That is sheer, stupid, utter nonsense. I didn't want her to die. But still, you wish I hadn't saved her. And you know why? Because you realize she isn't yours anymore. You abandoned her and I brought her back. I've got a greater right to her than you have now. What kind of crazy logic is that? It's like... It's like the law of salvage. She belongs to the one who saved her. You're out of your head. You're talking like a madman. We'll see. We'll see. That night at supper, Zoe, pale and weak, sat across from Melvin. She'd slept all day and she still didn't know how she'd gotten back to the cabin. But I was ready to explain all that. Zoe, Zoe, you haven't asked me how you got back to the cabin this morning. Well, didn't Melvin bring me back? No. He left you out there in the snow to freeze to death. Melvin came back alone. Oh, I see. Don't listen to him, Zoe. You know how we got separated. The snow was coming down heavily. I couldn't see you. I couldn't find you. I shouted and you didn't hear me. You didn't look very hard or very far, did you, Melvin? You left her there in the mountain and came running back to the cabin. I came back to get you to help me. And when you didn't find me, you just sat down and waited. You're afraid to go out again. Your own sweet life was too precious. That's a lie, Zoe. Don't listen to him. It's all right, Melvin. All right. I understand. You listen to me, both of you. You've got to know this sooner or later anyway. I love you, Zoe. You what? Whatever rights Melvin had as your husband, he lost when he left you out there to die. You don't owe him a thing. Melvin is full of hate, Zoe. He hates me because I showed him up for a coward. He hates you because you know that he deserted you. And he even hates himself because he's lost his self-respect. And I say this right in his presence. That hate is going to explode sometime and he's going to try to kill me. Maybe you too. Please. Please, you mustn't say such things. You mustn't talk like that. It's the truth. That's why I've taken his gun away. You've gone into my next Yes, I have it, Melvin. But even so, we'll have to watch him, watch every move he makes. No, no, you're wrong, Freddy. People like us don't kill. I won't give him a chance to try it. Now it's time to go out to the instrument shed again, but I'll be within call if you need me. I could see her staring at Melvin in horror as the realization of what I'd said slowly sank in. I rushed through my reading as fast as I could, and when I got back, I found them sitting on opposite sides of the room. I was certain then that she was finished with him, that she'd turned to me. I think you'd better go to bed now, Melvin. I want to make sure you're locked in your room before I turn in. Just a precautionary measure. Now, look here. Melvin, Melvin, do as he says. All right. If you say so. Freddy, I, I want to thank you for... Saving my life. That was very brave of you. You don't have to thank me, Zoe. But but about Melvin, I think you're wrong. He's ashamed, perhaps, of leaving you. Zoe, he hates you, believe me. That's what gave me the courage to tell you... To tell you I love you. You may think it a little strange. No, no, Freddy, I, I don't think it's strange at all. These things happen, at least in books. I've always loved you. I dreamed about you for months, for years. And when you came through that door yesterday, I knew that everything I'd ever dreamed of was about to come true. I'm glad Melvin hates you because it leaves you free. Freddy, if he does and and if he's dangerous, well, you have a phone. But couldn't you phone down to the valley for help? They couldn't get up any further than the devil's cauldron. We'll just have to watch him. If worse comes to worst, I've got his gun. No, Fred. That would be murder and... They'd hang you for it. Self-defense. But nobody would ever have to know. I could just drop his body into the cauldron and it would never be found. Yes, but you'd have it on your conscience. Yes, I might. But I'd do anything to set you free, Zoe. Anything. Zoe, would... Would you... Kiss me goodnight? Yes, Freddy. I will. I will. For 
the next two days, Melvin was very quiet and morose. He stayed in his room. I could see that he was planning something. Occasionally, Zoe would go in and talk to him, and I could hear the murmur of her low, urgent voice. She tried to reason with him, bring him to his senses. But his hate just couldn't be bridled. On the fourth morning, it stopped snowing. The thin, weak sunlight glanced off the smooth whiteness of the mountain, and through the window, it gave a false sense of security and warmth. I thought Zoe had managed to talk some sense into him, or he'd never have caught me the way he did. I was in the storeroom getting some things for lunch when he jumped for the door and slammed it shut. By the time I broke the door panels, they had gone. My furs were missing, too, both suits of them. I threw on some sweaters and a leather jacket, switched the revolver to an outside pocket, and went after them. They were about 300 yards below, stumbling through the drift, slipping on the icy rock. It took an hour before I caught up with them. Melvin! Melvin, wait! Stop! Stop or I'll shoot! No! No, don't shoot! That was a nice trick you pulled, Melvin, but you're lucky I managed to catch up with you. Now turn around and start back. Please, Freddie, please try to understand. I'm not going back, Parker. Then go on alone if you think you can make it. I'm taking Zoe back with me. Why, you fool. Fred, Freddie's right, Melvin. You go on alone. I'll go back with you. Come on, Zoe. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, oh. Take oh. Oh. Melvin. Melvin. I had to do it, Zoe, for your sake. What? What are you going to do now? Get rid of his body first. In the cauldron. You, you'd better come with me or you'll get lost up here. Yes. Yes. Anything you say. I shoved the gun into my pocket. Quickly, I stripped the furs off Melvin's body and put them on. Then I tied his shoelaces to his hands and lifted his body over my left shoulder like a blanket roll, his feet under my right arm. And that way I could carry him and still have my hands free. Holding onto Zoe with my left hand, I started for the cauldron's rim. With the dead weight of Colby's corpse dragging at my neck, I felt the strength draining out of me, inch by inch. Foot by foot, we struggled down the mountain toward the cauldron's tip. After an hour, we took a ten-minute rest. The sweat in our clothes had frozen, and the cloth crackled as we continued on. The grade was steeper now. Again and again, we slipped and fell, dragged ourselves to our feet, only to fall again. Zoe was crying now. Oh, don't cry, Zoe. It can't be much farther. I can't go on. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. But I dragged her on. And then, just a few feet away, a vast gray smudge separated the whiteness of the earth from the pale blue of the sky. It was the cauldron. In a few minutes, we were down to the rim. Everything was going to be all right. Even the wind was on our side. It had blown the snow clear of the stone fence at the rim. Zoe, we're in luck. Now help me get him off my neck. No, no. What's wrong, Zoe? She dropped to her knees, her face frozen into a mask of misery. I pushed upward against Kobe's underarm so that I could lift the body over my head. It didn't budge. I yanked and pulled with all my might, but it didn't give a single inch. I threw myself on the ground and clawed frantically at that rigid, frozen mass. It was no use. The body held me in a vice. Zoe, help me. I can't do this myself. I can't. Help me, Zoe. If I don't get out of this, we'll die here, both of us. I can't move. And I couldn't help you even if I wanted to. If you wanted to? Zoe. You're a... Zoe. You're a fool, Freddy. Melvin never hated me. He loved me. And I always loved him. We were both terrified of you, Freddy, from the very first moment. You don't see things the way other people do. You, you imagine things. We tried to humor you until we could escape. That should have been the end. And it would have been if they hadn't gotten worried down at the base station when they didn't receive my afternoon report. 
They sent up a rescue party and found us unconscious at the cauldron's rim. I'm still in a hospital. And when I'm well enough, they say I may have to stand trial. But I don't care what happens. I can still have my dreams. My beautiful dreams. And if they never come true... Well, perhaps it's better that they never do. This is Don Dowd again, your host for Mystery Time. Tonight's mystery classic, The White Curtain, was written by George and Gertrude Fass, starred Mason Adams and was produced by Clark Andrews in association with Ronald Dawson and Robert Arthur. Featured in tonight's drama were George Petrie and Ann Loring. A story based on actual events. To protect the innocent, names and places have been changed. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers bring you Mr. Richard Widmark in a story taken from life. Tonight's presentation of... Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents The Hunting of Bob Lee. The true story about the most famous of all Texas feuds, starring Mr. Richard Widmark. Here it comes, folks. Here it comes. You're so right, John Plugdeck. <coughs> Cold weather is on its way. And now's the time to take your car to your neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer for a change of oil, grease, some antifreeze. And check those spark plugs, too. Right, Johnny, because the spark plugs are the very heart of your car's ignition system. And when they're right, your chances of starting, even in coldest weather, are better than ever. If your spark plugs are worn out, then your Autolite spark plug dealer will install ignition-engineered, resistor-type or standard-type Autolite spark plugs for smoother performance, quick starts, and gas savings. So <coughs> prepare for cold weather driving now. And check those spark plugs, too. Yes, friends, see your neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer this week. Just call Western Union by number and ask for Operator 25. She'll quickly tell you the name and location of your nearest Autolite spark plug dealer. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, with The Hunting of Bob Lee and the performance of Mr. Richard Widmark, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. And go get me my gun I ain't no hand for trouble But I'll die before I run Lee Ranch, Fannin County, June 26, 1868 Editors, Texas News, Barnum, Texas. Gentlemen, if you will permit me the use of your valuable columns, I would like to give a true statement on what is known as the Pilot Grove difficulty. Notwithstanding, there has been no killing in the village except Dr. Pierce. But to begin, I was raised in this state. I came home from the war a hated man, merely because my fortunes had not suffered during the war as had those of my neighbors. And that was the basis for the hatred. I was too prosperous. They used my habit of dressing as an excuse for the first real trouble. For when I rode into the village, into Pilot Grove, I wore a black suit and a hat with a plume in it. It was that hat that started the trouble. They were waiting in front of Nelson's saloon. Hold up, Lee. We want to talk with you. Hold there. Oh, oh, stand. Hold oh. oh, there. What do you have to say to me? We want to know who you are to be dressing like that. Are you lording it over us with your fancy suit and a plume in your hat? Why should I lord it over anybody? I dress the way that pleases me. No man would ever wear a hat like that. It's for a woman. 
I'm wearing it, Evans. We can see that. That makes you worse than a woman. Only one reason you wear it. You think you're better than us. Takes more than a plume to make you better. And I'll see that hat pulled down around your neck. You want to try that, Evans? I'll see it there. You talk mighty brave still up on your horse. Then I'll get down. Oh, stand there, stand there. We'll, Don't we'll take wait. it from him, Evans. Now, Evans, if you or any one of the rest of you think you can tell me how to dress, this is the time to begin. Go ahead, Evans. We're behind you. Don't take it from him, Evans. Shove that head down his throat. All right, I will. <laughs> Good boy, Evans. Get him now. You guys will do it on your knees. Get him now, Evans. Evans, pull him out from under that horse. Pull him out. Come on, he got stepped on. Move that horse. Come on. Uh, oh, pull him out. Pull him out. Come on. Oh, devil. Stand there, stand there. The devil. Look at him, look at him. He's dead, boys. Look at the back of his head. Did you hear that, Lee? I heard. Evans is dead. And you killed him, Lee. He fell under my horse. You knocked him out. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was a fair fight, and I knocked him down. You all saw it was that way. You killed him, Lee. And we'll get you for He's it. He's not the only one who'll die in Pilot Grove. You can remember that, Lee. You pay for this. Isn't that right, boys? That's right. right. Nah, there's no sense in my talking to you. You all know it was a fair fight, but you built up a hate. And you'll think what you want to think. So do what you want to do. I'll be waiting. You won't wait long. You, Madison. You can give me back my hat. I want to say this strongly, gentlemen. I did not kill Hugh Evans. Those men knew I didn't know they would have killed me then. They were all armed, but nobody drew a gun. So I left them on a the road back home where my wife and my brother waited for me. Why did you fight, Bob? Why did you let them make you fight? I had to, Corey. Now hold still. You shouldn't have, Bob. Now they've got you, Evans, dead. Couldn't help that, Henry. Hold still. It's what they've been waiting for, something like this. Sometimes a man can't sit back. Sometimes it's smarter to. A man can't be insulted in the street and sit back. Now, I'm not a man for trouble. I came home to live in peace. They started this. I've done nothing that I wasn't pushed into. The way they're thinking is you kill one of theirs, now they'll kill you if they can. Then that's what they'll try. There's nothing I can do about the way they're thinking. But I'll wait for it. <laughs> As this group of men had been known before to raid ranches for profit, I thought they might ride the mine if they were planning retaliation, however groundless. So I prepared accordingly. I sent my three ranch hands to take all the horses, saving two, into hiding a few miles away. And then at nightfall, with lamps unlighted, and with my wife afforded such protection as possible, my brother and I sat down with our rifles at open windows and waited. Now, these might seem to you, gentlemen, unnecessary precautions. But they would not seem so if you knew this band of cutthroats. However, we were relieved sometime after when we heard two horses approach the house, saw two men dismount in honesty near the front door. The Union soldiers, what do they want? I don't know. But put your rifle aside. Who is it, Bob? Union soldiers. Why'd they come here? We'll find out. Light another lamp, Corey. Evening, men. We're looking for Bob Lee. You found him. I'm Bob Lee. What do you want? Stay here. I've come to take you to Sherman. I have orders to put you under arrest. Put me under arrest? For the murder of Hugh Evans. That was no murder. It was a fair fight and I knocked him down, but he died by accident. You'll have a chance to say all that to my officers at Sherman. You'll come... Peaceably, won't you, Lee? Of course I'll come peaceably. Bob. The Union Army is a just army, and I'll be treated fairly, Corey. That's more than I can expect from Boren and Deer and the others. Of course I'll go peaceably. Mm. 
In truth, I was anxious to yield myself to arrest because I knew that by fair trial, no army court could find me guilty of murder. So I surrendered in good faith, believing in right. But I was soon to learn that those two men who took me weaponless from my house were not Union troops at all. They were imposters with forged orders, shaming the uniform. And they turned me over to Boren and ten or a dozen others in Choctaw Bottom, where I was summarily tied to a tree before a fire. You can say what you want, Lee, but you'll be thanking us before we're done here. I'll thank the tree that sees the end of you, Boren. And you, Sam Beer and Wilson and Maddox, Lewis Peacock, all of you. Yeah. You might have seen your last one. Did you ever think of that? Are you trying to scare me, Maddox? Because you don't. None of you do. You want to get yourself killed, Lee? Never mind, Maddox. Don't listen to him. We brought you here to give you a chance to live. You give me a chance to live? That's what I said. Ask the rest of the boys. Now, well, what kind of talk is that? To give me a chance to live? You mean you think you hold the right to give anybody a chance to live? You're nothing but filth, all of you. Filth, is he? I say kill him and be done with it. Filth! Now, this isn't the time for talk like that, Lee. Some of the boys would just as soon knock your brains out right now. You don't hear me begging him not to. Give it to him, boys. Get out, wait. Wait. We brought him here to give him a chance. Well, get it over with. Now, listen to me, Lee. You want to live, don't you? You got a wife to live for. You're young. Man comes back from a war, he doesn't want to die. Say what you have to say. Blair there has a paper we're asking you to sign. If you don't sign it, we'll kill you here and now. Get in the firelight, Bill, and read it to him. This is what those thieves demanded of me in their note. That I sign over to them a bill of sale upon my ranch. The buildings, the cattle and horses, and all other property that I promise payable of demand $2,000 in gold, and that I and my family leave the state forever. They threatened to kill me if I did not sign, and also to kill me if I failed to meet the demands. So balancing certain death against probable death in the future, I decided to give them my signature. But I forced myself to suffer their beatings and their insults for three long hours, so that they'd get no inkling of a plan that was in my mind. Now, after being released, I thought to set about proving the illegality of the note they held and turn the civil law upon the scoundrels. So in the company of my brother the next morning, I rode into Pilot Grove to inquire about legal counsel. Although we still sought peace, we went armed. I with two pistols and a rifle, my brother with two pistols. It so happened that I first stopped for information at Nelson's saloon. And in front of there, I saw one of the men from the night before, Jim Maddox. I didn't notice out there if he was armed, but he was not when he followed us in a few minutes later. There he comes, Bob. I'm unarmed, Lee. I'm not starting to play, Maddox. But if you feel like backing up some of the things you said last night, I'll loan you a gun. I come in to say I was sorry about that. The rest of the boys got me riled up. I sure didn't expect to see you in town this morning. Well, I'm here. I came in to prove that note I signed isn't worth anything. Be quiet, Bob. And you can tell Boren and the others that if you've got enough brains to understand. Well, that note was my idea, Lee. I didn't have nothing to do with it. Then we've got nothing to talk about. Goodbye. You talk too much, Bob. I can't be driven by anybody. This isn't a time for pride. You got to let him know. First chance you get, you came out on top last night. That's wrong, Bob. Maddox will get to born before... They wanted me to... Without a chance to draw, Maddox? That's no... Bob. Bob. What'd you do, Bob? What'd you do? Autolite is bringing you Mr. Richard Widmark in The Hunting of Bob Lee. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Folks, winterize right now. Please.
keys, too. And check those important spark plugs, too. That's potent and pertinent patter, Johnny Plug Check. Cold weather is coming fast, and it's not a bit too soon to have the oil and grease changed. Antifreeze put in. And check those spark plugs, too. Right, Johnny, because when they're right, your chances of starting, even in coldest weather, are better than ever. So visit your Autolite spark plug dealer. His exclusive Autolite plug check indicator will instantly show you if your spark plugs are right for the cold driving days ahead. If cleaning or adjustments are needed, he has the latest equipment to do the job quickly. If replacements are needed, he has resistor type or standard type Autolite spark plugs. They're ignition engineered for smoother performance, quick starts, and gas savings. And used as original factory equipment on many leading makes of our finest cars, trucks, and tractors. So plan now to have your car winterized this week. And remember... Check those spark plugs, too! Be sure. See your neighborhood Autolite spark plug dealer, because from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage... Mr. Richard Widmark in Elliot Lewis's production of The Hunting of Bob Lee. A dramatic report well calculated to keep you in suspense. What I am writing you, gentlemen, is the truth. It was a cold-blooded shooting. The bullet entered one side of my face, tearing my cheek and breaking my jawbone. Came out on the other side of my head, just in front of my ear. Maddox left me for dead. And well, I might be, had it not been for the time, the aid, and skill of the late Dr. Pierce, who I mentioned at the beginning. I may add here that this excellent person, later who nursed me in his own home, was later killed by this gang. He was murdered in the presence of his family for the reason that he saved my life. In time, I was well enough to return to my ranch. But my face will always be twisted by scars. My cattle had been stolen. One of my hands had been killed. And the other two, frightened, had sought work elsewhere. The difficulty had become a true feud. My wife had been removed to safety in Hunt County, and I was forced to take up arms myself. I'll stand with you, whatever you say, Bob. We can't be out anymore. I don't see how it can get any worse. Except for one thing, Henry. Once we start out, we can't come back here. There's nothing to stay for anyway. All right, then. We'll pack some food and blankets right out late this afternoon. It's sure the ranch is being watched, so we'll ride north. As though we're leaving. Then tonight, when we're clear, we'll cross over the blackjack, come back the other way. Where to, Bob? I made a list, Henry. And I put Jim Maddox at the top. Under him, there's Sam Beer, and William Dixon, and Israel Boren, and Lewis Peacock. It was at this time that my brother and I were first called outlaws. That is not now nor never was true. All we wanted was peace, and there was no law and order. We never killed an unarmed man, or never without giving a man a chance. Why, that first night when we got to the Maddox shack, he was alone there with his guns hung up. We could have killed him through the window. This is far enough. I want to go in alone. I can see how you would. Uh, yeah, but he might remember my voice. If you knock on his door... And if he asks, you tell him you're John Baldock, that born sent you. All right, Bob. Step to the side when he opens. Who's there? John Baldock. Boren sent me. All right. Hey, what? Well, I've come to clear it up with you and me, Maddox. Uh, I'm not armed. You said that before. You'll put your gun on. What if I won't? Then I'll kill you where you stand. Put it on, you'll have a chance to draw. You don't have to watch me. Turn around, buckle your gun on. Turn around so you can see where it is. Bob? It's 
all right. He tried to draw from where it was hanging. I think this is a night we'll remember, Henry. Sam Pierce next on the list. Then we moved into Jernigan Thicket for safety because Boren and Peacock and the others had enlisted aid from Kansas. Some 30 strong, we were told, hired killers. So we were forced to move by night. All right, Henry. I'm all right. I look for him on the right side, you on the left. We'll go in there. Bob, there. Move farther down while we can. They see us now. Sam Beer, William Dixon. The Lee brothers have come to clear it up with you and us. What do you want, Lee? We want you to stand up from your table and start a play so we won't have to kill you sitting there. They're going to dump the table. What are you going to do? Back to the door. You've heard what the Lees have had from these men. If they have any friends here, this is the time to speak up. One day about 12 after that, when my brother and I returned from hunting to the shack in Jernigan Thicket, we were surprised to see Israel Boren waiting for us, unarmed and with his hands in the air. What does he want? Hold back, boys. You can see I came in peace. Then leave in peace, Boren. Whoa there. Hold, hold, stand, stand. Boy. Leave, Boren, and come back wearing your gun. No. Wait, I came in peace. Hold it. You've got no right to come in peace. Bob, can't we hear what... Henry! Henry! My brother was killed there in the thicket by rifles hidden in the brush. Boren and his hired gunman took advantage of the fact that we always gave our enemies a chance and lured us in with an unarmed man. I killed Israel Boren after that and I looked for Peacock, but I couldn't find him. And then I learned he put a thousand dollars on my head. And more gunmen came to hunt me from Kansas. I moved to Gibson Thicket, then to Thatcher. And there were so many men I could hardly move at all. And then finally, after three months, although I'd vowed that I'd die before I ran, I left the county and rode to see my wife. Oh, Bob, what have they done? What have they done so that we can't be man and wife and live the way we want to live? It's finished now. I've seen my brother killed. and I've avenged him. I've done what I can. I can't do any more. There are things to do. There are places we can go. We started in Fan County. We can start someplace else. Yes. Yes, yes, we can. But I've, uh, I've one more thing I have to do, Carrie. I write a letter about this trouble we've had to the newspaper in Bonham. When the people read it, they'll know the truth. That I'm not a criminal. That I wanted peace. And I couldn't have it. And so I say in conclusion that I have done what I can to procure peace. I have been driven farther than most men, I think. And any violence I have done has been justified. And finally, I am still willing to surrender myself to any impartial civil authority at any time. Since I know I am right. I'm sorry to take so much of your valuable time in your newspaper space, but a great many people have no idea of the true origin of all this trouble. I remain yours, Robert Lee. There's no danger here, Bob. Are you sure? If Peacock had followed, I'd have known. I'm sure, Corey. I'll post a letter. Be back in 30 minutes. 
Then we can talk about where we'll go. <laughs> well, after four months, Corey, I, I think there should be much to talk about. Oh, Bob. You wait in the house. Please hurry. I will. You go inside. Come on, boy. Come on. Suspense. A true story of the Old West. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Richard Widmark. That was a powerful story, Richard Widmark. A Western drama we'll remember for a long time. Thanks, Harlow. I really enjoyed playing Bob Key. And may I thank the other members of the cast for their wonderful support. They were a great team. Mm. Reminds me of the Autolite team, Dick, working together for better performance. Yes, I see what you mean. Yes, Autolite makes over 400 products for cars, trucks, tractors, planes, and boats. And they're engineered to work together perfectly. Autolite makes a complete line of ignition-engineered spark plugs, both standard and resistor types. Autolite batteries, including the famous Autolite Stay Full. In fact, Autolite makes complete electrical systems. No wonder, from bumper to tail light, you're always right... With Autolite. Next week on Suspense, our star will be Mr. Joseph Cotton, as a man who, in a most unusual fashion, tried to clear himself of the suspicion of murder. A dramatic report we call The Trials of Thomas Shaw. In weeks to come, we shall also present Mr. John Hodiak, Mr. John Lund, and Mr. Flint Lovejoy, all on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morwick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Miss Terry Lee was the ballad singer. The Hunting of Bob Lee was based on the book by C.L. Sonicson and was adapted for Suspense by Gil Dowd. Featured in tonight's cast were Kathy Lewis... Lou Krugman, Junius Matthews, William Conrad, Harry Bartell, Byron Kane, and Joseph Kearns. Tonight's appearance of Mr. Widmark was made possible through the kind permission of 20th Century Fox Studios, whose current release is The Desert Fox, starring James Mason. And remember, next week on Suspense, Mr. Joseph Cotton, in another story based on actual events, a dramatic report we call... The Trials of Thomas Shaw. For the location of your nearest Autolite spark plug or battery dealer, or your nearest authorized Autolite service station, phone Western Union by number and ask for Operator 25. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is the CBS Radio Network. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape, transcribed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are standing outside a room, horror gripping you. While before your eyes, seen through the transom window, the most beautiful girl in the world is about to die. Because of you. Today we 
we escape from reality with the fascinating story of a girl who lived a weird second life, as John Jessel told it in his gripping story, The Adaptive Ultimate. No, Daniel, I can't do it. You have a very interesting theory, it's but... It's more than a theory, Dr. Bach. I've proved it. It works. I tried my serum on tubercular guinea pigs and it cured them. They adapted themselves to the tubercular bacillus and live. Hmm. I tried my serum on a dog with rabies. He adapted himself, too. I tried it on a cat with a broken spine. The cat instantly adapted itself to its injury so that the spine had time to knit and heal. Don't you see what a tremendous discovery this is? Yes, perhaps. Well, think what that would mean in accident cases. There'd be no further need for emergency surgery. Don't you see that? No matter what the condition, the injury to the body, a mere injection of my serum would permit the patient instantly to adapt himself to his condition and live. No matter what his injury. Exactly. A serum made from insects. From a common fruit fly, the most adaptable of living organisms. Tear off a wing and it grows a new one. Tear off its head, even. Stick on a new head, and that, too, will adhere in time. Think of imparting that same adaptability to human beings. <laughs> to grow new heads? It has merit. Oh, now, please, Dr. Bob. <laughs> all right, all right. No, seriously. I know this may be a great thing, but to permit you to experiment on a human being, no, The most I hopeless can... case you can find, Dr. Bach. Someone already doomed. Well, if someday I discover in the hospital a hopeless case, Understand, it will be hopeless. I understand. And if the patient shall consent, then you will have your human guinea pig. Well, Dr. Scott, you requisitioned for yourself a hopeless case. Permit me. Here is your guinea pig. What is it, Dr. Mark? TB? Yeah, final stage. A matter of hours at most. Mm. Hmm. She might have been attractive once, but now, hair like string, skinny like a skeleton, and flesh like wax. Dr. Bart, you call this a fair test? I said hopeless, but I didn't say a corpse. Mm. The lady is returning to life, mm -hmm. such as it is. Well, Dr. Scott, I regret I have not a more palatable subject for your experiment, but this is what I promise, a hopeless case. It's all right, I'll try it. Oh, what's her name? Let me see. It's on the chart here. Uh, Zelas. What was that? Her name is Kira Zelas. Oh. Young lady. Mm-hmm. Permit me. I am Dr. Hermann Bach, chief of the staff, and I would like to introduce one of our promising young doctors. He wants a date, I suppose. Miss Zelas. Hello, brown eyes. What? Your eyes are... Brown, aren't they? Miss Salis, you see, I've perfected a serum. I like brown eyes. This, um, this serum might help you, but it has never been tried on a human being before. I... Well, I thought if you have no objection... What are the odds? Odds? Well, actually, you've everything to gain. And nothing to lose. Well. How right you are. Okay. I'm... I'm all yours, brown eyes. Go ahead. Experiment away. Dr. Bach, prepare her arm. Twenty-four hours and she is yet alive. I would have said yesterday it would be impossible she should survive the night. It is now 48 hours, and she actually seems better. But miracles such as this have happened before, and without serums. A week, and she still lives. Each day she becomes better. It is miraculous. The spots on her lungs are disappearing. Her coughing is stopped. There is no sign of bacillus in the culture. But even more amazing... A reaction to abrasions, skin punctures. Yesterday, I took a blood specimen. Before I had one cc, the puncture in her skin had closed. Yes, in 30 seconds. 
the ordinary person, it takes a day, two days for it to heal. With Miss Kira Zelas, 30 seconds. It is amazing. Then I will not dispute it. Your serum has worked a miracle. She is cured. And now I must just discharge her from the hospital. But, well, Dr. Bach, you know, I... You had forgotten that time must come sometime, hmm? But you see, I must. She is cured, and we need the room. Well, yes. Yes, I know, but... Well, well, she should be under observation. We don't know what effects will show up. I think, the... Daniel, you have an extraordinary interest in Miss Zeller. So I have asked her to come here. She is outside. Shall we invite her in? Well, yes, of course. Send in Miss Zellas, please. Now, observe well your miracle. Uh, Miss Zellas, come in, come in, sit down. Thanks. Oh, hello, Brown Eyes. Hello, Kira. I have sent for you, Miss Zellas, because I have good news. Today I am discharging you from the hospital. Oh? Yeah? Today you are free to go. That pleases you? Madly. Kira, you have people, perhaps? A family? Aren't we all brothers and sisters under the skin? Miss Zellas, I will come to the point. I wish to make you a proposition. I mean purely a scientific... Pro- yes, I know. An experiment. <laughs> Precisely. We are interested, Dr. Scott and I, to observe the further effects of the serum he gave you. Yes. I will pay you board and room and $30 a week. You will live at my house. I have a housekeeper, Mrs. Getz. She will look after you. Is that satisfactory? Wouldn't I be a fool to say no? Excellent, excellent. Does uh, Brown Eyes live there, too? No, but Dr. Scott will continue to have a clinical interest in the experiment. Miss Zelas, have no fear. Good. Yes. Well, it is now almost time for dinner. I will take you, Miss Zelas. You will join us, Dr. Scott? Oh, yes, fine, Dr. Bach. Very well. We shall meet outside in, what, ten minutes? That'll do me nicely. Miss Zelas, you wish to wait here or maybe outside? A little I... fresh air? I think I could use a little air. Good. There is a little park across the street. You will find benches there to rest. We will meet at the front entrance in ten minutes. Dr. Bach, what is it? What, what's the matter? Some sort of commotion across the street in the park. Oh. Where is Kira? Well, I, I thought she'd be here with you. Perhaps she is still over there in the park. What do you suppose? Come on! Dr. Bach, it is Kira. Kira, let, let me through, please. Let, Kira, let us through, please. Father, so what's happened? What is this? Why are you holding this lady? You know this woman? Yes, of course. What is it? What's the matter here? Plenty. Your lady friend here merely walks up to an old gent about 60 or so, picks up a nice hefty rock and beats his brains out. Officer, there must be some awful mistake. Yeah, her mistake. Cold-blooded murder. Come on, sister. There's the wagon. But, Officer, uh, listen... You'd better come along, too, mister. Mona Lisa here don't seem to be much in the mood for talking. We'll need someone to tell the desk sergeant her name. This is terrible seeing you here like this. I, I've got to get you out of here. I've got to help you. It's not so bad when you're here. Well, listen, this, this is all a terrible mistake. If you'll tell me what... Mistake? Well, well yes, of course. You... Kira, you, you, you didn't kill that man. If I said yes, what would you do? Why, why I, I'd tell him you weren't responsible. I, I'd tell him about the serum. I'd, I'd tell him it was my fault that, that somehow the serum I gave you caused your mind to, to snap something. That well, that would be the only explanation. You'd do this. Ruin your career, no doubt. Just to save me. Well, yes, of course I would. And what would they do to me? I, I don't know exactly. Put you away under observation. Or something. Kira, we... Then my answer's no. I did not kill the man. Oh, don't worry. I won't be convicted. I'll take care of myself very well. I'll, as you say, adapt myself to the situation. All right, now, Mr. Salvatore, continue. Tell the court in your own words precisely what happened. This old man, you see, is buy circus peanuts from me every day. For months, every day. And this one day, he pull out his pocketbook. It's a bill full. And I'm a look, it's a stuff with the bills. The big money. 
It's a Salvatore. Can I make a change for $20 and I'm a left? I mean, say, mister, I'm a peanut man. You take the peanuts and you pay me tomorrow. He said, thank you very much. He turned around and then here's this dame. She pick up all. Oh, it's a great the big stone and a conks him. It's a murder. I object, Your Honor. Objection sustained. Continue, Mr. Salvatore. Oh, she, she nothing more to say. This is a dame. She bend over and she reach in his pocket to take the money. I'm a grab of people who come, a police who come and a Mr. Grab Salvatore, me. can you describe this young lady to us? Oh, she... I remember her very well. She's... Uh, she's a skinny. She's... Ain't no beauty, you know. Got the black suit, the brown hair. Uh, eyes, uh, don't know, dark. You know, maybe brown or blue. Thank you, Mr. She's... Salvatore. Your witness. Oh, me too. <laughs> Mr. Salvatore, you si. say that the young lady, the assailant, had brown hair and dark eyes? Si. Brown hair, dark blue eyes. And do you see the young lady in the courtroom? Oh, si. She's a sit right to... What's the matter, Mr. Salvatore? Uh, Are you pointing at Miss Zalis? Si. May I ask the defendant to rise, please? Miss Zalis. Will you kindly remove your hat, please? Dr. Bach, look. Her hair, it's, it's become the color of aluminum. Your Honor, I submit that this defendant does not possess dark hair, nor, if you will observe, dark eyes. I am prepared, therefore, to submit a lock of her hair to be tested by any chemist the court may appoint to prove that the pigmentation is entirely natural. I don't believe that it is. Now, Mr. Salvatore, do you still say that this is the young lady you saw in the park? Uh, I'm, I think she's... Uh, is I, she? Uh, Mama, me, she, No! <laughs> Good Lord, Dr. Bach, that hair of hers. Did you see it? It was the color of aluminum. She was beautiful. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. And so she has been acquitted. They call her innocent. Daniel, I am a convert to your great principle of adaptability. But where will it end? You start with an ideal, and you wake up to discover you have created a monster. But she was acquitted. It was all a mistake. You really believe that? Dr. Yes, Mrs. Griss? She is here, Doctor. She? That woman in the newspaper. Ah. Kira is here? You said she was so poor, such a church mouth. Ah, oh, you should see her. What do you mean, Mrs. Griss? So fine, so great a lady. I'll, uh, I'll go and talk to her, Dr. Bach. Hello, brown eyes. Hello, Kira. Aren't you glad to see me? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Oh, congratulations on your acquittal today. We were there. I know. I sensed it. I was hurt that you didn't come up and congratulate me. Well, there were photographers and what? Well, Kira, your hair, it, it's black again. Isn't it always? Don't you like it? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. And it's beautiful. And I beautiful. Brown eyes. Very, very beautiful. And are you happy to have me back? Hmm. I always did like brown eyes. Kira. Tell me, how do you like my new clothes? My gown? Why, it's very nice. Nice? It's exquisite. I have a whole new wardrobe, hat, shoes. Well, how, Kira? Where did you get the money? Money? You only had three dollars when you left the hospital. Oh. oh, so I did. Kira. Kira, you did take that wallet from the old man. Why, well, naturally. You, you... You did murder him. Certainly. Oh, come, don't look so shocked. Oh, I'm tired, brown eyes. You'll excuse me if I appropriate Dr. Bach's room. Good night. Dr. Bach, we've got to do something. Yes, Daniel, we do. I haven't slept a wink all night trying to think of what we can do. I've been here in the laboratory all night. I think I know. What? This serum of yours, it has accomplished a miracle, yeah. It is the adaptive ultimate. 
changes that take the ordinary person days or months, she accomplishes instantly. She walks into the sunlight. She is ten. She walks out. She is pale again. When she is in danger, she adapts. She could survive the electric chair, the hangman's noose. She was in danger in the courtroom. She adapted. She changed her whole appearance at will, so she could not be identified. Yes, I know, I know. Oh, you must not blame yourself. You could not know what you were creating. Now, this morning, I operated on one of your guinea pigs. I found this. The pineal gland hypertrophy. That is what causes it. Well, then... Then we could operate and... and maybe change her back. Yeah, but she can adapt to anything, anesthesia included. How can we operate? Unless we get her consent? Well, perhaps... Oh, you are dreaming, Daniel. Do you really think she will consent now? Now that she has power? Perhaps more power than any human being ever possessed before. Power for evil. And she has already killed one man, remember. But if we watched her, Doctor, kept her under guard... Yeah, yeah, again, Pygmalion falls in love with his Galatea. No, Daniel, no. She must be destroyed. We must perform surgery at once. But she'll die. She will go back to what she was, with but a few hours to live. It is best, then. Yes, I suppose so. Yes? Yes, Mrs. Getz? Hmm? Oh. Okay. What is it, Dr. Bach? And so perhaps she is also telepathic. She sensed what we were about to do, and now it is too late. What do you mean? Miss Zelos is gone. Disappeared. Buck, did you call for me? Yeah, Daniel. Have you seen the evening paper yet? No, not yet. Then here. After two months, there is news of our Miss Kira Zelas. What? Let me see that. Where? Oh. The surprise of the evening was the appearance of John Kellan, ambassador at large, diplomat extraordinary, the man slated to head the forthcoming World Atomic Energy Control Commission. Mr. Callan, one of Washington's confirmed bachelors, squired the... the gorgeous Kira Zalus. You see? She has become gorgeous, our drab little urchin. Miss Zalus, the dazzling beauty who affects a dark wig by day and a white one at night. A great power of adaptability, courtesy of Dr. Daniel Scott. Dark by day, white by night. Well, what are we going to do, Doctor? Do? The world atomic energy control, the one real hope of world peace. Kira isn't interested in peace. What can we do? Surgery, I know. But politics... We must wait and see. We must wait and see how far your mad woman will go. Washington is agog with rumors about the romance between glamorous Key Rosales and John Callan, the newly appointed head of the World Atomic Energy Control, one of the most powerful political figures on the globe. John Callan leaves tomorrow for the crucial atomic energy conferences at Geneva, Switzerland. And sailing on the same boat as the exotic Miss Kira Zalis, with whom his name has been frequently linked. Rumor has it Miss Zalis acts as a sort of unofficial assistant to Mr. Callan, thus making her one of the most important women in the world. Glamorous, exotic. Of such fragile stuff is world peace fashioned these days, Daniel. I wonder what she intends to... Some of the calling at dinner time. Oh, sit still, Dr. Buck. I'll see who it is. Yes? Uh, Kira. Hello, Brown Eyes. May I come in? Oh, yes, of course. Oh, our exotic guinea pig. Hmm? Good evening, Dr. Buck. I'm not intruding. Of course not. You're very kind. John and I, you've read about Mr. Callan. Oh, yes, yes. We're leaving for Europe tomorrow for the conferences in Switzerland. Yes. He had a series of meetings to attend tonight, so I told him I would stay here. You're staying here? I took the liberty of saying you were my uncle, Dr. Buck. Oh. John will call for me in the morning on his way to the airport. We're leaving at eight. I do hope I'm not too late for dinner. Not at all. In fact, we're very happy to have you here, aren't we, Dr. Scott? Kira. Hello, Brown Eyes. What are you doing out here in the garden? Waiting for you. You knew I'd follow you? Of course. 
Have you missed me? You know I have. Oh, Kira, listen to me. Do you love this John Kellen? When I want love, I'll come to you, brown eyes. Well, then why? What is it, money? Money? I don't need money anymore. What does an empress need with money? Empress? That's what you've made me. The most powerful woman the world's ever known. <laughs> John Callan. He's supposed to be important. But in my hands, he's clay to be molded as I wish. Do you see what that means? Yes, I see. You hold the fate of the world in your hands. Exactly. To do with as I want. And I shall. Would you like to rule the world with me, brown eyes? Kira, you're evil. What is good? What's evil? Come here, brown eyes. Look at me. And forget such things. Are you asleep, Dr. Bach? Sleep? Who can sleep? Kira's insane, Doctor. Do you know what she's planning to do? I heard. Oh. Maybe, maybe we could get to this Callum. Yeah, and then what? Well, if, if we could talk to him, tell him... Tell him, tell him what? Didn't I talk to you? Would you listen? Where is she? Oh, she's gone to sleep. I tell you, there's only one remedy, surgery. It is the only hope. But she'll you. never consent to surgery, Dr. Bach, and she's probably immune to anesthesia. Maybe not. Maybe not all anesthesia. What? Downstairs in my laboratory, I have a tank of ethyl chloride. You mean operate here tonight? Yeah, tonight. Right here, where she sleeps. All right, then. Now stop staring down at her. Pour the anesthesia onto the cone. Hurry. That ought to be enough to anesthetize an elephant. Onto the face, quickly. All right. Then <laughs> tightly hold it. I'm trying. Close. I'm trying. She's forcing my hand. I, I can't hold her. She's too strong. I can't. Oh. Did you think you could make me unconscious? You... You were going to operate on me. Is that what you were planning? Or were you going to slit my throat with that scalpel? Look. Kira, don't. There. You see? I plunge your knife into my heart. I withdraw it. And the wound is healed. Now, go away, both of you. I want to sleep. John will be calling for me at eight. Half past five in the morning. Two and a half hours more and she will leave. And the world will be one step nearer chaos. We are scientists, Dan. We have a responsibility to civilization. We must find a way to destroy this... Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, It's a fundamental course. biological law. No human can survive in its own waste product. Carbon dioxide is a human waste. <laughs> Dr. Bach, if we could fill the room where she's sleeping with carbon dioxide, she'd become unconscious. You could operate, then. Who are you calling? The hospital. I will have them send over two tanks of carbon dioxide. Do you think it should work, then? We must try anything. Hello, this is Dr. Bach. Let me talk to surgery. Now hurry, it is an emergency. The tube is ready. You sealed the crack under the door? Yes. You closed the window? Yes. All right. Let us start the gas. Well, then, through the transom above the bedroom door, you will be able to observe her reactions. You placed the lighted candle inside the room? Yes, Doctor. I left the candle on the table. Uh, observe it carefully. All right. When it goes out, your Miss Kira Zelas should be unconscious. Then, can you see inside the room from up there? Yes, Doctor. Candle is flickering, Doctor. Wait. No, it's still flickering. It, it's just gone out, Doctor. Excellent. It means there is now a concentration of 8 or 10% carbon dioxide. The average person would long since be dead. Doctor. Yeah, then, what? 
Oh, just a minute. Yes, yes. She's breathing much more quickly now, convulsively. Uh, Jane's still breathing. She... She's opening her eyes now. What? She's... She's getting up. Getting up? She's staggering. Holding her throat, doctor. She's gasping. She's... Yes. Moving toward the door. <laughs> she's trying to unlock the... So, so. She's seen me. She... She's trying to... Well, well, try... well. What is it? She's collapsed. It's over. Yes? How do you do, Dr. Bach? I'm John Callan. John Oh, yes, yes, of course. Come in. I haven't taken you away from anything. Oh, no, no. We were performing some surgery, my associate and I. I, I have a miniature surgery here for emergencies, and we have just finished. Is that the patient on the table? Uh, the... Yeah, yes. Is she... Yes, she is dead. Too bad. Seedy looking creature, wasn't she? She was a charity case. Well, I, I won't keep you. Is uh, Kira here? No, she she changed her plans. She said there were some things she wished to do and she would meet you at the airport. Well, that's a woman's prerogative, isn't it, changing plans? <laughs> yes. I'd better get a move on, then. Nice to see you, Doctor. I, I hope we'll meet again when I return from Europe. Yes, that will be nice, Mr. Callan. And good luck on your mission. Uh, thank you, sir. Goodbye. Yeah, goodbye. Well, Daniel, maybe we will get some sleep now. Then... Huh? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Doctor. I, I was daydreaming. She's lovely, isn't she? Lovely. Yeah, then lovely. May she always be in your memory. Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Today, we have presented transcribed The Adaptive Ultimate by John Jessel, adapted for radio by Chet Spurgeon and Herb Futran, with editorial supervision by John Dunkel, starring Edgar Barrier as Dr. Bach and Stacey Harris as Dan Scott. Featured in the cast were Elsie Holmes, Frank Gerstel, Larry Dobkin, Tom Charlesworth, and Ann Morrison. Special music was arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. Next week, you are trapped in a dark, empty house. A girl lying dead at your feet. And surrounding you, closing in on you, are the band of killers, deadly enemies of your country and yourself. And they are intent on murdering you. Next week, we escape with the famous story, Confidential Agent by Graham Greene. Be sure to tune in at this same time next week, when once again we offer you... Escape! This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Here's your pass to the Globe Theater. This is the Globe Theater. The radio playhouse especially for men and women of the armed forces of the United Nations. Just as the Globe Theater has meant the best in entertainment since the days of Shakespeare, today it means the best in radio drama for service men and women all over the globe. Here to tell you about tonight's play is your host at the Globe Theater, Herbert Marshall. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Globe Theater. As always, the theater doors are open wide to every man and woman in the uniform of the armed forces of the United Nations. And as always, 
We have some of the theater's finest performers here to entertain you with a play which really should score. Tonight, the playbill reads Walter Abel, Louise Alberton, Ralph Bellamy, and David Bruce. The story is from one of the past year's very successful motion pictures, Phantom Lady. During the next 26 minutes or so, you are going to find out what not to do with a necktie. For behavior of this sort results not only in frowns from Emily Post, but uh, also in jury verdicts of guilty of murder. I think you'll get a kick out of this murder mystery yarn, so let's get on with the action. You'll hear Louise Arbritton as Kansas, Walter Abel as Inspector Burgess, David Bruce as Scott Henderson, and Ralph Bellamy as Marlowe. Curtain going up on Phantom Lady. You see, I was Scott Henderson's secretary. And not that I'd ever have let him guess. But even then, I... I knew I was in love. That morning started like any other morning. I went into Mr. Henderson's office and switched on the dictaphone to see what instructions he'd left for me. Good morning, Kansas. He always called me Kansas. Listen, I won't be in till noon. I got a meeting on the Peabody job. I stood there, so you'd better listening, check glancing at the, the morning paper, and, and then... Off to him. Mrs. Scott, Scott Henderson strangled to death. Police to hold well-known engineer. We'll the Henley bed. I stood there. And the dictaphone ran on, and the sun came flooding in the window. And suddenly, all the world was black. Why don't you stop? Why don't you let me go? I'm tired. I'm tired, too. We're all tired, Henderson. All but your wife. She's dead, with your necktie knotted around her throat. I didn't do it. How many times do I have to tell you? All right, let's go over it again. Yesterday you gave a little cocktail party. That was for Jack Marlowe, my friend. He was sailing for South America. And afterward, you planned to take your wife to dinner in the theater. She wouldn't go. She knew I'd gotten tickets, but she laughed at me. Said she was bored. Said she couldn't stand me anymore. So you went out and had dinner alone. And then you dropped into that little bar. Anselmo's place on 56th. And I got to talking with that girl. The bartender saw us sitting together. The bartender says you were alone. I wasn't. I was sitting with that girl. She was feeling low, and so was I. So I asked her to go to the theater with me. And she said she would. So you left together and got into a cab. That's right. Just ask the driver. He'll tell you I was with the girl. The driver says you were alone. He's lying. That girl went to the theater with me. We were in the first row, and the drummer in the orchestra kept smirking at her. That drummer saw her. Why don't you make him talk? The drummer says you were alone. Then what about the singer, Estella Montiero? She was wearing a hat, a funny hat, the kind you don't see in a hundred years. And then she looked down and saw this girl's hat, and, well, she got so mad she could hardly sing. Your companion's hat was a duplicate of hers? That's right. Absolutely the same. Montiero says there are no hats like hers. Hers are designed and made to order. She's lying. They're all lying. Why are they ganging up on me? Why doesn't somebody tell the truth? Why don't you? Why don't you tell me your girlfriend's name? I've told you I don't know her name. She wanted it like that. Just companions for the evening. No names, no questions, nothing personal. And all you're sure of is the hat. Oh, it's getting so I'm not sure of anything. I've got to find her, Inspector. I've got to find her. That's right. Or you're going to find your neck in a noose. Yes? Hello, is Miss Carol Richmond there? This is Carol Richmond. One moment, please. Rio de Janeiro calling. Rio? Ready, Rio. Go ahead. Hello, Miss Richmond. This is Jack Marlowe. Mr. Marlowe, you've heard. Just read it in the papers down here, but I don't believe it. Scott wouldn't do a thing like that. Of course he wouldn't. But they're holding him. They... They're trying to save him. Maybe I better hop a plane. I could be home in a couple of days. Oh, no. No, you mustn't. Mr. Henderson says it's your big chance down there. He says you'll be the greatest sculptor in the world. But he's my best friend and he's in trouble. Don't you worry, Mr. Marlowe. We'll work it out. We'll get the truth. Somehow, some way, we'll get the truth. Well, 
the truth. It all depended on that unknown girl. The girl with the hat. The girl that no one else had seen. But they had seen her. I was sure of that. I was sure that all those witnesses had lied. Someone, someone would have to break them down. Take them one at a time, right from the first. The first. That meant the bartender. And so I went to Anselmo's place. Something for you, miss? Two scotch and sodas, please. Two? Two? You're expecting somebody, miss? Yes. I'm waiting for Scott Henderson. That hit him hard. I could tell by the way he looked, by the way he watched me all night as I sat there at the bar, just staring at him, never saying another word. And when he left at closing time, I followed him. He managed to walk rather slowly at first, almost defiantly, as if he didn't care. And then he went a little faster... And faster. And faster until he was almost running. And then suddenly he stopped and turned. What do you want? Why do you keep on following me? You have something to tell me. You're wasting your time. You know what's going to happen to him. You can prevent it. Get it off your conscience. Don't ask me. Go ask the guy to give it to me. Give you what? Nothing, nothing. It was money, wasn't it? Somebody gave you a bribe. I ain't talking, I tell you. And I ain't staying around here either. I'm going to get so far away from here. Look out! <laughs> He was dead when they picked him up. And all my hopes of getting the truth might have died there with him. Except that next day I had a visitor. Inspector Burgess, who had handled the case against Scott. Miss Richmond, I won't say I did my job poorly. The evidence is taking him to the chair. But, um, since the trial I've done a lot of thinking. I think you should have done it before. Only a fool or an innocent man would have stuck to that silly alibi. And Scott's no fool, so maybe he's been telling the truth. Are you, are you trying to say that... Well, officially the case is closed, but unofficially, I'd like to help. How about it? Oh, Inspector Burgess, I... No, 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 take it easy. we got a lot of work to do. With that bartender gone, I figure that drummer is our best bet now. Yes, maybe. He must have seen the girl. Scott said he smirked at her. Yeah, nasty little character. You can take this report along and read all the dope we've got on it. Reading a report won't make him talk. Now, that's just the beginning. Suppose you rig yourself up like a cheap little dame. You know, tight dress, frizzed hair, lots of rouge and mascara. Oh, I don't get it. You will. You're going to that show tonight. A seat in the first row orchestra on the side where that drummer can't help but notice you. Oh. And when he looks at you, you look right back. And uh, maybe you sort of give him the eye. And uh, maybe he tries to make a date. No, maybe about it. If he doesn't, you're slipping. Baby, let me have a look at you. What do you know? You really waited. Well, you asked me, didn't you? I sure did. Hey, when you started giving me the eye, I come near falling right in my drums. Oh, I'm just nuts about drums. Mm -hmm. And you play swell. Yeah, thanks, baby. Oh, by the way, the handle's Cliff. Cliff Milburn. I'm Jeannie. Okay, Jeannie, let's go out and get some drinks, huh? Sure, Cliff. Then maybe later we can go up to your place and uh, sort of have a talk. Mm. Baby, how about a little kiss, huh? Kiss? Why do you think we come up here? You like me, don't you? Oh, I'm sure, Cliff, sure. Oh, it's more like it, Jeannie. Oh, what do you think of my place? Well, it, it ain't exactly what I expected, Cliff. I mean, I mean, with all the dough you make. Mm, my dough goes on other things. <laughs> And a lot of it's going to go on you, too. Uh -huh. Honest, Cliff? No kidding? No kidding. I'm going to make you look class, baby. No junk, either, like this dress you got on. This dress is cheesy. Oh, I suppose you don't like my hat, either. I'm going to stake you to a carload of hats. Ah, oh, Cliff, you're sweet. <laughs> oh, but just imagine you picking out hats for me. Why not? I'm an authority on hats. <laughs> Sure, I get paid for knowing about hats. <laughs> Do you, Cliff? <laughs> the dame is sitting right behind me, right where you were sitting tonight. <laughs> 500 smack of roots for just looking at a dame and saying I didn't see her. <laughs> Did she give you that 500, Cliff? Huh? Who gave you that money? Some man. 
I'll have a cigarette. Later, please, Cliff. What did the man say? Mm, he says no matter who asks, I've got to say I didn't... Give me a cigarette. I haven't got it. Oh, sure you have, right here in your purse. Oh, don't open that, please. Why not? All I want is a cig... Hey. Hey, this paper. Give it to me, Cliff. A police report. It's got my name and all about me. The cops are after me. They sent you here. Oh, no, Cliff, they didn't. Huh? Handing they... me a line saying you liked me. Trying to make me shoot off my mouth. Trying to make... Turn on that light. I can't see. Where are you? Hey, don't go. I won't hurt you. Don't go. Jeannie, come back. Come back, will you? I'm scared. I'm scared. Carol? I'm sure, Inspector. I watched the house from across the way. That's where I phoned you from that delicatessen. He saw her, Inspector. Somebody bribed him. If we can make him talk, I'm... I've got a warrant in my pocket. Here. This is the door. Now stand behind me. Don't take any chances. That's funny. The door's open. What? Uh, and the lights are on. All right, Cliff. You've got company. Come on, Cliff. Where are you? Oh, he's gone. My purse, too. He took it with him. He might have gone out the back. There's a flight of steps that... That... That what? What's wrong? He hasn't gone. He's here on the floor. Behind that chair. All crumpled up. That... That muffler knotted around his throat. Steady now. I'll have a look. Uh, what is it? Is it... Is he... Yes, Carol. He's dead. And this time, it's no accident. Two of them dead now Two of them who wouldn't talk anymore And the time getting so terribly short I felt so helpless All alone But the next day I had a wonderful surprise Scott's best friend Jack Marlowe flew back from Rio. He was so understanding, so kind. This thing has hit you pretty hard, hasn't it, Carol? It's been agony, Mr. Marlowe. If I could only find that woman. One word from her. Yes, I was with him that night, and Scott would walk out a free man. Uh, Scott said there were several people who saw her. Have you tried them all? Oh, I tried two of them. Now they're both dead. There's only that singer left now, Estella Montiero. If she won't talk, I... I don't know what I'll do. I can tell you. You're going back to Kansas for a while and take a rest from all this. Oh, I can't. Not until that woman's found. I, I can't think of anything else. You'll wear yourself out. I don't care if it means Scott's life. I... This is a man's job. Let me handle it. Well, I'm sorry. I, I just couldn't sit down. I tell you, I'm afraid for you, Carol. Don't worry about me. Just find that woman. We've got to, Mr. Marlowe. The murderer would kill her if he could ever find her. Yes, I think he would. I... I suppose he'd kill me, too. Don't say that. Do you think I care? Do you think I'd want to live if Scott... If they... Oh, I, I'm sorry. It's all right. I know all about it. I used to watch you sitting at your desk the way you looked at him. I don't think he's ever dreamed that you're in love. His life. That's all that counts now. And it looks so hopeless. Someone, whoever it is, always gets there first. He's so clever. Yes. There's genius behind such audacity. No, not genius. Only madness. Madness is a frightening word. What else can you call it? To go on killing. But we will find him, all right. We'll find that woman. We'll work together, Mr. Marlowe. You and I and Inspector Burgess. Burgess? He's hoping unofficially. You don't mind. Mind? Not at all. As a matter of fact, I, I'm glad to have him. Good idea, Marlowe. You're taking Carol to dinner. She's been running herself ragged on this case. I'll take her to dinner, Inspector, if she ever finishes dressing. She's been in there almost an hour. Oh, well, girls. 
She's been taking this thing pretty hard, hasn't she? Well, I don't blame her. I thought this case would be a cinch at first. Get the lowdown on everyone, friends, relatives. So I did, even you, Marlowe. Though I knew you were Scott's best friend. I was in mid-ocean when it happened. Oh, that's not important. None of you could have committed those murders. Why not? You're all too normal. And you're sure the murderer isn't normal? You know, possibly he's just very clever. (laughs) Yeah, they're always clever when they're insane. Insane? Paranoiacs. They all have that ego, that abnormal cunning, that contempt for life. You make him sound unbeatable. No, no, it's just the time element I'm worried about. Scott's only got a couple of weeks. But eventually, you're quite certain you'll catch the murderer? I'll stake my reputation on it. You might lose. Oh, no, I won't lose. I know his type too well. We used to talk about the criminal type. Criminal type, my eye. It's not how a man looks, but how his mind works that makes him a strangler. Someday, we'll train the mind as we train the body. And then they won't need any men like me, and that'll be all right, too. Sorry I'm all wound up tonight. Tired, I guess. You know how it is. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I think... Marlo, what's wrong? Easy now. Let me help you up. I'm all right. Just got a little dizzy, that's all. I've been having these headaches. Headaches? Nothing serious. I... Well, I'm ready. I said I'm ready. What's the matter? Is anything wrong? Not at all, Kansas. We were just talking. Yes, I uh, was telling Marlowe I've got to go to Philadelphia tomorrow. Philadelphia? Just for a day. I'm on a case. And, uh, Carol. Yes? I want you to make me a promise. Don't do anything until I get back. I suppose I should have listened to him, but I couldn't. I just couldn't sit by and wait a whole day. I thought maybe there was one person left who could tell me the truth. Estella Montiero, the girl on the show. She would talk to me, one woman to another. So early next morning, I went to her hotel and... Well, I'm very sorry, Miss Montiero is gone. Gone? Are you sure? Her show closed last night. We're just shipping her baggage out now. It's piled up over there in the lobby. Oh, thanks anyway, I... Excuse me. Is that hers, too? That hat box? Oh, yes, yes, that's hers. You're sure? You're absolutely sure? Why, of course. She has all her hats made by Madame Katisha. It was true. Katisha had made that hat. That one that Miss Montiero had worn on the show. She had made that hat and a duplicate. I finally forced her to admit it. For Miss Anne Terry, Hillhaven, Long Island. Jack, Mr. Marlowe, drove me down. And all the way we kept asking each other, if Miss Terry had spent that evening with Scott, why hadn't she come forward to save his life? And then at last we had the answer from Miss Terry's nurse. She's been very ill for weeks. Quite irrational. It often happens in these cases of shock. Shock? Yes, her fiancé died just before their wedding. He was sick only two days. Oh, that's too bad. She seemed to take it rather well at first. Until that day she went into town. She didn't come back till late that night. That may have been the night she met with Scott. If we could just talk to her. Carol, if she's irrational. Oh, that's right. Wouldn't help. Nurse. Nurse, could we see Miss Terry's hats? Why, of course. They're all here in this closet. At least if we could find the hat, we could prove that Scott was telling the truth. Then maybe they... Yes, miss? The hat. There it is on the shelf. I was so terribly happy all the way back to town. But Jack, Mr. Marlowe, was acting strangely. Sort of dazed and confused. He said he was having one of his headaches. And we got, when we got to his place, he stretched out on the divan and closed his eyes. After a while, he seemed to be asleep. So I tiptoed into the bedroom to freshen up a bit. I remember I was looking for a comb. I opened the top dresser drawer and... And it was there, lying in the drawer. The purse I'd lost at Cliff Milburn's place. <laughs> I knew who had murdered Cliff. I knew who had murdered Scott Henderson's wife. 
For a moment, I stood there frozen, terrified. And then... Carol? Carol, what are you doing? I'm just freshening up a bit. I, I'm coming right out. There. There, don't I look better? I, I thought you were asleep. That light it hurts my eyes. Turn it off, please. Of course. My tie feels like it's choking me. Mind if I take it off? No. Thanks. You opened the dresser drawer, didn't you, Carol? No. Yes. You saw what was there, the purse. Oh, please. Please, let's not talk about it now. I... We can meet tomorrow. It's getting late. I... Out of go. It's no use, Carol. The door is locked. Locked? You did kill her. You did. Burgess thinks I was on the boat. He doesn't know I got off before it sailed. She promised to go away with me. When I went back to get her, she laughed. She kept on laughing. I had to stop her. You killed her. And you let them blame Scott. What should I do? Give up my life, my work? You let them blame Scott. What's his life beside mine? A stupid engineer working in sewers, drain pipes, muck. You did it all. You bribed that bartender and Cliff Milburn. And then I flew to Havana and caught the boat there. Don't you think I was rather brilliant? I think you're mad. Don't say that. Don't say it, you hear? You're mad. You're sick. Those headaches of yours, they're all part of it, aren't they? I didn't want to hurt you, Kansas. I tried to warn you. You wouldn't listen. And now... No. You're the only one who knows. The only one... Open up, Marlowe, open up. Burgess. Come on, Marlowe, I know you're in there. I've been trailing you all day. It couldn't. It couldn't. All right, if I have to break it down. That noise. Make him stop. My head. My head. Everything's spinning. Make him stop. I can't stand it. Make him stop. Make him stop. It's all over now. Scott has been cleared and we're back on the job. The same old job, the same old routine, the same old boss who doesn't dream his secretary is in love. So I start the day like any other. That means the dictaphone to get my instructions for the morning. Hello, Kansas. I won't be in today. I've got a lot of important things to tend to down at City Hall. Well, that's that. Uh, uh, uh. Don't hang up yet. I think I'm going to need you tonight. About 6.30 for dinner. What? 8.30 for the theater. Oh. And after that, on to dance and have some fun. Oh, Scott. I mean it, Kansas. Tonight, and tomorrow night, and the night after that, and every night, and every night, and every night, and every night, and every night. Thank you, Louise Alberton, Walter Abel, Ralph Bellamy, and David Bruce. Thanks also to Wilbur Hatch for the music and to William Lawrence for his direction. For our next performance from the Globe, we've arranged the revival of a very important motion picture. Not only a great story, but a theme which is, which is significant to all people who are concerned with the proper functioning of democracy. This is the Oxbow Incident with the stars Edward Arnold... Henry Davenport, and William Ive. Here's a scene or two by way of preview. I don't suppose many people remember it now. It was back in 1885, you see. A small thing, not much. You might say... Just an incident. The town looked almost deserted that day. A few wooden shacks, a blazing sun, one dusty street, and nothing moving except an old, tired, mongrel dog. Until that cowhide came pounding down the road, 
pulled up his horse in front of Darby's saloon and yelled, Hey, men! Where's everybody? Where are you, men? The boys came piling out of the bar. And pretty soon, by the way they sounded, I could tell that something was wrong. So I left my place. I ran the general store, you see, and went right over to find out. Darby was the one who told me, standing behind the bar, polishing glass. Someone got Larry Kincaid last night. They found him laying in a dry wash this morning. Dead? Shot right through the head. But who? Kincaid didn't have any enemies. Who'd do a thing like that? There's been a lot of cattle stolen this year. You mean rustlers? Mm, Maybe. Jeff Farnley's taken it pretty hard. Him and Kincaid were buddies. Yes, I know. Then the other boys are kind of hot, too. They find them rustlers they might do something about. A lynching? I wouldn't be surprised. You've just heard a sampling of the forthcoming fare from the stage of this service men's playhouse. At our next performance, the Globe Theater presents Edward Arnold, Henry Davenport and William Ive in The Oxbow Incident. By the way, if there's some particular movie story or stage play you'd like to have us plan here in adaptation form, drop us a note, will you? Or if there's some star whose voice you'd like to hear over the Globe Theatre microphone, just tell us the name and we'll do our best to arrange for the people you want to hear at the earliest possible date. The address remains Armed Forces Radio, Los Angeles, USA. Until the next performance from the Globe Theatre, then, this is Herbert Marshall saying so long, and I'll be seeing you. Theater with Herbert Marshall as host and master of ceremonies. The Globe Theater is presented for servicemen and women of the Allied Armed Forces all over the globe. Listen for our next Globe Theater production soon. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. the biggest of all game, public enemies that even the G-men cannot reach, the Green Hornet. With his faithful valet Cato, Britt Reed, daring young publisher, matches wits with the underworld risking his life that criminals and racketeers within the law may feel its weight by the sting of the Green Hornet. Ride with Britt Reed as he races toward another thrilling adventure. The Green Hornet strikes again. Hurry, Cato, here's where we smash a smuggling racket.
This is the customs office right here, Axford. Golly, it's a big place, Lori. What's all this courtyard for? Do they hold parades or something? <laughs> you lug, don't you know what a customs office is? <laughs> what are you trying to do? Make me off to be ignorant? Now, with you, that's not necessary. I can see the proof right before my eyes. Oh, he's been a detective for nothing, Lori. Mm-hmm. The police department would give you an argument on that. The customs office is where, uh... It's where, um, uh, well, golly, it's where the customs inspectors hang out. Surprise, you do know something. And if that ain't the answer, I... I... Holy crow, you mean I hit it right? <laughs> For you, it's a bullseye. The customs offices where people coming into the country make their declarations. Declarations of independence? No, oh, you sap. Declarations of the stuff they're bringing into the country. Now, look, see that guy with the cap ahead of us? Yeah. Standing next to the truck? Is he a customs officer? Yep. Uh, the guy with him is giving him some kind of argument, huh? It looks that way. Suffering snakes, Lodi. Look at that trunk. It fell off the truck and got all smashed open. Say, maybe there is some news here. Huh? Gunnigan gave me this as a routine assignment because things were dull. But who knows? Maybe that guy's important enough to give us a story for the Sentinel. Come on, let's go over there and listen in. This is outrageous. I shall notify my government. I am the vice counsel for my country in this city. You have no right to inspect my luggage. It was a mistake, Mr. Smith. You did it deliberately. Even a blind man could see the diplomatic seals on my baggage. You brought in eight trunks. That's a lot even for a diplomat. I shall report this occurrence. There's no harm done. We'll send your stuff to your home. No harm? What is this trunk here? You deliberately let it smash open. Okay, I did. As a matter of fact, Mr. Sneed, I wanted to see what was in that trunk. This is an outrage. There's been plenty of smuggling going on. Look at the contents of this trunk. What of it? Nothing in it but lace handkerchiefs. Imported lace. What are you doing with a trunk full of imported lace handkerchiefs? You have no right to ask questions. Yeah, I know. Diplomatic immunity. Those handkerchiefs are for the consulate. I, uh, I may give some away as gifts. If you ask me, you're smuggling them in. For the last time, you have no right to question me. I will lodge a protest against this. It will be hey, no... Hey, this is pretty expensive lace, isn't it? How dare you? Golly, look at all the decorations on it. Give me that. Hey, take it easy. For the last time, I've had enough of this prying. Who are these two? Search me. We're reporters, mister. From the Daily Sentinel. Reporters, sir. There is no story here. Go back to your paper. Carly, what's eating you? This, this oath. Meaning me, Mr. Sneed? You and no other. I am leaving. I am going to the consulate, and I warn you. Unless these trunks are delivered at once, with none of the diplomatic seals tampered with, I shall see that you lose your job. Your government will pay damages for that broken trunk as well. Holy crow, he's mad enough to chew nails. Hey, what's all this talk about smuggling? Who is that guy? Name's Sneed. He's a foreign diplomat. If you ask me, the guy's using his diplomatic job as a cover for smuggling. Huh? Well, what are you going to do? Me? I can't do a thing. You heard him yelling about his immunity. Holy crow, you mean he's bringing in stuff without pay, no duty? Yeah, but just try and pin it on him. I'll be lucky if he doesn't get my badge for this. You guys might as well go peddle your papers. I'm in hot water enough already. <laughs> Call reporting, Lowry. I send you out to cover a custom house. And what happens? Don't again. I'm too bit diplomat gets riled when a trunk busts. And you're told to go peddle your papers and you go. Sure, I went, Gunnigan, because I had something better. Mm, I see. You're too important for a little assignment like the customs house, eh? Wearing a balloon where your head ought to be, huh? Or is your work on the Daily Sentinel beginning to bore you, Lowry? Oh, for Pete's sake, Gunnigan, give me a break. I tell you, I got something. Yeah. And maybe I can prove it right now. Maybe. You better. Casey. Hey, Casey. Have you two finished your word battle? Your final round, Casey. Did you tell the boss we wanted to see him? I don't see why Reed has to be smart. My inning, Gunnigan. Well? He said he'd be right out. Oh, here he is now. Yes? What's this about? Okay, Larry. Give, boss. I swiped a handkerchief this afternoon. I want you... grief, Larry. Swipe. See? Now he's a kleptomaniac. Okay, then borrowed. But Sneed doesn't know I have it. Sneed? At the customs house. He's some half-pint vice consul. When Axford and I got there, he was having a terrific argument with one of the customs officials. A diplomat shouldn't have to argue with the customs. That's what he said. There was a busted trunk, and I took this handkerchief from it. Gosh, that's a beauty. This guy sneed at a dozen trunks, and the one I saw was jammed full of lace hankies. So, instead of a story, Lowry comes home with a lace hanky. It's one of the loveliest I've ever seen. Well, what Hey, Casey, you don't have to grab it out of my hand. Lowry, are you sure you're not pulling a gag? Huh? Are you sure this hanky didn't come from Creevy's? Creevy's? The department store? They've made a feature of imported lace handkerchiefs like this at a swell price. Miss Case, you're sure they're the same as this one? Mr. Reed, that's one thing a woman knows. Materials. And you got this at the customs house, Larry? Out of Sneed's trunk, boss. What is this, a memory test? It's more than that, Gunnigan. Huh? Larry said he had a story, and I believe he has. 
Right, Larry? Check, boss. I have the same idea about this guy, Sneed, that the customs official had. Customs official? And he didn't mince any words, either. He told this guy off, even though it may mean his job. Gosh, Mr. Reed, I smell a mouse. Not a mouse, Casey. What you smell is a smuggling racket. What? Larry, you're suggesting Sneed is smuggling these in? He had plenty, and Casey saw them in that store. Well, maybe you are a reporter. But, Mr. Reed, the department store may have gotten the hankies some other way. Some honest way. Why not? This guy hasn't got a corner on lace hankies. What about the price, Miss Case? Did Creevy's offer them at a low price? Yes, Mr. Reed. It was much cheaper than anywhere else. It's a natural, boss. Creevy's is a big firm. They sell plenty of these things. Who's going to trace them? Yeah, that's true, Larry. It would be difficult. Sure, Larry. You missed your calling. You're not a reporter. You're an amateur sleuth. What reporter isn't going to... Gosh, Mr. Reed, if this is true, think of the thousands of people that are buying smuggled goods. And the thousands this guy Sneed is picking up. Reed. Can't you turn any place without running into a racket of some kind? I'm afraid not, Gunnigan. Every place you look, somebody is raking in the chips. I'm doing it by stacking the cards. Smuggling in lace. What can be done about it? Can't Sneed be arrested? Without proof, Casey? Even with proof, Miss Case. Remember, Sneed is a foreigner in this country under diplomatic immunity. All the police could do is make him leave the country. I see. The people who purchase these handkerchiefs will be out of luck. Why? For possessing smuggled goods, Casey. It'll be a mess all around, Miss Case. If one thing gets me, boss... How does Sneed deliver this goods to the department store? Who's he working with? Gunnigan Lowry dug this up. Can you keep him on it? You think there's a story? Perhaps. Okay. Where do I start? I got the police in on this. Give them the tip. Cover Sneed. Make a tent, boss. You find out who he's dealing with, there's something for the police. And plenty for the Daily Sentinel. Now, whatever you get, phone it in. I'll have a rewrite man handy. Sneed's going to have to move those goods fast, and the Sentinel wants to know how. <laughs> That evening, Britt Reed returned to his apartment and gave certain instructions to Cato, his valet and the only living man to know him as the Green Hornet. Do you understand what I want, Cato? Yes, Mr. Britt. A chemical ink that'll be invisible for a certain period and then begin to show up. You can do that? It's easy, Mr. Britt. Laurie and Axford are with the police shadowing Sneed's home. Even if they have some idea about who's working with Sneed in his smuggling racket, they may be unable to get proof. And that puts it up to us. You go out tonight? Tonight, Cato. As the Green Hornet. Go down to the hiding place of the Black Beauty and start preparing the chemical. I'll join you as soon as I hear from Lowry. Hello? Boss? Yes, Lowry, what is it? I called Gunnigan. He said you left word to ring your apartment. Will the police have any news? party, boss. Axford and Moran and I have been checking the guests. Come on, get to the point. Moran spotted one of the guests. Looks like our hunch was right. Don't tell me Sneed's trying to move that lace now. No, no, not yet, boss. But one of the guests was from the department store. Was it, uh, Creevy himself? Not Creevy, boss. Creevy's daughter. Creevy's daughter? Oh, looks like you may have a story, Larry. If we get anything else, I'll give it to Gunnigan tomorrow. Yes, do that. Good night. Night, boss. Creevy's daughter, huh? If anyone could get goods smuggled into the department store, she could. I think I'll go to that party myself. Britt Reed went through a sliding panel in the rear of his clothes press, then along a narrow passageway hidden within the wall of the apartment house, which led directly to the supposedly abandoned building where Cato's laboratory stood, next to the sleek, streamlined car of the Green Hornet. Are you almost through with the chemical, Cato? Yes, sir. You report in this container as soon as you add the reagent. I'm adding it now, Mr. Bait. Your knowledge of chemistry comes in handy, Cato. Here, I'll hold the funnel. Now cap this container and put it in your pocket. Do I have the hornet mask and the gun? In the car. Well, do I have the black beauty, Cato? We can't get too close to Sneed's place with the police watching. We'll leave the black beauty a little distance off and trust to the darkness to get in. It's a dangerous, Mr. Britt. Well, I recall after you left the apartment, Sneed is having a party at one of the guests is Miss Creevy. Creevy? When she and Sneed start discussing the smuggled lace, there's going to be another guest present, Cato. An uninvited guest called the Green Hornet. <laughs>
Ah, Miss Cleaver. Mr. Smith. Oh, this is a lovely party. I'm so glad that you enjoy it. Would you care to dance? No, thanks. I'm rather tired. Can't we just, uh, talk? Surely, Miss Creevy. Here, through this door. Now we can talk privately. You brought in the lace? Eight large trunks crammed full. There was almost some difficulty. What? The blundering customs inspector. Let the trunks fall off the truck. Does anyone suspect? One of the trunks burst open. There was a snooping reporter present at the time. He saw the lace? Oh, just nothing. He didn't suspect. I sent him away hurriedly. But we must be extremely cautious how we transfer the lace to your department store. There's no trouble about that. This particular department happens to be my job at the store. You have the lace here? Below in the basement. When will you pick it up? Tomorrow night, midnight. I'll have the truck. As usual, eh? Yes, the back entrance. We must be extremely careful. If we always. We got away with it before. We can do it again. Fine, then. Tomorrow midnight. Now, perhaps it is best for us to return to the main room and mingle with it. What's that? Excitement from outside. Here, this way. Through the French windows. I see them, Alan. Who's this way? He's on the wrong now, expert. Who are these people? He was right across the line. Who are you? What do you want? Haven't you been seeing nobody around? What does this mean? I am having some people in. What is the disturbance? Sorry, Mr. Sneed. Moran, police headquarters. There's been a prowler around your place. A prowler? Golly, lady, he ain't out. Is it an Moran? He must have got away, Lowry. You... You are that reporter. Why are you here? Well, uh... Holy crow, I tell you why we're hanging around, Sneed. It's on the Never mind, expert. I said never mind. It's nothing, Mr. Sneed. We, we're just covering police news for the paper, that's all. You've been prying, snooping around. Sneed. Huh? Oh, yeah. Yes, of course, of course. I, you must forgive me. I, I'm a little disturbed. So, so much excitement. Was it, um, a robber? I guess so, lady. You've got a lot of jewels in that crowd. Thank you very much for frightening this prowler away, Sergeant. Uh, if he has gone. Sure he has. Sure and Snash, we've seen him too fast for him to try nothing. Whoever the crook was, he ain't hanging around. Not with Michael Axford to nab him. Have you any idea who it was? All we've seen was the shadow, lady. Might have been any one of a hundred crooks. Sure, it's Holy mackerel. mackerel. Listen to that. that. This train's buzzing. What is it? There it goes. Way down at the corner. It's a car. But it's going so fast. I never saw a car like that. Well, take a good look while you can. There's your prowler. But who? Who? Holy crow, who do you think? That's the car of the Green Hornet. <laughs> The Green Hornet at Sneed's party. As Britt Reed's plan gotten underway, before the next exciting scenes of our Green Hornet adventure, please permit us to pause briefly. Green Hornet fans, please stand by for an important announcement. Next Thursday night, November 30th, the Green Hornet is going to inaugurate a new feature on this program when he calls into session for the first time on the air, the Law and Order Roundtable. Your forum of discussion on vicious rackets, the clever men behind them who victimize you and your neighbors, and what he thinks you can do to remedy the situation. Be sure to be on hand when the gavel sounds next Thursday night on this program and calls to order the first meeting of the Law and Order Roundtable. It's a feature for you and for every high-minded citizen in this great country of ours. And the Green Hornet's counting on you to be present. <laughs> Now to continue our story. As the huge streamlined black beauty sped away from Sneed's home through dark alleys, Britt Reed spoke briefly to Cato. The time will be tomorrow night at midnight, Cato. I'll be ready, Mr. Britt. Fortunately, Axford didn't get a close look at me. He spotted me there at the window, but the mask in the darkness gave me a chance to warn you. Just in time, Mr. Britt. You got into the basement. Yes, sir. Were you able to mark the lace handkerchiefs with a chemical? I stumped in. You used that rubber stamp we found on Sneed's desk, is that right? Yes. Good. Even though we were interrupted, there was still time enough to mark plenty of the lace. You went through each trunk. That's right. And the stage is set, Cato. I'll be at the Daily Sentinel tomorrow during the day to keep checking what the police know. Tomorrow night, we'll see if we can trap these smugglers without trapping the Green Hornet. <laughs> Put the brakes on, Axford. You'll go through the wall. Casey, did anyone ever tell you about what a great detective I am? You did, but I still don't believe it. You will when you hear what I dug up. The only thing you ever dug up was a garden. It's news, Casey. Uh, go ahead. Convince me. Super snakes. You don't take me serious. 
So help me, Hosanna. It's real news. News with a capital G. Capital G? <laughs> you fake large news isn't spelled with a G. Who said so? Mr. Webster. That's his dictionary right there. Ah, never mind that. This here news does start with a G. G for what? G for green hand, if that's what. But <laughs> it's excited. Not anymore. But, Casey, didn't you hear me? The green harlot. Axford, what time is it now? Who? Huh? It's four o'clock in the afternoon. Golly, what's that got to do with it? Anyone else would have been calmed down by now. What are you talking about? The same thing you are. I'm talking about the green harlot. That's just it. You've been talking about him ever since last night when you spotted his car at Sneed's place. Axford, don't you realize that's old stuff by now? Holy crow, Casey. I ain't talking about last I night. I can't figure out why you keep up. What? It ain't about last night. The hornet's popped up again? Sure he has. A telephone call to public headquarters. That, that's what I want to see Reed about. Well, that's different. Yes? Axford's here, Mr. Reed. Axford? With a mouthful of news about the green hornet. The hornet? Uh, late development? He's champing at the bit with it. Does he go in? Yes, send him right in, Miss Case. Now. Okay, Axford, that's your signal. But not too fast. Mr. Reed has company. Company? Lowry and Gunnigan are in there. Ah, them two. Go you. up, Axford. Ah, what do you mean? If you're going through that door open at first. It's easier. Ah, you and your guys. Hey, hey, hey Reed. What's this about the horn, Axford? You better be good. You're interrupting something. I came right over from headquarters. What's the scoop? Reed, the harlot's going to be over to Sneed's. Well, I thought that was last night, Axford. So much next. I just finished going through that once with Casey. He's going to be there again. Holy mackerel, boss. What's he after? Well, there's the smuggling business. Don't tell me the Hornet's interested in that. Why not? Read you. You seem mighty sure of yourself. Do I? From what Larry said, this smuggling was a team of two. Sneed and Miss Creevy. Now you're ringing in the Hornet. Well, he, he was there last night, Gunnigan. Sure, we seen him. So it seems logical to suppose he's concerned in some way with this racket. Mm, yeah, that's true. Who took this phone call, Axman? Over at headquarters, Reed. Uh, Moran took it. But he couldn't find out who was giving the tip off. Do we stand another watch, boss? You do, Larry. The Sentinel can use that good story. Help circulation. <laughs> Golly, Reed. Oh, why don't you come along? It's going to be a lot of excitement. Yes, perhaps I will, Axford. Perhaps I will. I- I'm telling you, I've been in training. If I get near that green harness, I'll... You'll do it. nothing. You guys remember one thing. You're a newspaper man. Ah, good Your good business good. is getting the news. Leave the green harness to the police. You get the story into the Daily Sentinel. <laughs> Doing here, Casey. Eight o'clock. You closed up your typewriter long ago. Didn't you know, Gunnigan? I wanted to go along with Axford and Lowry. Oh, I get it. You couldn't be right on the scene, so. Oh, so you... I'm staying here at the Sentinel to learn the news when they phone you. Well, maybe a long wait, Casey. Oh, I don't mind. I have my knitting. Okay. <clears throat> we'll hold down the lobster shift together. Holy crow, Miranda. There's the clock hit nine already. Ain't we going out to nab the harlot? According to that phone call, we got three hours yet. You ought to provide softer benches for the working press. I bet this bench is hardwood. Uh, do you think Reed is going to be there tonight, Lodi? Mm, I don't know, Axford. He said maybe. Your guess is as good as mine. All I hope is that the hornet is there. <laughs> What do you say, Creevy? Ten o'clock. It's too early. I'll give the order. Oh, Joe's downstairs with a truck. Wait. Can he wait? We leave for Sneeds when I say so, not before. Mr. Breath, eleven o'clock. Yeah, it's time for us to start moving, Cato. You understand what you're to do? Yes, sir. We'll use both cars tonight. You'll drive the black beauty. I'll take the small sedan. I'm going to come in at the finish. I can't have Lowry and Axford wondering how I got there. I understand. I'll meet you at the entrance to the alley two blocks south of Sneed's place. Keep the hornet mask and the gun and the black beauty with you so I can pick them up. I have them. The gun is loaded? Yes. And that's all, Kato. Get going. Take the black beauty out of here. I'll meet you in a few minutes. <laughs> Here's the squat car. Pile in. Come on, Axford. Move those dogs. We're going to Sneed's place now. Sure. Yeah. Us and half the police force. Step on it. That's you, Butch. I'll set you. Three of us can sit up in front here. Yeah. Let's go. We're going to pick up them laces, huh? Get this bus rolling. Sneed's expecting us. The 
house is far enough, Cato. They are waiting to wait. In the alley behind Sneed's house. It's almost midnight. As soon as that truck pulls in here, we have to get busy. Mr. Baird. Yes, I hear it, Cato. A truck. It must be the one we're waiting for. Listen soon now. Give me the hornet mask. Put yours on. Yes, sir. And the gun. Here. Remember, as soon as we're through here, we race for the Black Beauty fast. I can do the mask and gun, get in the small sedan, and come back here. To make sure the Black Beauty gets away with you in it. I understand. Get back out of sight. The truck has no headlights on it, but it's going to pass right by us. Back. All clear. Uh, Where's where Sneed? He knows we're due. Who's that? Is that you, Creevy? You fool, turn out that basement light. It's going right at us. So what difference? No one suspects that you were here for the smuggled goods, no? Come on, cut the talk and let's get going. Yeah, you amateur crooks give me a pain. If you're talking about me, I... Shut up. This ain't no time for argument. Butch and me will get the stuff out. You stay at the wheel. Uh, I stay at the wheel? Yeah, them trunks is heavy. I will open the back of the truck. Here. Better take this. A gun. In case there's some trouble. Very well. But there will be no trouble. I shall watch from a little further down the alley. Come on. We gotta grab them trunks and load them in. As the two men worked fast, making a trip for each trunk, Britt Reed and Cato moved closer to Sneed, sticking to the shadows. Okay, Sneed. We'll be out of here in a minute. I will watch. Those fools. What reason is it to keep a lookout? There is no one here. I'll take that gun. Who are you? A gun. That mask. I've seen pictures of it. The green hornet. going in that truck, Sneed. Now what for? Now before your thugs return on that last truck. You cannot do this. I can't. You'll shoot. Yes, I, I cannot read that. Uh, they are coming. Quick, give me a hand. Into the truck with him. Way back where can't be seen. The knock it off. Hurry, time for us to get out of here. Uh, uh, okay, heave it in. Uh, slam the doors. All through, Sneed. Uh, that's the works. Hey, where is Sneed? I don't know. Yeah, he maybe don't like the dog. He's got my gear. I'll go in and hurry No up. time. Come on, we got to get this stuff rolling around the front. All set, Miss Creevy. We can get moving. Where's Sneed? Come on, come on. We ain't got no time for saying goodbye. We got the goods. Let's deliver it to your store. But, but he always... He didn't this time. This stuff's hot. Come on. Yeah, step on it. It's 12 o'clock. As soon as we get out of this alley, you better snap on the light so nobody won't suspect nothing. As the huge truck rumbled out from the alley, the squad car carrying Moran with Larry and Axford approached from the main street. No sign of the harness yet. Are you think it was a false alarm, Moran? Hey, what's that truck doing come out of that alley? Whoever it is, Moran, it can't be the Hornet. He gives us something a little faster than that. Yeah, you're right. Are you going to look into that truck, Moran? What for? What for? Holy mackerel, you dumb flatfoot. Don't forget what started this whole business. Huh? You're after smugglers as well as the Hornet. That alley is right behind Sneed's place. Sneed? Hey, you're right. Holy crow, step on it. They're going around the corner. We'll get them. Hey, pull over there! Get to the curb! Crowd them in! They won't stop. Swing your wheel and smash into the defenders. Hold on, here we go. Get him. What are you doing? What's the idea of smashing it out? That's far enough. No gun of your move. What's this? Hey, it's a squad car. We've done nothing wrong. It's creepy, huh? That's my name. What of it? What have you got in this truck? I, uh, it ain't nothing. I... I'll tell you, it's late. Holy cow, you're admitting it. You're admitting you smuggled the stuff in with Sneed. I know, Mr. Sneed, but I have nothing to do with smuggling. This charge is ridiculous. These lace goods are for the department store. I'll say this for you, sister. You're a pretty smooth customer. Go ahead. Search the truck. You can't prove anything. I think that's a fine idea, Sergeant. Why not do that? Who's that smug? Reed, good gravy. Where did you come from? My sedan, actually. Parked right behind you. I saw the crash and came over. Okay, you. Open up this truck. Hold the flashlight on it, Axford. That's a gun the sergeant's holding. You'd be smarter to do as you're told. Uh... Okay. Those trunks are full of lace, but if you think you can hit anything on us, you're badly mistaken. Help! Let me out, I... Hey. Well, this looks like quite a party. Oh, Creepy, I, I was gassed to harness. Did, did you get the lace? Shut up, you fool. He's a police. Police? Yes, Sneed. Too bad your eyes were blinded by that flashlight. I am innocent. I, I have nothing to do with this. Nothing to do with what? You can't make any of us talk by these third-degree methods. I tell you, those laces are mine by right, and you can't prove they've been smuggled in. Hey, Reed! Here's one of the uh, handkerchiefs from the trunk. It sure looks like the ones we've seen in Sneed's possession the other day. What of it? Let me see that, Axford. I like it. Well, Sergeant Moran, take a look at this. Oh, holy mackerel. It's got Sneed's name written right across the corner. Oh. My name? Yes, right here. But that's impossible. 
When I brought these handkerchiefs in, there were no names on them at all. And yet, that is my signature from my rubber stamp. You fool! Give me that, that rat! No, you don't! You've ruined everything! Take it easy, Miss Creed. It would have made no difference if Sneed hadn't talked. I know better than that. You'd have been sunk plenty. These signatures were all the proof any court would need. Yes, yes, the signatures. I, I do not understand. Holy glory! What is it? Would you take a sniff of this handkerchief? Hmm... Whoever did it must have used invisible ink for those signatures. Invisible ink? Yes, you can tell by the characteristic odor. This was done with a chemical that doesn't begin to show up until 24 hours after it's applied. Well, what do you know? Invisible ink. Gary, who was it? Come on, Sneed, spin it. There is only one answer for that. It was the man who gassed me. The man who ruined our plans. The Green Hornet. just heard the adventurer, the smuggler, signs his name. These exciting dramas originate in the studios of WXYZ Detroit and are sent to you each Thursday and Saturday at this same time. They are copyrighted features of the Green Hornet Incorporated. The events and characters in tonight's drama are fictitious. Any similarity to persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Why, Mr. Connors, what are you... Okay, oh. back up inside fast. What you... Inside, Mrs. North. Hurry up and you won't get hurt. But if you stall around, you're in trouble. Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Alice Frost and Joseph Curtin. Listen as Pam and Jerry solve the mystery, Wheel of Chance. Mr. and Mrs. North, transcribed, is brought to you by the Colgate Palmolive Feet Company, makers of Halo Shampoo to glorify your hair, Colgate Brushless Shaving Cream for tough beards and tender skins, and Colgate Chlorophyll Toothpaste to help destroy unpleasing breath originating in the mouth. Take any brownstone building on any New York side street, Walk in, look into any room, and the odds are four to one you'll find someone waiting for a phone call. In this case, his name is Harry Connors, occupation dubious, past shady, state of mind, tense, distraught, nerves jangling like... Yeah, about time. Hello? Connors? Yeah, where you been, Lorenz? I've been waiting... You're nervous, Connors. Irritable. Now, look... Sign of insecurity. Lack of confidence. Yeah, your telegram said you'd call... I'm calling long distance, my friend. Words are expensive. Uh, okay, Lorenz. Pencil handy? Yeah. Take this down. It's a gray convertible 1953 model. Okay. New York license plate? Yes, license number 24S373. 24S373. You can learn the name of the owner from the Motor Vehicle Bureau or whatever it's called in New York City. Now, that'll be easy. You'll find our uh, prize in the left front wheel. Understand? The left front wheel. Okay. Car should be in New York in the next 48 hours. A young couple driving. They went through customs here at the border two days ago. Uh, no trouble. Why should there be trouble? They seemed like such respectable people. Pam. Pam. Oh, <laughs> I must have dozed off. Where are we? Home. Vacation's over. Home? Mm-hmm. Oh, Jerry, I couldn't have slept that long. You slept through half of New Jersey and most of the Bronx. Oh, impossible. I wasn't sleepy. <laughs> you must have been driving too fast again. Only as fast as the law allows. Uh, grab the little suitcase, dear. I'll, I'll get the others. Three glorious weeks across the border. No. This. I'll uh, help you upstairs with the luggage and then run the car down to the garage. What for? Needs a tune-up. I'd like to have it sometime tomorrow. Oh, uh, hmm? oh excuse me, folks. Yes? Uh, you're tenants in this building, aren't you? Yes, we are. Well, me too. I just signed a lease this morning. Well, that's very nice. I'm uh, kind of getting acquainted with the neighborhood. 
from out of town, you know, and uh, I can't get used to this New York parking situation. Well, just between us, you you never will. <laughs> Any place around here a guy can keep his car without getting a ticket or a, or a dented fender? Well, Jerry usually keeps ours on that street behind the building, uh, don't you, dear? There's usually a space or two there. Oh, well, thanks. That's good to know. Oh, here, let me hold that door for you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Uh... Uh, Connors. Oh, well, Connors. good luck in your new apartment, Mr. Connors. Oh, thank you, Mr. North. I'll uh, be seeing you around. Right. Uh, come on, Pam. I want to get to the garage. Pam. Jerry. Darling, the garage closes. Jerry, at... do we know that man? Connors? No. Well, then how in the world did he know our name? <laughs> Yes, ma'am. What can we do for... Oh, you. Oh, that's a fine way to greet a customer, Toby. Smile, baby. I'm busy, Anita. What do you want? Oh, that's funny. Your greetings used to be so much cozy. Anita, I can't talk here. Where will we talk, baby? Your place? I get your wife to invite me over. She'd love to hear us talk. There's a car on the ramp. You'd better move. I uh, need more dough, Toby. I haven't got it. You know, doggone well, I haven't got a dime left. Oh, but you can get it, can't you? Anita, for Pete's sake, this is a garage, not a gold mine. Do your prospecting someplace else. You can get it for me. I've got a little blood left. Do you want that, too? When are you going to let me alone, Anita? When do you pull out the needle? Oh, smile, baby. It took me years to save up that last bankroll. And I had to get mixed up with you. I'd hate to have to upset your wife, Toby boy. She seems to love you so much. Oh, move your car, will you? If she knew about us, she'd be miserable, wouldn't she? Hi, Toby. Well, oh, yes, sir. Be right with you. Anita, please beat it. Call me tonight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll call you. Uh, all right if I leave my car back there, Toby. Uh, oh, oh, hi, Mr. North. I, I'll take care of it. Oh, sure. Toby takes care of everything. Oh, who's that? Just a customer. Pretty. Yeah. I uh, think you can get my car tuned up by tomorrow, Toby. I think the spark plugs need cleaning and... Hey, Toby. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. North. Do I... all pretty girls affect you like this? No, sir. Just that one. Pam. Pam, wake up. What time is it? Late. Time to go to bed. Oh, isn't this awful? Three weeks vacation, and then I do nothing but sleep for three days after it. <laughs> oh, scratch my back, would you, dear? Okay. Mm, good. Now, a little higher. Yeah, how's this? Oh, wonderful. We ought to take vacations more often, Jerry. You've only been home three days, Mrs. Uh, Noel. A little to the left. Oh. That's it. Two vacations a year. Well, we'd be healthy. Mm -hmm. And dead broke. Mm -hmm. Now, who the devil can that be? Oh, I'll get it. All right, all right. Just a minute. Why, Mr. Cobb? Okay, oh. back up inside fast. Are you... Inside, I said. Now, hurry up and you won't get hurt. This gun isn't made of chocolate. Well, isn't it rather late to be visiting, Mr. Connor? Well, who is it, dear? Don't answer. Let him come in. Hey, Pam. Who's at the door? What? Come on in, North. Sit down. Hey, what is this? Sit down. You too, beautiful. Uh, yes, sir. What do you want, Connors? Why the gun? It's not chocolate, Jerry. Now, where is it? Where's what? Don't get cute. It's gone. What'd you do with it? I'm afraid I don't know what you're talking about, Now, look, Connors. you two. It was under your hubcap when you crossed the border. It's not there now. I'm warning you, it's important enough to kill for Let's have it, now. Uh, we haven't got it. Then get it. Uh, but... Now. Uh, Mr. Connors, we wouldn't keep a thing like that around the house. It, it Pam, might go... what are you... Okay, so you got it stashed away. I'll give you one hour to unstash it. Uh, at this time of night? Well, everything is closed, Mr. Connors. We... All could... right, I'll give you till noon tomorrow. Oh, we'll need more time Noon that. tomorrow. And I warn you, no funny stuff. You'll be watched. You'll be tailed. You'll... Oh, really, Mr. Connors? Noon we... tomorrow. And like I said, it's important enough to kill for. Well, Pam and Jerry may be in the dark, 
but they can still see they're in trouble. Men, want real shaving satisfaction at a big bargain? Then take advantage of Colgate Shaving Cream's special offer at your dealers now. Here's what you get. A large-sized tube of Colgate lather or Colgate brushless shaving cream free of extra cost when you buy the giant-sized tube of lather or brushless at regular price. That's right. Your choice of a large-sized tube of Colgate lather or brushless shaving cream free of extra cost. For you lather shave cream fans, you'll find nothing beats those clean, close, million-bubble shaves you get with Colgate lather shaving cream. And you men who prefer a brushless cream... Light and fluffy Colgate Brushless is the easy way, not the greasy way, for shaving tough beards and tender skin. Whatever your choice, lather or brushless, take advantage of Colgate Shaving Cream's special offer now. A large-sized tube of Colgate Lather or Brushless free of extra cost when you buy the giant size at regular price. Do it now while dealer supplies of the special pack last. Now back to Mr. and Mrs. North. Okay, now, uh, what did this guy look like? Well, Bill, he was rather nondescript. He was a little shorter than Jerry, uh, but heavier. Medium brown hair, was wearing a gray fedora and a light tan suit. And a gun. Mm. But, Bill, what in the world could possibly be hidden in the hubcap of our car? Oh, anything, Pam. At least anything flat and thin. But how could it have got there? Well, anybody could have pried the cap off while the car was parked. But and... why, dear? And, and, and who? Hey, Bill. What? Wait a minute. Wait just one minute. The garage. The garage? Where I took the car for a tune-up. We didn't have a flat. No, but at a lot of garages, it's routine to check the brake lining. Oh. You'd have to pull a wheel to... Toby may have found something. Who's Toby? The mechanic. Darling, you may be right. Come on. Hey, hold it, Pam. It wouldn't do any good to go to the garage. In that case, there's nothing to do but wait until morning. Uh, now, look, uh, you say this Connors guy said you'd be watched and followed? Yeah, but he may have been bluffing. Uh, maybe he was not maybe he wasn't. Anyway, I, I want you two to go to the garage alone in the morning. But, Bill... Now, now, wait a minute. I'll have a man tailing you to see if you're followed. And if you are, he might be able to grab the guy and we can get to the bottom of this. Okay. But, Bill, what about tomorrow at noon? If Connor shows, my man will be outside ready to take him. Now, there's nothing to worry about, Pam. Golly's, Bill. I hope so. <laughs> Sure, sorry, Mr. North. You said you just wanted a tune-up. You didn't tell me to check the brakes. Well, I thought you'd check them anyway, Toby. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. It depends on how busy we are. I'll be glad to look them over for you if you want. Uh, Toby, uh, didn't you even look under the hubcaps? Oh, no, ma'am. I... Hubcaps? Uh, you know, uh, on the wheels. Oh, hubcaps. Uh, were you the only one to work on the car, Toby? Uh, yes, sir. We've been kind of shorthanded here lately. Uh, and you didn't find anything? And nothing at all? A couple of bum spark plugs. Are they thin and flat? Pam. Well, I... It's okay, Toby. We just thought maybe... Mr. Uh... North, if those brakes are bad or if you're not satisfied, I'll be glad No, no, to... no. Nothing like that. We just lost something and, well, you know... Oh. Anything important? Yes, but don't worry about it. Well, what was it? Oh, nothing important. What? Uh, but uh, if you find anything that looks like it came out from under a hubcap, let us know right away, will you, Toby? It's important. Toby boy. Hello, Anita. Just like old times, hmm? Come on in. Aren't you an AWOL from that grease pit you work in? Yeah. Hmm, sit down. Thanks, I'll stand. Oh, come on. Sit here. I'll stand. Okay, what do you want? I want you to get out of town, out of my life. Smile, baby. I mean it. I made a big mistake getting mixed up with you. I paid plenty for it. Now, I'm telling you, get out of my life. I can? Yes, you can. Uh-uh. I need expense money. You'll get it. From you? Yeah. My last installment. Final payment. You said you were broke. I am. But I struck gold. In that garage? <laughs> In that garage, under the hubcap of a car. Don't make jokes, Toby. Boy, I'm getting tired of Look. you. Look. What is it? Microfilm. The Norths went on a vacation, they said, across the border. They slipped this under a hubcap so the customs inspectors wouldn't find it, but they slipped up. I got to it before they could use it. Let's see. Let me see. A whole spool of film full of spy stuff. 
Names, addresses, even pictures of enemy agents working in this area. And their contacts across the border. You sure it belongs to them? Well, I came in looking for it just an hour ago. It's dynamite. It's worth a fortune. It'll even pay your fare right out of my life. Yeah. Yeah, it sure will. What are you going to do with it, baby? Uncle Sam writes big checks for things like this. The FBI gets the microfilm. I get the reward, and you get... The FBI? Who else? With this film, they And could... the Norths? What about the Norths? The FBI will take care of them. Too bad, too. The nicest people are turning out to be spies these days. Toby, boy, if you ever opened up that pointed head of yours, a moth would fly out. Is that so? Well, here, look at this film. Go on, hold it up to the light. Listen, you stupid little grease monkey. The FBI may give you a reward for that, sure. A box lunch and a bottle of milk. But what about the Norths? What'll they pay for it? Well, that's not the point. I'll they... tell you what they'll pay for it. They'll dig up Fort Knox. They'll steal piggy banks from every kid this side of the Kremlin. They'll hawk their souls and auction off half of Europe to get that microfilm. That's what they'll pay for it. But they're spies. Sure, they're they... spies. You have enough on them to hang them. You can make them pay and pay and pay. No. And pay. No, Anita, I... I can't do that. What do you mean you can't do it? All you have to do is pick up the phone and call them up. No, no, I'll... I'll settle for half the dough and... And all of my conscience. Yeah? Well, I won't. Put the phone down. Get away. Put, put it down, I said. Put it down. Let go. That, that's better. A real patriot, aren't you, Toby? What do I have to do to convince you, Mr. Patriot? You got a chance to rub money in your hair and you're worried about dandruff. Oh, what do I have to do, Toby? Nothing. Let me handle it my way. What must I do, baby? Tell your wife about us. This is a lot bigger than that. This... Oh, a real patriot. All right, come here. Come here, Mr. Patriot. Forget that stuff, Anita. Come here. Forget it, will you? Just like old times, Toby boy. Can't forget old times, baby. Cut, Cut it out, Anita. I... Love these old times. Here. Call the Norths, baby. Call them now. And you were completely in the clear, Jerry. My man didn't spot anyone tailing you. Are you sure? Oh, not a chance. Now, what about the mechanic? Do you think he was telling the truth about not finding anything? It was hard to tell, Bill. He seemed a little flustered. Well, that might not mean anything. Now, you just sit tight until noon. Right, but you're sure your man won't take off for lunch? Well, <laughs> now, stop worrying. Okay. So no one followed us? No. Bill says... Th- oh, I'll get it here. Hello. Uh, Mr. North? Speaking. This, uh, this is Toby, Mr. North. Oh, hi, Toby. What's on your mind? Toby? What's he want? I, uh... I, I think I have the item you're looking for. What? I, I can't hear you, Toby. Well, I, I said I, I think I have the item you're looking for. Did he find it? What is it, Jerry? Can, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Where are you? Well, I, I have to be back at the garage in a little while. Okay, I'll meet you there. Oh, no, no. No, that's no good. Well, you want to come up here or we can go to your house? No, uh, I'll be back here at my friend's place about two o'clock. Two o'clock? Mr. Connor said noon, Jerry. It uh, has to be sooner than that, Toby. I can't make it any sooner. I have to go back to work. Meet me here at my friend's place. I'll give you the address. Uh, take this down, then. All right. Okay, let's have it. 67 Bryce Street. Apartment 1D. 67 Bryce Street, Apartment 1D. Uh, I've got it. Uh, Toby, can't you possibly make it before two? No, that's as good a time to talk business as any. I can't hear you. I, I said it's a, a good time to talk business. Business? What kind of business? Big business, Mr. North. Be sure to bring your checkbook. <laughs> Ten minutes before noon. Where's Bill's man? At the back door. How's he going to know when Mr. Connors comes in? He can hear the buzzer. He... Is the back door unlocked? Mm-hmm. Are you sure? Positive. Shouldn't we check it again? Relax, Pam. It'll all be over in ten minutes. Bill's man can't get in that back door. It certainly will. Jerry, look. Noon, straight up. Oh, why does he have to be so prompt? Well... Here goes. You wait here, dear. Oh, no. Wait there. I I wish you'd have checked the back door. 
Jerry. Jerry. Jerry, why won't you answer me? Oh, oh who, who is this man? It's all right, dear. He's uh, just a salesman. A salesman? Yes, darling. A life insurance salesman. Sixty-five. Oh, here, sixty-seven. Here's the house. Apparently, Bill isn't here yet. I don't see his car. What time is it? Two o'clock exactly. We'd better get up and see Toby. On the contrary, we'd better wait for Bill. Well, he knows the address and the apartment number, doesn't he? Well, I gave them to him when I telephoned after Connors didn't show up. Well, then uh, let's go up and talk to Toby. Bill will be along. All right, dear. I'm too tired to argue. Why do you suppose that man Connors didn't show up at noon? Mm, only two reasons I can think of. Either he got what he wanted or he knows we don't have it. Toby says he has it. Anyway, I'd feel better if I knew where Mr. Connors was. Yeah, so would I. Jerry, wait. Before you close the door. What? That taxi across the street. Hmm? I could swear it's been following us. At least it looks just like the one I kept seeing in the rearview mirror. Darling, there are probably a couple of thousand taxi cabs like that, all the same color, yellow. Well, Besides, if it's been following us, it's probably uh, Sergeant, what's his name, Bill's man. Uh, Come on. Toby's friend lives on the first floor. Must be down this way. 1B. 1C. Here it is. Look. It was unlocked. Now, why in the world should they leave their door... <gasps> What's the matter, Pam? Oh. You... Good Lord. Jerry, she... she's dead. Very dead. Where do you suppose she is? Toby's friend, probably. She's so pretty. Sure. Sure, she's the one. One what? In the garage. She was talking to Toby in the garage the day I brought the car in. Jerry, let's get out of here. Yeah, let's get oh. out of here. Let's all get out of here. Connors, what the... Come on, now, both of you move. Oh, what for? We... Because I like your company. And that... That's still not made of chocolate, is it? Nope. Same guy, same gun. Now, let's go. Where to? Well, you two have a nasty habit. You keep getting in the way all the time. So? So I'm going to see that you're put out of the way for keeps. Now move. Now look here, Connor. You, you heard me. Move. And since you're expecting your cop friend wagon, we'll go out the back way. Well, Harry Connors seems to have a talent for appearing in the wrong place, as well as at the wrong time. Remember, soaping dulls hair. Halo glorifies it. So, Halo, everybody, Halo. Halo is the shampoo that glorifies your hair. So, Halo, everybody, Halo. Yes, there's your cue to lovely, naturally lustrous hair. Soaping your hair with even finest liquid or cream shampoos hides its natural luster with dulling soap film. But Halo shampoo is not a soap or cream. Made with a special ingredient, Halo glorifies your hair with your very first shampoo. Even in hardest water, Halo gives oceans of rich, soft water lather. Needs no special rinse. Halo removes embarrassing dandruff from both hair and scalp. Leaves hair soft, shining, easy to manage. Ideal for children's hair, too. Next time, be sure to buy Halo, America's favorite shampoo. So, Halo, everybody, Halo. Halo shampoo, Halo. Now, back to Mr. and Mrs. North. Why have you brought us to this warehouse? You'll find out, Mrs. North. All right, hold it. Who is that? Connors. Well, Connors, what are these people doing here? Uh, I, I had to bring them, Lorenz. We'll decide that later. Inside. You found the film? Right here. The film, microfilm. So that... Thin, flat spool. You used our car to smuggle it across the border. It was nothing personal, my friends. Your car or another. It just happened to be yours we picked. Of course, as it turned out, we made an unfortunate choice. 
But uh, we had no way of knowing you would take your car to a garage or that you had a friend in the police department. And we had never known Lorenzo if I hadn't put that bug on their phone line. Bug on our telephone line? What do you mean by that? He means he tapped our phone. So that's how you knew that we'd contacted the police and that... Connors is a man of varied and useful talents, aren't you, Harry? Well, I got the film for you, didn't I? Okay, you've got your film. Now what? You brought them, Connors. What do you suggest? Well, I... I I don't know. You must have had something in mind. No, 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 no. look, Lorenz, I told you I had to bring him. I didn't have time to think. I just had to get out of there. Out of where? Lorenz, will you you stop talking? Connors. I have the feeling something has happened that I should be told about. No, 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 Lorenz. Uh, Not unless you already know about the killing. Killing? Shut up, will you? What killing? Don't listen to her, Lorenz. What killing, Connors? What killing? The killing at 67 Bryce Street, apartment 1D, Lorenz. 67 Bryce Street? Connors, what's this all about? Oh, well, I had to do it, Lorenz. I had to. A dame got hold of the film. She wouldn't you give it up. Fool. Well, you wanted the film, didn't you? You stupid. Before I could get out, these two walked in. I told you I wouldn't tolerate bad judgment, Connors. A murder at this stage of our work can only attract attention. I told you we had to work quietly, unnoticed, unseen. I know. You knew, yes, yes, you knew, but that isn't what you did. You've killed one person and you've brought two more here to be silenced somehow. It's a shame, Connors. A shame you tried so hard and failed so miserably. Stay away, Lorenz. A little man and a big job. Connors, stay away. I'm warning you, Lorenz. I'm warning you, Lorenz. I can't watch it. Get it, Pam. Get the gun. I've got it. I've got it, Jerry. Lorenz. Okay. You bungling, brainless. Shut up. Will you shut up? Here. Take the gun, Jerry. Okay, Pam. And stay right where you are, Lorenz. This gun isn't made of chocolate. You can take Connor's word for it. It was Toby in the taxi that followed us to Anita's apartment. Mm-hmm. He was just stringing Anita along, making her think he was going to blackmail us. Oh. That's why he insisted meeting us at 2 o'clock. He wanted to give himself time to warn us, but he missed us at our apartment, and by the time we got Ooh. to... Oh, <laughs> you tired, darling? Dead. You want me to drive? No, dear. We're almost home. Oh, gollies, I didn't sleep a wink last night. I laid awake trying to figure out what could have been under our hubcap. Yeah, uh-huh, so did I. But you're not tired? Of course not. Holy smoke, if a person can't go to s- without sleep for one night, they must be getting old. Well, let's face it, Jerry. We are. Getting old? Oh, nonsense. I never felt better. I feel as young as... <laughs> <laughs> so I see. <laughs> that yawn didn't mean a thing. No, no. No, it didn't. I'm just relaxed. That's all. Jerry. Darling, uh, uh, could you manage to relax a little more quietly? Colgate chlorophyll toothpaste destroys bad breath more effectively. Yes, clinical tests prove Colgate chlorophyll toothpaste destroys bad breath originating in the mouth more effectively, more thoroughly, and for a longer time than a non-chlorophyll toothpaste. These tests with actual cases, men and women who had unpleasing breath, proved Colgate chlorophyll's longer-lasting protection. These men and women brushed their teeth just once, and periodic checks were made on each with a breath-measuring device called the Osmoscope. Even hours later, Colgate chlorophyll toothpaste was proved to give far greater reduction of unpleasing breath. Remember, one brushing with Colgate chlorophyll rids your mouth of a high percentage of decay bacteria, and tests prove a chlorophyll toothpaste can reduce common gum trouble twice as fast as a non-chlorophyll toothpaste. So get the full benefits of a chlorophyll toothpaste. Get fresh-tasting Colgate chlorophyll toothpaste. Every Tuesday night at this time, the Colgate Palmolive Peat Company, makers of Halo Shampoo to glorify your hair, Colgate Brushless Shaving Cream for tough beards and tender skin, and Colgate Chlorophyll Toothpaste to help destroy unpleasing breath originating in the mouth, bring you Mr. and Mrs. North, transcribed, starring Joseph Curtin and Alice Frost. Be sure to join us again next week when Pam and Jerry encounter an angry mob with blood in its eye and a small-town sheriff with murder in his heart in the mystery, License to Kill. The characters of Mr. and Mrs. North are based on those originally created by Francis and Richard Lockridge. 
Tonight's script was by Don Brinkley, music by Charles Paul. Mr. and Mrs. North is produced and directed by John W. Lupton. The Colgate Palmolive Pete Company invites you to listen to their exciting new quiz, The Phrase That Pays, on radio every weekday morning, Monday through Friday, and to the new Mr. and Mrs. North program on television. Consult your local newspaper for details. Joe King speaking. M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Roma Wines present Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Mr. Paul Henry, the star of The Angel of Death, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense. Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness in entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you Mr. Paul Henry in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! December 31st, New Year's Eve. I shall identify myself as John Forsyth, my true name, as I have no reason to fear its being known nor to assume one of a different character. My early life has no place in this narrative, save only to point out with the utmost objectivity that I have always been possessed since my tenderest youth of extraordinary intellectual powers. As witness, my acquisition at the age of 16 of degrees from not one but three of the leading universities of Europe, where, despite my British nativity, I spent my formative years. But this fact has no special significance other than as it applies to those events which were set in motion on another New Year's Eve in London, 15 years ago. For it was on that evening, as I had planned some weeks before it should be, that I stood outside a door and listened for confirmation of the relationship I knew existed between my best friend and my wife. Oh, darling, darling, darling. It's all right now, Pam. It's all right. It's all over now. Yes. Are you happy? Yes, now that we've decided. Yes. Almost for the first time since I can remember. I know, darling. I suppose we should feel sorry for him, but I can't. Not after the way he's treated you. Raymond, what do you suppose you... It doesn't matter, darling. Tomorrow, tomorrow we'll be on the Atlantic Ocean, and within a month we'll be on my uncle's plantation in Brazil, where he couldn't find us if he looked for a hundred years. No, I suppose it doesn't really matter. How long will it take you to pack? Oh, an hour. Well, I ought to be back by then. I just got to pick up the tickets and a few things. All right. Hurry, darling. I will, darling. I will. Goodbye. Goodbye, darling. Good evening, my dear. Why? What's the matter, Pamela? You look as though you'd seen a ghost. Oh, why, nothing. You startled me, that's all. You said you were going out of town for the holidays. And you... You don't usually come in by the back door. You needn't be alarmed. I shall only be a moment. I, uh, forgot something. Can I get it for you? Your anxiety for my every wish is, uh, touching. But no, thank you. Uh... By the way, Pamela, have you any last words? Any what? We may not see each other for a while, you know. John, what are you talking about? What's the matter with you? Oh, my dear, sometimes I wonder if I married you out of infatuation for your beauty or pity for your stupidity. Oh, John, please. Uh, Pamela, where do you suppose we shall all be, say, within the month? Does it really matter so much? <laughs> no. No, I suppose it does not. 
Within the month, I was on trial for their murder. You are Henry Jenkins, proprietor of the Crown and Lion, number 17 Buxton Street. Eh? I'm that one, sir. I am. Henry Jenkins, sole owner Thank of proprietor you. of... Now, uh, will you kindly repeat the words spoken by the prisoner in the dock while in your place of business several weeks ago? Yes, sir. <coughs> Excuse me, sir. About uh, two weeks ago, one night, uh, Mr. Forsythe there, who's a steady customer of mine, although not what you'd call a sociable man. Yes, 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 yes. Well, sir, all me other customers had gone home, and I was asking Mr. Forsythe to leave also, just so I could close up me shutters, you know. When all of a sudden he looks up at me and he whispers, kind of horse-like, Jenkins, I did it. I finally did it. Not knowing what he did, sir, I naturally ask him what he did. And uh, what did the prisoner tell you, Mr. Jenkins? He said, sir, warning me to keep... Warning me to keep it quiet, sir. I found him together and I killed him. And then he laughs in a crazy way and added, And Jenkins, I've hid the bodies where no one will ever find them. Well, that's what he said, sir. So help me a tip. I saw him burning what looked to be a lot of bloody clothes. In the furnace it was. And he didn't try to hide them either. Just stared at me kind of odd-like. And went right on as brazen as you please, he did. He wasn't worried at all. He said the two of them won't ever get away together. Except if they are dead. I heard him say it on the stair landing one night and several other times in their rooms. Pamela, he says, if you don't stop leering at Raymond Tillotson with those evil eyes of yours, I'll see the two of you in your grave. I warn you. The uh, court feels uh, that it is its duty at this time again to remind the prisoner that he has so far made, nor allowed to be made, by counsel in his defense, no cross-examination of witnesses, nor a buttle to the charges made by the prosecution of any kind. And that this attitude can only result adversely to his cause. The prisoner is therefore once more given the opportunity at this time to make such a buttle. Now, does the uh, prisoner wish to do so? No, Your Lordship. I do not. Does the uh, prisoner wish to make any statement of any nature whatsoever in his defense? I should merely like to ask the prosecution one question, Your Lordship. Yes? What is it? Has the prosecution found the bodies? Well, the uh, prisoner wishes to know if the prosecution has yet produced the bodies of the alleged victims of the crime for which he is on trial. Well, uh, <coughs> no, Your Lordship, we have not. That is all, thank you. <laughs> To kill them had been my plan and my intention, naturally. But not in the usual stupid way such things are done, where men gamble their own lives against the lives of those whom they destroy. Every faculty of my intelligence revolted against such a thought. And so, for me, the gambler's risk was needless. So I planned it. It was therefore without fear or question that I stood before the court to hear the verdict which, in all the writing of it, I had contrived against Order. myself. Order! John Forsyth, the court has given most careful consideration to the fact that the bodies of the named victims have not been presented to this court as due evidence and a surety of murder, a fact which admittedly must alter the circumstances of guilt. But this Crown Court... No matter how deeply it desires to aid you, cannot but recognize the fact that you have allowed every shred of evidence and element to point to you as a cold-blooded killer. Under such circumstances, questionable though they may be, I can do only as the King's Lord directs me to do. 
tempered with the mercy of his majesty's court. I hereby sentence you to no more than 20 and no less than 10 years of hard labor for the suspected and willful murders of your wife, one Pamela Felice Forsyth, and one Raymond Elton Tillett. And may God protect the crown and the jurisprudence of this court of his royal majesty. Ten to twenty years. <laughs> it was perhaps a bit more than I expected, but uh, I was content. And it may be that there was even the trace of a smile upon my lips as I left the courtroom. Certainly, it was justified if only by the looks of awe and admiration turned in my direction by the spectators. Clearly, they recognized my genius, and I knew they were thinking of the countless lesser men who had failed in their efforts to hide even one dead body, whereas I, apparently without effort, had successfully hidden two. <laughs> Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as star Paul Henry in The Angel of Death by Alan Cameron. Roma Wines present tonight, nation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of suspense, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. With the holiday excitement over, most of us are glad to enjoy evenings at home again, taking it easy and economizing. What a perfect time to serve Roma California Sherry. Yes, glorious golden amber Roma Sherry adds so much to happy hours at home, yet costs so very little. More Americans every day make Roma Sherry first call for dinner. You'll find Roma Sherry ideal for entertaining, too. Delicious any time. For Roma Sherry is a happy, mellow wine with tempting fragrance, satisfying, natural sweetness, and superb nut-like taste. Roma Sherry, like all Roma wine, is a true wine, unvaryingly good always. Crushed from choicest grapes, grown in California's finest vineyards, then unhurriedly, guided to tempting perfection by Roma's ancient winemaking skills. Bottled at the winery. Get Roma Sherry tomorrow. Now selling at lowest prices in years. Insist on Roma. R-O-M-A. Roma Wine. For uniformly fine quality at low cost. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. And now Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Paul Henry as John Forsythe in The Angel of Death. A play well calculated to keep you in suspense. It was thus that I began my prison term and my association with William Waters, a sallow-faced, ill-favored little man who was to be my chief source of amusement and mental exercise for a long time to come, and to illustrate still further the inevitable triumph of the high intellect over all obstacles and surroundings. <coughs> <coughs> so you're the great John Forsyth, eh? You've heard of me then? Not off, I haven't. The luckiest beggar that ever cheated the hangman. Luck? There is no such thing as luck. Now? And how is it you're sitting here safe and sound? And now it is free as air in 15 or 20 years, instead of stretching your neck at the end of a rope, eh? I'm here because I choose to be here. That is all. Because you choose to be, eh? <laughs> <coughs> uh, now, now, tell me, Forsyth, just between us two, how did you do it? By using my brains. And there's many another tried that before and been caught up with. Simply because they did not really have any brains to start with. No, it's luck, I tell you. Bad luck, like mine. <coughs> you want to hear the worst bit of luck ever ruined a man's life? Well, if you wish to call it that, why not? 
It was like what happened to you in a way. The sweetheart, Agnes, her name was. With the biggest, bluest eyes. Oh, the prettiest little thing you'd ever hoped to see. And you'd killed her. Oh, I didn't mean to. It was the usual, you know, and I, I caught her dead to ride. But she laughed at me. That was the trouble. Threw it in my face, she did. Next thing I knew, something snapped. And when me head kid, there I was sitting on the floor beside her, crying like a baby. And her lying there with her pretty blue eyes staring out of her head and her pretty mouth all twisted. The red marks there on her throat. The marks of these two very ends where I'd strangled the life out of her. You weren't unlucky. You were stupid. You killed her without planning it. Well, and uh, what did you do with the body? Cemented her into the wall of the cellar. <laughs> and the bloke next door had a gas eater. Exploded and blew out the old ruddy wall between us, it did. By the time I got home, there was farming and bobbies all over the place. And there was Agnes. What was left of her? Lying right out in the middle of the cellar floor. For all the world to see. The truly intelligent man foresees every possibility and guards against it. Who could? Who could foresee a thing like that? I could. You could? I stand before you as the living proof of it. In 10 or 15 years, I shall be free because I'm intelligent. Whereas you will rot and die here because you are stupid. Oh, pretty clever, ain't you? Know just about everything there is to know, don't you? <laughs> no, no, not everything. But quite a lot of things. <laughs> For instance, I know something about that cough of yours. Oh, what about it? The color of your skin, the look about your eyes, the way you breathe. I hope you're not afraid to die, Waters. Oh, Gravich, what are you talking about? Have you ever heard of retribution, Waters? What? Oh, the inevitable fate that pursues and at last destroys the criminal mind. A vengeance, you might call it. Ah, uh, what? You don't think anything's going to happen to you or me, do you? No, not to me, Waters. For the intelligent man foresees and prevents even that. But to you, Waters, most certainly to you. Oh, indeed. I know he's going to do all of this. Oh, he is known by various names, Waters, but best known as the Angel of Death. <laughs> Retribution, the angel of death. Absurd, was it not? But a most purposeful absurdity. For the intellectual stimulus so necessary to remaining mentally alert during the prison years ahead was here delivered into my hand. An experiment. And one almost impossible under any other conditions. And William Waters would be my guinea pig. An experiment to determine just how far a man might succeed through sheer superiority of intelligence in breaking down and destroying the mind and the body of another by the simple power of suggestion. I suggested nothing directly, merely a word here, a glance there, drops of water wearing away the stone. <laughs> I got a fever again tonight, haven't I, John? No, no. A touch, perhaps, but that is all. The head feels up. <coughs> that blasting cough, what does it? No, no. You mustn't worry about it. It's very bad for people with your condition to worry. What condition? What condition, John? Why, nothing. People with a, with a cough like yours, people who feel, uh, well, uh, indisposed, that's all. Oh, What's that book you're reading, Nathan? Mm, just a book. A, a scientific book that I got from the prison library. What sort of a scientific book? Oh, a general book on medicine. Things like that, you know. Let me see it. Oh, no, no. You wouldn't understand. Here, give it here. No, please, give it back to me. You wouldn't be interested. Oh. You had it open at this place here, didn't you? This is what you've been reading, ain't it? Well, yes. Uh, among other things. You but... Tuberculosis? Is that what I got, John? Tuberculosis? Oh, don't be silly. There's nothing seriously wrong with you. John, you've got to tell me. <coughs> I 
I, I, I don't want to die. Uh, no, you're not going to die. You take care of yourself. Why should he come to me? I've always been healthy. I'm not old yet. Of course you are not. You're just imagining things. Imagining things? You're worrying too much, that's all. So what makes you think I'm worrying? Oh, I don't know. Uh, sometimes when you're asleep... Uh, uh, tell me, uh, do you ever have dreams? What sort of dreams? Oh, well, about the past or... Oh, oh you mean... About... About her? Yes. Do you ever dream you see her lying there on the floor with her eyes bulging oh. out of her head and her mouth all twisted and her tongue all black no, and swollen? John, don't stop it! And your fingers digging into her no, throat? Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Hey, 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 hey. What's the matter there? Oh, he seems somewhat disturbed in his mind this evening, God. Oh, his mind, eh? Oh, that reminds me. Doctor said we were to try to prevail on him to get out of his bunk tomorrow and get outside, get a little exercise and fresh air. Oh? Uh, you tell him, eh? Oh, all right, yes, I will. What were you two muttering about? Oh, he, he was just telling me what the doctor said about you. Uh, what? Oh, he wants you to stay in your bunk and get plenty of rest. <laughs> Time was drawing near, I knew. The time for what I had planned as the culmination of my experiment. Waters was having periods of definite delirium. But I waited. I waited for them to become more pronounced. Then, one night, when I'd listened to him tossing and muttering for hours in his bunk, I crossed over in the darkness. Oh, no. no. Wait. No. It ain't time yet. I don't have to go yet. No. William no. Waters? Uh, yes. I've come for you, William Waters. What? She sent me, William. She sent me with her eyes staring out of her head. With her black, swollen tongue. No. no. I'm the angel of death. I'll kill her. I'll kill her. Take your hands from my throat. Take your hands. I'll kill you. I'll kill Perhaps that will quiet you. Uh, what's going on here? I had to hit him. The man is out of his mind. He thinks I'm, I'm some angel of death or something. Yeah, you. Come on. Up on your feet. Come on, there, Waters. Now, what's the matter with you? Buster, you. It's you what done this to me. Oh, I was told you he was out of his mind. It's you what's done it to me. I'll see it now. Come on, now. You're coming with me. Come I'll on. kill you, fool, sir. Come on. I'll get out of you. Come on. 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 I'll kill you. I'll kill you. <laughs> it was interesting while it lasted. And I've always believed that given a little more time, I could have ended my experiment successfully. But I had other plans to make now. Plans for the day when I would be free. And at last it came. At last I was walking away from the prison gate a free man. And now began my search. It was not difficult. It led me at last to Paris, to a small apartment, where I went tonight, December 31st, New Year's Eve. Yes? Good evening. Well, good evening, sir. Did you, uh, did you wish to see someone? Oh, you don't recognize me? <laughs> Why, I do, of course, but, um, are, are you a friend of Pam's? I am indeed. Who is it, darling? It's a friend of yours, dear. A friend of both of you. John. What? Yes, in fact, your husband, my dear, and Raymond's best friend. John, it's been... Uh... Fifteen years, yes. You only returned to Paris recently, did you not? Yes, a short time ago. And you never knew that I was convicted and sentenced to prison for your double murder, did you? Murder? <laughs> oh, that was quite as I planned it. I knew where you were, but the authorities did not. John. But perhaps you have heard of a curious legal technicality which provides that a man cannot be convicted twice for the same crime. You see, I've already paid for your murders. And now I've come to collect. 
An ancient debt. Put down that gun. <laughs> I then walked calmly from their rooms. I made no effort to hide my face, my trail, or my identity. I can now defy every element in life and in law. After 15 years, I've committed the crimes for which I've already paid my debt to society. I shall mail this letter to the police, who may give it to the newspapers, or whoever wants it. Although it is now a matter of indifference to me if the world remarks upon my cleverness or my patience. For my life is complete. No man has ever known such happiness. John Forsyth. <laughs> yes, yes. Come in, Madame Leclerc. That's the letter now that I wished you to mail for me. I've come for you, John Forsyth. Waters. I'm not Waters any longer. How did you get out? They said I was insane. So I hadn't been responsible when I killed her. Then they said I was cured. Sane again. And then they let me out. But there was one thing they never knew. They never knew who I really was. What are you talking about? That's why I've come to you, John Forsyth. I am the chosen messenger of an higher power. Look here, Walter, sir. Die, John Forsyth! I... And the story ends with a newspaper clipping. Let me read it to you. Paris, January 1st. This gay metropolis spent one of its quietest New Year's Eves in recent years. In all greater Paris, there were only two recorded deaths by violence, both of which, by a strange coincidence, occurred within a few yards of each other. The first was the fatal shooting by an unknown assailant of an Englishman, John Forsyth. The second victim, unidentified, had apparently leaped from a window or roof of the same dwelling occupied by Forsyth. Police were at a loss to explain a weird black silk robe and cape worn by the man. jean vier Leclerc, concierge of the building, alleges to have heard a voice repeating an English phrase, I am the angel of death, just before the suicidal leap. However, this can hardly have any bearing on the case since the said phrase was undoubtedly uttered by New Year's revelers in the neighborhood. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. How much more pleasureful any meal becomes when Roma wine is served. Yes, a fine table wine such as Roma California Burgundy makes any food taste better, brings out all the flavor, lends romance and friendly companionship to the meal. America's famed hostess Elsa Maxwell says... My simple secret for gracious and enjoyable dining is to serve my guests Roma Burgundy. It's so easy to make your meals more delicious, more exciting, as Elsa Maxwell does. Because Roma wine costs so little, anyone can serve it often. Compliment your next dinner with the fruity fragrance and appetizing piquant taste of red, robust Roma Burgundy. Get Roma Burgundy tomorrow. Now selling at the lowest prices in years. And you get extra saving when you buy Roma in a half gallon and gallon size. No wine but Roma offers you so much for so little. Insist on Roma. R-O-M-A. Roma wine. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Paul Henry appeared through the courtesy of Warner Brothers Studios and will soon be seen in their production, Devotion. Next Thursday, same time, 
Roma Wines will bring you Mr. Phil Terry as star of Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Produced by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. KQW, San Jose, the Columbia Station for the San Francisco Bay Area. From the heart of the jungle comes a savage cry of victory. This is Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle. From the black core of dark Africa, land of enchantment, mystery, and violence, comes one of the most colorful figures of all time. Transcribed from the immortal pen of Edgar Rice Burroughs. Tarzan, the bronzed white son of the jungle. And now on the very words of Mr. Burroughs, the story of the American family Robinson. Born and raised in the heart of New York's teeming Manhattan, George Robinson had always rebelled against the confinement of city life. He wanted to be able to see the open sky at night. Feel the earth beneath his feet. Find adventure. Thrill to the excitement of travel. But marriage and a couple of youngsters had managed to clip his wings. And it was 20 years before George Robinson managed to travel at all. When he did, he found scant satisfaction. No kidding, Poil. I'm exhausted. Taking that subway every night is plain murder. Maybe we made a mistake moving to Jersey. Hmm. You want spaghetti tonight, macaroni tomorrow night, or macaroni tonight and spaghetti tomorrow night? Hey, couldn't we have a steak or some chops one night? I wake pretty darn hard, and I'm getting We can't sick. say for that trip we're going to take someday if we put every cent you earn in our stomachs. Yeah, yeah, I know. But no matter what we do, we never seem to be able to save enough to go anyplace really exciting. Two weeks vacation in Atlantic City once a year. The kids don't mind, George. I don't mind. You don't. Well, I do. A guy has to have some incentive to keep him working from nine to five, six days a week. Summer, winter, spring, fall. Whether he's feeling good or bad, taking a crowded subway. I know I... it's no fun working as hard as you do. I feel the same way. Being cook, laundress, chambermaid, and waitress for a family of four isn't any picnic. Oh, sometimes I think that if I have to face another fried egg before I'm half awake in the morning or wash another load of clothes, I'll scream. Hey, wh what in the thunder is that? It's only Billy. This week he's Tarzan. Wouldn't you think somebody could invent a nice, quiet hero? Bang! 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 bang. <laughs> You're dead. <laughs> Hiya, Billy. You shooting strangers or friends? Bad Arabs. Huh? They came into the jungle to steal ivory. But I killed them. I'm Tarzan. <laughs> Shouldn't you be using a bow and arrow? Ah, uh, they don't make enough noise. You see, George? Well, then, uh, how about swinging into the upper level and calling your sister for dinner, Tarzan? She can hear me upstairs from here. Hey, Marion! Screaming is terribly uncouth, Billy. Besides, I was only in the living room. Well, I thought you were... And furthermore, I told you to call me Marilyn. That's my name now. Since when? Since somebody told her she looked like Marilyn Monroe. Oh, don't be funny. It's just that I, I think the name is prettier. Marion. Well, uh, does uh, Tom think it's prettier? Tom. I don't care what he thinks. I don't care if I never see him again. Now, I'd like to get as far away from New Jersey as I could. India or, or Africa, even. Who we are in India. Africa's the place. Oh, stop that, Billy. 
Well, it's time I got dinner started. Hey, uh, just a minute, Twill. Yeah? No, 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 look. Now, now, don't jump off the handle when I suggest this, because it's not as far-fetched as it sounds. You see, we do have some money in the bank, and if we booked passage on a freighter, we'd still have enough left to buy supplies. And once we got there, I could shoot enough game to provide food. You've seen that sharpshooter's medal I got in the ROTC in high school, and well, the... Well, what do you think, Pearl? The whole idea sounds sensational. What are you talking about? Gosh, I thought you knew. I'm suggesting that we move to Africa. Golly! Double golly in spades. Uh, but think of it for a minute, Paul. A tract as big as Van Cortland Park, where we could raise vegetables and pick wild fruit right off the trees. Why, we dress in animal hides and sleep on pelts and... Wow, so no more dishwashing or laundry or bed-making, Poyle. Mm. Africa, where men are men, and... And women wear rings through their noses. Look, I'm serious. More serious than I've ever been in my whole life. You know, I'm not getting any younger. And this may be my last chance to escape the life sentence of nine-to-five drudgery. It could be your last chance to escape drudgery, too, Poyle. Well, I'd go to Timbuktu to get away from the pile of mending I've accumulated in my feeding basket. Timbuktu I... happens to be in Africa. So I'll put you down for an I vote. Everyone would say we went out of our mind. Well, we care what people say. What do you say, Marion? Uh, 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 Marilyn? Well, it suits me. Maybe when I'm a billion miles away, Tom will realize what we might have met to each other. Well, Billy, we wouldn't take such a step without a unanimous vote, so it's up to you. What do you say, boy? surplus store. I outfit a lot of campers, and I guess camping out just about the same in the Congo as it is in the Carolinas. <laughs> yeah, I suppose it is in a way. Now, um, now, how about this here uh, stove, Poyle? Uh, what do you think? If I never see a stove again the rest of my life, I won't complain. Yeah, I guess I could always build one on a stone or something when we settle down for good. You figuring on going to Africa for good, Mr. Robinson? That's right. We're the, uh, <laughs> the uh, American family Robin. <laughs> I bet. Well, you know, like the Swiss family Robinson that got uh, shipwrecked on a desert isle. Yeah, maybe you better buy one of these here life rafts. What we need is food, just in case the jungle animals haven't heard about Georgia's sharpshooting medal. Yeah, sure, you, you ought to take along a few cartons of these baked beans, a real bargain. Yeah, beans are always good to have on a camping trip. And according to that article we read about prices in Africa, it wouldn't hurt to take a few bargains along. Uh, Boyle, do you think that that Tarzan Billy keeps talking about is real or, or only in books and things? Well, so far as I know, he's only a fictional character. Why? Well, I was figuring maybe we ought to buy some glass beads and stuff like that for him, uh, just in case he does exist and we need his help. <laughs> Though it isn't at all likely. <laughs> yeah, you said it, Mr. Robinson. All that stuff about dangerous animals and savages and that voodoo business, that's nothing but pure hokum to make movies about, put on the radio. <laughs> Yeah, you be as safe in the Congo as you are in New Jersey. Yes, sir. Tarzan! Wanna Tarzan! I need the other knee! Baruah Wanna Tarzan! Have a letter for me? You sure? Give the old Wanna Tarzan. Baruah is for you. I told no one I was coming to this section of the Congo. Runner take Baruah from Liagu to Bekarata. From Bekarata, carried by safari to Tarzan Siko's cabin. He not there, so other runner take to Punya village. Man of Punya give Baruah to chief of Giora tribe. He handle Tengiki. Tengiki find Tarzan. <laughs> 
Well, I'm glad it was as simple as all that. How it ever reached me in one week, I'll never know. All who have Barua say is much important to reach Lord of Jungle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. See, I shall expect you to... Now yeah, you dislike me. My sake. What Barua say? Oh, it's from Captain Lawrence, who should know better than to ask me to play nursemaid to a group of babes in the woods. Babes? Uh, babies, uh, like Kitoto. Kitoto's coming to jungle? Oh, these are grown-up ones, uh, Tengiki. A man, his maki, and his two children. Two children? Yeah, uh, well, now, well, really, neither of them infants, but as ignorant of the jungle as though they were in swaddling clothes. And their parents, too. And Captain Lawrence delayed their departure from Liago as long as he could, but they've left there by this time, and... He expects me to see that no harm comes to them. Tarzan angry. He not do, yes? I have never yet refused Captain Lawrence any request, nor have I ever knowingly permitted the innocent people to come to harm in the jungle. I shall not do so this time. But on this occasion, I shall handle things a little differently than I've done in the past. By the beginning of the following week, George Robinson and his family had covered many weary miles of jungle belt. It was a thrilling experience for all of them. And though no Ascari or gun bearers accompanied them, they were without fear. They did have two bearers, and George marched bravely ahead, brandishing his rifle as he'd once seen Clyde Beatty do in a jungle picture. Behind him came the bearers, carrying a tent, numerous cases of baked beans, and a miscellany of other supplies. In their wake trod Pearl and Marion, and Billy brought up the rear, enthusiastically taking pot shots at cannibals with his cap pistol. Boss! Boss, you guys! Oh, oh, we wait here, Bono! Boss! That's Swahili. Yeah, sure, Swahili or something like that. But they understand English. Yeah, I know, but this lets them know that I'm an old-timer that can't be taken in by any of their tricks. <laughs> They've been trying to tell me they're supposed to get a dollar a day, but I know to go and rate six cents. <laughs> I read it in a book. What year was the book published, George? Bang, 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 bang! I just shot another cannibal. Oh, Mother, make him stop saying things like that. Stop saying things like that, Billy. Well, you uh, enjoying our little hike, Marion? Oh, yes, yeah, sure I am, Dad. It's only that when I used to go on Girl Scout hikes, we, we, we could always stop for a soda or something. Gee, I'm so thirsty I could... <laughs> it's only a coconut, Marion. <laughs> it just missed me. Guess a monkey must have thrown it down. Yeah, it sounds, sounds as though it's got milk in it. <laughs> Your order for a drink was fulfilled pretty quickly, I'd say, Marion. Uh, I'll smash it against this rock over here, and then I'll... Oh! What happened? What's oh. the matter, George? Oh. oh, I was just leaning over to smash the coconut on that rock when something stung me hard. George! Huh? George, don't move! On that rock! A snake! Yeah, well, oh, oh, sure, I, I, I saw it all the time. A perfectly harmless variety. But uh, maybe we better get moving, huh? We can, we can have the coconut later. <laughs> Never good to, to drink on an empty stomach. Tengiki, not think Kitotos keep walk so many days. Seems as though we've been dogging their footsteps for years. It's most difficult to travel so slowly. I like to swing rapidly through the trees. Uh, Nadio, Tarzan is Manu. I may have been raised by apes, and I may throw a coconut like a monkey, but that doesn't make me one. Tarzan almost hit girl with coconut. Now you needn't try to lord it over me just because you scored a bullseye with your blowgun. Matu yell much loud, yes, Tarzan? <laughs> much loud. He was lucky he was a small pebble instead of a dog. We keep following them, Tarzan? Long they keep going? Early this morning, I crept close to their campfire. They were discussing how much further they should go. What they see? Their father's looking for a nice, wide clearing in the heart of the jungle, one where he can plant crops without bothering to cut down any trees. His wife wants to keep going till they find a ready-made home, perhaps a, a cave with steam heat. The girl would like to continue until they stumble across a jungle ice cream parlor. And small boy... He's got his heart set on capturing a tiger. And since there are no tigers in Africa, we may have to continue following them until they reach India. An ice 
say we're lost, George Robinson. Ah, be reasonable, Pearl. How can we be lost when we wasn't going any particular place? If those bearers hadn't left us, maybe we would be going to some particular place. Yeah, they was very unreasonable, too. Yeah, they wanted to get paid. And you would have had enough money to keep them on if you hadn't squandered that $120 for a hunting license. Squandered? I had to have it so as I could shoot game. We had to have meat for our journey, didn't we? What meat, Dad? We haven't had anything but but beans so far. Well, I just thought I'd better wait until we made a permanent camp before I did any serious hunting. If you ask me, you were taken for that $120, George. I bet they don't get $120 from everybody. Not with animals as plentiful as they are here. Uh, Why, there must be a lion or a panther behind practically every tree. I I wish you wouldn't say things like that, Mother. You know, it's a funny thing. We keep hearing animals far away at first and then closer. But just when it sounds like they're going to attack us, we don't hear them anymore. Must be your father's sharpshooter's metal that's frightening them away. Uh, are we going to stand here the rest of the day, or are we going to push on? Oh, let's push on by all means. Billy, see if you can help your father with that buck shop, or whatever he calls it. Buck board, and it's a lucky thing I'm clever with my hands. If I hadn't rigged this up, we never would have carried the supplies this farther. Now, come on, mush. I could use a little mush as a change after all those beans. Hey, Mom! Pop! Look, there's a thatched hut over there, just behind those trees. A brand new one that looks empty. Oh, can you imagine anyone putting up a house around here? I wouldn't go inside if I was you, Billy. Uh, You never can tell what you like. Hey, there's no one in here. Come on, George. I guess if Billy can brave it, we can go inside. Oh, sure. I I only meant to... Oh, well, it's real nice. Separate rooms and everything. Let's see, I could make a kitchen back there. Well, not that I intend to do much cooking, but I... Now, just a minute, Paul. Somebody must have built this house for somebody. Let's just say that Providence provided it for us. But we just can't appropriate it. The real owners might be moving in any day now. It uh, might still be an escrow or something. I don't care what it's in. I'm not budging another step. Well... Mom, there's there's a river right near here. If I slip into my bathing suit, will you wash my clothes while I go in swimming? Everything else I own's in shreds. Mine, too. How about patching my denims, Mom? And if you get time, Poyle, see if you can fix up some sort of beds while I start collecting a little firewood. The Totos move into Hema, yes, Tarzan? Yes, the one that Providence provided. I'd say that young man feels very much at home the way he's swinging on that door. It's a good thing we build Hema much strong. Tarzan, what girl do in strange costume of native woman? Well, that's a bathing suit. And the little fool's going in swimming with a dozen crocodiles to keep her company. I'd better go... Get back in a little while, Ma. Don't worry. My two head for jungle near where is wild bush bark. I'd better follow him, then. You go down to the river and... Oh, now the boy's wandering off. And wife women start pick poison berries from bush. Tengiki, there ought to be six of us to keep the Robinson family alive. Just through one day. <laughs> Waving his arms ferociously and screaming like a banshee, leaped from the bush near Billy, who shrieked for home. And while Pearl Robinson turned away from her berry picking to comfort her small son, Tarzan wrenched the poisonous bush from its roots. By this time, Tengiki had reached the river. Spanking the water with a large stick, he flushed out the half-submerged crocodiles, opened their cavernous mouths to sound an involuntary warning to the frightened Marion. Meanwhile, Tarzan sped through the upper level until he was within sight of George Robinson, who walked blindly toward the alerted bush park. The wild bush pig rushed toward him. Not until the advancing dreadnought was within a few yards of him did George finally realize his peril. Come here! Come here, quick! Come here! Billy, Mary, and hurry! George, wait a minute! Are you all right? What's wrong, Dad? Dad, wait until I tell you what happened to me. I... George, what's the matter? Nothing. Nothing's the 
matter? I just wanted to show you the wild boar I shot. <laughs> The family breadwinner has fulfilled his promise to provide meat for his wife and children. <laughs> About 170 pounds of it is a rough guess. Oh, well, I wouldn't eat any of that fiendish-looking monster. Oh, well, it so happens, young lady, that wild pig is a great delicacy. <laughs> and now we can have pork with our beans. Billy, will you leave that thing alone? Okay, Dad, I give in. But if it's all the same to you, I'll skip the beans for a few meals and go whole hog. <laughs> That's my girl. Dad? Yes, son? Uh, did you want to hear how I bagged this animal? Dad, if you shot that animal, then how come there are no bullet holes in it and it only an arrow sticking out of its back? <laughs> Wake up, Tengiki. Oh? Come on, it's morning. Oh. He, he Giki, much tired. Tarzan and Tengiki not have enough sleep last few weeks. Yes. It's been almost a 24-hour-a-day job. And we have a new assignment this morning. More trouble. Which one this time? All of them. We've discovered that the village of the Hartusi tribe is not too far from here, and they're busy packing up a lot of glass, jewelry, and junk in anticipation of a visit there. Hartusi tribe, much bad people, yes? Yes. I shall have to accompany them on their little outing, without being seen, of course. But I'd like you to go ahead and warn the Hartusi chief that Tarzan shall hold him responsible for any harm that comes to these people. Uh, then uh, remain there and mingle with the crowd that greets their arrival. Stay close to them, Tengiki. They are Kitotos, but nice ones. You you speaking English? Oh, George, you don't have to talk to them that way. That's the only sort of thing they understand. See? One of them's coming towards us. Me speak English. Not others. Oh, well, uh, can you make them understand about these jewels we brought? Just hold beads out in hand. Oh, all right. Uh, here. Probably some sort of an honorary kind. Just like home. Every time you went in to see the boss, he used to give you a new title instead of an increase. I don't see the natives offering us any presents in return for ours, like the book said. Well, they probably think it would be an insult. They, they, they think that I'm some sort of a white god. Well, great white father, I think we better collect our family and start home. I've got to make some dishes out of that clay that Billy found before it gets all dried up. Yeah, and I'll give you a hand after I finish digging up that tree stump. Boy, I worked until midnight last night, but no soap. Those roots must go clear to China. We'll be lucky if we get home by dinner time. I, I hate to mention it, Poyle, but do you suppose there's anything you could do to that ham to make it edible? I've done everything but embalm it. But we won't starve to death for another few weeks unless the can opener gives up the ghost. <laughs> I don't like the way those Hartusi warriors are hanging around, peering into the shack. I'm going to try to find out what they want, and then go in and have a little talk with the Robinsons. Why Tarzan put brown dye on face and body? Because I'm not going to be Tarzan. As a native, I can deliver a threatening ultimatum. Lend me a few of your tribal ornaments, will you, Tengiki? No deal. No one would ever recognize me this way. Hey, Mom. Look, it's Tarzan. How, how did you know my name? How did you recognize me? Gosh, everybody knows about you. But why have you got all that dark stuff smeared all over you for? Billy, it's not nice to ask personal questions. Come on in, Mr. Tarzan. Oh, sure. Make yourself at home. <laughs> 
Hey, this is a real honor. <laughs> you make it difficult for me to tell you why I came to advise you to leave the jungle where you do not belong and where you're worse than helpless. Huh? Why, well, we've been doing all right. We found some strong grass for weaving. We located good drinking water, and the natives in the village near here like me just fine. Huh. Why, they call me Majinga. I do not mean to be unkind, but Majinga means ignoramus. The weaving fiber was placed on your doorstep, and I laid the trail to the drinking water so that not even an infant could have missed it. Yeah, I guess I must have known all along somebody was looking out for us. And frankly, I'm... I'm ready to light out of here. I complained about waking from 9 to 5 back home, but here I wake 18 hours a day just to keep alive, and I don't even get paid for it. And I have to make dishes out of clay instead of just washing them, and weave cloth and make clothes instead of just having to launder them, not to mention everything else I have to do, without any of those blessed conveniences I had back in New Jersey. And I know now that I want to go back to Tom. And you, Billy? Gosh, I can't do anything here without getting half scared to death. Not like listening to the jungle on the radio. I'm ready for home. Yeah, but there's only one rub. We ain't got any money left to get home on. <laughs> oh, but you do have a mountainous pile of empty bean cans stored in your kitchen. Oh, well, there wasn't any rubbish barrel, and I didn't know what to do with them. But... Well, what's that got to do with... The savages laughed at you when you gave them worthless pieces of glass when they possess many precious jewels. But they've been peering in here, admiring the shiny metal tins from which they can fashion many useful instruments and utensils. They're willing to trade this for the empty cans. A diamond? Golly Moses! Gee, even the movie stars don't have diamonds that big. Come on, let's get packed. we got to get going. A native friend of mine will escort you back to Liago, and Captain Lawrence there will help you with the sale of the diamond. I'm happy you've decided to return home for good. For good? Are you kidding? I'm going back and buying up every case of baked beans in New Jersey. Transcribed creation of the famous Edgar Rice Burroughs is produced by Walter White, Jr., prepared for radio by Bud Lesser, with original music by Albert Glasser. And this is a Commodore production. Listen to our next story, another thrilling episode of The Lord of the Jungle. Charles Arlington speaking. E.G. Marshall, come in through the mysterious door which hides the secrets and the sometimes horrors we dare not even think about, but which are nevertheless brought to the forefront of our imagination by the tale you're about to hear. A door, a simple door, shuts us out or lets us into a room. But such a room as we are to visit now is one perhaps we'd be better off avoiding. At least Stephanie Miller would have been better off if she'd never set foot in it again. Or would she? Maybe that was her destiny. And who can question what the fates have decreed? Mrs. Lanning, would you mind awfully if I just sat here in the room a moment? Alone? Of course not. I'll go down and make some tea. Oh, please don't bother. No bother at all. Oh, you're very kind. Sit here and take your time. Come down when you're ready. 
My dear, dear room. You look so different. I really don't like your yellow wallpaper. And there's no rug. Your floor must be cold. <laughs> oh, it's just like old times, talking to my old room. Talking. I don't understand why Mrs. Lanning doesn't like you. Oh, no. Our mystery drama, Stephanie's Room, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Bob Duran and stars Mercedes McCambridge. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Our story begins in a modern tract home in a Los Angeles suburb. Stephanie and Tom Miller are an average couple. Tom's on his way up in his advertising career. And for both of them, it means some sacrifices. I may be a little late tonight, Steph. I uh, have some things to clear up on the Rogers account. Well, that's okay. Now, n- now, look, honey, before you get upset, i got to tell you sometime. Oh, Tom, does this mean another move? Steph, it's my best chance yet. It's New York City, the home office. I'll go in as ad director, a, a vice presidency in two years, no more than three. Uh, look, it's the start of a whole new life. Tom! We came to Los Angeles chasing rainbows and vice presidencies. Well, and before that, it was Chicago. Honestly, we've had three different homes in five years. Well, this will be the last, I promise. Well, your career is important. But I'm so tired of living out of a barrel. I know, I know. Look, we'll live anywhere you want. Maybe even your old hometown, if you like. Uh, wasn't it in the suburbs? In Crestwood, yes. All right. Now, Steph, I swear to you, if anything does go sour on this deal... I won't move again. I'll take my chances in New York and we'll stay. All right, Tom. It would be nice to see the old house again. Ah, you know, Steph, looking down on New York like this, I I feel as though we're on top of the world. Mm Mm-hmm. But let's... Get settled soon, Tom. Oh, sure, sure. We'll house hunt every weekend. I don't like this hotel room any more than you do. Listen, I thought I might take a run up to Crestwood tomorrow. It's only 35 minutes by train. Sure, why don't you? Well, I mean, I'd like to see it, you know. See what's changed since I was a child. And see the old house. I wonder who's living there now. Well, maybe they'll let you in and show you around. Oh, I couldn't ask that. I'll just stroll around. Well, you can at least ask. After all, you did live there. Yes? Good morning. Uh, I'm not selling anything, really. Oh, what is it you want? (laughs) Well, I know this may sound foolish. Uh, my name is Stephanie Miller, and I grew up in this house until I was 14. And I, uh... I wanted to see it again, you know, to see if it had changed and who was living here now. Oh, well, my husband isn't home at the moment. Oh, well, that's all right. I understand. It's preposterous of me to ask. It's okay. I'll I'll just look around outside if you don't mind. No, I don't mind that. Um, How long has it been since you've seen the house? Oh, it's 15 years. See, we've been living in Los Angeles, and uh, my husband's firm transferred him here to New York... So that when I was this close, I just couldn't resist coming back. Uh, Stephanie Miller, you said? Yeah. Well, come in, Mrs. Miller. I don't see the harm. I'm Mrs. Lanning. Oh, thank you. I imagine it's changed a lot since you lived here. No, no, not that much, really. Oh, your furniture is different, of course, but I remember this room so well. Oh, I love that table. It was my mother's. And the fireplace. <laughs> I used to sit in my pajamas on cold winter nights and watch the pictures in the embers. I saw tigers fighting and flowers and monkeys and horses. <laughs> you too. Oh, I love the fireplace. Hey, I wonder. Oh, what is it? Well, it really couldn't still be here, but... What are you looking for? <laughs> 
There was a penny. I put it up in a crack in the chimney when I was ten years old for good luck, you know. And I think I can just about reach it. Ha, 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 Yes, I can hardly believe it. It's still here. Look. What? Isn't that amazing? Oh, golly. <laughs> well, do you like the house, Mrs. Lanning? Oh, I do. Except for what? Oh, nothing, really. Now, come on. You want to see the kitchen. Okay. Oh, how charming, Mrs. Lanning. Thank you. Yeah. Of course, we didn't have the breakfast nook. My mother had a big oak table right here in the middle of the floor. Well, I like room to move around. And everything happened at that old oak table. Mom and Daddy'd sit there every night and they'd talk. And I can almost see my mother making her Christmas strudel now. <laughs> One of those family conferences. I was always included in the minor decision. Oh, you were an only child then? Yes. Gee, may I... May I see upstairs? I'd love to see my old room. Oh, yes, if you like. <laughs> Mr. Lanning and I use the front bedroom. Well, mine was the small one facing the back. That's our... Well, guest room. We don't use it at all. You're sure you don't mind if I look? Oh, of course not. We don't have any children to bring grandchildren visiting, and we never have overnight company, but it's still the guest room. Oh, it's very pretty. Oh, I was going to use it for a sewing room, but... But what? <laughs> Nothing. Is it the same thing you hesitated about downstairs? Well, yes, I... I've never been able to use this room. Why? I feel as though... As though I'm not wanted. I'm not welcome in this room. But this is your house. Why wouldn't you be welcome? Well, I'm not sure any house is ours. We live in them, use them. But there are some things... We can't ever own. Oh, I love this room. I even used to talk to it. Really. And Mother had white curtains with little bluebells all over them and, and a bedspread to match. And uh, my dresser was over here, right next to the window. And then I had a little white chair. Don't, don't you feel it? Feel what? With strangeness in here... As though we didn't belong here. Mrs. Lanning, would you mind awfully if I just sat here alone for a moment to remember? Why, of course not. I'll go down and make some tea. Oh, please don't bother. Oh, it's no bother at all. I'm enjoying the cup. <laughs> you're very kind. You take your time. Come down when you're ready. You do look different. I really don't like that yellow wallpaper. And there's no rug. Your floor must be cold. <laughs> yes, it's just like old times. Talking in my room. Talking. I don't understand why Mrs. Lanning doesn't like to... Why so quiet, Helen? I wasn't going to tell you about what happened today, but I must. A woman who used to live here as a girl came to the house today, and she wanted to see it again. And you let her in? Now, Will, she was a sweet, young... Oh, well, wait a minute. She asked to see the house with a story about having lived here? Yes. But don't you know what she was? A con artist. Oh. Oh, uh, she used that story to get into the house. She looks around and makes note of anything valuable. And next time we're away, poof. She and her accomplice rip us off. Oh, now, Will, she wasn't anything like that. Oh, you're so naive, Helen. No. She remembered a penny she'd put in the fireplace chimney, and she reached in and pulled it right out. Oh, sure, sure. She had it in her hand all the time. It was a trick. 
Uh, well, well, she knew her room. The, the one I can't stand. Huh? That was her room, was it? Yes, and she described just how it looked when she was a child. I'm calling the police. No, no, wait, Will. Now listen to me. After she left, I went up to that room. Something strange happened there. Oh, hell yeah. I mean it. There's a totally different feel to that room. I don't know what it is. But it's as though the room were alive. Is that you, Steph? Tom? You home already? Yeah, we finished up early on that field trip to New Jersey. How was Crestwood? I take it you went. Yes, I went. Oh. You don't sound enthused. Who's living there now? Oh, there's a retired couple. I only met the woman. She was very nice. Oh, Steph, what's the matter? Were you were you disappointed? No, not disappointed. I was puzzled. About what? Well, I went up to my old room, and I sat there for a while, and I had the oddest feeling that the room remembered me, that it didn't want me to leave. How many rooms really can't remember? And then, then all the way home on the train, I kept thinking, knowing, really, that I have to go back there again. I'll be back tomorrow night. All right, Will. I'll be here. Well, don't look so down in the dumps. This isn't the first fishing trip I've been on. Now, Will, I didn't say anything. Lord knows, retirement's boring enough. You don't expect me to sit in a rocking chair for the rest of my life. No, I don't. Uh, If only we'd had... Uh, No, I promised I'd never say that again. But you think it. And I feel it. But we've stuck together, Will, even without children. There must be something for us. I'll, uh... I'll be back tomorrow around six. Uh Uh-huh. I'll have dinner ready. And listen, Helen. If that woman comes around here again, don't let her in. Call the police. All right, whatever you say. Oh, good luck. Bring home a trout dinner. If only we'd had... If only we'd had... Our whole lives have been nothing but if only. Only I could make Will believe me about the room. I know there's something different there. Something happened when that girl came back here. Stephanie's room. How many happy hours did she have here? How many tears? How many hopes? Now wasn't that a lady dish to step before the king? Backward, turn backward, O time in thy flight. Make me a child again, just for tonight. The poet's words strike a note in all of us who wish for a touch of childhood again. When the world gets weary and our own hopes aren't quite as bright as they were once, childhood looks awfully good. But beware, all of you who would turn backward. You'll see what I mean when I return shortly with Act Two. Another poet and novelist, Thomas Wolfe, told us, You can't go home again. Nothing stays the same. And the old familiar things just aren't as we remembered them. And how often they proved to be so disappointing. But for Stephanie Miller, going home again, rather to the house in which she had once lived, 
was proving to be a compelling experience. Hello? Hello. Uh, Mrs. Lanning, this is Stephanie Miller. Oh, hello. Hello. I really hate to impose, but I wondered if I could come out just one more time to see my old room. Well, now, my husband... Well, I don't want to intrude. Just, you know, any time that's convenient. Well, then, why don't you come today? My husband's away on a fishing trip. Yes. Come today. Come in, Mrs. Miller. I'm really glad to see you. Thank you. And please, call me Stephanie. All right. Come on in the kitchen. I have coffee and... And... Strudel! It's only from the supermarket, but you told me how your mother used to make it. Yeah, at Christmas time. Always at Christmas time. Oh, how very thoughtful of you, Mrs. Lanning. Now slide into the nook there and we'll have our coffee. Okay. You can stay as long as you like. (laughs) You know, I didn't think I was going to see you again. My husband did, though. He thought you were a con artist. Oh, what? Oh, he thought you made up the story about living in the house just to get in. To see if we had anything valuable to steal. Oh, he didn't. Really? (laughs) But I know differently. I know you lived here in that room. Mm Mm-hmm. Could we go up now? Well, of course. Bring your coffee along. I feel so peaceful. In this room Really, it's almost as though I'd never been away My husband won't believe there's a change in the room Do you know that I was never afraid of the dark in this room? Mama would put the lights out And then I'd begin to see the shadows start to form And they were always friendly shadows Listen Do you hear anything, Mrs. Lanny? Hear anything? Yeah a sort of sound. I don't know, it comes and goes. No. I heard it the other day when I was here. Stephanie, you were happy here, weren't you? Oh, yes. And then this room was a happy room. You know, I think, I think that the room is glad to see you. Well, I suppose if we love a house or a room, it just naturally has love in it. Mm, respond, Stephanie. It responds. That's why I want you to come and visit any time you want. Mm. You love this room. And your presence, it changes things. That's kind of you, Mrs. Lanning. But I guess this will be the last time, for a while at least. Tom and I have so much to do, you know, finding our own place and getting settled. But I tell you what, after I'm settled, I'll drop out maybe once a month or so to visit. Oh, I hope it's sooner. Will, breakfast ready. Be right there. What? I'll be darned. When did she do that? Uh, uh. Say, Helen, uh, when did you change the drapes in the guest room? What? You changed the drapes in the guest room, didn't you? No, they're the ones we've always had. Oh, that's funny. They look different. Oh, I admit I'm not as observant as you'd like me to be. Maybe they were gray all along. Gray? That's what they look like to me. (laughs) Well, they're chartreuse. Well, maybe they faded from the sun. But it's not a big issue. Forget I mentioned it. After breakfast, I'm going to march you upstairs and show you the difference between gray and chartreuse. I... I don't understand. Well, they look faded to me. Well, maybe they were chartreuse. Uh, Come to think of it, wallpaper looks different, too. Wasn't it more of a gold color? Yes, but that could fade, too. I know. You never liked this room. Well, what's the difference? We never use it, anyway. Close the door and let's forget it. 
Yes. Why don't we do that? Let's not worry about it. I'm so glad you came, Stephanie. Do you remember what color the drapes and walls were in the guest room when you were here last? Yes, I'm afraid I do. And I'm afraid that I didn't... Well, I mean, it just isn't my style. What were they? Well, the drapes are chartreuse. And the walls are sort of gold. Good. That's what I wanted to know. Come with me to the room. Why, what is it, Mrs. Lanning? I think you're in for a surprise after you see the room. Oh, this is so mysterious. Oh, you'll see. Oh. Mrs. Lanning. Where did you ever find them? Why, I... I... I didn't, but, but I... they're my drapes. White with bluebells. They're exactly like the ones Mother had made up for me. But they weren't like that. Oh, yes, you but... must have searched for days to get them so exact. Oh, but I didn't. I, I, I don't know what to say. You did get these drapes for me. Because I told you Mother had white drapes with a pattern of little blue bells. I, I, I thought... Oh, Mrs. Lanning, you are a beautiful person. Stephanie, what color was the wallpaper in here? Do, do you remember? Pale blue. Yes, to pick up the color of the blue bells. Pale blue. Mm-hmm. That would be right, I guess. But these walls are a dingy gray. Weren't they gold last week? They were. Stephanie, the next time you come, I promise you, they'll be pale blue. Are you ready to turn in, honey? No, Tom, no, I just want to read a little bit longer. Tev, things are okay, aren't they? Okay? Well, I mean about the move to New York. You're, you're not too unhappy. Oh, Tom, I'm not unhappy at all. I feel as though I've come home. I know we've had trouble finding the right house, but I have a feeling this weekend... I know, we'll find it. Y'all, I've been thinking about those visits you've made out to Crestwood. Would you want to live there? In my old house? Oh, no, never. But you seem so drawn to it. Well, I mean, it's a nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there. (laughs) No. Oh, Mrs. Lanning was sweet to put up the drapes like I had as a child, and now she even wants to change the wallpaper, but I don't want that, Tom. I want our own place, brand new, for us alone. Mm Mm-hmm. And the kids. (laughs) And the kids. I can hardly wait. Well, neither can I. (laughs) Okay, I'll see you for breakfast. Yeah, I wouldn't miss it. Good night, honey. Good night. Oh, where was I? Here we are. Roger leaned across the table. Uh-huh. Lois, please come with me. I can't. Oh. I don't want to read anymore. I'm going to go to bed. What? What's that? Yes. I'll come back. I'll come. Of course. Don't worry, I'll be there. You know I'll be there. Stephanie. Huh? What are you talking about? Talking? I wasn't talking, I was reading. Well, Steph, I I heard you talking in here. No, I wasn't. I mean, maybe I was reading out loud and you didn't know it. Why don't you come to bed? Well, I will in in a minute or two. Okay, but I, I think maybe you've read enough. You're starting to dream out loud. Well, I'll be there in a minute. Yes. Yes, I hear you. And I'll come back. I'll come back. Hello, Mrs. Lanning. Stephanie. You said that I could come to visit whenever I wanted. Oh, of course. Come in. I hope I'm not bothering you. I mean, coming all the time like I do. Oh, no, I like your visit. I brought something with me today. Look. Why, what a beautiful doll. (laughs) I was unpacking one of the barrels and I found her. 
I always loved Miranda. That's her name. Miranda. I've known her for such a long time. And she's so beautiful. <laughs> Why don't we put Miranda in your room? That's where she belongs, isn't yes, it? Yes, of course. Up in my room. And she'll look so nice in there. Just the way she always did. I always kept Miranda on the bed. Like this. Stephanie, could you... Could you call me Mother? Mama? Yes, Mama. Mama was tall and young. And she had brown hair. Such blue eyes. I have blue eyes. And such a smile. Mama was happy all the time. I could be happy if only... Mama had brown hair. Stephanie, look at my hair. Look at my hair. Mama loved to sing, too. She taught me many songs. My hair is brown. When we're together in this room, it's any color I want it to be. This is my room. Yes, it's your room. It's always been your room. Your room with the drapes of bluebells, the blue wallpaper, and now Miranda. It's your room because it wants you. It remembers you. And for the first time in my life, I feel I belong somewhere. Here. In this room with you. Sing to me, Mama. Yes. Yes, I will. London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. London Bridge is falling down. My fair lady. women caught in the spell of a room, or the spell of love, a woman who never had a daughter, a girl whose mother was taken from her at an early age. They both found something in this room, but the relationship goes far beyond their mortal feelings, and far beyond anything you might imagine. You'll see what I mean when I return shortly with Act Three. Turn now to Stephanie Miller, who paid an innocent visit to the house of her childhood, and now feels strangely drawn to her old room. Right now, however, she's in the New York hotel where she and her husband Tom are staying until they can find a house of their own. And at the moment, they're not seeing eye to eye on the forthcoming obligation. Steph, we have to go. Why? Well, it's company politics. Mr. Ames expects it. Oh, Mr. Ames, Mr. Ames. It's always what Mr. Ames thinks. Well, but he's my boss. Well, I'm fed up with company parties and... But it's part of the sacrifice, and there'll be lots more when I get to be vice president. All right, all right, Tom. It's important to your career. I know that. Steph, look... You always enjoyed parties and, and entertaining. I just dread a big dinner party. Having to talk to all those people. Well, it never bothered you before. All right, Tom. I said I'd go to the party. I'm just saying I'm not going to enjoy it. Now, look. Go out and buy yourself the best dress you can find. Maybe that'll make you feel different. Why, Stephanie, what a surprise. I hope you don't mind my coming without calling again. But no, of course not. Come in. Okay. Because I, I, I have something to show you. Oh, looks like a dress box. Yeah, it is. It's my new dress. It's for the party. Come on. Come on up to my room. I can't wait to show it to you. I haven't been to a party in such a long time. Oh, I hope you like my new dress. I picked it out all by myself. Oh, Stephanie, it's beautiful. Yeah. It's my first formal. Oh, I'm so excited. Imagine me in a formal... Try it on. Let me see. Okay, I will. There were uh, two of them in the store, and, and, and I liked them both, but I had a hard time choosing between them. You think I picked the right one? Of course you did. Why, nothing could be prettier than this. You really like it? I do. Look, I like the way it twirls. Watch, see? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope my date likes it. His name is Tom. 
Ken is. He groovy. He'll be the proudest boy there. Yeah, I'll bet Virginia will be so jealous because her mother is making her dress and her old date doesn't even have a car. Now, you shouldn't act that way with a friend. Oh, you're Stephanie. always saying things like that. No, really. I like Virginia okay, but I'm glad that I've got a new store-bought dress and a date with a car. Hey, i got to get out of this thing and run. Where are you off to now? Well, see, there's this new record i got to get, and I promised Virginia I'd bring it over. So, uh, uh, will you be an angel and hang this up for me? Yes, of course. Oh, no, wait a minute. Put it back in the box. i got to take it with me. Well, whatever you say. Oh, I'm so glad you like the dress. It's lovely, Stephanie. And I appreciate your coming so far to show it to me. Well, it's fun to share things with people we like. I really dread going to that party, though. Well, in that dress, you'll be the hit of the evening. And that'll make you feel different. Come on, Steph. We're late already. I'm ready. I just have to straighten this belt. Oh, you want help? No. There, that does it. How do you like it? Oh, it's... It's pretty. Just pretty? Well, the style is a little young for you, isn't it? Well, you mean young for me. You sound as though I was over 40. Well, look, I, I don't know anything about women's styles. It's pretty, it is. Well, you don't like my dress. I'm not going to go to the party. Honey, I like it. I like I it. I don't believe you. You're just saying that. So please, what's the matter? We've got to get going. Mr. Ames hates ready when to be late. Oh, Mr. Ames, Mr. Ames. Yeah, Mr. Ames. Stephanie, what's the matter with you? What? What did I say? Well, you're acting like a, a 12-year-old brat. Oh, first I'm too old for the dress. Now I'm a 12-year-old brat. Tom, have you been drinking? No. Should I ask the same of you? Don't be silly. You know I don't drink. Steph, were you out to the Crestwood place again? Yes. I wanted to show Mrs. Lanning my dress. Oh, why? What do you mean, why? Because every time you've come back from there, you've acted strangely. I mean, what goes on up there in that house? Nothing. Nothing when we just have tea and talk. Well, look, I don't want you going there anymore. Besides, you're going to be too busy entertaining when we get our own place. Now, come on. We've got to go. Mrs. Miller, a pleasure to meet you at last. <laughs> How do you do, Mr. Ames? Uh, we're very fond of Tom at Connecticut Paper. With us only a month and already, I can tell he's executive material. Well, that's uh, nice of you to say, Mr. Ames. Oh, it's nonsense. You're on your way up. And I can tell after meeting Mrs. Miller, you have the last and most important asset. Charming wife and hostess. Oh, I wouldn't be where I am without her. <laughs> oh, come on now, gentlemen. You're going to turn my little old head. <laughs> <laughs> well, go on. Enjoy yourselves. Dance. I'll chat with you later. Go ahead. <laughs> well, dance, Steph. All right. So, what do you think of Mr. Ames? Well, he's very nice. He's forceful. I can see that. Oh, yes. He knows what he wants. Uh-huh. And he seems to want you. Well, look, I'm grateful. It's my big break. Tom, maybe New York was the right thing. I know it was. <laughs> hey, Steph, have you been on a diet or something? On a diet? Me? Yeah. It seems so much lighter and smaller. I, I can feel it. <laughs> no, I haven't been on any diet. And I'm not losing any weight. You just haven't danced with me lately. How would you know? Sorry to cut in, Tom, but the evening's almost over, and I haven't had the pleasure with Stephanie. Oh, <laughs> of course, of course, Mr. Ames. The last dance, Stephanie? I'd be charmed, Mr. Ames. <laughs> I think a lot of Tom, Stephanie. I'm delighted to have him with the firm. Well, I know he's happy there, Mr. Ames. Really, he's finally found, well, fulfillment in his career with you. That's nice to know. I've had my eye on him, and I know he's going places to coin a cliche. <laughs> <laughs> and with you by his side, you can't miss. <laughs> you see, Stephanie, a man in Tom's position has to have a wife who can meet people and entertain on the spur of the moment. You might have to have 12 guests for dinner without notice and not bat an eye. Tom will be traveling a lot. Out of town for weeks at a time. What are you saying, Mr. Ames? 
Well, when a man as bright as Tom wants to get ahead, take sacrifice. Sacrifice of home and wife, I'm afraid. My Martha put up with it. I rest us all. And look where I am. At the top. Entertaining lots of people. Being without Tom for weeks, that's what this job means, doesn't it? I'm afraid so, Stephanie. But I know you're up to it. No, I'm not up to it. I don't want to be alone. Oh, Tom. Tom, I don't want to have to leave again. Stephanie, well, what is it? I want to be where I belong. Where I'm warm and safe. I've got to be there forever. Stephanie. I'll be there, yes. I'm coming back. Stephanie, where are you going? I'm going home. I'm going home. I'm going home. What's the matter, Helen? Oh, nothing. Why? Yeah. Quiet as usual. Mm, it's the rain, I suppose. I always feel depressed when it rains. Helen, I've been meaning to ask you, uh, have you been dyeing your hair? <laughs> dyeing my hair? <laughs> Whatever for? Well, it looks darker than usual. You've been gray for years, and suddenly there's a Brown streak in there. Oh, you're imagining things, Will. Oh, I'm the same plain Jane I've always been. Somehow, it looks different. You really think so? Well, maybe it is my imagination. Oh, I'll get it. Hello? Uh, hello, is, is this Mrs. Lanning? Yes. Uh, Mrs. Lanning, this is uh, Tom Miller, Stephanie's husband. Oh, yes. Is Stephanie there? Why, no. Well, she ran out from a party we were attending, said she was going home, but she's not at our hotel and no one's seen her. Oh, dear. If she does show up there, Mrs. Lanning, will you call me right away at the Imperial Hotel in the city? What makes you think she'll come here? She's very fond of you and that house. I, I don't know what got into her, but she was apparently upset when she left the party. Oh, but it's such a night. It's pouring rain. I, I expect she'll turn up at the hotel. I hope so, but please... Let me know if she comes to you. Oh, yes, I will. At the Imperial. Good night, Mr. Miller. What the devil was all that about? Stephanie's husband. What? He thought she might be here. He can't find her. You've been letting that woman in here all along? I've grown fond of her will, and it is her room. Was, you mean? Now, I'm putting a stop to the... What? Who? Stephanie! How did you get in here? Through the back door. I always come in the back door. Well, you do. I'm going up to my room now. I'm going to my room. I don't feel very well. Good night. What's the matter with her? Will, I'm warning you. Stay right here. You stay here and don't say anything or do anything. And I mean that. I don't want to go to Chicago. I want to stay here. You don't have to go, Stephanie. You can stay here with me. But they say I have to go and live with Aunt Louise. Not anymore. You can stay here. I can't. Yes. Miranda, do you hear that? Oh, Miranda, you bad dog. Your face is all dirty again. I have to give you another bath. You naughty girl. Lay to the rest now. Yes, it's time to rest, Miranda. Uh, goodbye, baby. In treetop. Helen, what's going on in there? Go away, Will. Don't open that door. Pray go, Will. Run. God, you're here, Mr. Miller. Mr. Lanning, thanks for calling me. I got a cab up from the city. I've been watching for you. I don't know what's going well, on. Never, but... well, where's Stephanie? Well, come on, follow me. Hush, dear. Time to put Miranda to bed. Ah, 
<laughs> You've had a busy day. <laughs> and tomorrow, Mother's going to put up new curtains, uh, white with little blue bells. <laughs> We're saying goodbye to the pink bunny rabbit. <laughs> There's my big girl. Stephanie! Stephanie! Come on. It's Stephanie's husband. Open the door, Helen. Look, what is going on in there? Uh, I'm uh, going to find out. on the treetop. Yeah. When the wind Good Lord. Where's Stephanie? <laughs> it's... It's uh, not possible. Where is Stephanie? Uh, 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 she... And she must... admit that Stephanie's room was a bit unusual, but think about your old room in the old house you grew up in. Maybe it's waiting for you to return someday, maybe even hoping. So if you should get the chance, why not go back and say hello, if you dare. In any case, I'll be back shortly. To be young again. We all search for that fountain of youth. And so often we don't realize it's with us all the time. You're only as old or as young as you feel. Those years don't matter. It's how you think that counts. I hope you'll keep thinking of us and join us again. Our cast included Mercedes McCambridge, William Redfield, Mary Jane Higby, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. She was a priestess in the temple of Apollo at Delphi. And she fell in love with me. Hey, hey Pop Pop, you, you know the sun's getting hot out here. Maybe you ought to get in. Anyhow, you, you swallow a few grains and you go into a deep trance. And when you come to or wake up, it's hundreds of years later. Oh, rave on. Now, now make plans to break out, Augie. Quickly before they come for you. Go get your gold. Sure, get the gold. And then where do I hide? You can hide anywhere. A secluded spot, a, a cave, a forest, a, a desert. Yeah, great. And what do I do for chow? I'm trying to explain this, Augie. You don't eat. You don't drink. You're oblivious to cold, to heat, to rain, to, to snow. And in several hundred years, you come alive again. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. adventure. Here's romance. Here's the famous Robin Hood of the Old West. Cisco, the sheriff, he is getting closer. This way, Pancho, Pamelo, the Cisco Kid. Cisco Kid in our exciting story, The Son of the Chief. Down through the ages, the motive of revenge has made many a man into a criminal. And more often than not, 
Revenge has boomeranged to bring the criminal to justice, sometimes years later. So it was with Magoon Fraley, one time of Troop 7 of the fighting 91st United States Cavalry, now outlaw and cattle rustler. As our story opens, Fraley and a henchman, Ned Dill, are sitting their horses on a bluff overlooking a plain on which cattle are grazing. Just one rider of them cattle, Fraley. Yeah. You know whose cattle they are? No. They belong to Colonel Blaze Duncan. Oh, commanding officer of your old regiment, huh? He was commanding officer, Dill, at the time I was with him. Then about 15 years ago, he was transferred back to Washington. And when his age retirement come up some months back, he headed out here and bought this ranch. You kept pretty close tabs on him, Fraley. Yeah. Yeah, I have. And I ain't through with him yet. Not by a long shot. I wonder if Duncan knows swift antelopes living on the reservation. The Sioux chief? That's right. They locked horns more than once, them two. And a long time ago, they took oath to get each other. Well, if Duncan don't know it, he will soon. And what do you mean, Fanny? This here's one of swift antelopes' blankets. Picked it up over at the reservation. It's got his own mark painted on it. When Duncan finds it down there behind some of his missing cattle, he'll know. And then, treaty or no treaty, he's going to start out after Swift Antelope. <laughs> That's not bad, Fraley. We get the cattle, and Swift Antelope gets the blame. Yeah, only I don't care whether we get the cattle or not, just yet. Say, you never told me how you happened to leave the cavalry, boss. Never mind, that's none of your business. Now listen, we'll ride down there at full gallop, Dill. We'll gun down that rider, drop this blanket, and run off some cattle. All right, let's go. Yep. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> In Pancho, very thirsty. Well, we will stop at the rancho ahead, Pancho, and ask for some water for our horses and ourselves. Who's the rancho, Cisco? Oh, I do not know, Mingo. But I believe someone from the east bought it only recently. Oh? Then we will ride on to the reservation and give the greetings and gifts of the United States Marshal to the chief, Swift Antelope. We not know Swift Antelope, Cisco. No, we've never met him, Pancho. Uh -huh. But from what I have heard, Swift Antelope is a great chief, respected by his enemies as well as his friends. Who the who? Who look who look who? Say you come out of the ranch house, Cisco. See, what is there, Senor? What is there, Senor? Ah, good morning, gentlemen. We would like some water, Senor, if you do not mind. Help yourself. Uh, your pardon, Senor, but are you not Colonel Duncan? Yes, uh, you have the advantage of me, I'm afraid. I am called the Cisco Kid, Colonel. Oh, oh, yes, of course. You were a very young man, Cisco, when I was commanding the fort. But even then, you had a fine reputation for courage and wisdom. Gracias. This is my compañero Pancho, Colonel. Glad to know you, Pancho. <laughs> Pancho, glad to know it's you, Colonel. Is this going to tell Pancho many times you a great Colonel, no? <laughs> well, that's nice to hear. <laughs> I presume you came back out here, Colonel, because you like the West. Is that true? Yes, uh, partly, Cisco. My main reason, however, is to see if I can locate my son... Your son? Uh, Billy was missing after a Sioux raid. He was three years old then. But I've never believed he was killed. Well, he would be about 18 years old now, would he not, Colonel? That's right. Who was the Sioux chief in that raid? Swift Antelope. Swift Antelope? Why, she's going to punch you. She's going to punch you. Get <laughs> Hey, what's that? Father Amir. Looks from here as if your cattle are being stampeded, Colonel. That was a Sioux war hoop if ever I heard one. Pancho and I will ride ahead to see what we can do. Diablo! <laughs> Logo! You had better saddle your horse and come as quickly as you can, Colonel. I'll be right along, Cisco. Easy, Diablo. All right, ah. ride, Pancho, for all your work. Up, Diablo. Ah. Go, Logo, go now. Watch your work. Go, go! Stop right here in this pass, Dill. I want to watch the plane. Whoa, 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 whoa. Ah, blast it, Fraley. Most of all them cattle stampeded. The cattle ain't important right now. We can get them later. You got them field glasses? Yeah. Let me see them. Yeah, here they are. Yeah. Yeah, some riders coming out from the ranch house. Two of them. I want to see who they are. The third one's just starting out now. 
Say, hey, Dill. Yeah? One of them two front riders is the Cisco Kid. Cisco Kid? What's he doing in this country? I don't know, but that's him. Well, looks like I'm in luck today. What do you mean? I got a score to settle with Cisco, too. He's responsible for my serving two years in jail some years back. Yeah, I remember you told me. Hey, you suppose they'll find Swift Antelope's blanket? They can't help but find it. They're riding right toward it. <coughs> Get down off your horse, Dill. Yeah, all right. Get your rifle out of that saddle scabbard. Yep. If Cisco starts up through this pass, as I figure he will, he's a dead man. <laughs> Right out on the ground, Cisco. You want to save, Pancho? Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Oh. Uh. It looks like a blanket. Uh, it's a blanket, Cisco. Hey, yeah, I'll shake out the dust and we'll have a good look at it. Huh. An Indian blanket, amigo. Yeah, an antelope on the blanket, too. Painted on the blanket. A running antelope. Uh-huh. Santa. Pancho, I believe this blanket belongs to Swift Antelope, the chief. But Swift Antelope, not, not Russell the Castle, Cisco. Oh, oh. So what Pancho hear about Swift Antelope? Wait a minute, Pancho. Uh-huh. I'm not saying too much just yet. Wait, 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 wait. Hey, what's that? Indian blanket? All right, George, it is. Let me see that, Cisco. Why, it's Swift Antelope's blanket. He must have brought it along to help stampede the cattle and then dropped it without realizing Senor it. Senor Colonel, I do not think Swift Antelope would stampede cattle. I know this is his blanket. He's always used this mark. Cisco, Cisco, look. Rider lay in the ground over there. Say, Pancho, there's nothing we can do for him. He's dead. Ah, Swift Antelope. Hmm. So he wants to carry on the feud with me, eh? All right. I'll give him more than he bargains for. I just heard today he's living on the reservation. What do you plan to do, Colonel Duncan? I'm going to round up a couple of my neighbors used to be in my regiment. And then I'm going to that reservation. But, Colonel, you... no use talking, Cisco. My mind's made up. The only thing Swift Antelope understands is a bullet. Well, he'll get plenty of them. Treaty or no treaty. Get up! Bad trouble, Cisco. See, Mm. all hatreds do not die easily, Pancho. Mm. Somehow we must bring proof of the Colonel that Swift Antelope had nothing to do with this stampede. But how? How, Cisco? How? That is just the question we will have to answer, Chico. How? Riding right up through here. You better jack a cartridge into the chamber of that rifle. Yep. Now I take the first shot, see? If Cisco don't go down, you shoot. All right. Uh, what about the fat one with Cisco? Oh, never mind him. He ain't got brains enough to be worth wasting a bullet on. He looks like Cisco's falling in our tracks, Frilly. He is. You see how he keeps his eyes on the ground? That's another reason we gotta have him out of the way. He's the best tracker in the whole Southwest. They're getting near. Yep. Just as soon as I can get this rifle rested across my arm, I'll touch her off. Better not let Cisco get too near, Freddy. They say Cisco's quite a number to ride anybody down. I ain't aiming to let him get near. As soon as he gets a little nearer, I'm firing. He's mighty close now. Yep. Here goes. Take your time. Got him. <laughs> he sure toppled off that horse nice, Freddy. Now, come on. Let's get out of here fast. Cisco, Cisco, you dead? No, Pancho, but I think this time I am hard hit. Um, Pancho, go after those hombres, Cisco. Those hombres shoot Cisco and Pancho fix them. Those hombres, Pancho... No, go no, no, fix- Pancho. This is no time to lose your head. The wound is in my side. Hey, Cisco, punch not lose the head. Here, here, and punch a look at the wound, Cisco. Careful, amigo. Uh, it's a bad wound, Cisco. It's a bad wound. But Pancho think that old bullet go clear through. Ah, oh, it's good. And Pancho tear apart the Pancho shirt, Cisco. And Pancho make a bandit. You have some water in your canteen? Uh, see, Cisco. Pancho clean the wound, too. That hurt, no? Oops. I can stand it. Um, Pancho got to see what the old bullet do. Uh, not get the ribs, Cisco. It's bad, but it's good, too. See, we bandage it up, amigo, and we'll be on our way. Be on our way back to the, to the ranch house, Cisco. That, that way we go. No, the wound is not bad enough for that, Pancho. Cisco, Pancho, Cisco, Pancho there is too much at stake. 
You not understand? Can't you understand? And Cisco need the rest. We've got to stop Colonel Duncan and Swift Antelope from making war on each other. Just one exchange of bullets would mean that the Sioux would come off that reservation and go on the war path. See, si, see, si, but Cisco... And that can... must not happen. Uh, I'm sure now that those two riders whose tracks we are following are trying to place the blame on Swift Antelope. So we must track down those riders. But Cisco not going ride. I'm going to ride Pancho. Find that wound tightly. Si, Cisco. What? No? No, find it more tightly. <laughs> I get on my feet. Can't you help, Chico? How it feels to stand up, huh? Well, I'm weak at the moment, Chico, but it will pass. Oh, and your face white like the snow, Cisco. Aren't you afraid? I'll be all right, Pancho. Do not worry. Pancho thinks Cisco not all right. I said I was all right, amigo. Santo! Cisco faint! Cisco! Cisco! What Pancho do if Cisco die from the bullet wound? Um, Pancho find that Dombre and kill that Dombre with his bare teeth. There is every possibility that Sisko's wound will keep him from preventing trouble between Colonel Duncan and Swift Antelope. In just a moment, we'll return to the Sisko Kid. Back to the Cisco Kid and our exciting story, The Son of the Chief. In addition to dropping an Indian blanket at the scene of a cattle stampede to make retired Army Colonel Duncan believe his old enemy Swift Antelope is to blame, Magoon Fraley, one time cavalryman, shot and wounded the Cisco Kid from ambush. Now, Fraley and his henchman, Dill, are riding onto the Sioux Reservation to cause more trouble. They're going to see Swift Envelope, eh, Freely? Yeah, and that reminds me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, what? you never seen Swift Antelope, have you? Nope. You've had all the dealings with him, Freely. Yeah, so I'll do the talking. And if that kid's around, he's most always with Swift Antelope. Don't say nothing about him having blue eyes. Blue eyes? A Sioux kid? He ain't a Sioux, Dill. He's the son of Colonel Duncan. What? I'll tell you now so as you won't make no talking blunders. We can ride along now. Yep. Hey, hey, hey. Duncan thinks the Sioux captured his kid during a raid. But I was the one that got him. Oh. I hate Duncan like poison. He had me dishonorably discharged for, for cowardice under fire. And stealing and selling army supplies. Well, maybe I did steal a couple of things. But that other charge, I... I'll show him how much of a coward I am. Now, well, now, easy, Fraley. Somebody might hear you. Well, anyway, I got even by taking the kid. I left him with a Sioux squaw up north. Then after Duncan had gone to Washington, Swift Antelope got a look at the kid, took a fancy to him, and adopted him. Hey. Yeah. Hey, is that the kid with Swift Antelope now? Yeah, yeah, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, Swift Antelope. Oh. Bring bad news to Chief. White man, Colonel Duncan, say he killed Swift Antelope. Swift Antelope, not afraid. Who said he would kill Swift Antelope? Colonel Duncan, white man. You can talk with me. I've been to white man school. No talk. Nothing to say. We wait, little Chief. But if anybody tried to kill Swift Antelope... No talk. Wait. I just think Swift Antelope like to know. Be prepared. Hey, so... hey, hey Freddy. Mm. Here comes the Cisco kid. What? Where? Yeah, they're riding up through the grove. They ain't seen us yet. We go, Swift Antelope. Yep. Hey, hey, hey. That white man. Bad white man, little chief. Talk with double tongue. <laughs> How'd you feel now, Cisco? I feel much better, Pancho. Yeah, Pancho, glad. Mm, Pancho worry like anything when Cisco faint. Gracias, Pancho. There is Swift Antelope on his son. Uh-huh. Hola, Chief Antelope. Who, who that? Who? Oh, look, oh, look. Uh, Pancho helped you up the Diablo, Cisco. Gracias, amigo. I'm stronger now. Uh-huh. Swift Antelope, 
The Cisco kid brings you greetings and gifts from the United States Marshal. Swift Antelope, no, of Cisco. Swift Antelope, glad to get greetings from friend, United States Marshal. Gifts are in saddlebags. United States Marshal hopes the health of Swift Antelope is good. Here are the gifts. Cisco, here the tracks of two hombres' horses. I see them, Pancho. Swift Antelope, Cisco and friend Pancho, come back. Welcome. Come back. Sit with me, with Swift Antelope and little Chief. How soon, Cisco? You are Swift Antelope's son? Yes. We'll be back within the hour, I hope. I hear much of Cisco, kid. I'd like to ride with you. You better not, Cisco. Our errand may be one of danger. Swift Antelope, are the ones whose horses make those tracks friends of Swift Antelope? They speak with two tongues, Cisco. Swift Antelope, lose blanket. Swift Antelope, say no more. But Swift Antelope, look. And listen. It is well. May your son ride with us? Go, little chief. Ride with Cisco. Wait up. The son of Swift Antelope is our friend. We'll return soon, Swift Antelope, perhaps with knowledge of your stolen blanket. Finished off that Cisco kid. He's a tough hombre, Frelly. Ah, uh, but he won't be so tough after my next bullet hits him. Whoa, boy, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Yeah, when you're gonna get a chance to gun him down? He'll be along. I know that buzzard. He don't never give up once he takes anybody's trail. We'll wait right here for him, Dill, and, and this time we'll make sure of him. Yeah, but the setup of this here ambush is just about like the other in Well, What of it? Well, Cisco won't be fool enough to fall for the same kind of ambush. This is the only other pass for miles around. It's got to be here. And I figure he'll ride right smack into it, same as he did the other. And right here's where we're going to wait for him. <laughs> We take a shortcut, Cisco. See, si. I'm glad little chief came with us. Uh-huh. He's guiding us well to the back of that hill. Uh, Cisco. See, si? uh, little chief not look like a Sioux. I strongly suspect he is not a Sioux, Pancho. He ride ahead most of the time, Cisco. See, si, but for a while he rode by my side. Uh-huh. He's a smart boy, Pancho. He has some education. Si, but he ride like an Indian and act like an Indian. Well, that is because he was brought up by the Indians. Uh-huh. Well, Pancho. Well, what, Cisco? You not yet guess the truth. Pancho not guess anything. What did you, what did you have? Huh? I strongly suspect that boy is the son of Colonel Duncan. Santo Cisco, son of Colonel Duncan? But, madam me, he think he's the son of Swift Antelope. See? Si. And Colonel Duncan ride to kill Swift Antelope. See? Si. Whose side the boy take, huh? It remains to be seen. Mm-hmm. Now you're stopping. Hold it, 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 slow down, slow down. Okay. See, little chief? Trail up there, Cisco. It leads to back of hill. And we will follow it. I had better go ahead now. Up there, get up. Oh, blow, go down, go down. I think those hombres may be waiting for us in that pass, Pancho. Huh? I see no dust rising from the plain beyond. Pancho, go get the hombres, Cisco. Do not rush. In a moment, we will stop our horses and then... Madre mia, we're almost upon them. I did not know the pass was so near. Ride them down, Pancho. Go, 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 Swing your rifle. You're right to do that, hombres. Just to be sure, I'll send a bullet into the stock of that rifle. Pass the stock of that rifle. Oh, great jumping snake. Oh, 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 oh. Get your hands up, both of you. Higher. Easy now, Cisco. I ain't done nothing. Shut up. But I ain't, Fraley. Shut up, I said. So, the name is Fraley. I remember that name. I also remember you, Fraley. This is the second time I'm to have the pleasure of sending you to prison. Pancho, get their guns. Uh, easy, Cisco. I dare you to get down off that horse, Cisco. Cisco got the wound, Coyote. And you make the wound. But Pancho down off his horse... And Pancho showed you. Oh, is that so? <laughs> oh, he almost broke my hand on his jaw. <laughs> and that's the way Pancho fight. Hombres break hands on Pancho's jaw, no? <laughs> that is one way to do it. But let us waste no time. Tie those hombres up and let us get back to the reservation as fast as we can. Indian I want. Uh, take a good look at me, Swift Antelope. Maybe you remember me. Swift Antelope. 
Remember? Whose blanket is this? Blanket belong Swift Antelope. So you've taken to stampeding cattle, have you? Swift Antelope, not stampede cattle. White Colonel, wrong. Hmm. Then how did that blanket get onto my grazing grounds? Huh? Swift Antelope, not know. Why, you thieving devil, I have a great mind to... Well, Cisco? Those are the hombres who stampeded your cattle, Colonel. They are the ones who shot and killed your rider. Ah. What makes you think... Ah, let me get a closer look at this one. Well, Magoon Fraley. See, si, Colonel. One of the worst bandidos in this part of the country. I don't doubt that, but then... These the... two hombres stole that blanket from Swift Antelope to place the blame on him. On this other one with the trembling lip. Killed your rider. No, 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 I didn't. I won't go up for murder. It was Fraley got No, you squeal. Get off, Fraley. And you, keep talking. Who stole Swift Antelope's blanket? He did. I'll talk. Just don't send me up. He told me this is Duncan's son. What? I'll kill you for this deal. Fraley stole him during a Sioux raid. My son? Swift Antelope. Is this boy my son? Swift Antelope. Not no. But Swift Antelope, I thought I was... What about that, Fraley? I ain't talking. You, quick. I, I, Fraley says Swift Antelope never knew. He, he... Colonel Duncan, anyone can see this hombre is so frightened he is telling the truth. Mm. Some of you men put these two under guard. Take them to the colonel's ranch house. We will have the marshal come there to get them. Get moving, killers. Uh, well, I, I don't know what to say. Billy, come over here. Let me look at you. Yes. Yes, you have your mother's eyes. Little Chief is the son of Swift Antelope. But Billy, I... If I may interrupt, Colonel, do not try to settle the whole matter right now. You must not expect this boy to accept you at once. Hmm. No, 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 of course. He, he can't... He uh... is your son. Yet for years he has lived as the son of the great Chief Swift Antelope. I would think your first move would be to forget all grievances... Yes. Yes, you're right, Cisco. I never expected to do this, but... Uh, my hand, Swift Antelope. White Colonel, great warrior, brave warrior. Swift Antelope, take his hand. Si, Pancho. Little Chief Billy go live with his father, the colonel? No, he is not going to live with him yet, Pancho. No? Although he is spending more and more time upon his father's rancho, uh -huh. the colonel is being very sensible about it. He understands. Uh-huh. Swift Antelope understands, too. He's a fine man, Pancho. Yeah, and Chico is one old better, no? Oh, just about, Chico. It gives me trouble now and then, but not enough to bother about. It only caused me to lose five pounds, which I can spare. Si, Cisco. <laughs> what are you laughing about, Pancho? To lose five pounds in my Pancho of the weighing scales in the store. What scales? Well, Pancho's friend, Big Maria, sent her little nephew to the store for four pounds of cookies. For four pounds of cookies? See, si, and the little nephew brought home two pounds of cookies. Brought home only two pounds? Si. So what did Big Maria do about that? Well, she goes to the store herself, and she say, You give my little nephew four pounds of cookies? See? And the storekeeper say, See, Big Maria, I weigh him out four pounds cookies. And Big Maria say, Then your scales must be wrong. Said the scales must be wrong? What the storekeeper said to that? He say, My scales weigh all right, Big Maria. You better weigh your little nephew. Oh, Pancho. Oh, Cisco. What the hell? And so ends another exciting adventure with O. Henry's famous Robin Hood of the West, the Cisco Kid.
Be sure to listen again for another thrilling adventure of the Cisco Kid. Cisco Kid was played by Jack Mather, Poncho by Harry Lang. Suspense, which is usually heard at this hour on Thursday nights, is taking its customary summer holiday. Suspense returns to the air two weeks from tonight, on Thursday, September 1st. You are standing at the doorway of a cabin on Cashier Creek. Upon the ridge, the bloodhounds have caught your scent. And between you and a fortune, between you and escape, yawn the white jaws of a deadly cottonmouth. We offer you Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight, we escape to the worn-out acres of a poor farm somewhere in the southern mountains with Irvin S. Cobb's great tale of vengeance, Snake Doctor. Far back in the southern mountains, it's quiet and hot and lonely. One pine-scarred hill is very much like the next, and one winding creek differs little from another. The area through which Cashier Creek twisted was the same as all the rest. Except for the snakes. Deadly, venomous, cottonmouths, moccasins. There are probably more snakes along Cashier Creek than anywhere else. Most people lived in constant, deadly fear of these snakes. But there was one man who even seemed to like them. A man they called Snake Doctor. His cabin was near the creek bottom where the cottonmouths were the commonest. And he earned his meager living by rendering down their soft fats, bottling their oil, and selling it. Snake Doctor seemed harmless enough. But there was one man who believed he was a colleague of the devil. Who hated him. Because he wasn't afraid of the snakes. This man was Jafe Mourner, the Snake Doctor's nearest neighbor. Jafe was that dangerous kind of man who suspected, feared, and hated anything he didn't understand. And he understood neither Cottonmouths nor the snake doctor. Jafe was ornery, ignorant, and shiftless. He'd rather shoot squirrels and chop cotton. He'd rather fish and hoe corn. And that's what he's doing now. Fishing down at the big hole with his son and heir, Finney, who's old enough but not quite bright enough to handle a gun. Missed him, doggy. Finney, you blame fool. I told you not to touch my gun. Trump on him, Pa, before he gets in the creek. What? The cotton mouth. Trump on him in front of you. The cotton mouth. The vomit. The unearthly vomit. You got it, Paul. Keep your foot on him, Will. Stop at your stick. You don't need to, son. He's dead. Now, come here. Paul, how'd he hit anything with that rifle? I had a beat draw right on him, and I... You done fool. do that for, Paul. Stirring up that filthy snake whilst I'm a-fishing. Heck, he was sunning himself not more than two feet from you. He was just two feet from you. Never mind that kind of talk. Won't be no fish around here till Thunderation after all that racket. Well, come on, let's go home and get us some vittles. Jafe Morn had tossed his bait can into the creek and threw a stick after it. He stood there watching the stick drift slowly toward the big hole where the creek widened behind a jam of driftwood. Jafe watched as the eddy caught the stick and sucked it beneath the dam. Jafe was curious. He moved downstream a rod or two and waited, watching the water boil up from under the driftwood. But the stick didn't come up. That was strange. It must have caught under there in a tangle of water-soaked and sunken logs. Probably it had stayed there for months. 
perhaps stay there always. Let's get some riddles, Paul. Jay thought about this, and an idea began to form in his slow mind as he and Finney started for home. How much all you reckon's in this, and Paul? Daddy? What you jawing about? This old cotton man. How much all you reckon? Throw it in? down. Throw it down? Why for? I'm going to Throw it land. down like I say. Oh, I was aiming on rendering the old cottonmouth's fat like the snake doctor does. I was going to sell it and make myself some money. I don't like to squirm at things around me. But it's dead. Leave it where it dropped. You scared on cottonmouths, Pa? I know better than to get myself bit by them. Hip Bailey know the fella got hisself bit one. We're in a drap of liquor for miles. So he goes to work and he cuts open a live chicken. And he put it on his leg where the bite was. Fella lived, too. Uh. Reckon Mr. Rise ever gets himself bit? I mean, handling cotton mouth like he does? Who? Mr. Rives. Who? Mr. Rives. That's old Snake Doctor's real name. Ma says I oughtn't call him Snake Doctor. Never mind what your ma says. Nobody in my family's calling no snake-loving scum Mr. Rives. Heck, that's what I say. All right. Could have made myself some money renting that cottonmouth fat down in the oil. I... How much you reckon old snake doctor makes out in the oil he sells? I don't know. Pip Bailey says old snake doctor's got more than a thousand dollars hid away somewhere in his cabin. More than that, most likely. Cuss it old miser don't spend nothing. Ain't got nothing save that rack of bones mare his. Pip Bailey says whenever old snake doctor sets foot out in his place... He's got the granddaddy of all cotton mouths that he leaves out in the cabin to stand guard over his money. Yeah. Tip Bailey says he'd see the old snake doctor put him in his pocket. Live ones, too. Snake doctor ain't fitting to be alive himself. Ma says he ain't so bad. Says he don't mean nobody harm. Your ma better be careful who she's associating with. She says he just don't have good sense. Had the fever too much. Daddy? You ever been in snake doctor's place? I don't have nothing more than I have to to do with that snake-loving hoodoo. Tip Bailey says he'd better wouldn't be no task at all for some no good to poke around the snake doctor's shack and maybe find all the money and make off with it. Mm. Blame the son's dirty rendering me down. Look at my head. Full of sweat. Look, Daddy. Huh? See? Full of sweat. Dirty near guard full of sweat come off. Why turn it down that way, Paul? Coming on noon, dinner be most ready. I'm going to tell the snake-loving hoodoo that there's some of them cottonmouths on the creek side of our dead it. Heck, he knows that. I'm going to tell him he's got my leave to catch him. You don't need to come along. Well, if you're going over to his place, I'd kind of like to see it for my own sake. Go on in, Pa. Huh? He ain't at home. Else why is he to show himself by now? I reckon. C- c- can you see any snakes? I told you to keep an eye out for her. I-, I bet it's in one of them chinks, Pa. Pa, I bet the money's in I one of them... I ain't looking for no money. <laughs> Must be a dang snake himself. Living in a place like this. I know you ain't looking for any money, Pa. But if and you was, wouldn't you look at that, that chink right up there? Where? Right there, second log by the fireplace on the right. You see that there hole? Yeah. yeah. I reckon I would look up there. Since we're here... I might as well see for myself. Paul, I wouldn't be a mite surprised if old snake doctor had him... Paul? Paul? Paul, ye... Was you looking for something, Jake Marner? Snake doctor? Yeah. Uh, I was looking for you. I want here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look here, y'all, Hoodoo. What's the idea of sneaking up on folks who's took the trouble to come all the way down here to do you a favor, huh? Uh, come on, Fanny. We're getting out of here. Yes, sir. 
Like as not, they had a dang old moccasin squirching around in his pocket whilst he was talking to you. Daddy, do you mind how his eyes was when he come in? Uh. Do you mind how I kept looking up at the wall where I said I bet he had the money between the chinks? Benny. What? Don't you say nothing to your ma about us being at the snake doctor's place, you understand? Why, sure Well, I? just don't. And don't you go nigh it again. <laughs> Cuss old vomit. You'd have thought we was prowlers way acting. Yeah, prowlers. Ma! Then about ready! You pull with your son? Yeah, I got time enough for dinner to go down the spring and get me some cold water. If you stir your stumps, you can. Catch anything, Jeep? Now you think I can catch fish with Fetty fine off my gun at cotton mouths all the time? Uh, ain't this heat more than a body can bear? Ain't it colder but the creek? Uh. That poor old Miss Rives come by here a spell ago. Might and I shook to pieces with a chill. Oh. He come by, did he? Well, did he come in? Just for a minute. Just for a minute, huh? What did he want? He wanted to give him something for his ailment. Just about could drag one sob foot for the other. Barely could make it up here from his place. I give him a dose out in our butler's acre drops. Would have given him a little smidgen of liquor, only oh, I could... Oh, you would, huh? Please don't, Jeff. Don't whop me. <laughs> don't, Jeff. Don't whop me. Just poor old Mr. Ives. <laughs> Mr. Ives. Mr. Ives. How many times I got to tell you that old hoodoo's name is Snake Doctor? You don't mean nobody no huh? He made a skin of lost with its hide and tallow, and you call him Mr. Ives. Huh. You'll be calling them honey and sugar next. Without I learn you. Please, Jeff, please. Bad names, huh? Well, I aim to learn you. What's his name now? Well? What's your poor Mr. Rives' name now? Snake Doctor. Kizzy Mona rubbed the ugly red weld on her scrawny arm and gave the frying pan full of sizzling side meat a hopeless nudge. She prayed that time and food might take the edge off Jave's temper. Finney slouched in from the spring, saw the mark on her arm. Pa been whomping you again, Ma? What'd you do this time? She silently dished up the hog back and cornbread for her two men. While they sat at table, she ate on her feet, serving them between bites, as was the custom in the Mourner household. After dinner, Finney stretched out under the chinaberry tree and... Kizzy sat on the porch, fanning herself and dipping snuff with a peach twig, scouring it back and forth on her gums. Jave took his ease on the floor of the back room, but he didn't sleep. The meanness was stirring in him, and his hatred of the man he couldn't understand, the man who'd got rich off a cotton mouse. His mind was working on something he'd seen that day and another thing he'd heard. He was adding them together. That stick it had disappeared under the log jam and the snake doctor's money. It was four o'clock before any of them moved and then Jave spoke to his wife for the first time since noon. Missy, where's that there vial of drinking liquor? By the window. You took it out in your pocket before you laid down. I ought to carry a vial of liquor with me. I might get bit by a moccasin as soon as Pa would. You better not let me catch you. You find it, Jave? Yeah. I just remembered. I won't be needing to tote no spits along with me while I'm going. I wouldn't take no chance, Dave. Just one cotton mouth bite. Cotton mouth's all down the slashes, else along a creek. Well, I'll be all this evening's up along Bailey's Ridge in the high ground. You fixing to go shooting? Yeah. Ain't the gummy a chance of young squirrels twixt now and dust time. Heard them barking all around me this morning. Reckon I'll come along, Paul. You stay in here, son. Oh, dang it. You'll be steaming in the place when the rain comes down. 
Paul, you might be needing me, Jim. You stay here. Oh, dang. Kizzy, you set me up a snack of cold supper on the chef. Likely I won't get back till it's plumb dark. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Escape. But first, that wonderful variety show with a purpose, CBS's one-hour-long program, This is Broadway, will be round again tomorrow night on most of these same stations. Comedian Abe Burroughs, Broadway playwright George S. Kaufman, Master of Ceremonies Clifton Fadiman will all be here, playing host to the top stars of show business. Hear these top stars and their top acts. Then listen closely as the expert showmen on This is Broadway help them with show business problems. And now, we return to the second act of Escape and tonight's story, Snake Doctor. Jafe Morn had turned north through his struggling cornrows, and in a minute he was lost from sight. He kept on for nearly a mile till he came to a wild red mulberry tree. Where there are mulberries, there are bound to be squirrels. Very neatly. He shot two young graves right through the head. The Jafe was a master marksman. And unsuspected by any who knew him, Jafe had another quality. One that made him more dangerous than the rest of his kind. Jafe had an imagination. Today it was an excellent working order. He tied the brain squirrels together and swung them over his shoulder. If needed, they'd be his alibi. And then he sat down under a tree for a while. Got plenty of time. Don't need to get on the snake doctor's place till about dusk. When he comes out to feed that sway back mare, his and <laughs> Mr. Ryan. He sat out two brisk thunder showers in the intervals between them. And then he set off in a wide arc down Bailey's branch along the skirts of Little Cypress Slash, down to the sunken flats edge in Cashier Creek. It took more than an hour of careful traveling before he came to his destination. A screen of haw bushes, less than 50 yards behind the snake doctor's cabin. No matter how ailing he is, you'll get up and come out to feed that rack of bones mare. <laughs> Mr. Rice. Well, I'll learn him to go colleaguing around another man's woman. Jafe Mourner let his jealousy heat him to white hatred. At this moment, he was avenging his honor. Didn't admit even to himself that the real reason he was here was a snake doctor's money, hidden behind the log by the fireplace. Home-wrecking, snake-loving varmint. Well, ten minutes from now, I'll chunk him down a big hole in the creek like I did that stick this morning. And he'll go down and never come up. And nobody will miss him. Nobody will know he's gone for leastwise a week, maybe a month. And maybe if I get around to it, I... Might come back his way someday. Poke around that cabin of his and just to see if it's true. His having all that money hid away. Jafe Morner's speculations were cut short. The cabin door opened and a figure stepped out into the growing dusk and walked toward the stable. He saw the snake doctor's loppy old straw hat. At this distance, he couldn't miss. And he didn't. The figure jerked backward and then went face forward. Jafe started for him, then he stopped. His eyes bugged. His mouth formed a scream that he couldn't utter. His rifle dropped to the ground. He had just killed a snake doctor. Killed him dead with a thirty-two caliber slug through the head. And there on his door still stood snake doctor, whole and sound, staring at him. Jafe Mona, <sighs> what have you done? <laughs> The scream came at last, for Jafe Mourner had seen the devil. The snake doctor who arose alive from his bullet-riddled body. <laughs> Jafe whirled and ran into the deep darkening woods, whimpering like a whipped puppy as he tore through the brush. Escape. He must escape this, this thing. He must get under the shelter of a sound roof. He must have the protection of four walls around him. He ran and ran for hours. <laughs> It was close to midnight when he came out on a dirt road a short distance southeast of his own land. Beyond the next bend, he'd be in sight of home. And then he stopped. 
Around the bend, coming toward him was a joggling light, a lantern hanging on a buggy. Jake flattened himself in a clump of brush to hide until the traveler passed. And then, just as the rig was opposite him, he heard a call coming from the other direction. Hey, over there! Who's jogging? Oh, there. Oh, steady, boy. Me, Davis Ware. That you, Tip Bailey? Yes. Hooked it out from the junction. Tolerable tired. What brings you out this time of night, Davis? Somebody sick? Sick nothing. It's been a parcel of trouble of popping in these bottoms tonight. Steady, boy. Steady. Hey, hey, uh, what do you mean? A killing. That's what I mean. You don't say. Who got killed? I'm, uh, I'm uh, fixing to tell you. It happened uh, just around dusk time at down an old snake doctor's place. Yeah? Was it him was killed? Give me time, Tip. It seems like snake doctor's been a chilling lately. Mm-hmm. It was pretty bad off today. So Miss Kizzy Morner, she footed it down from her place to his and fetching some physic with her and a plate of hot vittles. You might have thought it, Miss Morner. Might have thought it. You want to hear this? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Go on. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Well, uh, pretty soon after she got there, it seemed like he was tired. And uh, he tried to get up out of his bed to go and feed that old crowbait nag of his. Uh-huh. It uh, started in again by then, pouring down hard. So she made him stay where he was, and she put on his old hat and throwed his old coat around her. And he wanted to keep out of the wet. And no more, and she got outside, and a shot came from the edge of the woods, huh? and down she went with a bullet through her brains. Killed her? Kizzy. It was a dog. It was well, but, but, Kizzy. But you've done it. Was that low-flung husband of hers done it? That's who. They shot it was him. Oh, sure thing. Oh, boy. Sure thing, they're certain. Snake doctor jumped up when he heard the shot, and he catched a quick look at Jafe over the fence. Uh-huh. There wasn't a long streak in Kiss's arm where he must have whopped her during the day. Why, hanging's a sight too good. Did they catch him? No, but they gonna. Sheriff get there yet? No, oh, but he's due any minute with his pack of hound dogs. Oh, Trail lot of lay good. Ground being damp the way it is. Oh, sure. Old snake doctor, he's a saying the Lord's going to strike the murder down in his track. Amen. But me, uh, I'm a putting my main dependence on them bloodhounds. Oh, poor Miss Marner. She always was a good-hearted, hard-working woman. Kizzy. And mightily put She's apart dead. by that skunk. A kid. shot Kizzy. I th- say, did you hear something just there? Can't say I did. Yeah. Oh, probably a rabbit breaking through the brush, hmm? Listen. Yeah? The sheriffs are coming. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear them hounds are hissing? Oh, just for sure. Oh, I gotta hurry. Uh, Get out, Bessie. Uh, Come on. I'll see you back at the morning. You sure will. Jafe didn't waste no time mourning his dead wife. He had a chance against a pack of bloodhounds if he started right away. But Jafe's imagination went to work again as he backtracked along the creek bottom in the spotty moonlight. Gotta throw those dogs off the trail. He gotta wade the creek. Even if it is full of cotton mounds. Must be all around me now. Folks say don't strike in the water. Hope him folks is right. Yeah, I've got to get back to the snake doctor's. Get his money while he's still up at my place with Kiz's remains. Get his money and the rest will be easy. I'll make for the deep timber, cross country to the river, make it for tomorrow sundown. Hire me a shanty boater to ferry me to the Arkansas side. He'll get me a haircut and catch me a train for somewhere else. And I got to get Snake Doctor's money first. <laughs> Snake Doctor's cabin was dark and empty when Jafe reached it. Only a few dull embers in the fireplace. But he knew where the chink was. He'd find it in the dark. He scrabbled at the logs, felt some bark give, felt the clay mortar crumble under his fingernails. There it was, a hole big enough for a man's arm. He plunged his hand into it, touched something slick and smooth, and then something sharp plunged into his thumb. <laughs> At that moment, the fire flickered to life. Jafe yanked his hand out of the hole, saw two tiny bleeding punctures in his thumb. At the mouth of the hole stretched the wide-open jaws of a cotton mouth. It worked fast. He felt the pain leaping from his thumb to his hand, seeping up his arm. If only he had some liquor. If he had a fresh-killed chicken to slap on the wound, but he had nothing. Then a sharp, horrible pain wrenched his heart. And then a second. And there in the firelight, the huge cotton mouth poised in its crevice. Jafe leaped out of the shack. 
started blindly for the timber. He staggered, stumbled, then he pitched forward on his face, his open mouth full of weeds and muddy grass stems. The cramping fingers of his outstretched right hand almost touched a reddish-black smear on the wet, trampled grass. Ridden, Spike Gravy. I'd call it that, wouldn't you, Doc? I reckon there's a sort of rough justice in the way he died. Look, his hand reaching out, just about touching the blood where his woman fell. <laughs> but in all my life, I've never known but two or three people actually was bitten by water moccasins. And until tonight, I've never had personal knowledge of anybody dying from the bite of any kind of snake. It's a fact. You know that I'm going to take that rifle off of you, Finny Mourner. I'm going to kill the dang reptile and kill my pa. That Mourner's boy kicking up the fuss? Yep, and no good like his pa. Let go of me. I'm my own boss, man. What's the trouble, Tip? Oh, Finny here's went out in his hay. I'm going to kill the snake that bit in my pa. Then I'm going to give that snake doctor a whomping for keeping a reptile in his place. Your pa got what was his due, Finny. Snake doctor ain't to blame. He's a hoodoo devil. Look here, boy. Mr. Rives give me all his savings, nearly a hundred dollars, to pay for burying your mother decent. That's how much he thought of her. Now go on home. Behave yourself. I'm in the get Go it. on, Finney. There ain't no reason for you hanging around here. Somebody ought to kill a reptile a bit in my paw. Doc, just a minute ago you started to say something about snake bite not killing. But how about them two marks on his thumb? Them snakes gashes like some I've seen. No, that don't explain how it... Huh? Oh, it's Finny Mona. He's in the cabin. The fool kid. Come on, oh, Doc. He's probably shot. Well, we're too far gone. I shot him. I shot him. But I just did it. It's going to get me like he got my paw. He said he shot at something in the cabin. Come on, Doc. Let's go see. All right. We'll <laughs> I don't see anything. Oh, Finney's had enough happen to him yesterday and today to upset even a bright boy. So we can't... Oh, oh. There it is. What? That cotton mouth up there in that hole in the log. Oh, there. Snake doctor told me about that vomit. Look at him closer, David. Mm, no, sir. Not me. Go ahead. It's just a stuffed snake. Stuffed? Mm-hmm. Snake doctor believes in precautions because that hole's where he hides his money. That snake would scare away anybody who didn't know it was stuffed. But just to be sure, old snake doctor lined the hole with coils of barbed wire. Oh, I see. You mean them marks on Jafe's thumb was got off the barbed wire? That's right, sir. Lots stronger hearts than Jafe Mourner's would stop beating at a scare like that. Well, I'll be switched. Old Snake Doctor's a cute one, ain't he? Escape, produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Tonight brought you Snake Doctor by Irvin S. Cobb, adapted for radio by Fred Howard, starring Bill Conrad as Jafe with Paul Fries as Finney. Featured in the cast were Ira Grossell as a narrator, Bill Lally, Ruth Parrott, Wilms Herbert, and Edgar Barrier. Music is conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Next week, you are groping through the midnight dimness of a gigantic department store. And suddenly you realize that a hundred eyes are staring at you from the shadows. And a hundred hands are reaching for your throat. And your most urgent desire is to escape. Next week we escape with John Collier's story, Evening Primrose. Be with us next week at the same time when once again we offer you Escape. Ethelbert is at the bar, and Anne and Casey are about to enter on another thrilling crime photographer adventure. Tonight, it's a story entitled Big Danger, and it'll be along on most of these same CBS stations in just a moment. This is John Jacobs speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Frontier Town, the saga of the Roaring West. Frontier Town. El Paso, Cheyenne, Calgary, Tombstone. Frontier Town. Here is the adventurous story of the early West. The tamed and the untamed. From the Pecos to Powder River, Dodge City to Poker Flat. These are the towns they fought to live in and lived to fight for. Teeming crucibles of pioneer freedom. Frontier Town! If you're interested in facts and statistics, I'm a Frontier Town lawyer named Chad Remington. Frontier Town called Dos Rios. The rest of the facts and statistics somehow are the kind you get from the government. Because this little adventure in danger I want to tell you about couldn't have happened unless the government had ordered the remonetizing of silver. And this brought about one of the most turbulent booms the frontier has ever known. The boom brought thousands upon thousands of people into the painted hills behind the town of Angel's Draw. And although Angel's Draw originally referred to a gap in the hills behind the town, which under the proper twilight lighting looked like an angel with his pinions spread, by the time the silver boom was underway, Angel's Draw had taken on a new meaning, and a deadly one. It was said, and with a good deal of reason, that the man who was slow on the draw soon became an angel. Curious to see the boisterous town and the country around it, and hopeful of finding new opportunities, Cherokee O'Bannon, the reform medicine man who most always rides with me now, and I saddled up and set out for the turbulence and excitement of Angel's Draw. Councillor Remington, I'm willing to admit that I'm glad you persuaded me to join you in this trip to Angel's Draw. Persuaded you? I came near having to throw a holder on you to restrain you once you heard about a boom town with its wine, women, and song. Fi on wine, women, and song? Double fi with little yellow ribbons on it. Oh, so? You mean you're no longer interested in wine, women, and song? Sir, I've never been interested in wine, women, and song. No, indeed. No, indeed. The only thing that ever appealed to the old Bannon has been liquor, ladies, and brass bands. <laughs> <laughs> liquor, ladies, and brass bands, eh? Well, you certainly like your pleasures hard-boiled. <laughs> I not only like my pleasures hard-boiled, Counselor, but from time to time I've been known to become boiled myself. Yes, indeed. Well, that certainly explains why you spend most of your time in hot water. Yes, indeed. I Say, Chad, see down there? Looks like something's going on down in the street. Sure does. Seems to be a whole crowd milling around a man who's up on a platform or a soapbox. These watery blue optics don't deceive me. There's trouble going on down there. Real trouble. Come on, man. Don't just stand there. Rattle up that pony. It was hard making much speed down the rutted and crowded street. But as we neared the knot of jeering people, we were able to make out a little better the man standing on the packing case. He was tall and bony, with a look about him of the hill country. His clothes were black where they hadn't worn green, and he wore his collar reversed. A preacher. A preacher fighting to bring the gospel to a boomtown crowd. Cherokee and I reined up and started working our way through the crowd to hear better, to find out what was going on. I ask you, what good will all the silver in the hills do you if you do not find the gold in your hearts? How long are you going to sit indolently by and countenance the bestial vulgarities visited upon you and your families by this Pablo Perkins. How long, I ask? Ah, go on, you... draw up, will you? We like this town the way it is, and we don't need you. Or the likes of you around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If Pablo Perkins sent you here 
to disrupt this meeting, go back and tell him that my mission hasn't even started. Pablo Perkins serves mammon. I serve our Lord. Ever since you come to this town, Gasaway, you've done nothing but call names. Mr. Perkins happens to be a friend of ours. And if you're fighting him, you're fighting us. Right. 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 Well, if it's a fight you're looking for, Reverend, we'll be glad to oblige. Come on, boys, get that sign singer off that box and run him out of town! Yeah. Yeah. If there are any of you who want some sung over him, just take another step. Huh? Well, who do you think you are? Coming in here and telling us what to do. We'll show you who we are in mighty short order if you insist on being convinced. I'm not waiting. But a lot of you break this up and clear off the street. My son, I appreciate your help, but I have no fear of these men. And neither have I, Reverend. Not while they're in front of me. Why, you loudmouth, big talk! <laughs> Anyone else want to start reaching for their guns? Come on, boys. Let's go down and get some tar and feathers. Yeah, we'll run the three of them out of there. All right, Cherokee. You can put your gun up now. Gentlemen, although I dislike being beholden to any man, I want you to know my gratefulness for your timely interception. The people of this town have no respect for the cloth. Looks to me as if this town could use a lot of what you've got to sell. It does indeed. Well, Mr. O'Bannon here used to sell something that wasn't 1% as good for folks as what you've got. So if you'd like, perhaps if we got our heads together, we might be of some help. Any help would be welcome. And if you'd care to ride over to the little shack my wife and I live in, perhaps she'll brew us a pot of tea while we talk this over. A pot of... Cherokee. Ah. Oh. All right, Reverend, we'll get our horses and you lead the way. The cabin Reverend Gassaway occupied with his wife, Alma, was little more than some packing cases. Mining machinery had come in nailed together. But it was scrubbed and clean and had an air about it that bespoke home. Despite the obstacles in their path, both the Reverend and his wife were still filled with hope. Well, this... Is a frontier town, Mr. Remington. Although the Reverend hasn't been able to clean it up entirely, I think our efforts have helped some. Sam Alma is far from enough, and the little we have accomplished has been blocked by what we had best term the opposition. What's been blocked? Well, a few weeks ago, the Reverend shamed the so-called town council into passing a closing law. All places that serve liquor are supposed to close at 2 a.m. They're supposed to, all right, but they don't. But you've got a marshal's office here. We saw the marshal's office as we rode into town. Yes, there's a marshal, but apparently he's in the pay of Pablo Perkins, too. Then you have no law at all in Angel's Draw. Not the right kind of law. You see, Mr. Remington, the Reverend and I are far from being blue-nosed reformers. But Perkins and his tribe are bleeding the miners and their families of their hard-earned pay. In fairness to the wives and children, we feel that it must be stopped. And I suppose there's no church in Angel's Draw. The only church in Angel's Draw at the moment is in Alma's heart and my own. With the few contributions I've been able to get, we've bought a plot for our church on a knoll which overlooks the town. It's up on top of some old digging. But now that Perkins is running this town, we haven't been able to raise a dollar in two weeks for building materials. Who is this Perkins character? Is he a Mexican? I heard you call him Pablo. And Pablo is his nickname. We understand that he got it because of the finery he wears. Satin vests and silver ornaments. Just like a Spanish grandee. And probably what he needs is a few weeks on the torture racks of the Spanish Inquisition. As a man of the cloth, I know that Pablo Perkins... We'll face his own inquisition when he... The window! What happened? Someone tossed a brick through the window with a note attached to it. Well, not very imaginative. But not many people in Angel's Draw seem to be very imaginative. What did they write, Chad? What does the note say? Well, even that isn't very imaginative either. It just says, get out of town, and it's signed with a skull and crossbones. It's from Perkins, all right. Or one of his crowd. Reverend, do you honestly feel that if the saloons and gambling joints and Angel's Draw could be made to close at two in the morning, 
That there'd be enough money available so that you could get some to build your church? Oh, there's no question about it, Mr. Remington. The wives of the men who have fleeced out of their pay have told me time and again that they'd contribute to the church. Well, in that case, we'll see what we can do about closing up those dyes and Pablo Perkins right along with them. Huh? And how do you propose to do that, Chad? Well, if you'll come with me, Cherokee, I think you'll find out. We're going down to the marshal's office and do a little talking. Straight from the shoulder. The marshal? He wouldn't dare walk into Perkins' place and tell him to close it up. Well, I'd dare. And I'd enjoy it to boot. All right, come on, Cherokee. We're wasting time here when we should be talking to the marshal. <laughs> What you fellas are asking me to do is impossible. Pablo Perkins is a big man in this town. The biggest. You're the town marshal. You were put in office to enforce the laws. How much is Perkins paying you to lay off? Now, wait a minute. You got this whole thing wrong. No one's paying me nothing. All I get is my wages for doing my job. And if I cross up Perkins, he'll fix it so I won't get that. Chad, it looks to me as if all that's wrong with Angel's Draw could be cured by getting a new town marshal. Oh, now, look here. I'm a married man. I've got a family. So have a lot of the miners around this town. And your friend Perkins is taking the bread and butter out of the mouths of a good many families. Oh, good gosh. That ain't my fault. We say that it is. And since this whole thing is as distasteful to me as it seems to be to you, I'm going to ask you just once more. Are you giving O'Bannon and me deputies badges, or aren't you? Now, now, wait, wait a minute. You're putting me in an awful spot. Pablo will have my hide if I do anything like that. Well, that's our answer. Now, the next step is to get an indictment against this jelly-kneed so-called lawman for malfeasance in office and have him thrown out. Well, all right, all right. Then. You, you win. Well, if we win, let's have the prizes. Get out those deputy marshal badges. Ah, there are your badges. Now hold up your right hands. You solemnly swear to uphold. We'll return to the second act of the Glory Trail, our exciting frontier town adventure, in just a few moments. Frontier Town. Well, there were the two of us, O'Bannon and I with deputies' badges. Two men against, if not half the town, at least against this Pablo Perkins and his complement of gun toters. Tough odds? Well, not as tough as they might first appear. Because knowing that Perkins was a gambler, I knew that he was at least half bluff. And if he could be half bluff, Cherokee and I might get some place by bluffing three quarters of the way. However, not wanting to expose our cards until the pot had been built up, Cherokee and I sat in the marshal's office so that he couldn't get loose and warn Perkins. And we sat there until the clock struck two next morning. Then, checking our guns to make sure that they were ready and able, Cherokee and I started out down the street and headed for Pablo Perkins' Straight Flush Cafe, which, as usual, even at this hour of the morning, was jammed to the raft. Hey, Pablo. Yeah, Wendy? Have you seen the marshal? I ain't seen him around tonight. Yeah, well, that's right. Now that I think of it, neither have I. He generally comes in sometime around midnight for his, uh, <laughs> his salary. You think, uh, something's happened to him? <laughs> what if it has? It ain't gonna make me feel bad. That ain't what I mean, boss. I mean, them two Jaspers who rode into town today and stopped us from busting up old man Gassaway's revival meeting. What about him? Huh? Remember what Cleet said? He thought he saw him going into the marshal's office a little while after? You quit worrying. That marshal ain't got enough salt in his whole system to sprinkle on a soft-boiled egg. He'd no more do anything to stop us from... Huh. What's gotten through you, Wendy? What are you staring at? Here come them two I was telling you about right now. 
And do you see what they got pinned on their chest? Marshal's badges. From the clothes you're wearing, I take it that you're Pablo Perkins. What of it? Oh, nothing much. Is that a watch you've got on the end of that gold chain, Perkins? Yeah. And what of that? What time is it, Perkins? Well? I think it's time for you to get out of here. It's time for everybody to get out of here. It's 20 past two. You're wrong about that, too. It's 28 minutes past. Good. Then that just gives you two minutes to have this place emptied out and closed up by 2.30. We're giving you half hour of the best of it right there. Why, you red nose it. I'm sorry, my friend, but any gunplay in this place tonight will be done by the law. And at this hour of the morning, my temper's worn pretty thin. Well, there's not much I can do when you come in here and pull a gun on me. But if you don't mind, I'm going to pour myself another drink. Can't look out. He's grabbed the bottle. That's about as low down a stunt as anyone's tried to pull, Perkins. Nobody but a sidewinding snake would reach for a bottle behind a man's back. And if I didn't have a man with me like Deputy O'Bannon, who never takes his eye off a bottle, you might have gotten away with it. But now you've only got one minute left to close this joint, or we're marching you down to jail. Well, boss. Hey, quiet down a minute, will you? Quiet! There'll be no more playing and nothing more served in here tonight. So go on, beat it. Go on home. All right, wise guys. The closing order is good for the decent people in this town. It certainly applies to the riffraff like you. Now go on, make tracks. If I ever see your heads over the top of the bat wing doors again, I'm telling you right now, I'll blast them. Blast them right off your shoulders. <laughs> I guess that was about the easiest victory I ever won. Or so it appeared at the moment. Yes, and even for days later. As a matter of fact, Pablo Perkins' easy wilting, I'm afraid, made us all let down our guards. Just as Alma Gassaway had said, money started to flow in for the building of the little church. Not only money which was no longer lost over the long bar or the gaming tables at the Straight Flush Cafe but nickels, dimes, quarters, and dollars squeezed out of the household money of grateful wives. And as fast as the money poured in, the Gassaways, Cherokee, and I bought building materials and dragged them up to the knoll that we nicknamed Glory Hill. Willing hands nailed the studs and joists and stringers into places as our little church started to gain form and grow. This being a carpenter is wearing work. Oh, yes, Cherokee. Hard work's uh, not easy. Nope, even the Lord's work isn't easy. I'll say amen to that. Too bad we can't make that yellow spine Molly Coddle of a marshal come up here and drive a few nails instead of lolling around that office of his. Oh, Cherokee, that's no way for a deputy to talk about his boss. Besides, if the marshal... Hello. Here comes a real surprise. See who's buffing his way up the hill? Praise his bee. Mr. Perkins. Perkins? <laughs> if that no good imitation of a man is coming up here to make more trouble, I'll personally thrash him within an inch of his life. Good morning, Brother Perkins. Good morning, Reverend. Mrs. Gasway. Good morning to you, too, you deputy marshals. What brings you up the hill, Pablo, and particularly at so early an hour in the morning? Well, ever since you made us close up at two o'clock and I'm getting to bed at a respectable hour, I'm up and out every morning. Then it's still not too late for you to be redeemed. Much of the Lord's work is done in the morning. Well, that's what I came up to see you about, Reverend. My eyes have been opened. Closing early, I'm still making enough money, and since I don't want to see this little town of ours split in two by factions, and to show you that my heart is really in the right place... I have brought you up a little donation for your church. Here. Five hundred simoleons. <laughs> Maybe I should make a practice of getting up early every morning myself. Yes, I should. Well, Reverend, what's the matter? Why don't you take the money? Brother Perkins, I'm very grateful for your more than generous offer. But I'm sure that a man who is as wise as you are must recognize that I cannot take a contribution... For the cause of good, when the money comes from the cause of mammon. Dear, 
Are you sure you're not being a little hasty? No, Mrs. Gassaway, I think the Reverend is right. However, let us not belittle Perkins' generosity and apparent change of heart. Okay, you're the doctors. But if you ever do get stuck, you know where to find me. And the money's yours just for the asking. You would do far more good for our church and yourself by attending every Sunday rather than contributing to it. I may fool you at that. You never can tell. I may get religion, too. Adios. I think that was simply wonderful of him. And I must admit that so do I. Well, I don't. I'm afraid that the years I've spent rubbing shoulders with dishonest characters like that gambler have convinced me that a leopard doesn't change his spots and a polecat doesn't change his stripes. <laughs> Right, Cherokee was. Pablo Perkins walked down Glory Hill, and although we couldn't see it, his face wore a smug, self-satisfied smile. Once back in the town itself, he strode into the straight flush cafe, back in one of his gun slicks, walked into his office, and locked the door. What's up, boys? I just went up where they're building the church. <laughs> I knew this getting up early in the morning wasn't good for you. What'd you do that for? I offered the old coot a donation to help him finish the church. Five hundred bucks. Now I know you're loco. Yeah, loco like a fox. Now when that church ain't here no more, no one in Angel's Draw will even think I had something to do with it. <laughs> you're a loco for sure. The church ain't gonna be here no more. That's what I said. The church is gonna vanish into a million pieces of kindling wood. You see, they're building the church right on top of an old digging. And the old tunnel's right below it. What's your tunnel got to do with it? In mining, they use explosives. And who's to say if the tunnel suddenly blows up, taking the church along with it, that it ain't from some old dynamite that was left in the diggings when they quit? How do you know there was dynamite left in the diggings? I didn't say there was any left, but there's going to be some left. Because you and me, we're going to leave it there, all wrapped up with a nice lighted fuse. <laughs> yes, sir, Wendy, when they open that church on Sunday, there's going to be a big celebration. <laughs> a big blowout. Just like the 4th of July. <laughs> There should be a warm glow in your heart that'll endure all your life as you watch these good brothers and sisters climbing up Glory Hill to attend church. I've got a glow, all right, but the real satisfaction must be yours and your wife's. Oh, I've never known a happier day or a happier moment. Well, I think it's time we should be going inside and holding our first communion with the Lord in his new edifice. You go ahead, Reverend. And you too, Mrs. Gassaway. I'd better wait here for Cherokee. Even though his past is well behind him, I think it would be better if I made sure that he gets to church. <laughs> well, you go right ahead. But where is Cherokee? Well, you know, he's not in the pink of physical condition. Although he's full of the milk of human kindness, right now he occasionally backtracks and imbibes other kind of fluids. So he's a huffing and a puffing his way up that hill. <laughs> All right, Chad. We'll leave you to get behind Satan and push Cherokee and Satan both into church. Come down, Ma. <laughs> Don't be late now, Chad. Morning, brother. Beautiful day, ain't it? And a good, good morning to you. Cherokee, Cherokee, come on. Dad, wait. Don't go inside yet. Oh, for goodness sake, what's the matter? Chad, I just saw something that scared ten years out of my life. What, his satanic majesty moving out of Angel's Draw? No, oh, much worse than that. Halfway down the hill to the left where you can't see it from here... I saw two men just vanish into the side of the hill. What were you doing uh, around to the left? Well, to be perfectly honest with you, I stopped behind some juniper bushes to take a snort so I could climb the rest of the hill. Chad, I'd swear that one of those men was Pablo Perkins and the other his bodyguard. Now, what the dickens could Perkins be doing vanishing into the hill? Well, there's an old mining tunnel there from what I could see. Chad, we've got no time to waste. Those two are up to something, and we'd better investigate. Come on, Cherokee. Try to keep up. See, it is a deserted mine. Come on. Watch that brush. Let's get inside. Dad, there they are. They're lighting a fuse to something. Blast you, Remington! Cherokee, try to grab him. I'm going to see if I can put out that fuse. 
Windy, come on, make a run for it. Hound found you. You just try to make a run for it, and I'll blast it. Sadly, got me in the leg. Cherokee, see if you can go over and smother that fuse. I'll tie these two up and fast. Right there, Windy. He shot the gun out of my hand. Wait, wait. Use your knees, will you? Can you screw this out? Keep out of it, Cherokee. You're hurt badly enough. I can still do it with me. Doggone it, O'Bannon. You put out the fuse, you floored this other crook. Even with a slug in your leg, you did the work of two men. <laughs> and why shouldn't I? There were two of us. Me and Satan right behind me. Oh! Well, I'll be blamed. Mr. O'Bannon has gone and fainted. <laughs> If I should walk the meadows green or sail the ocean wide, no fear would fill my trusting heart, for thou art by my side. God's love for man fills every space. His presence goes with me. Tis round about and everywhere throughout eternity. Town, starring Reed Hadley and featuring Wade Crosby is a Bruce Ells production. Story and direction by Paul Franklin. Music written and played by Ivan Dittmar. Be sure to be with us again same time next week for another fine action adventure story with your favorite young western star, Reed Hadley. Now this is Bill Foreman telling you that Frontier Town comes to you from Hollywood. This woman may spend a lot of money and time in your store, Billy, but is a good customer worth more than your life? Have Gun, Will Travel. Starring Mr. John Daner as Paladin. San Francisco, 1875, the Carlton Hotel, headquarters of a man called Paladin. Hey, hey. that ought to do it. Thank you, hey boy. Oh, you saw, uh, but there is one thing, hey boy, not understand. What's that? Why you take fancy shirts on easy trip, Mr. Paladin? <laughs> I'm not sure I know the answer myself. I just have a feeling that... Whitewater Falls has become a very fashionable town now that Billy Boggs has set up shop there, and I want to be in style. Oh, this is uh, Billy Boggs. He's the same man who have haberdashery shop in San Francisco for many years? Yeah, that's right. Same man. 
Why he move away to dinky town like uh, Whitewater Falls? Well, for his health, he said he couldn't stand the fog anymore, he said. Oh, fog not hurt health. Hey, boy, like fog. Like big city much better than dinky town. Well, to each his own, hey, boy. Why he son for you? He in much trouble? If a man threatened to kill you because he thought you were trying to steal his wife, would that be trouble? Oh, you saw. That's what Billy said in his letter. You oh my could be big sad mess. <laughs> we'll see, eh, hey boy, but it's hard to believe that Billy Boggs is mixed up with a woman, especially a married woman. He never seemed to be the type. Oh, I can't always tell a man by the way he looks, Mr. Paladin. Ordinarily I'd agree with you, but not when it comes to Billy Boggs. But we'll see, eh, hey boy. We'll see. <laughs> Constipation can be a problem for anyone, even doctors. And when constipation occurs, it's interesting to see just what doctors consider important about a laxative they might use or recommend. Well, a majority of the doctors we heard from had this to say. A laxative should be effective, gentle, close to natural acting. A medicine that can be used with complete confidence. Now, X-Lax has been popular with many doctors and millions of people over the years because chocolated X-Lax is effective. Overnight, it helps you toward your normal regularity. X-Lax is so gentle, so close to natural acting, there's no upset. That's why many doctors and millions of people use X-Lax with complete confidence. X-Lax, the laxative that helps you toward your normal regularity, gently. Overnight. From a haberdasher shop in San Francisco to a general store in Whitewater Falls was quite a transition. From the street, it looked like any other general store anywhere, but inside, it looked more like Billy Boggs, except for one big difference. He was now specializing in women's apparel instead of men's. More than half the floor space was devoted to a ladies' department where the latest Paris styles were proudly displayed. The more mundane items found in a general store like cheese and coal oil were crowded to the corners. Billy Boggs personally attended to fashion, and I must admit he had a style all his own. I declare, Mr. Boggs, this was a dreary town before you brought high fashion to us. Well, it's a privilege and a pleasure to adorn beauty such oh. as yours, Mrs. Thompson. Oh, Mr. Boggs, yeah. how you do go <laughs> on. <laughs> well, I must say, Billy, um, your merchandise is more attractive than your customers. Yes, well, they, they don't have to be gorgeous, Paladin. As long as I can make them believe they are, it keeps me in business. Oh, that could be a dangerous philosophy, Billy. Perhaps that's causing your present troubles. Oh, no. No, no. They're not all like that old hen. Oh, Paladin, wait until you meet Amelia. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, Mrs. Arbuthnot. Uh, what's the full story, Billy? Well, it's like I told you. Her husband's got it in for me. Just because she craves high style and spends a lot of time in my store, he's fixing to gun me. And when does he propose to do this? Well, how do I know? I haven't talked to him. You haven't talked to him? No. How did he make his threat? Through her, through Amelia. She's warned me. Uh, he thinks she's attracted to me because she comes in here all the time. Why don't you keep her out? Well, I can't do that. She's my best customer. Was a good customer worth more than your life? Uh, well, no, I hadn't thought about it exactly that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think there's more to this than you're telling me, Betty that... Boggs. <clears throat> now, Paladin, don't be jumping to any conclusions. All I want you to do is to keep Henry Arbuthnot from killing me, and I'm willing to pay you. This kind of protection usually wins pretty high. Whatever you say. I'll let you know. Maybe I'd better get Arbuthnot's side of this before I decide to take the job. Amelia can tell you all about it. Oh, when do I meet her? Right now. Look. Oh. That's her. Mrs. Arbuthnot? That's right. Oh, my, my, my. She is indeed a looker. Yes. Oh. Billy, I came as soon as I heard you had a new shipment. Yes, Did you get the reversible silk petticoats with a lacy frill? Uh, <clears throat> oh. Excuse me, I, I didn't know you were waiting on someone. Oh, that's all right. That's all right, Amelia. I want you to meet a friend of mine. Paladin, this is Mrs. Arbuthnot, one of my most valued customers. Ma'am. How do you do, Mr. Paladin? Hey, Mr. Paladin is a, uh, well, a business associate of mine, Amelia. Oh, indeed. Mm. Will your business keep you long in Whitewater Falls, Mr. Paladin? Uh, that depends. On what? You. Uh, me? Uh, well, that's to say, I'm, um, 
I'm here to make a survey of Mr. Boggs' female clientele. Oh, how well, and... interesting. When do you begin? I already have. But I, I should think such a project would uh, proceed more successfully under less formal circumstances. It might. Then suppose you take tea with me this afternoon. Uh, uh, I should be honored, ma'am. Uh, 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 Amelia... I, I, I should like to direct your attention to these perfectly entrancing bonnets. Later, Billy, later. I seem to have lost my interest in clothes for the moment. But, Amelia... Billy can direct you to my house, Mr. Paladin. I'll expect you at three. I'll be there. Until then. Until then. <clears throat> well, well, now, look here, Paladin. Mm? I'm not hiring you to socialize with Mrs. Arbuthnot. You're supposed to protect me from her husband. I am beginning to think I may have to protect you from yourself. Now, what do you mean by that? You didn't look like shopkeeper and customer to me, Billy this and Amelia that. Are you sure you aren't holding out some facts on me? My private life has nothing to do with it. Oh, it has everything to do with it. Your private life and hers and her husband's. The only way I can do a job for you is to find out all I can about the people involved. If you don't want me to do that, then maybe we'd just as well forget about the whole thing. And I'll go back to San Francisco. Yes, well, maybe that would be best. Whatever you say. <gasps> Paladin. Look, look, out in the street. What? There, 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 out there in the street. He's coming this way. He's coming to get me. Who? That big fellow in the buckskin coat. That's Henry Arbuthnot. Her husband? Yes, yes. Well, he doesn't look so big or so tough. Well, he is. Well, he isn't coming in here. He's walking right past the door. Oh, oh. oh dear. Well, this time maybe... But the day will come. Listen, Boggs, he wasn't even wearing a gun. No, he probably left it in the gun shop to have it put in a top-notch shape to kill me. And, oh, look, Paladin, forget what I said. Do it your way. Anything you say goes. Only, only don't walk out on me. Don't let that man kill me. Mr. Paladin, how nice of you to come. I've been looking forward to it. You say the nicest things. Come in. We can have tea in my private sitting room. Oh, how cozy. Come. A lovely home. We enjoy it. Mm -hmm. In here. Thank you. Come now. Sit here beside me on the love seat. Is there room? We'll make room. Uh, there. Uh, there. There. Now, I, um, I didn't know you were such a famous man, Mr. Paladin. Am I? My husband told me all about you. He did? Yes. How many men have you killed, Paladin? <laughs> well, quite frankly, I don't recall. Have you ever killed over a woman? Over a woman? Oh, it must make a man feel like a, a god to kill for his woman. To stand there, gun smoking, looking down on his dead rival, knowing what a prize is waiting for him. I wouldn't know. <laughs> Come now, Paladin, don't be modest. Then how must she feel? The woman these two men have fought over. For that moment, she must, oh, she must feel indeed like a goddess at whose altar a human sacrifice has been laid. She might, uh, if she were as romantic as you are. Uh, do you find me so, Mr. Paladin? Well... Maybe you've been reading too many novels. I do read a great deal. But then why shouldn't I? Nothing ever happens in Whitewater Falls. Like men being killed over a beautiful woman? Oh, who would do that in this town? <laughs> a bunch of farmers who never shot anything more dangerous than a jackrabbit. Billy Boggs tells me your husband was once pretty handy with a gun. Well, he was, to hear him tell about it. I suspect he could still outdraw anyone in these parts. Except you, Mr. Paladin. Ooh. I'm not looking for any trouble. I'm trouble, Mr. Paladin. Are you? For the right man. Are you the right man, Paladin? Right man for what? For me. Well, I hadn't given it much thought. But you will, now that you know I have. Won't you, Paladin? It does seem to give it some immediacy. 
You're him, Paladin. You're what I've been waiting for. And there's really nothing much I can do about it, is there? Nothing. But a seed, gracefully. And you won't find that too much trouble. Will you, Paladin? Not when you're this close to me, ma'am. Amelia. Amelia. Oh. Um, uh, you, uh, you must be Paladin. Uh, that's right. Excuse the interruption. Sit down. Why, um, uh... Amelia uh, said you'd be coming to call. Oh, she did? Yes. Amelia has no secrets for me, have you, my dear? None, Henry. Why should I? So, if you'll get that nervous hand of yours away from your holster, I'd like to shake it. Hmm? Oh, yes, of course. I'm glad to meet you, Mr. Arbuthnot. And I to meet you, Paladin. You're so famous, you're practically a legend. But as you can see, as human as the next man and as susceptible to temptation. Uh, he who is without sin, let him throw the first stone. You see what I mean, Paladin. You see the kind of heroes we grow in these parts. Now, Amelia, are you going to start that all over again? No, Henry, what good would it do? Amelia thinks things are too quiet around here. She's always trying to stir up some excitement. Oh, Henry, that isn't true. Well, isn't it now? Mr. Paladin, I figure if you don't go looking for trouble, trouble won't come looking for you. But you saw plenty of it in your time, didn't you? Maybe I have. Uh. But if the good Lord lets you live long enough, you learn that there aren't very many reasons for drawing a gun on a man. But the only one that comes to mind right readily is to protect yourself. <laughs> and then, too, man gets to be my age. His fingers get the rheumatism. His eye isn't so good. He'd better keep his gun in his holster. Right, Mr. Pallon? If you say so, Mr. Arbuthnot. However adept Henry Arbuthnot may once have been with a gun, it was clear that he was no longer a threat to anyone. He had a philosophy of non-violence and a body that was tending to go flabby. Billy Boggs was safe, and I told him so. You're, uh, you're sure? Positive. Whether you're selling her ribbons, yard goods, Paris hats, or your special brand of sweet talk, you're safe. <clears throat> I told you, Paladin, our relationship is strictly business. Whatever it is, your life is in no danger and never was. Hmm. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, you say Arbuthnot's got a uh, philosophy or whatever it is? Huh? But he, he could change his mind, couldn't he? Sure he could, but he won't. You sound mighty positive. I am. Why? Well, he's not as young as he once was. He's slowing down. He's got a touch of rheumatism in his gun hand. Hmm, is that a fact? Eyes aren't as sharp anymore. I never knew that. What are you going to do now, Billy? Play footsie with that wife of his under his nose or face up to it like a man and run away with her? Neither paladin, neither. But uh, in any case, my plans no longer concern you. That they don't, and I'm mighty glad to be out of it. Are you going back to San Francisco? Might as well. No stage until tomorrow morning. I'll be on it. But if you need me, I'll be around till then. <laughs> Well, evening, Mr. Boggs. Evening, Ben. I'll have a whiskey. A whiskey, Mr. Boggs? I said whiskey. <laughs> well, since when did you go off in the beer wagon? Since when is that any of your business? Oh, yes, sir, Mr. Boggs. One whiskey. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Uh, Arbuthnot been in this evening? Why, yes, sir. He's right over there in the corner, sitting in on a hand of poker. Oh, yes. Yes, I see him. Uh, hey, did your uh, friend Mr. Paladin leave? No, Ben. He leaves tomorrow. Well, well, howdy there, Mr. Bog. Evening, Red. Hey, what's your big idea, huh? What idea, Red? Well, I never saw you wearing a gun before. Uh-huh. Well, you do now. Well, so nice and shiny and new, like, like it was out of your stock. It is, it is. How come? Are you gunning for somebody? Maybe. What? Oh, no. Now, what's so funny? Well, you, on the prowl. You. Now, don't you upset me, Red. I'm not gunning for you, and I don't want to. Well, you better not be. Oh, no, be quiet. Oh, there, he's coming this way. You gunning for him? You stick around and see. Uh, Arbuthnot? Henry Arbuthnot. Oh, good evening, Boggs. Arbuthnot, the time has come for a showdown. Indeed. Yes. 
It's you or me. Go home and sleep it off, Bob. Now, don't you tell me what to do. Don't you tell me anything. Well, that's fair enough. Good night, Bob. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Here, now. You don't walk out on me. I'm not finished yet. You hear me, Arbuthnot? I'm not finished with you. You better stop right where you are. I'm not anxious to shoot you in the back, but I will if necessary. Why don't you go home, Boggs? I've got no quarrel with you. Well, I've got a quarrel with you, and we're settling it right now. So go on. Go for your gun. What's the matter? You getting too old for gunfighting? It's a sure thing you're too old for that young wife of yours. You leave her out of it. I can't. She's right in the middle of it. She's sick to death of you, Arbuthnot. Didn't you know that? Everybody else in town does. Everybody else knows what's been going on between us. Seems only fair to let you in on the secret. Why, well, you... Billy! Billy, what happened? Paladin, he... He, he went for his gun. His gun? It's still in his holster. He couldn't have. His hand was too crippled. You knew that. I told you that. Oh? I, I don't remember. Billy, this is murder. You know it, and I know it. Somebody got the word to Amelia Arbuthnot, and she came running up the moonlit street, holding her skirts high. She threw herself on her husband's body, and she seemed to be sobbing. But I could see her unbuckle her husband's gun belt. She got it loose, rose to her feet, strapping it around her waist. All right, Mr. Boggs. I'll see to firing my husband's gun. Well, Amelia, I, I... I'm giving you a chance to defend yourself. Well, I can't go up against a woman. Why not? You went up against a man who was unable but, to defend himself. I'm able and I will. But, but I can't, Amelia. I love you. Oh, do you now? Love me enough to murder my husband? I gave him a fair chance. Like I'm giving you. Oh, no, no. Now, Amelia, I can't. You're not scared a little old me, are you, Billy? Mrs. Arbuth's not. Look, do you know what you're doing? You bet I do. He didn't think there was room in Whitewater Falls for him and my husband. Well, there isn't room in the whole wide world for him and me. But I love you, Amelia. I won't shoot you. That's too bad, Billy Boggs, because I loathe you. And I will shoot you. Amelia! All right. Make your play! <laughs> Any of you boys want to call the law in on this? No, ma'am. That was a fair fight and the best man. Well, that is... Very well, then. Now, uh, Mrs. Arbuthnot. I'd better escort you home. Thank you, Mr. Paladin. You knew he wouldn't draw on you, didn't you? Aren't you forgetting? No, I'm remembering. I didn't realize you had such a strong feeling for your husband. I didn't. But you just killed Billy to avenge his murder. Not to avenge my husband's murder, Paladin. To remove Billy. I don't understand. Well, Billy Boggs was such a dreadfully silly little man. But he did do us a favor. Us? You and me. He did us the favor of removing Henry. I'm grateful. But we wouldn't want Billy around bothering us, now would we? What a pity you didn't talk it over with me first. What do you mean? Haven't you understood a word I've said? Every word, Mrs. Arbuthnot. Every word. And all I've got to say to you is... Good night. Excuse please, Mr. Parlida. Hmm? Oh. Yes, Miss Wong? Oh, I've finished cleaning room. Would you like me to want to bring you some nice... Hot coffee? No, thanks, Miss Wong. I'll be going down for lunch soon. You all right, Mr. Paladin? Why, yes, I feel fine. Why do you ask? Well, ever since you come back, you've been very quiet. You look white, like you've been scared. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, I was a little frightened, Miss Wong. What scare you? A femme fatale. A <laughs> 
It's one you don't understand. Well, it's hard to explain. There's nothing like it in China, I'm sure. Oh. Femme fatale. A fatal woman. Oh. That's to say, a woman who tries to get her man oh. no matter what. Yes, sir. Now, Mr. Wong, understand, we have the same thing in China. Well, perhaps you do it that, but not the kind who uses a gun. Oh, no, sir. Chinese woman, I have to use gun. Can get her man much better without gun. Oh, many better ways. <laughs> I think I know what you mean. And I believe I have witnessed our Miss Wong as a femme fatale when it comes to, uh... Hey, boy? Hmm? Uh, you very observant man, Mr. Pallidus. Be sociable. Look smart. Keep up to date with Pepsi. Drink light, refreshing Pepsi. Stay on and fair and debonair. Be sociable. Have a Pepsi. Created by Herb Meadow and Sam Rolfe, he is produced and directed in Hollywood by Frank Paris and stars John Daner as Paladin with Ben Wright as Hey Boy and Virginia Gregg as Miss Wong. Tonight's story was specially written for Have Gun, Will Travel by William N. Robeson. Featured in the cast were Olin Soleil, Jack Moyles, Russell Arms, and Lynn Allen. This is Hugh Douglas inviting you to join us again next week when CBS Radio presents... Have gun, will travel. Speaking for Lever Brothers, makers of Swan, the new white floating soap that's pure as fine Castile. Well, it's Tuesday night again, time for another pleasant visit with George Burns and Gracie Allen and their guest, the star of the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer picture, Madame Curie, Walter Pigeon, with Jimmy Cash, Felix Mills, and his orchestra. And now, meet the people who live in the Burns house, George and Gracie. Well, it's morning in the Burns house, and George is upstairs dressing. Gracie is just answering the front door. Gracie, look out your living room window quick. Well, Blanche, what is it? A new neighbor's moving in next door to you, and wait till I tell you who it is. You'll die. Who is it? Walter Pigeon. Walter Pigeon, the actor? Uh-huh. You mean Mr. Greg Arson? <laughs> Yes, aren't you thrilled to death? Oh, I should say.
say I am. Oh, I just adore him on the screen. Why, when the bombs are exploding all around him and his house is being blown up, nobody could light a pipe like he can. I know. He's so romantic. Oh, yes. Look, here comes his living room furniture. Oh, look. See, there's his bookcase. Uh-huh. That's a pretty coffee table, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And, and I just love that bridge lamp. Gracie, look. Oh. Oh. Oh, and it looks like such a comfortable sofa. <laughs> You're telling me. We used to have one just like that at home before I got married. Yeah, but you had George on it. <laughs> Well, of course I did. And I wouldn't trade one George Burns for 20 Walter Pigeons. Well, that's what makes horse racing. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess it's just a matter of taste. You like one thing and I like George. Oh, look, Gracie. Here comes his bedroom furniture. <gasps> oh, yeah, and there's his bureau. And the top drawer is open. Oh, my! Did you see what just fell out? Oh, yes. Oh, he wears cute ones, doesn't he? <laughs> oh, yes, they are cute. Oh, I've been dying for George to get some like those. He, he wears the long, droopy kind. <laughs> Maybe they just look droopy on George. <laughs> oh, Blanche, look. Look right there. It's him, Walter Pigeon himself. See? <gasps> what a man. Yeah. He, he is kind of cute looking, isn't he? That, that brown hair and those white teeth and those blue eyes. Yeah. Same coloring as my husband. Only he has blue eyes, white hair, and brown teeth. <laughs> There he goes into the house. Oh, I wouldn't dream of spying on him in his house, would you? Oh, no, of course not. It wouldn't be nice. No. I'll get my binoculars. <laughs> hey, what are you two doing at the window? Snooping, eh? Shame on you. Well, George, a glamorous movie star is moving in next door. I was just going to get the binoculars. Movie star? Well, well. <clears throat> I'll get the binoculars. Who is she? Uh, Walter Pigeon. Snooping, eh? Shame on you. Well, I, I think I'll be running along, Gracie. It was wonderful seeing Walter Pigeon so close up. Well, glad you enjoyed it, Blanche. Give my regards to your husband. I will, Gracie. If I ever decide to go home again. Come away from that window, sweetheart. Ah, jealous, huh? No. Uh... Should I be? Oh, of course not. Why, you're much better looking than Walter Pigeon. Oh, no, Gracie. Oh, I mean it, George. Well, when you smile and your nose wrinkles up, it's just too cute for words. Really? Yes. It's even cute when you stop smiling and it just hangs there. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty. Walter Pigeon. I'll take George Burns. Life with you is just like a beautiful fairy tale. Oh, please. Oh, yes, it is. I often play a game when men whistle at me on the street. I pretend they're wolves and I'm Little Red Riding Hood and I'm hurrying home to you, my dear old grandmother. <laughs> Must be fun. Good morning, folks. Hi, Bill. Oh, Bill, guess what? We've got a new next-door neighbor, Walter Pigeon. Really? Say, you know, I, I think I'll drop in and tell him about Swan, the new white floating soap. That'll kind of establish me as a bird lover. A bird lover? Well, uh, George, think of the headline. Bill Goodwin gets pigeon to bathe with Swan. <laughs> Say the cute things. Yes, he's a second Ben Turpin. <laughs> well, of course, I'll tell him that Swan's not only great for his bath and for his hands and face, but it's great for bathing a baby and perfect for dishes and light laundry. Swan is four swell soaps in one, a great wartime buy. Well, I'm glad Mr. Pigeon's a bachelor, Bill. Now you'll have somebody to pal around with. Say, that's right. Gee, Pigeon and I can have some real fun together. Double dates, you know. I know a couple of sisters. Beautiful apartment, champagne, home-cooked meal, and uh, 
after dinner... Yeah? Uh, that is, if we play our cards right... Mm-hmm. They let us wash the dishes with swan. Oh, joy supreme. Well, George, it's a real kick to wash the dishes with swan. A kick to see those loads and loads of suds. And to know that swan is so mild and gentle, your hands won't get that rough red dish panty look. Well, it's time for me to get to the office. Goodbye, sweetheart. Bye, dear. And uh, while I'm gone, you two let Pigeon alone. Don't annoy him. And Gracie, above all, don't try to get him married to Tootsie Sagwell. Goodbye. Phil, doesn't George get the best ideas? (laughs) Hand me the phone. Okay, here you are. Hello? Hello, Tootsie? Tootsie, this is Gracie. Now, listen carefully. How would you like to marry Walter Pigeon? Tootsie! Tootsie! To- oh, dear. What happened, Gracie? A short circuit. I guess she drooled on the wires. popular young tenor, Jimmy Cash, and a new ballad that's rising in popularity, When They Ask About You. When I go for a walk and meet old friends we knew, we sit around and talk, then they ask about you What's the good if I say that you and I are through I tell them you're away when they ask about you They wonder where The pigeon wouldn't even speak to you. Oh, I don't care. I'd be satisfied just to squeeze him and listen to him grunt. (laughs) Now, Tootsie, that's just why we've always failed before. You rush men so. Now, this time I have everything planned. Well, Gracie, how are you going to get him to propose? Well, I'm going to put him under obligation to me. How? Well, neighbors borrow things, don't they? Yes. Well, I'm going to lend him an egg, and then he'll have to do me a little favor and marry you. (laughs) Oh, that's a wonderful idea. Thank you, Tootsie. Now, I'll take an egg and be on my way, and don't worry, in no time at all, you'll be Mrs. Tootsie Walter Sagwell Pigeon. Yes? Hello, Mr. Pigeon. Um, I'm Mrs. Burns, your next-door neighbor. Would you like to borrow this egg? Uh, well, uh, uh, no. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, you're making a big mistake. Eggs are very good for you. Uh, perhaps, Oh, but, they're uh... full of all sorts of healthy things, like vitamins and chickens. <laughs> Mrs. Burns, I, I don't want to borrow an egg. No egg? No egg. 
If I find I need one, I'll send to the store. Oh, don't do that. It's dangerous. Dangerous? Well, certainly with the shortage of materials. Who knows what they're making eggs out of these days? Uh, but, uh, Mrs. Well, now, Burns... this is a real egg. Pre-Pearl Harbor. Uh, a bit ripe, wouldn't you think? Well, just mellow. Here, here, take it. Uh, no, thanks. I appreciate your good neighbor spirit, but really, I don't want to borrow your egg. No egg. No egg. Good day, Mrs. Burns. Oh, good day, Mr. Pigeon. Uh, don't hesitate to call me if you want to borrow an egg. <laughs> Any luck? Oh, darn it, no. I couldn't lend him a thing. He seems to have everything. You said it. <laughs> and I... I thought sure I could tempt him. <laughs> oh, Tondaleo didn't have any trouble tempting him. Oh, Tondaleo. That native girl in white cargo. Yes, the one who wore the sarong. Oh, so that's what he likes. Oh, aren't men beasts? Yeah. <laughs> lovely, lovely beast. <laughs> Tom DeLeo, huh? I'll be right back. Oh, it's uh, you again. Big white stranger like a Meg. <laughs> what? Egg. Good deed. Come from bird. You want them, me got them. Uh, <laughs> Mrs. Burns, uh, just why are you talking like a travelogue? Me native girl. Live on island. What island? Uh, uh Catalina. Uh, are you asking me or telling me? Me telling you. Like a Meg? Uh, really, you shouldn't run around like the, in the neighborhood acting like this. Uh, what will your husband say? You mean pale face? Well, uh, you know him better than I do. He no care. Want a egg? No, I don't want a egg. Egg make white strangers strong. Put hair on chest. Why don't you give it a pale face? No got him chest. <laughs> ah, I, uh, I see. Beautiful, gorgeous, stunning native girl give white stranger one more chance to borrow egg. What say, white stranger? Aloha, Mrs. Burns. No, Tootsie, I guess he's tired of Tondaleo. Who else has he been running around with? Well, uh, Mrs. Miniver. Oh, yes, he borrowed from her. They used to be married. <laughs> sure. Let me see, she was English, wasn't she? Uh-huh. Well, I'll be right back, Tootsie. <laughs> Well, don't you see me? The fog, old boy. Thick as consomme. Can't see my jolly old digits in front of my jolly old puss. Are you British now? Rightfully. Care to borrow a spot of egg? Oh, that egg again. No, I don't want it. Delicious with crumpets and a cup of petrol? Oh, thanks. I like my petrol without egg. <laughs> Amusing chaps, you Americans. Uh, Mrs. Burns, why are you working so hard to get me to borrow that egg? Because you blimey well need it, old cricket. You, um, you look a bit pico today. Pico? Yes, tired as an old tea bag. Ha, ha! <laughs> beastly jolly, eh, what? Uh, more beastly than jolly. <laughs> but I definitely do not want the egg. Now, if you don't mind... Cigarette! What? Cigarette. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mitch. Thanks. Thank you. Egg. No. Cad. <laughs> Mrs. Burns, once and for all, I don't want to borrow an egg. Now, cheerio. Are you there? <laughs> Me. I can see by your face. Mm-hmm. Mrs. Miniver didn't work either. Gracie, the title of his latest picture is Madame Curie. Madame Curie. 
Au revoir, Tootsie. I left the door open. What is it this time? French. French? Yes. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Would the uh, Yankee like to borrow La Egg? All right, Mrs. Burns, you win. Give me the egg. There. Well, now that I've done you a favor, will you do a little favor for me? What is it? Drop over to the house and marry my girlfriend. <laughs> marry your girlfriend? Yes. Right now? Yes. You don't believe in long engagements, do you? No. Will you marry her? No, thank you. Well, that's gratitude for you. After pestering me all day to borrow an egg. Yeah. I, I did hound you, didn't I? But the answer is still no, even if you throw in a rasher of bacon. Well, Mr. Pigeon, won't you at least come over and meet Tootsie? No, thanks. I, uh... Say, uh, is this, uh, Tootsie between the ages of 20 and 35? Yes. Has she had at least two years of high school? Oh, yes, at least two years in each class. <laughs> uh, I, I think I would like to meet Tootsie. Oh, good. Well, come for dinner at six o'clock. Very well, I'll be there. Oh, dear. With an extra dinner guest now, I'll need another egg. May I borrow one from you? Uh, oh, yes, I, I just happen to have one on me. Oh, Felix Mills and his orchestra with a special Mills treatment of this lively air, Canadian Capers. Tootsie Sagwin and Walter Pigeon to dinner. Didn't I tell you not to annoy Pigeon with that broken down dame? Didn't I tell you that Tootsie oh, should... Oh, George, please, remember your appendix. My appendix was taken out for... has been taken out for five years. Well, poor Tootsie hasn't been out for ten. <laughs> well, never mind, you're calling this dinner off. All right, if you don't want to sing in pictures. Tell Pigeon you... What, uh, what was that? Mr. Pigeon is coming over just to hear your voice. Oh, so that's it, huh? Probably wants me to sing in one of his pictures. Well, sure. You have a remarkable voice. The kind that puts people right in the mood of your song. It uh, does? Yes. 
Remember at Bill's party, you sang Leave Me and Love Me or Leave Me? Uh-huh. Well, while you were singing, I loved you and everybody else left you. <laughs> so Pigeon wants to hear my voice, huh? Well, okay, he'll have a chance to hear it. Come in. Oh, good evening, Mr. Pigeon. This is my husband, George Burns. How do you do, Mr. Burns? How do you do, Mr. Pigeon? How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Pigeon? How are you? <laughs> Uh, an attractive house you have here, Mrs. Burns. Oh, thanks. It's not very big, but we're crazy about it. Be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. Uh, may I, uh, open a window? <laughs> no, see here. Uh, I'd like to light my pipe, but I don't want to get the room all smoky. Oh, that's it. Hmm. Where do they go, those smoke rings? I blow each night. Oh, those smoke rings. Uh, happy little fellow, isn't he? Yes, he sings. He does? Oh, yes, I, I got a special little number worked up. Would you like to hear it? Uh, well... Swell, uh... swell. <laughs> Say, have you ever been away? Hello, folks. Oh, Say. Walter Pigeon. Oh, yes. Walter, this is Bill Goodwin. How do you do? I'm glad to meet you. Sit down, Bill. I'm going to sing a little song for Walter. Oh, great, George. Say, ever heard George sing before, Walter? Uh, no. Oh, has a magnificent voice. Go ahead, George. Say, have you ever been away? Get that high note, Walter. Say... Pure as a bar of swan. <laughs> and swan's pure as fine Castile's. Now, Bill, don't start with that. Tell him about swan later. Oh, well, sure, George. Say Remind me to tell you later, Walter, about swan being the new white floating soap that's four soaps in one. The soap for bathing the baby, for your own hands and face, or for dishes and light laundry. Four swell soaps in one. Bill, don't tell him about swan. Now, wait till I finish my song. Oh, well, sure, George. Go ahead. Say, have you ever been away? Walter, when he finishes this song... <laughs> are, are you going to hear something? <laughs> I'm, I'm going I'm gonna to tell you why so many doctors recommend swan for bathing the baby. Because it's so mild, it's kind even to a little baby's tender skin. And since Swan is so mild, it must be swell for your hands and face, your complexion. Look, Walter, do you want to hear Bill talk about Swan's soap, or would you rather hear me sing? Uh, Bill, uh, I understand Swan breaks in two. Oh, no. <laughs> You're absolutely right, Walter. Swan does break in two, so you can put half in the bathroom for your hands and face tub or shower, and half in the kitchen for dishes and light laundry. Are you through? Yes. Now, if you open your yap once more, I'm going to throw you out. Say, have you ever been away? George. Say, George. Oh. <laughs> you hurt my feelings. I'm going home. Down that guy anyway. I'm sorry, Walter. Well, now I can do it right. <laughs> Say, have you ever been away? No, but it's a wonderful idea. Goodbye, everybody. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. After all, you you came over here to hear me sing. I came over here to hear you sing. Whatever gave you that idea? Gracie, didn't you tell me oh, that... My dinner's ready. I can smell the water boiling. <laughs> Walter, what did you come over for? Well, uh, uh, I'm very interested in a girl named Tootsie Sagwell. Walter, things can't be that bad with you. <laughs> uh, uh, you don't understand, George. I'm doing some special recruiting for the Wave. Oh, you want Tootsie to join the Wave? Of course. And from what your wife told me of her, she loved the Navy. She already does. <laughs> Tootsie, what queer garden got that you haven't got? So I bought a red wig. 
Oh, oh, it's simply marvelous. Honestly, if Greer Garson didn't look the way she looks and you didn't look the way you look, nobody could tell you apart. <laughs> oh, how wonderful. Oh, where is the pigeon? Let me add it. Oh, right in here. Uh, well, Walter, I guess I don't have to tell you who this is. Of course not. Hello, Hoppo. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, no. Oh, Mr. Pigeon, this is Tootsie Sagwell. Oh, I, I, I beg your pardon, Miss Sagwell. Uh, oh, Mr. Pigeon, it's really you. I can hardly believe my eyes. I'm having a little trouble, too. <laughs> and I go into the next room, Walter probably wants to be alone with Tootsie. No, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't leave. What I have to say to Tootsie, I want the whole world to hear. Uh, uh, may I ask you a few questions, Tootsie? Oh, sure. Uh, are you between the ages of 20 and 35? Uh-huh. Well, does she have to tell you how far between? Uh, no, 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 no. That, that's, that's all right. And uh, you're single, naturally? Naturally. 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 Uh, yes, uh, naturally. Uh, although that doesn't matter. If you were married and had no children under 18, you'd still be eligible. I would? Certainly. Now, uh, Tootsie... Uh, uh, I, I want you to understand the problem. Every day, more and more sailors are leaving their posts to carry men and materials overseas. The situation is really desperate. You're telling her. <laughs> oh, gee, Mr. Pigeon, imagine you picking me out of all the women in this country. Oh, uh, I don't want only you, Tootsie. I want thousands of women. Thousands? Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Pigeon, don't you think you're biting off a little more than you can chew? Uh, oh, I'm not asking anything for myself, Gracie. It's, uh, it's for Uncle Sam. Ah, well, I like that. Let your uncle get his own women. Uh, Walter, you'd better explain just what you want Tootsie to be. Why, a, a wave, Tootsie, of course. A wave? Yes. And every woman who is eligible should join. It's a fine way to share the experiences and adventures of her fighting brothers and friends who are now in the armed forces. Well, all right. Tootsie can become a wave and a bride on the same day. Bride? Well, yes. Now, let's eat before the ceremony. You don't want to marry Tootsie on an empty stomach. I certainly don't, or any other way. <laughs> well, you will before I'm through. As long as you live next door to me, I'll be at your house every single day until you decide to be more neighborly. Uh, well, in that case, Mrs. Burns, uh, I'd better run along. I, I have to get up very early tomorrow morning. Oh, really? Why? Uh, it's moving day again. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> George and Gracie will be back in just a moment. Friends, we have as our guest next week, lovely Loretta Young, and the following week, Charles Boyer. And now, before George and Gracie return, I've time to remind you that you can't be too careful when it comes to choosing the soap for your baby. So better think twice and choose Swan. Lots of doctors and nurses recommend Swan. They know it's pure, pure as fine cast seals. And they know, too, that Swan is mild, so mild, so gentle, that it will not irritate your baby's skin. And look, it's just good common sense that if Swan is that pure, that mild, well, you just can't get a finer soap for your own complexion now, can you? Think it over. I'm sure straight thinking will lead you to Swan, the new white floating soap. Well, here again are George and Gracie. Ladies and gentlemen, our Navy has a tremendous job ahead of it. And we women should be proud that we've been given a chance to do our share. The need for wave recruits is urgent. Every girl who is eligible and who is not now working in a war plant should talk about the waves with a Navy recruiting officer. Or she can write to Waves, Washington, D.C., and ask for a free illustrated booklet, The Story of You in Navy Blue. Do it now, without delay. Good night. Good night, all. <laughs> Remember George Burns and Gracie Allen, CBS next Tuesday night. And now till next week, this is Bill Goodwin saying, Well, I swan, how about you? Good night. The Kraft Foods Company presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> yes. 
It's The Great Gildersleeve, starring Harold Perry, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company, makers of a complete line of famous quality food products. For every mortal on this earth, some would like to believe there is a guiding star in the heavens. If this is so, then Gildersleeve's star, lumbering through space, must this week have brushed by Venus. Fate moves mysteriously and in sudden ways. Fate was at work the day that Gildersleeve, wearying of the monotonous fare and familiar faces at the idle hour tea shop, wandered alone for lunch into the grill of the Summerfield Hotel. He handed his hat to the checkroom girl, let her help him off with his overcoat, and turned to look for a table. When suddenly, coming toward him, he saw a vision. <laughs> She was, she was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. She was beautiful. An absolute vision of delight. I tell you, she was, oh, she was just beautiful. The dame must have been pretty good looking. Who was she? I don't know. All I know is she was beautiful. Well, didn't you ask, for goodness sake? Floyd, I'm trying to tell you, this woman was so beautiful. I know, I know. I couldn't just walk up to her and say, who are you? No, but you could have bumped into her and said, beg your pardon. There's ways. I know, but I couldn't think of them. I couldn't think of anything except that she was beautiful. Hmm. Uh, was this dame alone? Or she, was she was not a dame, Floyd. She was a different type entirely. I don't know whether she was alone or not. I didn't notice. Well, um, what'd she look like? Floyd, she was... I know, she was beautiful. But what did she look like? Was she dark or was she a blonde? I don't know. Well... <laughs> Was she tall or was she short? I don't remember that either. You sure you saw this dame? Why, of course I saw her. And stop calling her a dame. Oh, pardon me. Finish me up, Floyd. I want to get going. You know what she reminded me of, Floyd? What? A poem we had to learn in school. I don't remember it exactly, but it went uh, something, something, something. And then my heart with rapture fills... And dances with the daffodils. This dame fond of daffodils, is she? How do I know? I was just asking. I thought you were reciting me this poem about daffodils. Maybe she was crazy about them or something. It's the only poem I remember. Oh. Floyd, the woman was beautiful. Yeah, tell me. I'm not joking, Floyd. How do you suppose I could find out who she is? How do you suppose I could meet her? Well, you sort of muffed your chance there. The only way I can think of is to go back where you've seen her. Maybe she'll come in for lunch again. That's an idea. You know, the criminal returns to the scene of the crime and all. Gosh, if she walked in there again, Floyd, I don't know what I'd say. But I'd think of something. Hurry up, let me out of here, Floyd. I've got to... Oh, a little early for lunch, isn't it? Only 11.30. It ain't so early. If you're worried about eating alone, Mr. Gildersleeve, I'll be glad to close the shop and come with you. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no, Floyd. This is one thing I'm handling by myself. Now, dear, what do you have? Huh? Oh. Are you expecting somebody else? No. Uh, that is, I... Uh, no, I'm alone. Well, what would you like? Uh, I don't know. I'm not very hungry. What's good? The veal shank is very... Yeah, I'll have that. It, say, miss. Yes, sir? Uh, tell me. You haven't seen a lady come in, have you? I mean, she was in here yesterday. What kind of lady? Well, she was uh, quite attractive. She... Uh... No, sir. Nobody like that's been in. 
<laughs> Look, if uh, you're lonesome, I'm not necessarily doing anything tonight. What's that? Let it go. I'll get your veal shank. Oh, uh, head waiter. Yes, monsieur? Uh, maybe you could tell me. I'm looking for a lady. I don't know who she is, but she was in here for lunch about a week ago. I thought maybe you might have noticed she... Uh... Did she sit at that table right over there? I don't know. I only saw her coming out. Well, was she... Uh... Oh, very. And kind of... Uh... Yes, yes. And did she have the... Uh... That's the one. Uh... Uh, do you know her? Do you know who she is? No, monsieur. But I know the gentleman she was with. She was with somebody? Mr. Engelbach. Otto Engelbach. Nuts. Otto Engelbach, Peavy. The one man in this town I'm not speaking to. He isn't speaking to me either. Well, it's a small world, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> it's a small town, Peavy. That's what's wrong. This town isn't big enough for me and Otto Engelbach. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> of course, maybe the lady isn't big enough for you and Mr. Engelbach. Peavy, how can a lovely creature like that associate with a fellow like Engelbach? Oh, I don't know. A lot of people are glad to associate with Mr. Engelbach. He's a pretty solid citizen. President of the country club three times running. Yeah, he bought his way in. I told him so, too. No, he was not speaking to you. Like this affair he's giving at the club Saturday, the president's annual dinner. Why do you suppose he does that? So he'll get reelected, throwing his money around. I wouldn't be caught dead at that thing. Were you uh, invited? Nope. I don't care either. Little sour grapes? Not at all. What would I want to go to the. Say, you don't suppose she'll be there? No. Oh. Peavy, she's bound to be there. If she's still in town. A show off like Engelbach, he'd never miss a chance like that. He'll be parading her around, strutting like a peacock, the fat slob. Oh, no. Peavy, Mr. I can't stand it. What can she see in him, Peavy? Tell me that. Well, after all, he's got money, as you say. And he's an eligible bachelor like yourself. Oh, this girl wouldn't be influenced by money, Peavy. You don't know her. Do you? You can tell at the minute you meet her. There's something, something unearthly about her, Peavy. Something radiant. Something that makes you want to worship from afar. Mm. I've got to meet her, Peavy. I've got to get to that dinner. I thought you wanted to worship from afar. <laughs> don't make fun of me, please, Peavy. I know you don't believe me, but this is the real thing. How can I get to that dinner? Mm, the only way I can see is to make friends with Mr. Engelbach. Friends with Engelbach? Never. No, sir. But do you know what he wants me to do? He wants me to apologize. Well? I never apologize to anybody. It's against my principles. Least of all to a fat... Well, Judge Hooker. Gentlemen, gentlemen. Still hanging around drugstores, Gildy? You old goat. What can I do for you, Judge? You will pardon us a moment, Gildy? Sure, go ahead. Say, Peavy, this stuff you sold me, there aren't any directions with it. No, well, it's very simple. You merely apply it to the denture and then... Say, you... Judge... You know Otto Engelbach? Certainly. Why? I mean, you're on good terms with him and all. Why, of course. Why? Uh, I was just saying to Peavy, what a pity it is that Otto and I haven't been speaking all these years. Well, I don't think Otto's losing any sleep over it. I know, but the whole thing is so unfortunate, Judge. So petty and ridiculous. Two men who ought to be friends carrying on this way. Well, you wouldn't be if you weren't so pig-headed and obstinate. I know. I've been at fault, Horace. You made a very unfair accusation against Otto Engelbach in public. And I think that he had a perfect right to insist on an apology. That's just it, Horace. I've come to see that now. Haven't I, Peavy? Uh, will you do me a favor, Judge? Will you go to Otto and tell him... Why should I go to him? You go to him. Just go and apologize. That's all there is to it. Horace, please, if you just tell him... Tell him yourself. Why should I be the go-between? I'm shy. <laughs> all right, I insulted him in public. I think it's only fair that I apologize in public. What do you mean, in public? Well, you know, Otto, you'll be seeing him, Horace. Tell him if you'll invite me to his dinner party Saturday night. Don't tell him I said so, mind you. But tell him you have it on good authority from a source close to me. Yeah? Tell him if you'll invite me to his party, I'll apologize. Will you do that? 
What are you so anxious to go to his party for? So I can apologize, Judge, for no other reason, believe me. My, my. <laughs> Will you do it, Judge? Will you, for me? All right, then, do it for Engelbach. Well, if I see him. Uh, thanks, Horace. Gee, you don't know what a relief this is. I've had this hanging over me all these years. Just didn't want to give in. But lately, I haven't been able to sleep nights hardly, thinking about Otto and I was unfair to him. Tell him that, will you? Uh huh. Well, I'll be going. And thanks for the information, Peter. And not at all, Judge. I think you will find it'll stop that wobble. If it doesn't, bring it back. Don't forget, Judge. You might even find Otto in right now if you stop by his office. <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve, really, I, I... Well, what's the difference? All's fair in love and war. <laughs> but to pretend to make friends with your man and then steal his girl... Peavy, I'll say this. It couldn't happen to a nicer fella. <laughs> now, don't say I'm not friendly. <laughs> We told you last week, but it's still big news and good news. Kraft Kitchen Fresh Mayonnaise is once again available and in reasonable quantity. Yes, the supply of fine salad oils is becoming more plentiful. And now Kraft can make a fair amount of this really superior mayonnaise, which has long been famous. Soon, if you haven't already, you should be able to find some at your food dealers. Kraft Kitchen Fresh Mayonnaise, you know, is mayonnaise with the delicacy of flavor... The richness that only choice ingredients can give. Fine salad oil, selected eggs, fragrant vinegar and spices. And for the final touch of inspiration, fresh lemon juice is added. With its piquant homemade goodness, Kraft mayonnaise glorifies any and every salad. Its texture, too, is marvelous. A special patented beater exclusive with Kraft gives Kraft mayonnaise a velvet smoothness you could never accomplish in your own kitchen. It's mayonnaise, nothing short of perfection. Kraft, kitchen fresh mayonnaise. Incidentally, another famous Kraft product, Miracle Whip salad dressing, continues to be fairly scarce. We're sorry, but the shortage of sugar continues to limit its production. Now let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. Judge Hooker has promised to patch things up for him with Otto Engelbach. But here it is Saturday afternoon, the day of Engelbach's country club dinner, and Gildersleeve has had no news. We find him pacing thoughtfully in his parlor. Uh, the old goat. Would he have the sense to let me know? No, he wouldn't. How could he? No imagination. He doesn't know what I'm going through. He doesn't know how beautiful she was. How beautiful who was? Eep, erp, uh... I was not addressing you, Leroy. There's nobody else here. I thought I was alone. Eavesdropping is a nasty, dirty trick, my boy. That means spying. Who's spying? I just walked in here. I was going to ask you for a quarter. Spying. Can I have a quarter? Leroy, I'm about to answer your question. I wish you to regard my answer as the end of our conversation, not the beginning. Do you understand? I understand. I want to see the picture at the Majestic. I just told it's you. It's an educational picture. I thought you'd want me to see it. Educational? It's three little girls in blue. <laughs> well, it's an educational short. Goes with it. Leroy, I told you I wanted no lengthy arguments. You said when you answered it would be the end, but you haven't answered yet, so I thought I'd tell you some of the advantages. Then if you... The scared... answer is no. Now, for heaven's sake... Well, if I can't go to the movies, can Piggy come over and play? I don't want Piggy hanging around here this afternoon, Leroy. We won't hang around. We'll play. I don't want you playing here either. We'll play quietly. And stop arguing with me. Who's arguing? Okay. Permit me to answer it, Leroy. Sure. Gosh, what's eating him anyway? Hello? Just a minute, I'll call her. Leroy, please go upstairs and ask your sister to come to the telephone. Do not yell. Okay. Gosh, there's nothing the matter with her. Maybe Hooker hasn't even seen Engelbach. If he had any idea what I was after. Oh, no, he wouldn't. Maybe he just forgot all about it. Man his age gets absent-minded. Better call him up. 
Yes, by George, I'll call him right this very minute. I'll... Who is it, Uncle? Do you know? Uh, I didn't ask. Some girl. Francie? I don't know. Please be brief, Marjorie. I'm anxious to use the telephone. Hello? Oh, hello, Mary Louise. What do you know? Well, it's funny that you should call because I heard only this morning that Francie told Clubby the same thing. So naturally, Lloyd knows all about it. And if he knows George knows, it's because Lloyd tells his brother everything. It's terrible to get mixed up with brothers. Marjorie, I'm anxious to use the telephone. If you will confine your conversation to the essentials, I shall be greatly obliged. Wait a minute, Mary Louise. Unky's mumbling about something. Get off the telephone. I want to use it now. <laughs> I'll call you back, Mary Louise. I hope you realize Mary Louise could hear every word you said. I don't care what Mary Louise heard. I could hear her gasp at the other end. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> That'll take it easy, Marge, but these little things seem to get them in an uproar. Well, good heavens. Hello. I'd like to speak to Judge Hooker, please. I don't care. This is important. Yes, this is Mr. Gildersleeve. The old goat working on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> Listen, Hooker, you said you were going to get a hold of Otto Engelbach for me. Why didn't you call me? What did he say? You might have let me know. Uh, good old Horace. <laughs> Seven o'clock, black tie. Why, George, you're a real friend, Judge. If I can ever do a favor for you, just name it. Thanks again, Horace, and so long. Woo-hoo! I'll be down to get you in a taxi, honey. Better be ready about half past eight. Well, children, what's the idea of moping around the house on a beautiful Saturday afternoon? Huh? Do you mind if I use the telephone, Unky? Telephone? Certainly not, my dear. Telephone to your heart's content. Telephone to Philadelphia. Call up somebody in San Francisco. The sky is the limit. For heaven's sake. And Leroy, go to the movies. <laughs> <laughs> what a character. Ooh, that's enough. Yeah, where the devil is the soap? Oh, here. Too hot? Nope. Just right. Uh. 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 What'll I say to her? First impressions are very important. I suppose there'll be a whole mob of people around band playing and so forth. And somebody will say, Miss So-and-so, may I present Mr. Gildersleeve? And she'll say, How do you do? And I'll say, How do you do? Then what do I say? Well, Miss So-and-so, where have you been all my life? I'll just say it lightly like that. Well, Miss So-and-so, where have you been all my life? And she'll say, yeah, something like... Uh... Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, where have you been all my life? <laughs> <laughs> then what? Where have you been all my life? I could sort of smile at her and say, I've been waiting to meet someone like you. That ought to get her. And I guess I could ask her to dance. Just an excuse to leave the other people. But you'll understand that. Uh, would you care to dance, Miss So-and-so, by any chance? I'd love to. Got to have a little more hot water. <laughs> you dance beautifully, Miss So-and-so. Light as a feather. You lead brilliantly, Mr. Gildersleeve. You seem to feel the music. Oh, I do. Tonight. Is there something special about tonight? Oh, there is. I feel I've known you for a long time. Possibly in another world. I had a similar feeling when I saw you coming across the room just now. Even before we met. Miss So-and-so. I don't like to ask this on such short acquaintance. But does that loud mouth Otto Engelbach mean anything to you? 
I can't stand Otto Engelbach. Neither can I. I wasn't going to say anything if he was a friend of yours, naturally. He's but... an old friend of my brother's. But he's treated me practically like a prisoner ever since I've been here. He hasn't introduced me to anyone. Takes me on long rides. Why, the... Has he tried to force his attentions on you? I've been able to prevent that. Why, if he was to lay a finger on you, I'd break him in two like a match. It's nice to know I have a strong defender. Miss <laughs> uh. so-and-so, let's go out on the terrace. I think that's a lovely idea. There's a moon. And I know a dandy little place to sit. You can see the whole 18th fairway, practically. Isn't it a beautiful night? Lovely. You're not worried about being out here with me on account of Engelbach? Oh, no. Aren't you afraid of what white people might say? Not me. Don't sigh and gaze at me. Your sighs are so like mine. Your eyes mustn't glow like mine. People will say we're in love. Ah, oh, Mr. Gildersleeve. Call me Throckmorton, Miss So-and-so. Throckmorton. He. <laughs> Certainly not. I'm washing thoroughly, that's all. Yes, Floyd? I'm on the way. Just dropped in for you to put on a couple of uh, finishing touches. Uh, let me see. Gee, the old tux still shapes up pretty good, don't it? Well, it's not so old. It cost me plenty, 15 years ago. Uh-huh. Boiled shirt and pearl studs. Hey, those ain't real pearls, are they, Commissioner? Well, they're not the most expensive variety. I believe they're mother of pearl. Well, it's all in the family. <laughs> Gee, I'd say you were all set to mow them down, Mr. Gildersleeve. What do you want from me? Well, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, mustache? Uh, hair trim? Massage? I've shaved, of course. You shaved, all right. If I tried to shave you any closer, you'd bleed to death. <laughs> Turn around. Let me see you in the back. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Mm, no, no, you don't want to trim. Oh, you're right at the best stage. Uh, don't look like you just had a haircut, you know what I mean? Uh, you're sure. Oh, why should I lie to you? I could run the clippers up and down there and charge you half a buck. Rather see you look good. Well, thanks, Lloyd. I appreciate that. This, uh... This means a lot to me, you know. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, here I go. <laughs> here I go. Oh, good evening. Oh, hello. How are you, Mrs. Van Hartsfeld? <laughs> Yeah, good evening. Well, Gildy, I've been looking for you. Oh, hello, Judge. See you later. I... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Huh? Engelbach was around here just a second ago. Engelbach? Well, there's no hurry about it, is there? Oh, yeah. I thought you were in a hurry to get straightened out with him. I thought that you... Uh, Horace. What's the matter? Let go of me. Horace, that lady over there, that lady, have you met her? Sure I have. She's the guest of honor. You want to meet her? Horace. If you'll introduce me to her, I'll be in your debt as long as I live. In longer. Well, that's easy. Come on. Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, is my tie straight? Oh, sure. That's different. Come on. Okay. Well, here we are. Miss Stevens, may I present my friend, Mr. Gildersleeve? How do you do? How do you do? <gasps> Uh, well, Miss Stevens, where have you been all my life? Oh, and her husband, Colonel Stevens, Mr. Gildersleeve. How do you do? Uh, 
How do you do? <laughs> Colonel Stevens is the noted flyer. Oh, oh, he is. Well, uh, would you gentlemen forgive me if I dance with my wife? I haven't seen her in two years. How about it, darling? I'd love to, darling. <laughs> Charming woman, isn't she, Gildy? Oh, here comes Engelbach. Now you can get squared away. What? Well, good evening, Gildersleeve. I understand there was something you wanted to say to me. Yes, go fly a kite. <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be back again in just a minute. Many an expert hostess has built her reputation for fine foods on the superior salad she serves. And chances are those salads have been made with Kraft kitchen fresh mayonnaise whenever possible. So here's really good news. Fine salad oil is becoming more plentiful. And Kraft mayonnaise is once again available in reasonable quantity. If not already, your favorite food store should have a small supply very soon. Just as you remember it, Kraft Kitchen Fresh Mayonnaise has a delicate, homemade flavor that comes from the choice ingredients that go into it. Fine salad oil and eggs, fragrant vinegar and spices, and as a final crowning touch, fresh lemon juice. Then a special beater patented by Kraft gives it surpassing smoothness, a creamy velvet texture that is truly superb. You'll never again bother to make your own once you try Kraft Kitchen Fresh Mayonnaise. It's available now. Miracle Whip, however, remains rather scarce because of the sugar shortage. Her nose was too big. <laughs> Good night, The Great Gildersleeve is played by Harold Perry. It is written by John Whedon and Sam Moore. The music is by Jack Meekin. Included in the cast are Walter Tetley as Leroy and Louise Erickson as Marjorie. Dick Legrand plays Mr. Peavy and Judge Hooker is Earl Ross. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the Kraft Foods Company and inviting you to listen in again next Wednesday for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. Good night. always tastes especially good. So ask your grocer for several packages of Frizz. Yes, Frizz, F-R-I-Z-Z, is the new craft product that makes delicious ice cream right in your own refrigerator. Ice cream that's velvety smooth and rich with plenty of milk and cream. It's easy. Just add water, a little sugar, and freeze according to the directions on the package. So economical, you get six generous servings from one small package. Remember, Frizz is made by an exclusive process that retains the fresh cream flavor. Try it soon. The new craft product called Frizz. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.